President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Minister, are you seeking the call? No? Call the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Minister. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of private senators' bills today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Minister. Thank you, President. I move that the following general business orders of the day be considered today at the time for private senators' bill. Number 18, Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022 and number 14, Social Services Legislation Amendment, Enhancing P Pensioner and Veteran Workforce Participation Bill 2022, second reading speeches only before the Community Affairs Legislation Committee reports. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Private Senators Bill's Orders of the Day No. 18, Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. I welcome the opportunity to speak to the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022, and I acknowledge the work of my House colleagues Alicia Payne and Luke Gosling in bringing this private member's bill into the parliament. As a Territorian, I support this bill. And I want to be clear about what this debate is about. Right now, hundreds of thousands of Australians have fewer democratic rights because of their postcode, because they live, work and raise their families in a territory they have fewer rights. That decision was made for them by this parliament 25 years ago when the Andrews Bill became law, preventing the ACT and Northern Territory legislatures from considering or debating related laws relating to voluntary assisted dying. In doing so, it restricted the rights of territory citizens by placing restrictions on the autonomy of their democratically elected legislatures. But it has been a quarter of a century since that decision was made, and times have changed. Every state has now considered and debated laws on this issue. Victoria in 2017, Western Australia in 2019, Tasmania, South Australia and Queensland in 2021, and New South Wales earlier this year. All the bill before us today will allow is for the ACT and Northern Territory that same right. It does not compel their parliaments to legislate on this issue. It simply restores their right to do so. Their right to legislate in their own terms, in their own words and on behalf of their own citizens on the issue of voluntary assisted dying. It removes a constraint on the legislative authority of those democratically elected parliaments which does not exist anywhere else in Australia. I understand that many of my colleagues may be personally opposed to the issue of voluntary assisted dying, and I acknowledge within my own community that there are a diversity of views. But this bill is not about that. It's about whether every Australian, regardless of where they live, should have the same right to, to self-determination. 
The territory parliaments are mature parliaments. They run hospitals, build schools, they design transport networks, deliver emergency services, they shape cities and they manage multi-billion dollar economies. And we've seen over the last two years they've led the pandemic response. The people they represent deserve the same right to self-determination as every other Australian. Now, this is not the first time I have spoken in this place to support a bill on territory rights, nor the first time that I have campaigned to get this done. It's been a long journey, and for more than a decade I have fought to end this discrimination against Canberrans. Ten years ago, as Chief Minister, I made a submission on behalf of my government to a review of the Self-Government Act, arguing that the Andrews Bill was a constraint on the ACT's legislative power and that it should be removed that its inclusion was an unnecessary constraint on, any, on ACT policy choice, a constraint that was not possible in the States. In 2014, I continued my campaign as Chief Minister, writing to the Federal Parliamentary Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee to argue that the Andrews Bill creates a differential democratic right between citizens in the States and Territories and that repealing the legislation would ensure that all Australians were treated equally before their parliaments. And after arriving here in the Senate in 2015, I got straight to work on building support in this building to get it done. In 2016, I co-sponsored with former Green Senator, Senator Di Natale the Restoring Territory Rights Bill, which would have repealed the Andrews Bill and dealt with the issue. Unfortunately, that bill was not allowed to come to a vote by the government of the day. I continued trying the same year and again in 2017, supporting former independent Senator Lanham's Restoring Territory Rights Bill, working across the aisle to get it passed. That bill came to a vote a year later in 2018 and was only narrowly lost by just two votes. But that brings us to where we are today, and this is our best chance to get it done. And having worked since my time as Chief Minister to do this, I'm optimistic that in 2022 we can right this wrong. Because the difference this time around is that we have a Prime Minister who has facilitated as a priority a debate and a vote on territory rights in the House. This was a commitment Labor made last year and one we followed through on in the very first sitting of the new parliament. It matters because before now, even if the Senate had passed a bill, previous governments wouldn't have allowed the issue to be debated in the House, a reality that had played out time again over many years. With debate and a vote on the Restoring Territory Rights Bill facilitated in the House last month, we saw the bill pass on 3 August with an overwhelming majority of 99 votes to 37. That vote highlighted the broad support for getting this done, with Labor, Liberal, National, Green and independent members of parliament voting for it, including the Prime Minister, Opposition Leader and Nationals Leader. We have seen every federal representative of the ACT support the restoration of territory rights, with my Labor colleagues uh, Alicia Payne, uh, Andrew Lee and Dave Smith having long advocated and championed getting this done. We have seen every federal Labor representative of the Northern Territory support this bill. And we have seen every member of the ACT Legislative Assembly, Labor, Liberal and Green, support the removal of this legislative constraint with the passing of a unanimous motion on 31 March in 2021. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, that the ACT Minister for Human Rights, Tara Chain, is with us today uh, in the gallery. Another member. Oh, and my colleagues from the House. Sorry, I hadn't seen you there. Um, but that shows you just how important ACT representatives uh, believe um, repealing this legislation is. So with every state having now considered and debated legislation on voluntary assisted dying, with broad support across the House and unanimous support at federal and territory level here in Canberra, this is our best chance to get this done. As this bill begins debate in the Senate, my message to Canberrans is, I know how much this matters to you. To every one of you who has spoken and a major voice heard, whether you are one of the thousands who signed the petition last year or whether you raised it with me in the aisles of Woolworths or at a street stall across town, whether you called, emailed or wrote to me, your advocacy on this mattered. You are not asking for much. You are just asking for the same rights as your neighbours across the board, a border in Queanbeyan. And standing here right now, I speak on behalf of every single one of you. 
While this parliament made a decision 25 years ago to restrict the democratic rights of Australians living in the territories, more relevantly today, it has the opportunity to end that discrimination and restore those rights. Because the continuation of this discriminatory legislative constraint on the people of the ACT and Northern Territory cannot be justified. The bill before us today would ensure that every Australian, regardless of whether they live in a state or territory, has the same democratic rights. I thank the Prime Minister for facilitating the vote in the House and giving us the best chance we've ever had to deal with this issue. Without his commitment, we would not be in this position today. As this bill is considered by the Senate, I extend an open invitation to any of my colleagues to continue discussing this bill and to share what it means to the constituents I represent. Colleagues, the House has spoken decisively on this bill, and my hope is that the Senate plays its role too, that the Senate stands up for democratic equality, and they can do that by supporting this bill. And I hope that we are able to get the majority of senators to do that, to right this wrong and to ensure that everyone, every single Australian, no matter where you live, enjoys the same democratic rights as other Australians. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to join this debate on the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022, uh, a bill that across the major parties is quite rightly a free or conscience vote uh, in its consideration. Uh, I rise to join Senator Gallagher in supporting this bill. The bill for me is a series of simple questions that, with the elapse of time, have only become even more straightforward. Personally, I'm of the opinion that the Euthanasia Laws Act 1997, imposing restrictions on the legislative abilities of the territories in regards to voluntary euthanasia, should never have been enacted in the first place. Entrusted and empowered as the territories are, with all manner of other life and death, tax and spend, lock people up or let it rip type powers, it was always anachronistic for the Commonwealth to have decided that the one limitation on the territories compared with the states would be on the questions of voluntary euthanasia or voluntary assisted dying. For me personally, the right to voluntary assisted dying and to access that has always been one that humane societies should make available albeit with appropriate safeguards. Let's be frank, death and all that comes with it isn't pretty. We don't really like to think or talk about it, but it's an unavoidable and ultimately the process of dying always has the same tragic ending. For some of us, we will avoid prolonged pain and loss of dignity, but potentially lose the opportunity to say our farewells to loved ones or to put our affairs in order. For others, time will be on our side but the preservation of dignity or of quality of life will not. For a comparatively fortunate few, they will face a middle ground where farewells are possible but pain or suffering is not prolonged. Voluntary assisted dying makes the kinder pathway of avoiding prolonged pain, suffering or loss of dignity available to more who choose to access it. The question of choice is a significant and determinative factor. No person should ever feel pressure to leave this life before they're ready, but nor should people of sound mind, clear intent and genuine need be deprived of the ability to make that choice. To make that last point in the inverse, people of sound mind, clear intent and genuine need should not be forced into months or years of cruel and prolonged suffering or loss of dignity because of the judgment or attitudes of others. My body, my life, my choice. The very sound liberal philosophical approach, so long as those choices don't harm others. Many will come to this debate with personal experiences of loss and the agonising death of loved ones that inform their opinions. I respect those approaches and, like most of us, have experienced some of my own. But for me, the fundamental principles of choice and empowerment lead me to support voluntary assisted dying. Others will come to this debate with faith-based and ethical beliefs that inform their opinion. To those colleagues, I respect your beliefs, will always defend your right to live by them, but urge you not to impose them upon others. However, as Senator Gallagher has rightly emphasised, this bill is not, per se, 
a voluntary assisted dying bill. It simply restores the rights of the territories to make their own laws on this matter. You don't have to agree with me or others on questions of voluntary assisted dying to support this bill. This is where my opening thesis that consideration of the questions relating to the support or otherwise of this bill have only become more straightforward with the passage of time. When it was passed, when the restrictions on the territories were passed and put into law, the Northern Territory was at the time the only jurisdiction in Australia to have enacted voluntary assisted dying laws. While I pay tribute to former Northern Territory Chief Minister Marshall Perrin and those who supported him in the passage of those laws, I also acknowledge that at the time it was an act of legislative adventure by the smallest legislature in Australia. They were ahead of their times and were penalised for being so. In the intervening decades, every Australian state has now enacted voluntary assisted dying laws. To maintain the restrictions put in place in 1997 on the territories would be even more anachronistic and inappropriate than was the imposition of them in the first place. Far from enabling legislative adventure by the territories, this bill we consider now will only enable the territories to play legislative catch-up. Rather than inventing their own safeguards, the territories can now adopt the best of the safeguards and approaches already legislated across all six of the Australian states who have already legislated for voluntary assisted dying. But whether they do so under this law would still be a matter of choice for the ACT and the Northern Territory. This bill will not impose voluntary assisted dying legislation upon them, just the right to enact it, if they choose, thereby giving their citizens the ultimate right to choose. The Deputy President, I urge all colleagues in this place to back choice and equality of opportunity for those across the territories, for those who reside in the territories, and I urge them to support this bill. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise today to speak in support of the Territory Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022. I want to start by acknowledging the member for Canberra, Alicia Payne, and the member for Solomon, Luke Gosling, who co-sponsored this bill and successfully moved it through the House. This isn't the Parliament's first attempt to pass a bill of this nature. I'd also like to acknowledge the previous efforts by the member for Fenner and Assistant Minister of Competition, Charities and Treasury, Dr Andrew Lee, as well as Senator Gallagher, the member for Bean, David Smith, and the many other territory representatives who have pushed this issue over the years. I'd like to thank the many Canberrans, including Nicole Robertson, Kate and the two Sams, Samuel Whitsett and Sam Delaney, who've shared their stories with me, who've spoken out with so much dignity and courage about why it's so important to them that our rights are restored. I'd like to thank the many people who've given their time raising awareness, making the argument. Andrew Denton and, jo and Go Gentle Australia, Dying with Dignity, ACT and New South Wales, Judy Dent, Marshall Perron, and the many others across the country. I've spent some time with Samuel Whitsed, a 39-year-old contemplating end-of-life choices. No 39-year-old should have to contemplate the end of their life, but Sam is. No father should be fundraising for his son's funeral, but Sam's dad is. As Sam has said to me, he knows speaking up may not allow him to get the kind of end-of-life choices people living in every other, every one of Australia's states do, but his hope is that by telling his own story that one day those in the ACT will. That's what courage looks like. In 1997, Kevin Andrews' private member's bill, the Euthanasia Laws Act, came into effect immediately making the people of the ACT and Northern Territory second-class citizens to their family, friends and neighbours living in the States. Much has changed in Australia since 1997. In those intervening decades, the States have all had discussions about voluntary assisted dying and how to craft laws that both honour the wishes of dying people to have that choice, 
to provide options for a death with dignity while ensuring they have rigorous safeguards in place for the most vulnerable in our communities. We have seen these discussions happen in every state across the country. We watched in 2017 as Victoria led a compassionate discussion on voluntary assisted dying, inviting clinicians, terminally ill people, disability groups, palliative care professionals and faith groups to contribute to the debate. We watched the debate in New South Wales just last year, sorry, just this year, where parties across the spectrum came together to discuss, debate and interrogate whether a voluntary assisted dying scheme was appropriate for their state. Queensland has also had this opportunity, so has Tasmania and Western Australia and South Australia. In the quarter of a century since the Andrews Bill, every single state has legislated voluntary assisted dying. Yet the Andrews Bill still stands in the way of the territories being able to debate and consider voluntary assisted dying for ourselves through the work of our elected representatives in our parliaments. The people of the ACT and Northern Territory overwhelmingly want to have the same debate for ourselves. The overwhelming majority of Australians living in states believe their fellow Australians living in the territories should be able to have these debates and make our own decisions on whether to legislate and what that legislation should look like. Yet, as we all know, we can't, which begs the question, why? Why is it that by virtue of where we live in this country, we cannot participate in these same debates and decisions? Why are we denied the democratic rights enjoyed by the states? Why are we considered less capable of having this discussion? It makes no sense to me, and nor did it, to the framers of the ACT Self-Government Act 34 years ago. The framers understood that the people of the ACT are no different from other Australians and should be given the political franchise to consider laws for themselves, as each state does. In his second reading speech, then Minister for the Arts and the Territories, the Honourable Clyde Holding said, unlike every other person in this country, where a fair go is the creed by which we live, the people of the ACT cannot elect a member of their own government. They have no say in the decisions which affect their everyday lives. What an extraordinary admission in a country committed to democratic ideals, and why? Are these people somehow different from other Australians? Are they second-class citizens in some way? Can they not be trusted with their own destiny? The, the simple answer to all these questions is very simple. The only difference between those people and the rest of Australia is that they live in the Australian Capital Territory. Nothing separates us from the rest of Australia other than a jagged line on the map and fewer representatives in this chamber. The ACT and Northern Territory governments are expected to run their own treasuries and manage their own finances. They must run their own health and child protection systems. They collect revenue. They provide public transport build public infrastructure and face public scrutiny for their decisions and actions. They are represented on the National Cabinet and played their part in keeping their people safe through the uncertain years of the pandemic. Simply, the ACT and Northern Territory governments and legislative assemblies are expected every day to make complex, life-changing choices on behalf of their citizens. They are no less capable of having a discussion on voluntary assisted dying than every other state. I've listened respectfully and read the arguments to the contrary. In his first reading speech, the architect of the Euthanasia Laws Act stated his bill simply reflected the national approach to voluntary assisted dying. He stated that his bill was designed to bring the Northern Territory in line with every other state and territory. 25 years on, and it is now the ACT and the Northern Territory that are forced to be out of step with the rest of the country. We know that over three quarters of people nationally support the ACT and NT in having, their, having these decisions for themselves. I've heard it said that the territories are incapable of having these discussions as their parliaments do not have an upper house. But neither does the Queensland parliament. And why is it that only on this topic that this issue is raised? It's clear to me that the concern lies in the subject matter itself 
the issue of territory rights was tied to voluntary assisted dying 25 years ago in the Andrews Bill. I recognise that people have deeply held convictions on voluntary assisted dying. I don't discount the personal, ethical or faith-based perspectives brought to this chamber by senators or their right to view legislation, legislation through that lens. However, as legislators, I believe it is our responsibility to unpick complexity and to set our own beliefs in the context of how we promote the equal treatment of all Australians before the law. As former ACT Chief Minister and Senator for the ACT, Gary Humphreys has said, the ACT is mature enough to have this debate for ourselves. This is not the chamber to be, to be debating voluntary assisted dying, and no, one is asking to, no, and no one here is asked to do so. Senators are only being asked to allow the territories to have the debate for themselves. Just as every state has done, people will be able to contribute their perspectives and concerns on whether a scheme is established and what it looks like through their representatives in the legislative assemblies. I have confirmed with both the Chief Minister of the NT and the ACT Minister for Human Rights that draft legislation on this matter does not yet exist. Both territories will engage in a rigorous consultation process in the formulation of any bill, which will also be the subject of debate in the legislative assemblies. There are divergent views on this matter. These views need to be heard and considered, but that should be done in the legislative assemblies. Let me be clear, here in this place, each one of us is being asked to decide whether you believe the people who live in the ACT, as well as those who live in the Northern Territory, deserve fewer democratic rights than their family, friends and neighbours who live in the States. Senators are being asked to consider whether the people of the ACT and, and the Northern Territory should keep being considered second-class citizens in this federation. Apart from my three Territory colleagues in this chamber, your constituents already have the rights to engage in this conversation and have done so. Please give us that same right. I have had many conversations since coming to this place with colleagues across the chamber seeking your support, and I will continue to do so. To those of you who are yet to make up your mind on this important issue, my door is open and I will welcome and seek out an opportunity to speak with you. People are living in the territories are not asking for anything more than what everyone else in this country already has. It is my sincere hope that this bill passes. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting oh, Deputy President. Sorry, and uh, it's always uh, an honour and a privilege to speak on matters that are of such import in the community, and to enter the chamber when there is clearly a very considered and respectful debate underway. Just this morning, I was listening to Radio National on the way in, in a conversation between the presenters of um, the presenters of a, a, a philo 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 philosophy show. Um, Waleed Ali and his uh, co-compare. Now we're talking about the strident voice of debate in the modern place and the discourse practices that are sort of engendered by social media uh, algorithms that lead to sort of more outrage. So it's, I think it's very important to, to note the quality and the standard of this debate is moving away from that. Uh, and I do rise to speak on the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022. I acknowledge that this is a very emotive debate and, on a source, and a source of tremendous suffering and anguish for many people here and many of those we seek to represent. I acknowledge the grief, the loss and the personal truth of every account by senators here who have shared their life experiences of losing someone that they love uh, in both this debate today and also in the previous debate on this matter. Um, I certainly respect the diversity of views that have been put respectfully on the record in the course of the debate. And I have my own history, as others do, of grief and loss, and it's a lens that colours what I feel about this issue. But what we're called on in this place is to combine that journey of the heart with the intellectual endeavour to interrogate the legislation that comes before us, and I will endeavour to do that in my contribution. I also want to acknowledge that my contribution is formed by my faith perspective as a practising um, garden variety Catholic, as I call myself, hate to be thought of as devout because that could be a standard I'd never be able to live up to. 
Um, so the reality is that, as a person of faith, I do represent a range of views across that Catholic faith and also other communities of faith who hold views about life that are at the core of what is being debated here and then what will be debated if this legislation is advanced in the two territory uh, jurisdictions that it's up for. Uh, and, and I want to make a claim for the importance of a faith perspective in this debate. And I want to use the words of the Canadian legal philosopher, Margaret Somerville. Uh, those wanting to exclude religion from the public square have created confusion among freedom of religion, freedom for religion and freedom from religion. Freedom of religion means the state does not impose a religion on its citizens. There is no state religion. Freedom for religion means the state does not restrict the free practice of religion by its citizens. Freedom from religion means the state excludes religion and religious voices from the public square, particularly in relation to making law and public policy. The first two freedoms are valid expressions of the doctrine of the separation between of church and state. The third is not. And that is why I think it's important uh, in an in this particular debate, which goes to matters of life, not just to state rights, these two are absolutely intertwined in this legislation, to put on the record a faith perspective and a life perspective that I bring as a representative of that group of people in the, in, in the community. Um, this bill is about euthanasia. Let's make no mistake about it. Um, it. The only amendment that this bill will make is to remove the prohibition that the federal parliament made under its constitutional powers to prohibit euthanasia in the territories. I know that there have been many earnest contributions to this debate that no doubt with good intent call us to avert our eyes from the substantive issue at the heart of the bill. Many will say and indeed have said that this bill is just about legislative rights of the territories. But that is only one small element of the bill. The greater substantive part deserves consideration. Let me say clearly, history will show that this bill is about giving territories of this nation the green light to go ahead with enacting legislation that will make it legal for phys physicians to terminate the lives of their patients and to assist patients to take their own lives. I think a review of the contributions of those who will support the bill will show that as much as they declare it is not so, they indeed do know that enabling state sanctioned suicide in the ACT and the Northern Territory is in fact exactly what they are seeking to achieve today and heralding the sort of debate that is going to advance. And I acknowledge the most recent contribution of Senator Pocock, who spoke in this place just before me, that, that is, this is the trigger for that to happen. These two things are intertwined. They are not separate. So the substantive debate does matter, I think, in this place. Uh, the legislation that passed this parliament um, in the form of the euthanasia laws in 1997 was about euthanasia. Uh, it doesn't use that word in the new bill. It uses the lexicon of assisted suicide. And this bill would allow a matter of life and death to be determined in unicameral parliaments where there is no House of Review. And I note that Senator Pocock uh, notes that uh, Queensland has advanced legislation and it is unicameral. Um, it is also a much larger state, and we do have these two. Two states are not seeking, these two uh, territories are not seeking to become states. They are, will remain territories, and that is in alignment with the scale of the population that they have and the resources that they have, uh, with requirement of support from the rest of the federation. So there is something unique about the Northern Territory and the ACT. I also know important remarks from colleagues and community leaders about the particular vulnerability of the First Nations people, the Indigenous people, particularly in the Northern Territory, although I don't want to uh, underplay the important contribution of the First Nations people here in the ACT, the land of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, who we acknowledge every single day. Uh, but so much of the population of the Northern Territory uh, is First Nations people, the Indigenous people of the North, and the impacts of this bill are unlikely to be known before the passage of this legislation. Now, I do take on board that if this legislation passes, as we have uh, as it appears it will be, um, it's important going forward that this very important constituency, which uh, doesn't yet have a voice to this place, is taken very much into account when the debate is considered in the Northern Territory. <clears throat> and I think that goes to issues of resource capacity as well. It's one thing to think about what uh, enacting voluntary assisted dying laws, euthanasia laws in the ACT might look like. It's an entirely different matter to look at it in the context of the Northern Territory and a very dispersed population with incredibly different levels of access to uh, services, <coughs> health services, 
mental health services, physical health services and uh, palliative care. Um, I just hark back to 2014 during the Victorian state debate. 105 of Australia's 148 palliative medicine specialists, that's 70 per cent of that, of that profession, wrote an open letter in which they stated that euthanasia advocates actively and deliberately undermine the confidence in palliative care. Um, at the time the vote passed the Victorian Parliament, Victoria had the lowest level of palliative care specialists per capita in the country. And that is, in my view, very instructive, and it's part of what's driven this debate. It reveals that the first state to enact in legislation to allow assisted suicide was the least well served in terms of expert palliation advice and access. I think it would have been very helpful to have an inquiry at this point of time to give some deep consideration to any shifts in movement in terms of the level of palliation that's available in the jurisdictions that have adopted euthanasia laws. Um, I want to say that much has been made very appropriately of the pain that people have witnessed on the passing of someone they love. And I don't doubt for a single moment that senators who've authentically revealed their experiences, both in this debate and in the previous debate, um, the experience of witnessing that pain of their own and their own deeply personal encounters with the death of a loved one informs their view in this debate. Indeed, I recall one day in the course of my own father's uh, dying when palliation failed him as an aggressive brain tumour progressed. He was very much in pain and we were very distressed. Seeing that sort of thing makes you question everything. But his palliation was able to be adjusted and he continued his farewell to us with very little pain over the following weeks. He reached his 49th birthday not long before he passed. That was 35 years ago. Things do change. Things have changed. But death is ever with us. And saying goodbye to a loved one is always a fraught experience. There's no doubt amongst palliation specialists that there's been an improved, a marked improvement over that time in the field. And I acknowledge um, the powerful contributions of many senators that call for an increase in the need of uh, the level of resourcing and the enablement of ever improving palliation practices, including for dealing with mental, the quality of mental health and the psychological supports that ameliorates the challenge of a journey to death. In response to many claims about pain management that have been uh, characteristic of this debate in the public place and here also in the Senate, I would make a few remarks about the claims that pain management is the most pressing advance, reason for advancing legal assisted suicide. Um, just how significant is pain as a factor in the decision making of those who actively seek suicide in jurisdictions where it's currently enabled? And um, to the best of my knowledge, the most instructive piece of research I was able to locate is in the Oregon Public Health Report of 2016. Of the 1,127 patients in the state who died from ingesting a lethal dose of medication, the data revealed the real reasons for that action. Somewhat surprisingly, it was neither pain nor fear of pain that was actually cited by those people who took their own life as the main reason that they sought assisted suicide. It was, in fact, um, some 296 of those 1,127 people, or 26.3 per cent, who indicated that, that pain or pain control was a factor for them. So not an insubstantial amount, a quarter. But to be fair, put, let me put on the record that the most often cited reason for assisted suicide in the Oregon study, at 91 per cent, was the steady loss of autonomy, being less able to engage in activities, making life enjoyable was a reason cited by 89.7 per cent. For 77 per cent, it was the loss of dignity that motivated their assisted suicide. Loss of control of bodily functions, such as incontinence and vomiting, was the reason cited by 46.8 per cent. And it's important to note that the two reasons most cited by people who die by assisted suicide reveal that it was their feelings about their lives, their concerns about others' views of their lives, that prompted them to take action. And that is really what worries me at the heart of this debate. As much as we've talked about pain, it's people feeling they are a burden. People feeling they are a burden. People so overwhelmed by the social mores of our time that they think to lose um, some control of body functions is a loss of dignity. Where fundamentally, as a Catholic, the dignity of a person is fundamental to them. 
regardless of what they look like or what they can do or how old or how infirm they are. That belief in the essence of life is actually what informs a theological position that is opposed to voluntary insisted dying. I want to put on um, the record in the few moments re remain to me um, a recollection of attending a public meeting in the lead up to the now long ago 2001 federal election. Labor's Kim Beasley um, and our candidate for the seat at the time, Trish Moran, arrived at Kincumber High School. And it was a well attended meeting and it was surrounded by a large number of people from the local retirement villages who, who had very strong views about euthanasia and I do believe that they were really for it. When he was asked the question, Mr Beasley spoke about his experience of taking evidence in a parliamentary hearing. He spoke of a young man and his sister who came to the inquiry and insisted that assisted sui a suicide should be enabled because their mother was a perfect example of someone who was spending their inheritance on her health care. And they should have access to that. Now, Mr Beasley rightly pointed out that people who want assisted suicide and people who are arguing passionately for it here in the chamber are not motivated by that kind of intent. But nonetheless, these motivations do exist in our community and we're wise to heed them as we make law for this country. We have to make it for people, all people, and we have to cover those who have malintent. Mr, ben Mr Beasley finished and these words still echo in my head. I don't know what kind of a mother you had, but there's very little my mother wouldn't have done or given up in order for me to have a better life. That motivation can lead to egregious practice. We are battling an epidemic of elder abuse. These are contexts that actually should be informing a decision in this debate. I'm also remaining uh, concerned, in my view, about the message that euthanasia sends to those suffering with mental health troubles and to people who are suffering from a disability. In a moment when a moment or an extended series of moments when you can't access services can make voluntary assisted dying seem a lot more appealing than fighting for access to services that should be your right in a country as large and as sophisticated and as successful as Australia, the 12th largest economy in the world. When you feel bad, so bad that you want to die, treatment doesn't work, you should end your own life. I think the easy movement to that can be a very dangerous thing. And I'm looking at Senator Perrin Davey and I know that she cares about access to services in the regions, as I do, and that this is another layer of concern. So I want to uh, thank colleagues for uh, their participation in this debate and I, I, I put my words on the record there and I hope that we find a safe way through this for the Australian people. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to thank Senator O'Neill for her very considered contribution to this debate. Uh, she raised a lot of um, very sensitive issues that are certainly foremost in the minds of many people when they're uh, looking at the bill that is before us. Um, a lot of people are, to are making this bill about voluntary assisted dying or, or euthanasia, a and certainly uh, the passage of this bill, if it, if it goes through, will enable the Northern Territory and the ACT to um, bring on debate about voluntary assisted dying and, and certainly it may result in the passage of laws in those territories. But what this bill is actually about, while yes, voluntary assisted dying might become the outcome of the, of the passage of this bill, but what this bill is about is about what this place started in 1978 with the first passage of the Northern Territory Self-Government Act in 1978. Ten years later, that was followed up by the Australian Capital Territory Self-Government Act. And then uh, we also had the Norfolk Island Act in 1979. This place, we in this place at those times decided that it was right and fair for the territories 
to be able to govern themselves. We decided that the territories have the power to make laws for the peace, order and good government of their people. But then, in 1996, when people in this place saw the result of that, the passage of those bills, when the Northern Territory uh, passed the Rights of the Terminally Ill Act in 1995, all of a sudden we decided that, no, the territories can't govern for themselves over everything. They can only govern, govern for themselves on things that we think is appropriate for them to, to have self-government. Now, I don't think you can have, have it both ways. We either support the territories governing and making laws for the peace, order and good government of their people, or we don't. I don't think it is fair that the territories always have this um, hanging over their heads that if we don't like their laws, we'll come into this place and, and uh, count uh, work against them. This bill proposes to remove the restrictions that were put in place in 1996, known as the uh, Andrews Bill. And I acknowledge that this is a very sensitive issue and personal issue for many people in this chamber, in the parliament and in the wider community. Uh, we know that there have been many attempts to repeal the Andrews Bill, uh, and if this bill is unsuccessful today, I'm sure there will be many attempts going into the future. I am not here to debate the merits of euthanasia. What I am here for is to debate the merits of the territory leaders, the elected representatives in the territories, taking their positions to their electorates and for their right to debate in their own assemblies um, the merits or otherwise of their proposed legislation. I grew up in the ACT. In fact, I was living in the ACT when they had their first self-government elections. Uh, I remember the size of the ballot paper. It certainly made the look of the New South Wales Senate ballot paper uh, seem quite small at the time. I remember the party, 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 party running. Um, because that was the joy the ACT had, that they could finally elect from their own people to come together and determine uh, rules and legislation for the peace, order and good government of their own region, of the territory. It was a joyous election. And the ACT has been governed ever since by people that they elect from their own, who come together in the ACT Legislative Assembly to deba debate the merits of their proposals. Why then should anyone from any other jurisdiction determine that the people of the ACT and the people of the Northern Territory and Norfolk Island don't have the right? to have their own elected representatives debating the merits of their own laws. In today's world, there is no justifiable reason why the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly or the ACT's Legislative Assembly should not have the power to make laws that impact on their own citizens. Territory leaders should be able to take legislative proposals to their electorates. Their elected representatives have the right and indeed must adjudicate on issues on behalf of their electorates. It is crucially important um, that they, these people 
are able to have those rightful debates in their chambers, uh, in, their, in their assemblies. And the people of the ACT, if this bill is successful today, the people of the ACT or the Northern Territory, I implore their leaders to first take their positions to an election so that their constituents are aware of what the positions being taken forward are. I implore them to give it that time so the people of their jurisdictions can have the right say, um, can vote for their elected representatives knowing full well what that person's position is. And then they can have the debates in their assemblies um, to progress or otherwise any legislation uh, that they wish to bring forward. But I think that is a right that the people of the Territory should have. They should absolutely be able to vote for representatives based on what their positions are. They should be able to vote knowing that their representatives will then take forward that position into the assemblies and have the debates like we're having this debate today. I don't want to dwell on the fact of um, the voluntary assisted dying part of the bill because really to me this bill is about the territory's rights. But I, I will just address a couple of issues. I wholeheartedly agree with Senator O'Neill when uh, she raises the importance of palliative care. We must do better in this country to provide palliative care uh, for our elder, elderly and for our terminally ill. But I also want to um, – there is a fear that if we allow voluntary assisted dying, we will have an absolute tsunami of applications. But this is not borne out in Victoria, which was the first state to bring in voluntary assisted dying. Um, their legislation passed in 2017, and between June 2019, when it came into effect, to June 2021, only 836 assessments have been made. Now, some might say that shows that it was unnecessary, and I would say no, but it shows that it is not going to be a tsunami of applications. People are not going to race forward to try and get early inheritance. People take this very, very seriously. And out of those 836 assessments, 597 permits have been granted, but only 331 people actually took the medication. That is less than 40 per cent of all assessments. And that goes to show that even if you are assessed and even if you have got a permit, it doesn't necessarily mean you will follow through. But what it means is you have the choice. You have the right and you have the option. I certainly uh, wouldn't want to take advantage of such a law prematurely ever, but I do think that people deserve the right to choose to live or die in dignity. I, all, I still think that the first priority should be palliative care. The first priority should be health, treatment, medication. But I also know that there are times when, for all good intentions, there is no means of uh, prolonging someone's life and uh, there are certain there are certainly uh, diseases and ailments that just cause so much pain and suffering that people want a choice and I think that the people of the Northern Territory and the ACT should absolutely have the right 
to debate the merits or otherwise of any proposed legislation brought forward. We have certainly learnt a lot from the different models that are out there, and I am sure that the people of the Northern Territory and the ACT um, and their leaders, their elected representatives, will take all due consideration, um, but they should have the right to have the debate for themselves and um, to then vote on the merits or otherwise of any legislation that is brought before them. I do not think it is the responsibility of us in this place. Most of us don't uh, live in either of the territories. In fact, in the Senate, there's only four territory senators out of 76 of us. So for the rest of the 72 of us, I don't think we should be telling them what they can and can't do. I think that the Territory, they have the Legislative Assemblies now. We passed that in 78 for the Northern Territory and in 88 for the ACT, and we should let them govern. So I will be voting in support of this bill. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. I rise on behalf of the Greens to indicate our party's support for the Restoring Territory Rights Bill, Territory Rights bill 2022. Madam Deputy, the Coalition's decision to prevent Territory governments passing assisted dying laws was always deeply cynical and inappropriate and deeply undemocratic. The Greens opposed that measure at the time, and we have been consistent in supporting efforts to overturn it ever since. And as a party, we support this bill to overturn that move. Indeed, the Greens, um, uh, the Greens are the only party that has a clear, clear position to, uh, to support the urgent repeal of the 1997 so-called Andrews Bill. And we do this as part of a long track record of supporting territory rights. And I do want to commend the different speakers in this debate for the way in which they have positioned the discussion on territory rights. I particularly commend the contribution of Senator Pocock and indeed Senator Davies' recent, um, recent contribution, frontlining the right of people in the ACT and the Northern Territory to have the same rights as citizens across this country. If citizens of, this, citizens of the states, residents of the states, are allowed access to voluntary assisted dying schemes, well then the Greens fundamentally believe that citizens of the territories must also have that right. Um, and this should be indeed the case for all other legislative rights, that the democrat democratically elected bodies of the ACT and the Northern Territory choose to adopt uh, for, for, for their respective territories. Indeed, this proposal should not even be controversial. For the Greens, this is not a conscience vote, and we hear the discussion amongst other parties that this, because it may involve some moral issue, is descending into a conscience vote, where individual senators will choose which way they vote. But the Greens see this as a matter of principle, a matter of principle, first of all, about the rights of territory citizens to have the ultimate say through their elected uh, bodies about what laws should apply to them, what rights they should have. But we also adopt it as a matter of principle when it comes to voluntary assisted dying. This is a matter, again, on which the Greens unite, and we unite on principle. Um, and, and, and I believe we're the only party uniting on those core principles in this debate. If people who live in states are allowed access to voluntary assisted dying schemes, well, then it goes without saying that those same rights need to be able to be extended to the territories if their democratically elected representatives choose to legislate so. Uh, over the last two decades, the Greens have been a key part of the work in different states and territories to deliver rights to, to, to rights of assisted dying laws and to give people, often in unbearable pain or, far, or, or facing the impossible loss of self and dignity to give people choices and empowerment around their death. Terminally ill people in pain have a right 
to choose to die with dignity, provided appropriate safeguards are put in place. Uh, uh, to the people who have been bravely advocating for access to voluntary assisted dying for themselves and their family members as part of this debate, I want to recognise the strength and the power of their advocacy. And, and to also state clearly that the last years or months of your life should not be spent advocating to the right to make choices about your own life. The last years and months of your life should be focused with family, should be focused with, um, um, on self. But too often we've seen brave advocates spend those last months fighting with politicians for the right to die with dignity. It's time that ended. It's time the right was entrenched um, in the territories as well as the states. And indeed, regulating voluntary assisted dying um, has been a call for the great majority of the medical profession across the country, because it gives a clear framework to doctors, nurses and healthcare workers when dealing with terminally ill patients in immense pain who are asking for the right to choose when to end their pain and their indignity. Legislating for clear voluntary assisted dying laws provides that clarity and enables health workers and doctors to get on with doing their job and putting the rights and the needs of their patients first. And it also provides clear, unambiguous pathways to prevent um, uh, what can be very, very serious legal consequences for the medical profession if they get the call wrong in an unregulated environment. Inbuilt protections in the schemes that have been now legislated across the country um, show how voluntary assisted dying can unite political debates. Um, there are appropriate checks and balances in each state jurisdiction to ensure sound decision making, to prevent um, inappropriate pressure and to prevent the kind of uh, uh, highly inflated rhetorical instances that are often put in this debate by opponents of voluntary assisted dying laws, such as we've heard um, from some senators in, this co in, in their contributions in this debate, arguments that this will be abused by gold-digging gold relatives have not stacked up um, in the experience in states around the country that have legislated for voluntary assisted dying. And the move in, in, in adopting this bill would clear the path for progress on voluntary assisted dying in both the territories. And it's a sad, it's a sad tale for those families for those individuals who have been seeking the help of their legislatures in the Northern Territory and the ACT um, now since 1995. Because it was in 1995 that the NT moved first, one of the first jurisdictions on the planet, to legislate for assisted dying laws. And within less than two years, a political backlash saw the then Howard government support the Andrews Bill and override the right of the Northern Territory to legislate. But since then, and it's through the courage of survivors, it's through the courage of families, it's through the courage of patients, it's through the courage of doctors, we've, we've, we've finally seen laws passed in Victoria, Tasmania and Western Australia, I think in 2019. We saw laws passed in South Australia, in Queensland in 2021, and just this year, we saw laws finally pass in New South Wales for voluntary assisted dying. And I was, I was grateful for the contribution of one of my last, my last contributions as a member of the New South Wales Parliament was to speak with my Greens colleagues in support of those New South Wales laws to finally legislate for voluntary assisted dying in New South Wales. So every part of the Commonwealth now has these laws, except for the ACT and the Northern Territory, and they are prevented from moving forward, determining their own democratic future by an offensive law supported by this parliament that dates back to 1997, 
that we can strike off the statute books if we support this bill. Dying with Dignity describes voluntary assisted dying laws as legislation that enables competent adults experiencing unrelievable suffering from a terminal or incurable illness to receive medical assistance to end their life peacefully at a time of their choosing. Uh, dying with Dignity um, says we need a better method of end-of-life care than unbearable suffering. And indeed, I know from the many, many contributions that I got um, as a state MP when we were moving forward and legislating on voluntary assisted dying, I had many family members talk about how they lost critical months with their mum or their dad because their mum or their dad felt that they had to move forward and end their life while they were still physically capable of doing so. Before their, in, before their illness descended into incapacity, prevented their ability to act. And they didn't want to have their family members caught up in the legal dangers of helping them assist the end of their life. So they lost months and months with their family members, with their mum and their dad, and their mum and their dad, their sister and their brother, died alone, without help, without assistance because the law forced them down that path, because they had no open, clear, legislated pathway to end their life with dignity at a time of their choosing with appropriate safeguards and with their family around them, and not legislating for voluntary assisted dying for the ACT and the Northern Territory. This parliament preventing them legislating is making those people in unbearable pain and suffering, too often in their life isolated from families, in secret, hiding the truth from their families and stealing those critical months and weeks from families. It's time we ended that. Opponents of these laws will say that improved palliative care is the answer. But we have been told by the profession, we've been told by family members, that yes, there is a desperate need for increased palliative care, and of course we should all unite and support that. But tragically, there will be many cases where it will never be sufficient. Um, there will still be cases that are deeply, deeply distressing for people in their last weeks and months of their lives, and for their families who see this unbearable suffering, where the pain relief offered and the sheer indignity of the illness cannot be meaningfully ameliorated by palliative care. And that's the pathway that's open through voluntary assisted dying laws to give people empowerment and choice in those situations. The current situation that this law seeks to address um, has a person who lives in the ACT or the Northern Territory um, in great physical suffering, approaching the end of their life, and this parliament has said that they must continue to endure their suffering. They must continue to endure their suffering. They have no choice. They have no choice because of a cynical political decision made by this place in 1997. Your end of life choices should not be dictated by former Senator Andrews or former Prime Minister John Howard. People have a right to choose and their, their, their elected representatives have the right to make laws. And I'll finish with a contribution from the ACT Attorney General, Shane Rattenbury, um, who said this, it's absolutely time these discriminatory restrictions were removed and we ask the Attorneys General of Australia to support us in this call. It's very simple. If citizens of the, state are, of the states are allowed access to voluntary assisted dying schemes, citizens of the territories should also be allowed. Residents of the territories are being treated as second-class citizens. The imposed restriction on our ability to legislate on voluntary assisted dying is inequitable and undemocratic. Voluntary assisted dying is a deeply important issue to people in the ACT, and we should be permitted to consider this issue within our own democratically elected parliaments. Well, I endorse the words of um, the ACT Attorney-General and the Greens collectively 
commend this bill to the House, not as a matter of conscience, but as a matter of principle. Thank you, Senator Shubridge. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Restoring Territory Rights Bill of 2022. Uh, and first, let me be clear that this is not a debate about voluntary assisted dying, uh, because this is not a bill to legislate voluntary assisted dying, uh, and nor should it be. This bill is about restoring the democratic rights of territory residents, the right to self-government and the right to debate and consider their own laws on this matter in the same way that residents of every state have done. Because it should not be we in this chamber who make those decisions on behalf of Territorians. And it's time for the Northern Territory and Australian Capital Territory residents to be treated equally to their state counterparts. 25 years ago, the Howard government passed the Andrews Bill which significantly restricted the democratic rights of residents in the ACT and Northern Territory. The bill overturned the Northern Territory Parliament's decision in 1995 to become the first jurisdiction in the world to legislate voluntary assisted dying. This decision had been debated by residents of the Northern Territory and ultimately had been decided by those residents through their elected representatives. It was a democratic process that was unfairly ignored by the federal parliament at the time. The Andrews Bill limited the lawmaking powers of the territory parliaments. It removed their ability to even consider laws related to voluntary assisted dying. And this bill will return those powers to these jurisdictions giving the territories back their democratic right to debate these laws. Uh, and it is absurd that the lawmaking powers of these jurisdictions has been restricted by this very parliament when the same is just not true for the states. The elected representatives of these territories should have the right to debate the same laws that a state parliament can. And the residents of these territories deserve the chance to have their voices heard in these debates. And that's what this is really about. My home state of Victoria was the first state to introduce voluntary assisted dying laws to the parliament in 2017. Uh, and as my friend, uh, the Honourable Jill Hennessy, said in her parliamentary speech, the laws are uniquely Victorian and have been developed recognising the, di the diversity of Victorians. And this was only true because Victorian residents and their representatives had the right to participate in a debate. They had the right to participate in the discussion. They had the right to share their stories and help shape the laws that would impact their own lives making sure that Victorian laws reflected the stories and the experiences of Victorians. Victorians like Amanda, who bravely shared her story about her father's struggle with myelofibrosis. Amanda shared uh, at the time how after several years her father's entire body was shutting down and the medication he used to slow the passage of his illness no longer worked. There was nothing left that the medical professionals could do to ease his pain and his suffering. And in the end, Robin took his own life alone. And Victorians like Greg, who shared his story of living with HIV and watching his life partner die in the end, sta end stages of that same disease. He spoke of the pain of nursing his partner uh, and the fear for his own future. Amanda and Greg had the courage to share their stories and those of their loved ones in the debate about voluntary assisted dying in Victoria. And Territorians should simply have that same right to share their own stories, to have their voices heard, to meet with their parliamentarians and tell them what they think, uh, and just to have their say. For Amanda and Greg, once the debate had concluded and the law had been voted on, they were secure 
in the knowledge that their voices could not be shut down by the federal parliament, that Victorian stories would shape the Victorian laws about voluntary assisted dying. These laws in Victoria and in every other state allow people to make what is, of course, a deeply personal choice to relieve their suffering and die with dignity. Every death is a tragic loss. And in this parliament, we should respect that the laws that give this deeply personal choice to so many people must be decided by the residents of each state and territory, not by us here in this place. I want to acknowledge Dying with Dignity Victoria for their participation in the community discussion towards the Victorian legislation. Uh, and in particular, I thank Vice President Jane Morris for speaking with me about the bill before the chamber today. Uh, and I want to repeat that this bill does not seek to legislate voluntary assisted dying for the territories. It seeks only to restore the voices of Australians living in these places, giving back to the people, people just like Amanda and Greg, their right to contribute to the laws which affect them. Every single state in this country has had the opportunity to debate voluntary assisted dying laws without the interference of this parliament, and we need to return the right for the ACT and Northern Territory to do the same. Uh, and Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Okay. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Clerk. General Business Order of the Day number 14, Social Services Legislation Amendment, Enhancing, Enhancing Pension and Veteran Workforce Participation Bill 2022, second reading debate. Senator Smith. Madam Deputy President, I rise this morning to speak to a bill that I introduced to the Senate in the last sitting fortnight. It comes hot on the heels of last week's Jobs and Skill Summit. And the only question that people need to ask themselves at the end of this contribution is why must aged pensioners and veterans wait for this initiative? You'll think it a bit of a coincidence that this bill, introduced into the Senate in the last fortnight, replicates, not completely, replicates one of the 36 initiatives that Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said deserved immediate attention on Friday afternoon. This private senator's bill is a timely, immediate solution to two challenges that are facing our country. The challenges are real, they're immediate, and they're beginning to hurt. Those two challenges are the rising cost of living. There is not a household in our country today that is not experiencing the devastating effect of rising cost of living challenges, whether it be food or petrol or interest rates. The other immediate challenge is affecting every small and medium-sized business, indeed every large business, across our country, in every town, in every city, in every suburb. This bill will go a long way to immediately addressing cost of living challenges for aged pensioners and veterans and go a very, very long way in meeting the labour shortage challenges being faced by small and medium-sized businesses in every community across our country. You might like to ask yourself why, after two days of a Jobs and Skills Summit, can Anthony Albanese, the new Prime Minister, and Jim Chalmers, the new Treasurer, have a grand bargain with big business, big unions and big government, but they can't legislate a grand bargain for aged pensioners and veterans today? This bill doubles the Age and Veteran Service Pension Work Bonus Scheme the amount that can be earned without impacting pension payments, increasing it from $300, as it currently is, to $600 per fortnight or $1,200 a fortnight for a couple. 
Working pensioners will also continue to accrue the unused work bonus scheme income up to a $2,800 cap, exempting future earnings for pension income test purposes. Importantly, this bill removes disincentives for working pensioners. Age pensions are currently cancelled where a recipient's total income exceeds the income test for a 12-week period. The pensioner concession card access is subject to this same test and time frame. Under this bill, pensions will be suspended for up to two years instead, during which time pensioners undergo a simplified process to resume the pension if their income falls to the prescribed level. Both age and disability support pensions will be able to keep their pensioner concession card for two years under these circumstances as an acknowledgement of the importance of the concessions the pensioner concession card offers working pensioners. Pension partners of working pensioners will also enjoy the same pension resumption and pensioner concession card arrangements for a two-year period. Importantly, this bill includes an annual review mechanism requiring a ministerial review to be tabled in Parliament on the operation of the amendments, sunsetting of the amendments every 12 months unless determined otherwise by notifiable instruments. That is necessary because we would hope, indeed this whole parliament would hope, that costing, cost of living pressures in our country would ease and we would hope that labour shortage pressures in our country would also ease. Having a review mechanism makes sure that taxpayers' money gets spent wisely. So you could be excused for thinking that sounds very much like the idea that Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Treasurer Jim Chalmers trumpeted on Friday afternoon. You would be wrong. Labor's plan is less generous. Labor's plan is temporary. Labor's Age Pensioner and Veterans Reform Initiative for pensioners can earn them an extra $4,000 for this financial year. This is an extra $4,000 on top of the $7,800, which is the maximum income allowed to be earned under the work bonus currently, bringing the maximum under Labor's improved work bonus plan to $11,800. This is an extra $153 on top of the $300 that can be earned every fortnight. The maximum fortnightly earnings under Labor's plan is just $453. Labor's plan will allow pensioners to work an extra four and a quarter hours every fortnight, or just over two hours every week before they're financially penalised. Under the Coalition's Age, Pensioner and Veterans Reform Initiative, pensioners, can, can, pensioners can earn an extra $7,800 for this financial year and for future years. This is an extra $7,800 on top of the $7,800, which is the maximum income allowed to be earned under the work bonus currently, bringing the maximum amount that can be earned under the Coalition's improved plan to $5,600 a year. This is an extra $300 on top of the $300 that can be earned every fortnight. The maximum fortnightly earning under the Coalition's plan is $600. The Coalition's plan allows pensioners to work an extra eight hours every fortnight or four hours every week before they are financially penalised. Why does Labor, under its plan, want to make aged pensioners and veterans worse off than they would be under the Coalition's plan? This bill sits before a Senate committee at the moment. That Senate committee has taken submissions. That Senate committee has not yet had a public hearing because Labor senators thus far have not made themselves available to participate in a public hearing. Shame. So not only does Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Jim Chalmers bring to the Jobs and Skills Summit at the 11th hour a plan that is worse than the coalition's, Labor senators don't even want to have a public inquiry into the coalition's plan because members of the community would realise that Labor's plan lacks generosity. Labor's plan is temporary. They're embarrassed. They are very embarrassed, Senator Scar. They're late to the party and they've come embarrassed. Let me be clear. This is not a proposal for charity. 
This is an economic measure that deserves support now because small businesses are being hurt now. Aged pensioners and veterans are experiencing real cost of living pressures now. Here is a bill. We have eight parliamentary sitting days before the federal budget. Senator Ayres, Senator Chacon, Labor senators could come back to the Senate any time over the next two weeks and say, let's put politics aside, let's be the best selves we can be, and let's endorse a plan that delivers for aged pensioners and veterans and small businesses across the country. So what have some of those submissions had to say? What have some of those submissions to the inquiry had to say? National Seniors Australia, and let me acknowledge the great advocacy, consistent advocacy that National Seniors Australia and Ian Henschke in particular has done prior to the last election and since the election to get this initiative up. This initiative does not look exactly like the National Seniors Initiative, but their advocacy, their commitment to supporting aged pensioners and the real cost of living challenges in our country deserves to be acknowledged. National Seniors Australia has said in public submissions to the committee, National Seniors Australia welcomes a proposal put forward by Senator Smith to double the work bonus limit. According to the latest ABS data, 107,700 people aged 60 to 69 are not in the labour force, not retired and not currently employed but want to work. But want to work. Labour shortages across our agricultural communities are crippling. Grain Producers Australia, in its submission, says, Grain Producers Australia supports the positive intent of this bill to introduce changes to the social security entitlements and payments for Australia's veterans and pensioners to help incentivise greater participation in the agricultural and rural workforce by introducing more flexible rules and modern arrangements. Australian agriculture has faced long-term structural challenges with labour supply, and whilst these problems are widely recognised, lasting solutions continue to elude policymakers and governments. That would be true until this bill was introduced into the Senate. Indeed, from my home state of Western Australia, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry has said, in this context, it is those economies that can extract the most out of their local workforces that will gain a competitive edge in the global economy. ABS data shows there is currently significant latent demand for over 65s to work. In 2019, the average hours of additional work sought by people over 65 was 685,000 hours. The total number of hours has since swelled and now stands at 724,000 hours. The Victorian Chamber of Commerce has said, during the current skills and labour shortages, pensioners and veterans can help provide businesses with the workers they need to keep operating. Not only can they fill roles, but the community can benefit from their experience in training, managing and mentoring other staff, as well as lifting overall productivity and bringing broader skills into the labour market. I would have thought that if Premier Dan Andrews thinks this is a good initiative, there surely can be no other excuses for not legislating it immediately. Dan Andrews supports the idea of older workers being able to enter the workforce, help address cost of living challenges and help address labour shortages, as does the New South Wales Treasurer, Matt Keane. What more is needed? The Premier of Victoria, Dan Andrews. The New South Wales Treasurer, Matt Keane. What more is needed to convince Labor that this is an initiative that serves to be legislated now? So I think, I think it's very true. It's very, very true. When Peter Dutton, the leader of the opposition, did something very, very unorthodox for a new opposition leader following an election, he came up with a policy idea, which is this idea. On the 26th of June, there was enthusiastic head nodding. There was enthusiastic head nodding across this country because people understand this is a sensible solution. Sensible solution. I think Senator Ayres himself is nodding. Yes, Senator Smith, I think that is a sensible solution. But Labor's enthusiasm is lukewarm. Labor's enthusiasm is lukewarm. If Labor was enthusiastic, they would have done this 
not on 101 days of being in government. They would have done it immediately. If Labor was not lukewarm, they would have made this the first initiative of the Jobs and Skills Summit, not the last. If Labor was enthusiastic and not lukewarm, they would say to pensioners and veterans, we will not make you wait. We will not make you wait until the budget. We will not make you wait until the legislation that comes out of the budget later this year. Age pensioners and veterans are saying, why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? I hope that Senator Ayres, in his contribution, will be able to satisfy that question. And why is Labor's proposal less generous than the coalition's? Why is Labor's proposal less generous than the coalition's? Because in the submissions to the committee inquiry, one of the submitters has made it very, very clear that the initiative will pay for itself. The initiative will pay for itself. I hope that when I walk out the Senate chamber, I'll get a call from the chair of the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee to say, Senator Smith, you're quite right. You caught us out. We've been avoiding a public inquiry on your bill, so we're going to have a public inquiry soon and we're going to get that report out because this is an initiative that deserves to be supported and to be deserves to be supported now. The Jobs and Skills Summit did deliver a grand bargain for big unions, big government and big business. I've been around long enough to remember that once upon a time it was called the Accord. That's right. But Senator Ayres, indeed to all Labor senators, Age pensioners and veterans in our community deserve their grand bargain, and they deserve it now. This bill can be legislated in the, eight, in the next eight sitting days, and I look forward Thank to that you. being the outcome. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I always enjoy Senator Smith's uh, contributions and listen to them very carefully. Um, uh, and uh, I, I do think that his capacity to uh, confect enthusiasm and sort of certitude uh, on this piece of uh, proposed legislation should be an exemplar to all senators today and into the future. Um, it really is, it really is a remarkable thing. Um, I don't, um, I don't criticise Senator Smith for bringing this piece of legislation to the parliament, but honestly, honestly, uh, we know, we know he didn't draft it. We know, it, we know it came from somewhere else. If he drafted it, it would be much more elegantly worded uh, and, uh, and much more politically sharp. Uh, but we've got a bill that was drafted, drafted in the opposition leader's office. And the key words in Senator Smith's contribution, three key words, beginning to hurt. That's what he said. Uh, cost of living pressures are just beginning to hurt. Labor supply issues just beginning to hurt. They, 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 they were a pro they've been a problem for the last 105 days. They didn't exist prior to the last 105 days. They're just beginning to hurt. I just say to um, senators opposite, when you do go to the government party room, or if you ever get in, you knock, knock on the door and you get into the leader of the opposition's office, just say, look, we need a better plan. This isn't going very far. Nobody on earth is convinced, least of all ordinary Australians, that cost of living pressures are suddenly a new development that's happened over the last 105 days. Um, the, the Morrison government's approach on these questions, utterly sclerotic, no action. Uh, Mr Morrison said he didn't want to leave a legacy. Well, he never said a truer word. He never said a truer word. Nothing the Morrison government did on cost of living or labour supply troubled the scorers. In fact, in fact, some of the measures, as Senator Payne well knows, as some of the measures that the Morrison government undertook, particularly during the COVID crisis, rode in exactly the wrong direction. Now, as if this debate 
over labour shortages and skills shortages and cost of living only occurred over the last 105 days. It's really been a debate, of course, that's been going for well over the last three years. And where was this proposition in 2019? Where, where was it in 2020? Where were Senator Smith and his colleagues all through 2021? And where were they on this proposition, as generous as Senator Smith describes it is, in the first few months of 2022? Well, they were nowhere, of course. They were defending, defending Mr Morrison. You can't find too many of them over there, publicly or privately, who want to defend Mr Morrison now, but they are all up to their ears in it, on, defending Mr Morrison on, day in, day out. On, I mean, Senator Smith wasn't doing it very loudly, but there he was. You could find him if pushed to it publicly. He'd, he'd stoutly defend him. Zero action on labour supply, zero action, zero action on cost of living. In fact, the last government did worse. I'll never forget when Mr Morrison sent the message to temporary visa holders to go home. I, I remember walking around in the Sydney CBD and you would see piles of furniture out the front of blocks of flats. You would see food queues, food queues in Australia in 2020, 2021, uh, as people were sent, sent packing. And now these characters want to come in here and complain about skill shortages. Uh, when, where were they then? Where were they then? Full of big ideas today, utterly vacant on big ideas over the last few years. Now there was, there was a place for big ideas about our shared national problems in the labour market. It was the last two days of last week. It wasn't a bad place if you're interested in big ideas about the future of the labour market. The Jobs and Skills Summit that the Prime Minister convened, denigrated by Senator Smith, but it was a place for big ideas, uh, a place for Australians to work together uh, on some of the big national problems. And if I can say this, set the tone. The leadership of the trade union movement was there. Business, large and small, was there. The stakeholders went. Key organisations, they were all there. Experts, people who actually know things about stuff instead of just saying things about stuff, many of them were there. Many of them spoke up. All of the states, Labor and Liberal, they were there. Mr Littleproud went. And good on him. It's the right call. It would have been ridiculous for him not to attend. That's where Australia was. That's where the leadership of corporate Australia, not everyone could get a ticket, but that's where the leadership of corporate Australia was, and many of them participated in the hundred mini summits that the government convened in the weeks leading up to the big summit. Where was Mr Dutton? and the Liberal Party. Where, where, where were they? Well, Mr Dutton was outside on the radio and the television denigrating the participants who went, pouring scorn on the participants who went, trying to encourage a bit of scepticism in the community about the idea that Australians would get together recognising their own interests but putting the national interest first, get together and actually try and deal with some of these questions. Where was Mr Dutton? It was the old Morrison politics of division. That's where he was. I, I, I reckon if Senator Smith had been invited, he probably would have gone too. Um, I listened to Senator Cash on Radio National this morning. More of the same nonsense wants to denigrate trade union officials, wants to denigrate the businesses, large and small, who attended, you know, actually come into grips with some of the challenges that we're facing. It was really more reminiscent of a young Liberal speech 
uh, really made me think about how difficult it is those first months and years facing up to dealing with the legacy of a sclerotic and hopeless government, uh, walking into Walking, there's a few young Labor people here too, don't worry. Walking into, walking into a period where suddenly you reflect on what it is that you should have been up to over the last few years. Now, if Senator Smith had picked up the phone and given one of us a call, we could have told him, um, we could have told him last week on Friday what it was that the Prime Minister had announced uh, amongst the, other, the 36 other measures. Amongst the 36 other measures. The Prime Minister announced the work bonus measure as recently as last Friday, and there was more discussion about it over the weekend. And I want to want to spell out some of the key provisions uh, of that announcement. It will assist the Income Bank will assist working Social Security pensioners over age pension age, including those receiving the age pension, the disability support pension, and the carer payment. It will also assist receiving some veterans' entitlements, such as the service pension and income support supplement. From 1 December 2022, pensioners over the age pension age will have their work bonus income bank credited with $4,000. This will take the maximum work bonus income bank from $7,800 to $11,800 until 30 June 2023. The increase will be added to each age pensioner's work bonus income bank upfront. Uh, that means that every age pensioner could have an extra $4,000 of employment income disregarded from the income test from the start rather than accumulating it over time. Age pensioners who currently work and have already accrued the maximum income balance of $7,800 will now be able to have up to $11,800 disregarded for the purposes of the age pension income test. This provides a very strong incentive for those who do not currently work to start earning additional income if they wish to do so. It's a significant reform. Age pensioners who are currently working and have already benefited from the full value of the concession will have their income bank topped up by $4,000. A pensioner who is working and has used some of their income bank will also receive the $4,000 top-up. The maximum income bank limit will return to $7,800 at the end of this financial year. By providing an immediate top-up of $4,000, rather than allowing it to accrue over time as currently happens, this measure will provide an immediate benefit to any pensioner who starts work or works additional hours and is going to help addressing pressing labour shortages in a practical and immediate way. The work bonus operates in addition to the income test free area. Under the work bonus, the first $300 of work income a fortnight is not counted in the pension income test and, as such, does not reduce the amount of pension received. Pensioners are able to build up any unused amount of the $300 fortnightly exemption in a work bonus income bank up to a total of $7,800. Uh, I, I would acknowledge that, that in all of these areas there is, of course, uh, for veterans, pensioners, uh, disability pensioners, participants in the NDIS, uh, long-term unemployed Australians, particularly First Nations Australians, women uh, who, whose participation rate is not as high in the labour market and are participating in areas of the labour market where, uh, where incomes are lower and employment is more contingent, there is, of course, more work to do. There is more work to do. And wh what I say to the chamber is that we've, we have, as a government, moved to deal with this question. We've moved to deal with it carefully. We've moved to deal with it in a way that includes all of the Australian community. We've, we've done it in a careful, methodical way. Uh, it is a significant improvement. Uh, but there is, of course, more to do on all of these questions. Uh, and the way to get the best out of Australians 
The way to get the best out of Australian institutions is, of course, to play a leadership role from government and encourage people to work together. Not to encourage Australians to think that there might be some sectional advantage in playing with the politics of division, a politics that some on the other side, some on the other side, are all too comfortable playing. And we'll continue to work through these issues. We'll continue to work through these issues with the trade union movement and with business, large and small, develop practical solutions to do the kinds of things that Senator Smith has only become recently so worried about. Uh, the, cost of, the cost of living, the cost of living uh, and labour shortages. Uh, issues that the Morrison government uh, talked about but didn't lift a finger to resolve. Now, of course, on the cost of living questions, uh, there are some, quite some announcements today about uh, indexation and general support for aged pensioner and service payments. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in most cases, in many cases, the, the three pillars of the retirement system, compulsory employment superannuation, voluntary savings and the aged pension. Uh, the aged pension is, of course, now the largest component of social security expenditure. Expenditure in 22-23 is around $54 billion. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a significant announcement being made today about indexation, which will see the job seeker payment for singles without children increasing by $25.70 a fortnight. Uh, significant increases to other government social security payments. Uh, these payments will increase from the 20th of September, uh, and that reflects a serious contribution. A serious contribution, the largest indexation for quite some time. Uh, that will make a real contribution. Thank you, Senator on cost Ayres, of your time issues. has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I want to start by thanking Senator Smith for his focus on income support in this bill. Senator Smith and I have got a long history of working collaboratively on complex issues, and I want to particularly acknowledge his measured and very considered approach on some of the challenging issues facing us in the parliament. With regards to this bill, it fits within a framework of needing to increase people's well-being right across the board. The Australian Greens believe that a socially just, democratic and sustainable society should actually be underpinned by a guaranteed livable income, complemented by the provision of universal social services. We believe that everyone should have enough to live on and essential services to enable them to fully participate in society. And which is why we want to see the development and adoption of a comprehensive suite of tools to measure poverty across the range of communities in Australia, including a national definition of poverty and ultimately the eradication of poverty in Australia. I mean, we can choose to eradicate poverty in Australia. And a key step in that process would be the reform of our income support system in its entirety to ensure a guaranteed livable income for all. This bill, of course, goes nowhere near a guaranteed livable income, and the government's version of, of it falls even further short. But it does include a number of measures to better support pensioners, making it easier for pensioners to earn more before their pension is reduced. And the changes in this bill would also make it easier for people to keep their pensioner concession card when they earn above the income threshold in a 12-week period. And the questions that this bill is addressing of how to balance the income test and ensure that we're providing support for everyone who needs it are really important questions. And in reflecting on the measures in this bill, I'm of course very conscious that the Greens actually were the only party in the last election with a clear proposal to provide earlier access to the age pension. 
as we said at the time, that lowering the eligibility age will expand access to the pension for hundreds of thousands of older Australians currently living in poverty and provide a well-deserved earlier retirement with guaranteed income support for people who have worked their entire lives on low wages in order to take care of their families. And since the Rudd government's 2009 increase to the pension age from 65 to 67, Liberal and Labor have been failing low-income older Australians. Across the country, thousands of older Australians approaching retirement age have limited capacity to continue working or have been excluded from the labour market entirely. Thousands more are in physically demanding minimum wage jobs, first forced to keep working an additional two hours two years because of successive Labor and Liberal governments failing to give them the support they need. So we need to be doing more than just enabling pensioners who are able to work to increase the hours that they can work. In particular, we need to be supporting people who, at the end of their working life, having worked hard all their life, don't have to absolutely be putting themselves to be literally breaking their backs in in manual labour, as many of them are, whether it's working in hospitals, whether it's doing heavy lifting, um, to just to survive. Of course, that measure that we took to the last election of reducing the age that people could access the pension was in addition to our proposal to increase the rate of payments for all income support recipients to $88 a day, so that people on job seeker or on, on pensioners, people on youth, youth allowance, people on the disability support pension would all receive an income payment above the poverty line so that no one was languishing in poverty. And we also wanted to remove compulsory obligations, those largely pointless tasks and hoops and form fillings and meetings that people on income support have to subject themselves to to receive income support. And as an aside, there is increasing evidence that some people and more people are actively choosing to not access income support, not because they don't need it. They are choosing to try and survive with no income at all because of these so-called mutual obligations processes that are imposed upon them. And I met a woman earlier this year who was homeless on the streets of South Melbourne who told me that she was actively choosing to not have any income from the government at all, because the whole process of having to go through these processes of mutual obligation were worsening her mental health so much that she decided that being homeless, living on the streets with no income at all, was actually going to be better for her mental health rather than having to jump through the pointless mutual obligation hoops that she was being forced to do so. So, as well as reforms that benefit pensioners, we want to ensure that no one, no matter how old they are, are living in poverty. We know that poverty is a political choice. It's a choice that the government is making. It's a choice that the previous government made. And at the same time as they are handing, choosing to hand out billions of dollars to billionaires, billions of dollars to the ultra-wealthy. I mean, Senator Ayers talked about the very important measure that the Treasurer has been spruiking today of increase, increases to income support. That is actually only just keeping pace with inflation. And the Treasurer, in announcing these measures, said, we know that it won't solve every problem for everybody, but it's important that we try and make sure that those payments keep up. That's what the indexation is about. It will be welcome, even as we acknowledge that times will still be tough for a lot of people. Yes, indeed, Treasurer. Times indeed are very tough, and your government is choosing to keep them that way. The government is choosing not to increase the woefully inadequate rates of income support for job seekers, for pensioners, for people on disability pension, for young people, for students. The, job, the government is choosing to keep millions of Australians living in abject poverty where people can't afford to eat three meals a day, where people are being diagnosed with malnutrition and scurvy at the same time that they get, this government is proceeding with the stage three tax cuts. And recent analysis showed just how skewed and just how wrong proceeding with the stage three tax cuts is in this context where The Guardian reported that the richest 1 per cent of Australians will get as much benefit from the stage three tax cuts 
as the poorest 65 per cent combined. The tax cuts, which will cost $243 billion to 2032-33, would see $160 billion flow to men and $83 billion flow to, men, flow to women. So let's be clear. At the same time as we're debating this bill, which is going to give some very modest increases to, to pensions to be able to earn more, we have got both sides of politics, the Liberal Party and the Labor, Labor Party alike, planning to give $244 billion to very wealthy people over the next 10 years. And at the same time, the indexation that the government's touting today is worth less than $2 a day to people living on JobSeeker. $2 a day, whereas everyone earning over $200,000, that's everybody in this place, will get $24 a day in the stage three tax cuts. $2 a day is not enough for people facing a housing crisis, for people who are struggling to buy food. My office get a call out for people's stories in the lead up to the Jobs and Skills Summit last week of people's experience of being on JobSeeker and what that did to their ability to find work. And their answers were stark and sobering. I mean, one said, being on JobSeeker feels like a punishment, a punishment for not being able to find work where there simply aren't enough jobs to go around. You see people around you enjoying the most basic things, like catching up with friends for a coffee, and you feel like you've been kicked when you're already down. And to be honest, I'm one of the lucky ones. I don't have children or pets that depend on me to provide for them. When the rate was raised, I was able to buy winter clothes without worrying if I'd be cutting into the food budget. This shouldn't be a normality. No one should have to choose between a meal and a jumper. It's a punishment and it's killing people. And another story. I'm so blessed to now be in full-time employment. But in the past few years, I've been on job seeker payments for extended periods. It was demoralising and frightening. There was no safety net, nothing to be done except watch the little bit of savings I'd built up dwindle to nothing. And then every new letter in the letterbox filled me with dread. Another bill I had to try and negotiate not paying. I became depressed and fearful and angry at the injustice of it all and at the stigma created and perpetuated even by Centrelink itself. Please continue to fight for those trapped in poverty. And I can assure them that's what we Greens will continue to do. I mean, Senator Smith's bill takes some measures that will make life easier for aged pensioners, but there is so much more that needs to be done. And there's a simple answer here. We can make a different choice. We can choose to increase the rate of income support so that payment rates are above the poverty line. Choose to care for people rather than profit. Choose people over corporations. The Greens believe that no one in Australia should be living in poverty, and we will keep fighting for that change. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. I too rise to speak on Senator Smith's private senator's bill, the Social Services Legislation Amendment Enhancing Pensioner and Veterans Workforce Participation Bill 2022. And firstly, can I congratulate my very good friend and colleague from Western Australia on his work and his enduring commitment to older Australians, to pensioners and to veterans, not only in our home state of Western Australia but also nationally. And uh, contrary to what Senator Ayres has just told the chamber, this is a project of passion for Senator Smith for his entire time in the Senate and he's worked tirelessly for older Australians and also for grandparents and increasing grandparents' rights in particular who have responsibility for children. Um, this is the culmination of many months of consultations by Senator Smith and others with businesses, with agricultural organisations, and particularly in partnership with National Seniors Australia. And as I said, it is a genuine and long-standing commitment. And uh, Mr. Deputy President, I admire greatly Senator Ayres' uh, attempts to um, deflect from the very substandard proposals that the Labor Party, well after their 100 days, have now put forward. And in uh, my contribution today, I'd like to focus on the contrasts between this 
excellent piece of public policy, and I thank Senator Rice for her comments about the legislation and about its benefits. So, as a senator for Western Australia, I do welcome and support this bill, which will improve the livelihoods not only of thousands of Australians but thousands of Western Australian pensioners and veterans. This bill does contrast sharply with the government's long overdue announcement on an aged and veterans pensioner income credit. And again, I note that it took Senator Ayres probably 10 minutes of rewriting history of the previous government before he was able to very lightly uh, touch on the benefits, as he saw it, of Labor's uh, emperor with no clothes policy. And I'll explain uh, why it is so deficient. As Senator Smith said, it is a very lukewarm response at best. It is a substandard and a very temporary measure, unlike the measures contained in this bill, which are permanent for uh, older Australians and for veterans. Sadly, this is yet another classic ALP response, one that is clearly influenced by the dead hand of the trade union movement, who are very fast becoming the de facto government of this nation. Not only is the Labor announcement too little too late for many Australians, but as I've said, it is a very poor, a very poor um, attempt to copy our, our policy that we announced in June of this year. In June, let me remind the chamber that the coalition announced our policy to double the amount of income that aged pensioners and veterans and service pensioners can earn without reducing their pension payments. Uh, this is something that we put forward in June, and as you can see, it is now sitting before a Senate committee which completely and utterly disgracefully, Labor is now stalling so that there have been no hearings on this bill yet in the Senate, in the Senate committee, which is something that I also joined Senator Smith in calling for. So let's now compare the two. Let's contrast the two policies. Our policy is to increase the amount that can be earned each fortnight from $300 to $600 for individuals or $1,200 for couples without impacting on their pension payments. Now, Labor's plan uh, will allow pensioners to work only an extra 4.25 hours per fortnight. That's right, I will say that again, only 4.25 hours per fortnight, which is just over two hours per week. That is pathetic. In contrast, the Coalition's AIDS Pension and Veterans Reform Initiative Pensioners can earn an extra $7,800 for this financial year and for future years, which again contrasts sharply with Labor, who are just introducing a very light touch policy for 4.25 hours per fortnight. But again, under the dead hand of the unions, they're not making this permanent, and that is a complete and utter disgrace. So our policy, in contrast, is an extra $7,800 on top of the $7,800, which is currently the maximum income allowed uh, to be earned under the work bonus. That, that, uh, currently brings, so this will bring the total amount per year under our plan to $15,600 per year. That's an extra $300 on top of the $300 that can be earned every fortnight. So the coalition's plan allows pensioners to work an extra eight hours every fortnight or four hours every week before they are penalised. And Labor's uh, so-called income credit will only increase the amount of eligible participants what they can earn to 453 per fortnight, well short of the 600 per fortnight proposed by the coalition. The coalition's policy also extends the period in which age and disability support pensioners are required to reapply for payments when their employment income exceeds prescribed limits. It's also to retain access to the pensioner concession card for up to two years in these circumstances. And that is something that seniors' organisations have said to us is very important, but something that clearly has fallen on the, dead, the deaf ears of those opposite. Also to the dismay of senators on this side, it appears that Labor has completely cynically and unnecessarily delayed this announcement 
to coincide with the government's job summit. And not only uh, is that unnecessary, but also it's having serious consequences on our economy. By delaying this for over 100 days, eligible participants have not yet had the confidence to work. So during the first quarter of this financial year, which is a critical time in our nation's economy, people have not been able to go out and start filling some of those jobs. Australians who want to be in the workforce, who could have been now in the workforce today, providing such necessary support to businesses who are now closing because they cannot find enough workers to assist. Now, as Senator Smith asked rhetorically uh, through the chair to Senator Ayres, is why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? And despite all of the revisionist history uh, we got from Sen Senator Ayres, there was no answer. And in my own home state of Western Australia, businesses and communities are battling staff shortages each and every day. Businesses are closing. Small business owners in particular are struggling to do all of the extra hours to keep their businesses open. And according to the ABS, there are 107,000 people aged between 60 and 69 who are not in the labour force. They're not retired, but they are not employed but they want to work. Australia's labour shortage, while bad uh, right across this nation, is even worse in my home state of Western Australia. And despite that, the Labor Party, for all of their rhetoric about, yes, we care about Western Australia and we understand you're the financial engine room of our nation, guess how many delegates we had from Western Australia? Colleagues, guess how many we had from Western Australia? It was seven, so you were close. Seven from the state that is the most impacted by job shortages. There were seven delegates from my state. That is a complete and utter disgrace, and as Senator Scar describes it, it is a disgrace and a shame. So, in Western Australia, we need every able-bodied person who can work and wants to work to be able to work and to be contributing to the workforce. We simply need this policy now. We don't need a half-baked labour influence policy from Labor uh, that will provide an extra 2.25 hours per week. We need something far more substantial and we need it now from the Labor Party. So this is absolutely typical of a pattern that is now emerging from the Labor Party. In the first 100 days, they have already broken so many promises. They have delayed making any decisions and going through to summits, to reviews. You wonder what they've been doing in opposition when their first 100 days they don't have a plan. They've got a lot of fabulous rhetoric, but they don't have a plan. There is nothing, there is nothing more concrete and more, you know, that will provide more benefits and will be self-funded after the first few people take up this scheme than this piece of legislation by Senator Smith. So I call on the Labor Party to at least allow hearings on this bill now in the Legislative Committee of Community Affairs so that we can hear, we can hear from the people who will benefit the most from this. The Liberals will continue to support Senator Smith's legislation. We will continue to advocate for people who are on the pension, veterans pension and age pension, people who have so much to contribute to our nation, but they have roadblocks in the way right now. So, Mr Deputy President, I commend this bill to this chamber. Thank you. Senator Hughes. Deputy President, well, we know that the Labor Party has been waiting for their job skills talk fest before looking to do anything productive to address the skills shortage that is being faced across so many sectors across the entire country. This proposal 
to allow pensioners and those on the disability to support pension to work longer hours without impacting on their pension was proposed by this opposition, by the opposition leader, uh, a substantial period of time around the 26th of June uh, to start to put in train methods and ways that we could boost workforce shortages as quickly as possible. Now, this is actually the point. We've heard lots and lots of things being talked about, about increasing migration, increasing skilled and unskilled numbers, bringing people into the country, working on the visa processing system to get them through. And whilst much of that is commendable and needs to be done probably at a much faster rate to ensure that we can address these work skill shortages, both in skilled and unskilled positions, we have a workforce ready to go. We have a substantial number of people that are in receipt of an aged or disability support pension who would like to work more hours. But those opposite now in government have of course opposed this up until their talk fest. Up until the Job Skills Summit, it was something that would not be countenanced. Now, is that because it was proposed by those opposite? Is it because we have a level of, level of pettiness that won't allow good ideas to be discussed, that this is a government who isn't going to govern for all Australians, is a government that's only interested in governing for their union mates? And so we needed to make sure that John Setka, Sally McManus and the majority of participants that were at the Job Skills Summit representing those unions would give this the tick of approval because we couldn't have a situation at all where those in government upset their union mates. So just to be clear when we talk about the unions, the unions currently represent around 10 per cent of Australians, the private sector workforce, yet had 33 seats at this summit talk fest. So as Senator Reynolds just made the point, there was only seven participants from Western Australia, they were, the Western Australians were completely overshadowed by the union and how much say and what the influence was and the numbers they had representing them at this talk fest last week. Now, to put that in context, 10 per cent of Australians members of unions. 41 per cent of the Australian workforce is employed in small business. 41 per cent. And guess how many seats they had at the table? Guess how many seats representing small business who employ 41 per cent of Australians had at the table? One. One seat. Now, those of us in this chamber are more than aware that the government has no interest in small business. They have every opportunity, whilst those on this side of the chamber in government did anything, proposed anything to boost small business. It was opposed. It was vehemently opposed at every single opportunity. But I guess what's even more important for those everyday Australians that are looking to what happens in this place, that lo is looking to what this place and the other place is doing to address cost of living pressures, what is impacting them? The ability for them to put groceries on the table, the ability for them to afford power bills to currently warm their houses and very, very soon to start to cool their houses as we go into summer. What were the topics that were used around that and talked about at the skills uh, job talk first? Nothing. Nothing. But easing workforce shortages would make a significant contribution to cost of living pressures. And we know this because cost of living pressures are significantly impacted at the moment due to supply chain issues. And it's the supply chain that is being so dramatically impacted. And there are costs around increased cost of fuel. We know that the war in Ukraine is having impacts, something that we completely understand, but when in opposition, those opposite denied had any factor whatsoever. But we do know supply chain is having a significant impact on cost of living pressures. And how do we start to make practical inroads into supply chain issues? We boost the workforce. And we need to do that today. We need to do that as soon as possible. And as I said, there is a workforce willing and able, ready to go, ready to do an extra shift, to do an extra day, to help 
the small businesses that so many of them—41 per cent of Australians—so many Australians are employed in, and they are available to go today. And so I commend Senator Dean Smith's bill, and we will continue to support it and make sure that these sorts of solutions, practical solutions, solutions that can be impacted quickly, enacted quickly to make a real difference, to help everyday Australian families, whether it's putting more money in their pockets or whether it's helping to, helping to ease the workplace shortages, to make sure that we are supporting everyday Australians. Now, what I find extraordinary as someone who sat on the Community Affairs Committee in the last term of parliament was the volume of inquiries that we conducted. And because we understand the importance of looking at all legislative options, we understood the importance of making sure inquiries were held that would look at what, situ what solutions may be on the table. And whilst I would suggest more good ideas come from this side of the chamber, particularly when it's going to help small businesses, particularly when it's going to help working families, we did many, many inquiries. The fact that those opposite in these first 100 days of parliament have gone out of their way to block an inquiry, to block looking at this as a solution. Now, this is a government who held themselves up as the soon-to-be bastions of transparency. They wanted to make sure that there was a new politics. There was an open exchange of ideas that there was transparency in what they were going to put forward in a legislative agenda that is going to have a direct impact, not only on disability support pensioners, not only on age pensioners, but on all of those small businesses that employ 41 per cent of Australians, the larger businesses that employ many, many more Australians that are able to then contribute more without having their pension impacted. So what do those opposite do? They block an inquiry. They absolutely said, no, 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 we don't want to look at this. Now, is it because the unions told them not to? Is it because they can't look at any idea that's not their own? Is it because they don't care about cost of living pressures? Because we're yet to hear a word come out of so many opposites' uh, mouths what they plan to do. They plan for a plan, secret plan to fight inflation that's uh, allegedly uh, rumbling around. But there is no plan to ease cost of living pressures. We know that those opposite who spruced, I think it was around 94 times in the, in the lead up to the, during the campaign, in the lead up to the election, that $275 was going to come off every Australian's power bill. Well, try and get them to say $275 now. Not one of those opposite will mention the figure, because as, every, as Australians are seeing, Day after day, quarter after quarter, their power bills are continuing to rise. So those opposite who promised Australians would be better off, how are they going to be better off? They're certainly not going to be $275 better off on their power bills. They're certainly not going to be better off when you object to moving towards allowing pensioners to increase their activity, increase their work, increase the hours the contribution, the productivity that they can make to our economy, but when you refuse to look at that, you refuse to inquire into it, you refuse to look at any ideas that aren't your own, you are standing in the way of improving the life of everyday Australians, you are standing in the way of easing cost of living pressures. All those opposite are interested in is making sure that John Setka gets his payback for the ABCC that we're going to make sure that we're going to increase costs on building sites, we're going to increase costs to everyday Australians who are trying to build their, their, their own homes. That's going to become more difficult because all of a sudden the Building Commission won't be there anymore. We're going to see union thuggery return. Well, not that it ever left, but we actually had the ABCC that could look into union thuggery. But we're going to, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to see workplaces in uh, building sites become particularly unsafe, especially for women, because we know how many cases have been brought to the ABCC. And every single one of these cases meant additional costs to people building a home, to businesses developing property. All of that, those cost of living pressures are just going to increase at a time when we do have housing issues, where we do need to be working towards getting 
more stock into the market, but that's not going to happen because the union mates have to be appeased. And so we are committed on this side to ensure that pensioners, disability support pensioners, are able to participate more fully, that they're able to boost their income, that they are able to continue to contribute to Australia's productivity, that small businesses are able to staff their business, so that restaurants are able to, to do a service, both lunch and dinner, because they can actually get the staff to work. These are the real impacts that are, are being felt. Retail businesses not able to get someone to work. Aged care homes that could be desperately keeping nurses and other aged care workers in the workforce, unable to bring them back just for one extra shift a week because at the moment the damage to them, what they would receive in a reduction to their pension is going to have such, a contra uh, such an impact on their income that they are unable to do it. This is a simple solution. It is a fantastic bill that Senator, has been put Senator forward Hughes. by Senator Smith. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government business notice of motion standing in the name of Senators Wong, Birmingham and Payman relating to Afghanistan. I call Senator Wong. Thank you, Deputy President, and I move the motion. And at the outset, can I start by acknowledging the support and the co-sponsorship of the opposition, the leader of the op Senate leader of the opposition, uh, and also acknowledging uh, the co-sponsorship of Senator Payman, who will speak, who obviously has a very deep personal interest in this. Uh, colleagues, a year ago in Afghanistan, 12-year-old girls went to school. Some aspired to be engineers, doctors or lawyers. Now those same girls are barred from attending secondary school, whatever their dreams. A year ago, many women in Afghanistan went to work. They ran their own businesses. They provided for themselves and for their families. Today, they are effectively excluded from the workplace, directed not to leave their home without a male chaperone. A year ago, Afghanistan had diverse media. Today, journalists face arrest, intimidation and harassment, restricted in what they can report, if at all, on conditions and developments in their own country. An estimated 40 per cent of media outlets have been closed and others are self-censoring. Deputy President, the Afghanistan of, de Afghanistan of today is a diminished country from that which we saw before Kabul fell, fell to the Taliban on 15 August 2021. It is a country facing an economic crisis, growing humanitarian demands and ongoing problems with security and governance. Following the one-year anniversary of that day, it's timely for this place to reflect upon the journey we have taken as a country with the people of Afghanistan and with the international community. And I start by acknowledging that the 15th of August is a particularly difficult day for many in Australia for different reasons. Our 20-year legacy of engagement saw more than 39,000 Australian Defence Force members and civilians serve in Afghanistan. As part of an international effort, they worked and fought alongside coalition and Afghan partners to deny Afghanistan as a safe haven for international terrorism and helped Afghans rebuild their, their country. On behalf of their nation, they did an incredibly important job in the most difficult of circumstances. They should be proud of their service as we are, and we thank them for it. Tragically, 41 Australian service people died in Afghanistan. Many more returned home with lasting physical and mental injuries, and we have lost more defence personnel since they returned. For those veterans and family members who, have may, who may have been concerned with or affected by the anniversary of the fall of Kabul, we encourage you to reach out to Open Arms, which provides support for current and ex-serving ADF personnel and their families. This is a good time to check upon your mates. The one-year anniversary is a sad time for the Afghan community here in Australia and around the world. Many left their homeland in the most trying of circumstances. Some had to make the difficult and life-changing decision to navigate a difficult journey to the Kabul International Airport with family and loved ones. They then had to negotiate their way through the intimidation of Taliban checkpoints, congregate for hours, if not days, in the heat of the Kabul summer, with tens of thousands of people also desperate to enter the gates of the airport to secure a safe passage out of the country. 
And for those who were able to depart, there remain deep concerns about the safety of family and friends still in Afghanistan. And today, the Taliban remain in effective control of Afghanistan, and it has reverted to misogynistic and oppressive practices that characterised its rule during the 1990s. The Taliban have worked systematically to take away the rights of women and girls. The Ministry of Women's Affairs, part of the previous Afghan administrations, was abolished, replaced by the Ministry for the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice, which issues decrees forcing all Afghan women to cover from head to toe and mandating that women leave home only when necessary and always with a male guardian. Male guardians are being punished for non-compliance with their directives. Likewise, since August last year, the Taliban have threatened and intimidated journalists and media workers and subjected around 120 to arbitrary arrest and detention. And shocking videos have emerged of Taliban thugs whipping and beating defenceless journalists. This is a deliberate effort to silence dissent. The United Nations has recorded that in the 10 months since the fall of Kabul, the Taliban have committed 160 acts of extrajudicial killings, 178 arbitrary arrests and detentions, and 56 acts of torture against former Afghan national defence and security forces and government officials. While the Taliban doubled down on repression and inclusion, they have been negligent in providing the most basic services to the people of Afghanistan amidst a severe and deepening humanitarian crisis. Violence, recurrent natural disasters, poverty, drought and the COVID-19 pandemic have left the Afghan people vulnerable. The United Nations estimates that 24.4 million people, 59 per cent of the population, are now in need of humanitarian assistance, an increase, in, an increase of 6 million since the beginning of 2021. The World Food Programme estimates that almost 19 million people will face acute food security in the coming months through to November 22, a situation made worse by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Australia will continue to speak, for, for the, speak up for the human rights of Afghans. No country has formally normalised relationships with the Taliban, and the international community has been very clear about our expectations, including the need to respect human rights, particularly for women and girls and minorities, to observe humanitarian principles and to deter any transnational terrorism resurgence from Afghanistan. So I join, as I'm sure all do in this chamber, the voices across the international community in calling on the Taliban to stand by its undertakings and to stand, set a firm date for the opening of secondary schools to all children. And I call on them, on the Taliban, to respect the rights of all Afghans, including women and girls and minority groups, and to remove restrictions on women's movement and their right to access employment. It is not in our national interest for Afghanistan to again become a training ground for terrorists or for organised crime there to go unchecked. And history has shown us the flow-on impacts of an unstable and ungoverned Afghanistan. It has consequences for the world, it has consequences for our region, it has consequences for Australia. Al-Qaeda leader al-Zawahiri was killed in a US airstrike in Kabul on 30th of July. He was indicted by the United States for the part he played in the 1998 bombings of the US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania and coordinated the September 11 hijackings that destroyed the World Trade Center in 2001. So many lives have been lost and so much blood has been spilled since, including all those Australians who served, sacrificed and gave their lives in Afghanistan. Let the terrorists see that Afghanistan will never be a safe haven for their hatred and attacks on our collective humanity. Afghanistan remains the world's major producer of illicit opium, accounting for 86 per cent of production in 2021, and Afghans remain vulnerable to human trafficking and modern slavery. And we are working with the international community to, res to respond to the unfolding humanitarian crisis, now one of the worst in the world. Over the past year, we have committed $141 million, mostly through UN agencies, to ensure that aid is delivered to those most in need. And th with our humanitarian partners, Australian support is saving lives. We are providing emergency food supplies. We are enabling responses to natural disasters like the June earthquake in the southeast of the country. 
We are supporting women's access to sexual and reproductive health care. We are delivering education to primary school boys and girls. And we are providing shelter to the most vulnerable, recognising that displacement re affects recovery and stability. We have also supported those neighbouring countries hosting the many Afghans who have fled the country. The fall of Kabul led to one of Australia's largest humanitarian ev evacuations. And over a nine-day period, officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, supported by colleagues from Home Affairs, Australia Border Force and, of course, the ADF, led the whole of government effort to facilitate the safe movement of around 4,100 people out of Kabul on 32 flights. I thank the, all those who are part of this urgent and dangerous mission. In addition to those on the ground in Kabul, Officials in Dubai, Doha, Tehran and Islamabad also supported the evacuation operation. And I, we want to recognise the ro role of host governments in supporting this important phase of the operation. People will know when in opposition we were highly critical. We were critical of the approach of the Morrison government, which failed to act on warnings about the deteriorating situation in Afghanistan, applied rules, appeared to apply rules inconsistently and did not move fast enough to evacuate locally engaged employees who had helped Australia. The Albanese government is commissioning an independent review of how decisions were made, including the application and appeals process, record keeping and departmental resourcing. In the meantime, we will continue to do what we can to enable safe departure from Afghanistan. Following the conclusion of the evacuation phase from Kabul airport, almost 3,000 people have departed Afghanistan for Australia including on 22 flights out of Islamabad and six Qatari-facilitated flights via Doha. A total number of 31,500 places has been earmarked for Afghan nationals over the next four years, which comprises 26,500 places under our humanitarian program and 5,000 under the family stream of the migration program. Our focus is on doing what, everything we can to assist people fleeing persecution and seeking help. But we should be clear. This is a very difficult set of circumstances, not least because border crossings out of Afghanistan are difficult and they are dangerous. At the same time, the demand for protection is growing, particularly as conditions under the Taliban deteriorate. This government is steadfast in our commitment to supporting the Afghan community at this distressing time. The Afghan diaspora brings its own special contribution to multicultural Australia, including my recently elected colleague who will speak in this debate, Senator Payman. For this community and for many others here around the world, this anniversary will bring much pain and great sadness. But let us remind ourselves that history did not stop on that day. Difficult as the forward path is, it continues, and Australia remains part of this journey. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President, I rise to uh, also speak in support of the motion noting the first anniversary of the fall of Kabul, a motion which I am pleased to co-sponsor uh, with the Leader of the Government in the Senate and with Senator Payman, for who uh, this motion brings extremely personal reflections. And I thank the Government for the opportunity to co-sponsor this motion. It is, Deputy President, with a degree of great sadness and disappointment for so many people that through this motion we acknowledge that on the 15th of August this year, it was one year since the fall of Kabul to the Taliban. We acknowledge all of the consequences the last year has brought to the people of Afghanistan, the Afghan diaspora here in Australia and around the world. Many still fear, quite understandably, for loved ones in Afghanistan. As we speak to this motion, we also note that we are just four days away from the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks that so shook the world at that time and which sparked the military engagement to come in Afghanistan. The return of the Taliban to power in Afghanistan was a major blow to all those who fought for peace, for freedom and for human rights in Afghanistan over those long 20 years. And that disappointment no doubt is felt most acutely by the many Afghan people, alongside those who sacrificed so much in the pursuit of peace and stability. Today, Deputy President, we honour 
the 41 Australian soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice during their service in Afghanistan. We honour those from other nations serving alongside them and those within Afghanistan, Afghanis who equally made that sacrifice. We honour the many more Australians who were wounded and those who continue to experience the trauma of what they faced and endured, including those whose lives have been lost since returning home. This anniversary, I am sure, was felt intensely by the more than 39,000 Australian Defence Force personnel and civilians who served in Afghanistan, felt intensely by their family, friends and loved ones, felt intensely by those from all nations who served during those conflicts. We honour them, we acknowledge their pain and we thank them for their service. The images we all saw on 15 August last year and in the days surrounding that of people crushing to get to flights to evacuate out of Kabul, of the desperation to flee, were a haunting reminder of the fall of Kabul. Australia, through the work of the Australian Defence Force and other agencies, facilitated the departure of 4,100 people out of Kabul on dozens of flights. And I acknowledge and thank all of those involved in those operations. 80,000 people were evacuated in those few days thanks to the combined efforts of nations around the world. There are many stories of those who managed to escape, of those who made connections with people in this place, with people throughout our systems of government and with those in other nations that helped them to be able to escape. And there was a day and night effort put in by Australian officials and by those of like-minded countries to help as many as possible. Sadly, of course, there are many more who were not able to undertake that journey or to have that opportunity. As this motion notes, Australia remains committed to the resettlement of Afghans in Australia, especially those who assisted Australian operations in Afghanistan, as we should. On behalf of the coalition, I reaffirm our strong bipartisan support for this important and ongoing resettlement effort. Most importantly, despite the withdrawal from Afghanistan, we, like those friends and allies around the world who value democracy, freedom and human rights, especially the rights of women and girls, remain committed to working in a bipartisan way with the government here in Australia and with the international community to respond to the humanitarian needs of the people of Afghanistan. This continuing effort is critical. As this motion notes, the Taliban has stripped freedoms from the citizens of Afghanistan. It has clawed back the educational opportunities for young girls and women. The Taliban has stripped away 20 years of progress as it engages in violence and repression. The United Nations, in its report, Human Rights in Afghanistan, released in July this year, noted that in the first 10 months after the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban, that the, and I quote, erosion of women's rights has been one of the most notable aspects of the de facto administration. And the United Nations Acting Secretary General, Special Representative for Afghanistan, Marcus Potzel said, and I quote, the relegation of women and girls to home denies Afghanistan the benefit of the significant contributions they have to offer. During the period of time in which peace, stability, freedoms and democracy were sought to be achieved in Afghanistan, the advances made, the opportunities created for young women, girls across Afghanistan were perhaps the proudest achievements of many. And to see those advances now so eroded, those hopes and opportunities of those women and girls so crushed is unquestionably one of the most depressing aspects of all we have seen in the last 12 months. Despite all the promises made by the Taliban in August last year, we have seen the end of so many gains that came to be held dearly by the Afghan people, including also the right to the freedom of peaceful assembly, freedom of expression, 
and freedom of opinion. Dissent has been curtailed through crackdowns on protest and by the curbing of media freedoms. These are freedoms we here in Australia are fortunate enough to take for granted. The events we have seen though unfold in Afghanistan since 15 August 2021 are a reminder that such freedoms can never be taken for granted by those who enjoy them. Extrajudicial killings, arbitrary arrest and detention, torture and ill treatment, along with human rights abuses, have, as the UN has noted, sadly become the norm in Afghanistan over the past year. The Amnesty International report Death in Slow Motion, released in July this year, reported that 95 per cent of the Afghan population does not have enough food to eat. It is appropriate, therefore, that Australia implement the United Nations Security Council Taliban sanctions regime into Australian law, apply those sanctions in efforts to promote peace, stability and security of Afghanistan. It is appropriate that Australia rightly be a significant contributor to the humanitarian aid effort in Afghanistan. In April this year, the then Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, announced an additional $40 million in aid in 2022. This was in addition to $100 million announced in September 2021. This was announced just after the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban. It was following and alongside the implementation of those UN sanctions. This aid is crucial and ongoing support to ensure that we deliver aid and assistance to where it is needed, that we deliver the humanitarian support and assistance across the wide range, the almost insurmountable range of needs faced by the Afghan people. Through this motion today, we also recognise the important role of the Afghan diaspora in Australia. We are all in this place well aware, I'm sure, that connections between Australia and Afghanistan go back a long, long way. The 1860s, when the first Afghan Kamaliers arrived in Australia, playing their role in the development of our remote inland. Today, more than 40,000 people born in Afghanistan, most of whom have arrived since the war and their homeland began, are part of a community which makes a significant contribution to Australia. That community is growing, with more than 31,500 visa places being made available over four years for Afghan nationals through our humanitarian program and family stream. That was a decision announced by the coalition government in the last budget, and it's one which I note and encourage the current government to maintain their efforts to ensure full delivery of those places. President, Deputy President, this motion is a tangible demonstration that we should never give up in standing up for the rights of Afghans, that we should never forget the battles they face, the challenges they face, that we should not grow apathetic or tired of focusing on those needs and pressures. We must continue to work to uphold the rights of all Afghans, especially women and girls and minority groups who have suffered so much over the past year with little hope in sight for the future. We must call on the Taliban to honour the commitments they made, to be true to the words they gave in relation to the rights of Afghan and particularly Afghan women and girls. We must be strong in our own position and urge all other nations of the world to apply the same pressure to the Taliban to reverse the type of erosion of rights they have undertaken. We must not allow Afghanistan to become a safe haven for terrorists once more and their support networks. We have seen all too starkly what can happen when the Taliban believes it can act with impunity. In speaking to this motion, I want to reiterate the words of the Leader of the Opposition who said on the anniversary date that, and I quote, the tragedy of August 2021 does not detract from the 20 years of service and sacrifice which denied al-Qaeda a safe haven, inhibited the terrorist organisation's ability to plan operations and prevented attacks being conducted on Australian soil or elsewhere around the world. It is important to reiterate that point because for those who may feel that it was wasted effort that was undertaken through 
those years in Afghanistan. It is important to remember the achievements that did occur and that were made and what we continue to fight for. Deputy President, with this motion today, we stand with Afghanistan. We stand with the people of Afghanistan. We must and will remain steadfast in our determination to see the people of Afghanistan achieve their hopes for a peaceful, free future of opportunity and equality. I thank the Senate. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to support the motion and to reflect on the one-year anniversary of the fall of Kabul to the Taliban. Just over a year ago, we were seeing heartbreaking images of desperate Afghani people trying to flee the Taliban regime. There are horrible, heart-wrenching accounts of that terrifying ordeal, uh, including by uh, many Afghan refugees who have now settled in Australia. I won't share the full graphic account, but I do want to quote um, from one Afghan refugee, Noor M. Ramazan, who says, after 20 years, Everything in Afghanistan was back to where it began. After years of waiting, hoping and dreaming about our country, we were leaving our belongings, family and friends. Everyone remembered the first time the Taliban came. The ones who were young and didn't remember heard from the elders. We all knew who the Taliban were. That's why everyone wanted to be the first to leave. All our belongings were on our back and we were running for life. Celebrities were running, politicians were running, we were running and everyone was running. Elderly people were out of breath, children were trampled and some died, but still everyone was running to go. Some of those people who sought safety in the chaos around the airport made it to Australia, but many remain in Afghanistan in dire circumstances. And I want to acknowledge the effort of all MPs' offices, including my Greens colleagues and my own office manager at the time, for going above and beyond to expedite the safe passage of so many Afghanis to Australia. I'm sure that many of us um, and our officers did that, and I acknowledge the former government's efforts to collectively uh, coordinate that, um, that effort and to evacuate over 4,000 Afghanis. But there are still people stuck there who are not safe. This is far from over. Women and girls once again face oppression, and minorities like the Hazara people live in fear. Many have been killed in the last year by bombings, some of which amount to war crimes. A few weeks ago, a group of UN special rapporteurs and other experts issued a statement warning that the human rights situation would continue to deteriorate. They said, and I quote, since August 2021, we've seen a plethora of human rights violations committed by the Taliban, with their virtual erasure and systematic oppression of women and girls from society being particularly egregious. Nowhere else in the world has there been as widespread, systematic and all-encompassing an attack on the rights of women and girls. Every aspect of their lives is being restricted under the guise of morality and through the instrumentalisation of religion. Discrimination and violence cannot be justified on any ground. Uh, the special rapporteurs continue. Regrettably, there is little or no sign that the human rights situation is turning a corner. Indeed, the daily reports of violence, including extrajudicial killings, disappearances, arbitrary detention, torture, heightened risks of exploitation faced by women and girls, including for the purposes of child and forced marriage, and a breakdown in the rule of law, gives us no confidence that the Taliban has any intention of making good on its pledge to respect human rights." End quote. Australia cannot and must not forget these people. We have a moral obligation, and that starts with telling the truth to ourselves, to people in Afghanistan, about why it was that Australian troops were deployed. Prime Minister Howard at the time, without recourse to parliament, put us into that war, took us directly into that conflict. Part of our truth-telling about why we sent troops to Afghanistan must also be a reckoning about our treatment of whistleblowers. Julian Assange has faced incredible injustice and torture in response to his simple act of sharing the truth of what was happening in Afghanistan and why troops were deployed there. The fundamental injustice and lack of transparency around the deployment of Australian troops to Afghanistan has tainted our treatment of whistleblowers. This is why the Greens have called for decisions to commit Australian troops to war to be made by parliament, openly and with debate. Given the wide-ranging and long-lasting impacts of war, these decisions demand parliamentary scrutiny. 
international cooperation and development, and respect for human rights. As well as telling the truth about why Australian troops were deployed, we must also be honest about what has occurred while they were deployed. We owe that honesty to Afghan civilians and to ourselves as a nation. That includes acknowledging and mourning the 41 Australian soldiers who lost their lives, as well as the horrifyingly high number of civilians killed in Afghanistan by Western forces and their allies. Thousands of Afghan civilians were killed by coalition forces, including by airstrikes. There have been serious, credible allegations that crimes were committed by Australian forces. Those perpetrators must be brought to justice and the evidence must be made public. We must also be honest about the evacuation of Kabul and the fall of the Afghan government. Some people were able to make it to the airport and through the throng of people, many more died either in the chaos and violence around the airport or subsequently. We know that there were locally engaged employees who worked with Australian forces who have not been able to leave Afghanistan or find a place of safety. A few weeks ago, The Guardian published accounts from some of those left behind, and I quote, I worked for DFAT in Afghanistan for five years. At the request of my DFAT colleagues, I submitted an application for DFAT certification. But since August 2021, DFAT has been saying my application for ministerial approval is still under consideration. It's taken more than a year, and I wonder what makes my case different from others. The Taliban have executed two colleagues I worked with at USAID. I feel I will be next. I remember family members warning me to stay away from international organisations when I worked for the Australian government, lest I be left behind and betrayed. Now I am reminded of what I was told. I gather I should have worked for someone else as the Australians have closed their door on my face." End quote. The simple reality is that decisions made by ministers of the Australian government cost lives, both of Australian soldiers and Afghan civilians, and has had a devastating impact on the lives of those who remain. We also need to be conscious of the impact of this war on veterans. The Brereton Report, the evidence to the Royal Commission into Veteran Suicide have all revealed the high toll of war. We need to make amends to both personnel and civilians that have experienced harm through reparations and psychological and wellbeing supports for serving personnel and veterans. Violent wars are failing everyone. We've seen it in Vietnam and now Afghanistan. We must find peaceful, non-violent solutions to increasing international tensions. Australia played a significant role in a 20-year war that failed to create a lasting peace and for which we face allegations of war crimes. The war was not the solution to the problems that Afghanistan faced in 2001. We did not succeed in building robust institutions or working with the Afghani people to bring about lasting change. Australia's actions contributed to the growing threat to many Afghan people from the Taliban and we have a moral obligation to provide sanctuary for some of the people who will suffer as a result. The fall of Kabul a year ago was an appalling culmination of two decades of failure by the invading forces. Now we must continue to do whatever we can to support the Afghani people, to remove from harm those who need it, and to make sure that the rights of citizens are upheld. A year ago, the Greens called for the Australian government to provide immediate assistance to Afghan people, both on the ground in Afghanistan and by providing protection here in Australia. We called for Australia to offer uh, permanent protection visas to up to 20,000 people from Afghanistan who were at risk of persecution from the Taliban. We called for those places to be in addition to our regular humanitarian intake and to include prot protection for people like female leaders, human rights advocates, LGBTIQ plus people, alumni of Australian universities, journalists, Afghan government workers and people from ethnic and religious minorities previously persecuted by the Taliban. We welcome the genuinely additional 16,500 places that have been announced, but it still falls short of the 20,000 that we called for, and we still think there is room for the government to do more. Those additional places should be rolled out as needed rather than arbitrarily spread over four years. Afghan citizens on temporary visas in Australia must also be offered protection in Australia with permanent visas. Given the confusion and chaos that faced many leaving Afghanistan, we believe that all 449s issued to Afghan nationals should be honoured and reissued if necessary. 
The government should immediately offer temporary bridging visas to any Afghan people who worked to support Australian Defence Forces or consular officers so that they can come to safety in Australia while their claims for asylum are assessed. And Australia must also commit significant additional aid funding to Afghanistan as a matter of urgency, in the order of at least $100 million per year, dispersed to aid organisations working on the ground who have strong connections with local communities and civil society. Australia must act as a good global citizen and do what we can to support people on the ground, especially women and girls, who face a huge curtailing of their rights living through this dire situation. Australia must do its utmost to pick up the pieces and support the people of Afghanistan and the diaspora in Australia. Senator Payman. Thank you, Deputy President. I note this is not my first speech. I rise as an Australian Afghan to express my support for the motion commemorating the one-year anniversary of a sad day, 15th of August, the day when Kabul fell to the Taliban yet again. A nation that has been torn by war, destructed over decades of conflict and left in a state of destitute. A land prominently rich in natural resources such as lithium, iron, zinc and copper, yet the economy remains depleted. The country was a busy section of the famous Silk Road, a route that merchants have travelled over 2,000 years from China, India and Europe. This is the reason Afghanistan earned the title Crossroads of Cultures. With a population of 35 million people, 34 provinces and a range of diverse languages spoken from Dari and Pashto to Uzbeki, Hazaragi, Baluchi, Pashai and Noristani, just to name a few. During the last year, we've seen the deterioration of human rights and the growing humanitarian crisis leaving thousands in poverty and resulting in ongoing problems with security and governance. We have seen schools shut down for girls. According to the recent UN report, and I quote, women and girls in particular have been subjected to severe restrictions on their human rights, resulting in their exclusion from aspects of everyday and public life, end quote. Unemployment has increased dramatically, forcing hundreds of thousands to flee to neighboring countries but millions of Afghans still remain stranded with no hope in sight of a future for themselves or their families. We are still hearing reports of the Taliban persecuting and torturing members of the previous government, while thousands of people from different ethnic groups whose opinions were against the Taliban have been killed and labelled as ISIS. We cannot let Afghanistan become a breeding ground for terrorism and extremism. We find ourselves here today marking one year on from the fall of Kabul, and I want to extend my deepest condolences and prayers to the people of Afghanistan and the diaspora communities across Australia who are suffering and in pain and feeling the trauma. I too have family back in Afghanistan and receive daily news of the atrocities and injustices that take place, while their lives remain in danger and their children remain stranded at home with no access to education or any prospect of a sustainable future. It is heartbreaking, and my sincerest thoughts go out to everyone with family and friends in Afghanistan going through this ongoing devastation and to the veterans and their loved ones scarred by the, the pain and trauma, I wish upon you healing and closure. I have come to understand that in plight of challenges, unity is so important. There is no such thing as a minority group in Afghanistan bearing the brunt of the atrocities and destructions alone. Whether you identify as Tajik, Uzbek, Pashtun or Hazara, you are experiencing the same pain and heartache as the millions of people in Afghanistan and abroad. I'm aware of the unspoken division that exists 
among the ethnicities within the Af Afghan diaspora here in Australia. At times like this, your unity is needed more than ever. Bond over your identities as Australians first, then as Muslims, and then as Afghans. There is no need to ostracize, criticize, or have animosity towards one another because of what history had determined. History teaches us many lessons and the people to pay tribute to. So I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the brave contribution and sacrifices made by more than 39,000 Australian Defence Force and civilian personnel who supported operations in Afghanistan for over 20 years. Australia contributed in capacity building, in counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency and national security. We remember the 41 Australian soldiers who died during operations and will never forget their ultimate sacrifice. The fall of Kabul led to one of Australia's largest humanitarian evacuations and over a nine day period, around 4,100 people were evacuated on 32 flights. The work to ensure safe departures from Afghanistan continues. The Albanese government is committed to standing by those who helped Australia including by supporting former locally engaged employees to apply for visas and resettle in Australia. The government is considering its response to recommendations from the Senate inquiry into Australia's engagement in, in Afghanistan. Australia is working with international, commu international community to respond to the humanitarian crisis and has committed $141 million to ensure that help reaches those most in need. Whether it be emergency medical supplies, food supplies, or simply a safe place to get some rest. Australia will also offer 31,500 places to Afghan nationals under the humanitarian program and the family stream of the migration program over the next four years. We understand the urgency and nature of this crisis and we in Australia are doing our best. I now want to talk about something that has made devastating crisis in Afghanistan even more heartbreaking for those impacted and for those like me who are from Afghanistan and now calling Australia home. We know that the former Liberal National Government were responsible for the countless scandals and cuts to our public institution. And one of the most disgraceful examples of this is the broken system of visa and citizenship processing. They destroyed that system bit by bit, firing thousands of staff over their decade in power, and it has caused human misery and economic pain. The economic pain is obvious now, with small businesses, the health system and the education sector crying out for visas to be processed. While the delays mean other countries who haven't destroyed their own visa systems race ahead. All of this is obvious, and we saw some progress made at the Jobs and Skills Summit last weekend, which is amazing. But I want to focus on the human element, often forgotten, but just as important. Every day, my office hears from those with loved ones trying to flee the Taliban or from those who have been hunted down. I cannot describe the insurmountable pain and misery we hear about day after day. And while we should not lay the blame at the feet of the former government, it is true that countless visas for those trying to flee the Taliban did not get processed in time because the system had been so thoroughly destroyed. It is now our responsibility to fix this, and it will take time to fix this 10 years of destruction. But we will, and I will, keep speaking up. I'm heartened by the work already begun, and that the minister has confirmed processing the visa backlog is an urgent priority. There is also important work to be done in our platform like giving genuine refugees permanent protection in this country and moving them off the cruel temporary protection visa scheme. The Labor government will fix things 
It will take time, but it will happen. It is easy to break things, and the former government took pride in destroying the system and to have caused immeasurable pain for countless families. Just like with a house destroyed by a natural disaster, it can happen instantly, but the rebuilding can take months. This is what we are facing right now, trying to repair the visa system. Like I said, it will take time to clear the backlog, but we have started the work and are committed to seeing this through. Thank you. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this motion in support of this motion. So often in this chamber, um, we talk about statistics, we talk about numbers, but we don't always talk about people. And what I'd like to uh, talk about today in support of this motion is the last 20 years uh, of my life, which actually, while I didn't serve in Afghanistan, um, what happened in Afghanistan in 2001 and subsequently through to this year has certainly been a reoccurring theme in my life. And I'd like to share that with the chamber today because I believe it reflects um, the, the service, but also the support of so many Australians. And unlike what we've just heard in the chamber from previous speakers, I believe how Australia has responded to the World uh, Trade Tower, the Pentagon, and uh, the, all the aircraft and, that were downed uh, during those attacks uh, right through to today, I think really shows the best of Australians. And our response over that 20 years shows us that Australia is a strong nation. We are a compassionate nation and we are good people and we are generous and we are welcoming. So my journey uh, with Afghanistan started uh, with the bombing of the World Trade Towers. I was Chief of Staff to the Minister of Justice and Customs at the time. And if you will recall, the Prime Minister was actually in Washington on the, on the day. And like everybody in this chamber who uh, is uh, old enough to remember uh, that footage and those events, we watched with horror and incredulity at the images of those passenger aircraft uh, deliberately being uh, flown into, into towers, into the Pentagon and into the ground. And the first question uh, for all of us as we gathered here uh, in the building to assess what it all meant was, where is our Prime Minister? Uh, is he alive uh, and is he safe? And once we uh, ascertained that, uh, it was all about, we quickly pivoted to being all about the response. What do we need to do for Australia and what do we need to do uh, with our like-minded partners globally? And just to remind people the impact, nearly 3,000 people from many, many nations were killed on that day, and that included 10 Australians. And very quickly, on the 14th of September, Australia uh, invoked Article 4 of the ANZUS Treaty. And for the following 20 years, we conducted two operations in Afghanistan continuously. The first, from uh, November 20, 2001 uh, to December 2014, was Operation Slipper. And that was followed by Operation High Road from January 2015 to mid-2021, when the last of our ADF personnel withdrew from Afghanistan. And in total, over those nearly 20 years, 39,000 of our service men and women, full-time, part-time, Army, Air Force and Navy, served in Afghanistan, and also in support of those who were uh, actually in country in Afghanistan. And at its peak of our military deployment, we had 1,500 personnel based uh, there at any one time. But tragically, we also lost 41. Australian service personnel, personnel who, who came home in coffins to grieving families. And as a nation, we will always commemorate their service and thank their families and support their families who still grieve to this day. But tens of thousands of Afghan citizens also lost their lives over those 20 years. 260 Australians returned home seriously wounded, 
and many thousands more returned home with injuries that weren't as visible, um, with mental health issues uh, that still are with many of them today. So when you listen to, uh, as Senator Wong, I think very eloquently, and also Senator Birmingham, very eloquently summed up the impact over the last 12 months of the return of the Taliban. I think it's worth reflecting on, on a few things and asking us the question, was it really all worth it? And I would say absolutely yes, it was worth it. For those who have not heard the saying, the Taliban have a strategy which is, a, a which is encapsulated in the saying that you have the watches and we have the time, which uh, reflects their strategy of waiting out foreign forces in their nation. And that is clearly what we saw 12 months ago again. So was it worth it? And I know that that is something that many service personnel who have returned and their family members of those who have returned, but those who have returned home uh, with lifelong wounds. And as I said, I would like to say that I believe that it has been. When you have a look at what was achieved under uh, when the coalition forces were there, the proportion of girls attending secondary school rose from 6 per cent to well over 40 per cent. The proportion of boys attending secondary school rose from 18 per cent to over 70 per cent. Female literacy, literacy in uh, 15 to 24-year-olds was 56 per cent, which was up from 11 per cent in 2001. And male literacy in the same age group uh, rose from 46 per cent to 74 per cent. And previously being banned uh, from higher education under the Taliban 20 years ago, by, the t by 2001, over 30 per cent of university students were women. So coming through to the circumstances um, subsequent, I had the great privilege, as I said, while I didn't serve myself in Afghanistan, um, it was a recurring theme in my, my career and my life. Um, I was, had the privilege as the Minister for Defence to visit Operation High Road in July 2019 and to meet the many men and women who were still serving there and clearly serving there in conditions where there were still threats. There were still attacks uh, on our accommodations and it was still very dangerous flying in and flying out of Kabul. But yet they were there, um, they were in high spirits and they could see the difference they were making every single day. And they were so proud of what they were doing in the community for community development, the schools they had built, the people they had educated, both service personnel, the carpenters, the builders, uh, the, the girls. They made a lasting and enduring difference. And I hope that all of our service personnel, the 39,000, will remember that on this upcoming anniversary of the great things they did. But again, coming back to uh, one year ago, almost one year ago today, the Taliban, true to their word, we had the clocks and they had the time and they returned. And we've heard here today the devastating impacts and consequences of that. But again, what shows the best of Australians is that we joined with uh, so many other like-minded countries to form an air bridge out of Hamid Karzai Airport. Uh, and we had 32 flights out of Hamid Karzai in the most challenging and difficult uh, of circumstances. And we evacuated over 4,000 Afghan nationals uh, during that time. Part of 80,000 uh, that were airlifted in total uh, by other like-minded during that period. And uh, like many people in this chamber and many people uh, we know throughout this building and in the other place, many of us were working furiously to try and get out a whole range of people who needed to be evacuated. And I'd just like to share the story with the chamber of 16 of uh, those 4,000 people who were evacuated in the most traumatic and difficult of circumstances out of uh, Hamid Karzai Airport. 
On 15 August, I sent a message to my friend Shukira Barakazai. And Shukriya was, had been an MP in the Afghan parliament, uh, and she had been an underground teacher under the Taliban, and she was also the survivor of a Taliban uh, suicide attack, which again she, she emerged alive, but terribly scarred mentally and physically through that experience. So I contacted her knowing that she was still in Kabul and asked her what I could do. Did she need any help to get out? because clearly her life was at great in great danger. And she said to me, no, I will be fine, but there are others that you need to help. And one of them, she said, was a young outspoken journalist whose name is Khalid Amiri, who she said was in immense trouble and was facing death threats from the Taliban. And he needed to be removed from Afghanistan so that some of the young voices, some of those young uh, Afghans who have been educated and who are very supportive of a modern, free and democratic uh, Afghanistan can come out to have, so that they can still have their voices heard. So, on Twitter, I contacted uh, Khalid, uh, never having met him or communicated with him before. And that started an extraordinary chain of events, which again mirrored so many others uh, that Minister Foreign Minister Maurice Payne and her staff were working 24-7 on evacuating. And can I now just acknowledge Minister Payne at the time and also her staff, who did an extraordinary job to coordinate the activities, as did the Minister for Immigration, to get the visas and to get uh, many of these um, people out. So with uh, Khalid and his family, he he was under threat. He was terrified. He has four sisters living at home with him, all who had been, uh, been educated and you know, were professional uh, young women. He also had a married sister and brother who were also uh, had their own children between them, four daughters and a son. And they were all under immediate threat. So I now have a, a, you know, hundreds of WhatsApp messages about how we, we got their visas, how do we get them quickly, and then how do we get them to safety. And it was an extraordinary time. Um, they got the visas, they left their home, they put on uh, women's clothes so they wouldn't be, uh, be identified. We tried to get them through the Taliban checkpoints into the French embassy. That didn't succeed. They then moved to Abbey Gate, and everybody has seen those pictures of thousands and thousands of people trying to get through uh, Abbey Gate and over the fences. And they were very tense, very tense days and hours. But then I got a text message as I was leaving this chamber from Khalid after I hadn't heard from him for hours. And he sent me a photo right on the wall of at the Abbey Gate, and there I could see two Marines sitting there on, on the, the gate with other people around. I asked Khalid to give his phone to the Marine to see whether an Australian voice would help the Marine help him and his family through to the Australian evacuation point. And wonderfully, this Marine, whose name I cannot mention but who has been thanked, he came on the phone and there was this Australian voice who asked him to take my word that these people had Australian visas. And he did. And he took Khalid, his mother and father, and four of his sisters to the Australian collection point. And then the rest of the process, as it unfolded, Khalid and his family getting on uh, the C-17 at Al Minhad Air Base with the Australian soldiers and then through to Howard Springs and now to Melbourne. Wonderfully, his brother and sister uh, and their families are now also reunited with them in Melbourne. They will be extraordinary Australians. And it is their stories of these 16 members of the Amiri family, plus everybody else out who we were able to get out and who we are supporting today. Because they, along with the 80,000, are the future.
They are the future of Afghanistan. It is our great hope that they will be able to return to Afghanistan and that the Taliban will once again fall. But in the meantime, they are here in Australia. The girls are studying. They will be great contributors to the Australian economy, but their nieces in particular will have a very different future. And whether they become Australian citizens and stay here or whether they are able to return to Afghanistan, I think they demonstrate that it was worth it. And I hope in those stories and the stories of every other Afghan who has been ripped from their nation and coming to Australia or elsewhere, that our servicemen and women and the families of those uh, who were killed will find great solace Senator Still in that. Thank you. Thank you. Today marks, uh, and we mark as a Senate, uh, one year since the fall uh, of Kabul and the end of the war in Afghanistan. For the people of Afghanistan, the time uh, between the invasion of their nation and that moment when the last plane took off uh, from the tarmac of Kabul airport uh, marked two decades wherein the tyranny of a regime guilty of horrendous human rights abuses was replaced by the shadow of occupation. And as we as a parliament reflect on the one year anniversary uh, since the end of that war, we must do so actively, seeking to take responsibility, seeking to offer apology, seeking to translate apology into urgent action. Now let's be really clear. Australia, in entering into the war in Afghanistan alongside the United States, committed a terrible, terrible mistake. A mistake of judgment which would lead to the death of tens of thousands and the harm of so many more. Our failure in those moments, in the aftermath of 9-11, to confront our American friends calmly but firmly and demand that the global action taken in response to those events be proportionate and within the boundaries of international law, clear in its purpose. Our failure to do this not only cost the lives of Australian serving personnel, but so many, so many Afghans. We poured away life, we poured away resources, and we took from the Afghan people so much during this war, coming on the back of so many decades of occupation by foreign powers. Now, in doing this, we made ourselves a justification that we were perpetrating, that we were supporting invasion and occupation in order to liberate the people of Afghanistan from tyranny. Yet not once in all of those decades did we reflect upon the fact that our ally in that cause, the United States, was to its very core one of the key reasons for the existence of the tyrannical regime, which then was the Taliban in the 1990s. Never was there a moment to own and reflect the reality that it was American support of the Mujahideen during the Soviet-Afghan war that gave birth to the Taliban. Now, from this space of ignorance and unwillingness to work collectively 
and within the boundaries of international law to react uh, to the events of 9-11, we ended up staying alongside the United States in an occupation which did incredible damage to the Afghan people, which undermined institutions and which left a legacy of destruction and division which they will have to manage for generations to come. Now, we not only did this, we not only perpetrated this damage in our entry and our occupation, we then, after 20 years, exited in one of the most diabolically mishandled, fundamentally inhumane moments in Australian political history, leaving behind countless who had, despite our presence, alongside occupying forces which daily took the lives of Afghans, despite the fact that our special forces, the Red Beards, took the lives, murdered innocent civilians, disabled Afghans, despite all of that, they worked with our forces in, a, in an attempt to build something better, and we left them behind. We failed them, proving in that moment that our so-called dedication to the people of Afghanistan had never been much more than a political spin, proving that it didn't even go skin deep, because when things got tough, we got out and we left them. And what have we left them in? A humanitarian disaster, which we contributed to. I'd like to read to the Senate just a few of the stories of individuals right now in Kabul and throughout Afghanistan living in the ruins that we left behind, trying to rebuild their lives in the chaos. Avansa, an IT officer in Kabul, who sent to me yesterday the following words. Life in Afghanistan is a burden, something that you just bear. Neither do we have human rights nor civil rights. We are deprived of all basic rights. Every day that goes by, life under the Taliban rule breaks my spirit and weakens my consciousness. I feel abandoned. We feel as though we are on our own. Now, in this next passage, I will inform the Senate that I will be making reference to the issues of suicide and of sexual violence, but I feel it is necessary. It comes firsthand uh, from an individual who has experienced these crimes uh, firsthand on the ground. It has been reported uh, that women and girls are being detained and raped in prisons. In the last few days, there have been widespread coverage of a girl who was first detained and then ra raped by a prominent Taliban commander. The victim's name was Aliha and the perpetrator's name, Saeed Kohosti, who forced the girl to marry him. Saeed was constantly beating and torturing her. He has then divorced her, claiming that she has made blasphemous comments and that he has evidence to this effect. There is now a concern that if tried for blasphemy, uh, she may face uh, coercion uh, and ultimately death. It has been well reported that women's employment and educational opportunities, access to health care, have become extraordinarily limited under the return of the Taliban regime. As it has been reported uh, that women are unable to move uh, without the presence of a male companion. Human rights abuses of the most heinous nature are reported daily. 
and it is incumbent upon us as a nation to take our share of responsibility for the realities that these crimes are being perpetrated. perpetrated. Because for 20 years, instead of work as we should have with the people of Afghanistan to rebuild, to address uh, the issues facing their nation, we sat alongside an occupying force for political reasons. And then we left for political reasons. And we have now seen fit as a nation to cast ourselves free of even the thought of the people of Afghanistan. I once again reiterate the Greens' call for emergency humanitarian intakes to ensure that those who served and supported the work that was done are brought to safety and for accountability for those who, during the war, committed such heinous crimes against the people of Afghanistan. And so too responsibility for those officials and members of government who, in the full knowledge of the imminent evacuation of Kabul, failed, failed to get those to safety. Senator Steele John, uh, time for debate on this motion has expired, uh, but you will be in continuance. And I now proceed to two minute statements and I call Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. It is disappointing that MPs from the Greens choose not to fly our Australian flag. The new member for Ryan, Elizabeth Watson Brown, has in her electorate one of our country's largest army barracks, and yet she refuses to fly our flag. Shame. In doing so, she brings shame to this parliament. She brings shame to the memory of all those who have served and died under our flag, shame. and she shames the families who mourn. Shame. I wonder what those who serve at the Inogra Army Barracks think of her childish antics, well, along with all of those in Ryan who love and respect our country. Because when we think about symbols of national pride, symbols of which we can unite behind, symbols of which our countrymen and women have fought under, symbols which galvanise us as a one Australian people, our flag is front and centre. It has been and will always be a shared symbol of national pride and unity, one which we all know and love and respect. We fly our great flag in this chamber to remind us of the people we serve. We fly our flag at schools to remind the next generation of what it means to be Australian. We fly our flags at RSLs out of respect for those who have fought and died to protect the freedoms that we so willingly use today. I fly the flag at home in Warwick because I love this country and shame upon this, on these Greens, on these leftists who hate Australia and who hate the freedoms that we all enjoy so much today. Because this flag it represents the great Australian dream, freedom and democracy. Our flag is sacred, our flag is cherished and is owned and adored by Australians all, and we love it. Shame on the Greens. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Sheldon. Thank you. Uh, the Jobs and Skills Summit was a meeting of our nation's best and brightest. However, Qantas CEO Alan Joyce was also there. Mr Joyce decided it wasn't enough that he was, had he'd ruined our national airline with his extreme anti-union agenda. He wants to weigh in on our national industrial relations system as well. Mr Joyce has attacked the tripartite <coughs> agreement reached on multi-employer bargaining by saying, and I quote, what you don't want is the pendulum swinging too far in either direction on industrial relations. Well, if you want to see how far the pendulum has swung towards employers, just look at Alan Joyce's Qantas, a company which illegally sacked 2,000 <coughs> workers and replaced them with an outsourced workforce so underpaid they, that they can't fill the jobs, and a company which took a $2 billion handout from the Morrison government and then announced $400 million share buyback the very next year. 
a company which threatened their flight attendants that they would rip up their agreement and give them a pay cut of up to 50 per cent. This is what a flight attendant told me about Alan Joyce's conduct. I have found myself breaking <coughs> down to the point I had to seek medical and professional help. And a Qantas baggage handler said, it's like walking on broken glass every day, every week, not knowing when you're going to get cut. And Alan Joyce has the audacity to complain about workers getting too many rights. He should resign. And the fact the opposition is taking Alan Joyce's side on this matter is a simple disgrace. Thanks, Senator Sheldon. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, today I will be tabling a private member's bill that creates a climate trigger in our environment laws. This is essential if we are to ensure that any project being assessed by the Environment Minister indeed looks at the climate damage that any project has. And how can it be that in 2022 we can have environmental approval being granted to a big new coal mine expansion or a gas field or any other big project without any consideration of the climate damage that that project might wreak havoc on including on our environment. We know that the state of Australia's environment is in crisis. We are facing species collapse. And yet, time and time and time again, projects are being given the green light by the nation's environment minister without any consideration of the climate damage that is being done to our environment. In 2005, Mr Anthony Albanese himself introduced laws that did exactly this when he was the portfolio holder for the environment for the Labor Party. Back in 2005, the then Mr Anthony Albanese said that there was a gap in our environment laws and it needed to be closed. Well, there's still a gap in our environment laws and it does need to be closed. We need to get serious about reducing pollution in this country, about halting dangerous global warming and about protecting our environment. A climate trigger is one of the most important things to be done to make sure we put a halt to climate destruction, to environmental collapse and to putting our country on a better path that looks after Senator nature Hanson, and doesn't your destroy time has it. Expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much. Today we celebrate the great work that the 60,000 charities that operate in Australia do for our community. Indeed, we celebrate the almost 4,000 of them in my home state of Western Australia. And when we think about charity, we think about community, we think about volunteerism, we think about philanthropy. So today I'm delighted to acknowledge that this is the International Day of Charity. We know that whether it's natural disasters, humanitarian crisis or even indeed pandemics, charity and the giving of others in service of the community stands out as a great achievement, not just for our country but indeed for our humanity. The practice of being charitable is felt by millions of people across the world daily and today we celebrate that. Of course, this is the 10th anniversary of International Day of Charity the 10th anniversary because this is the day that we mark the death of Mother Teresa, a great symbol of the good and important work that charitable people do across the globe. Indeed, many of us will recall that in 1979 she received the Nobel Peace Prize for work undertaken in the struggle to overcome poverty and distress, which also constitutes a threat to peace, the prize said. So today, as we go about our work, as we acknowledge the great contributions that are made in our community, across our nation and indeed across the world, let us take a moment to acknowledge and appreciate and pay tribute to the International Day of Charity. Senator Polly. An Albanese Labor government outlined a holistic plan during the election campaign to deliver for Tasmania. Part of this strategy was to bring back manufacturing and with it more secure local jobs. 
Originally established in 1874, Waverley Mills is the oldest working textile mill in Australia. It produces high-quality wool products and is a hallmark of our ability to make things locally. To boost the longevity of the historic site, the Albanese government will invest $6 million to preserve the mill and improve safety, transforming the site into a state-of-the-art facility at the forefront of sustainable wool and other cloths recycling. Once completed, the project will support 120 ongoing jobs and is a demonstration of Labor's commitment to bringing more jobs in manufacturing back to northern Tasmania. In line with our commitment to boosting the skills of northern Tasmanians, the upgrade mill, upgraded mill will also support new training opportunities through its collaboration with local industry and tertiary institutions. Not only will this redevelopment enhance jobs in manufacturing, but this upgrade will also unlock new potential for the site as a tourism destination. Our wool products are world-renowned, and I'm sure tourists will flock to the site to experience the rich history and see how our fine products are made. The next decade should be one where we make things here at home again, with Australian workers, Australian resources and Australian ingen by backing woolen mills, we are supporting this aspiration at a local level, and I'm excited to work closely with the Honourable Ed Husick, Minister for Industry and Science, and ensure the delivery of this project on time and in full. Unlike the previous government, who failed to deliver jobs in Tasmania, who failed to deliver and support our local economy. Thanks, Senator Polly. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Two minutes is more than enough to review Labor's Jobs and Skills Summit. Allowing pensioners and student visa holders to earn more will help small businesses in the city and in the bush. This has been One Nation policy for some time. $40 billion in development funding through to 2030. Hmm. $5 billion a year sounds good until we realise private investment spending in Australia in 2022-23 alone will be $143 billion. $5 billion is a drop in the bucket just enough to provide the Labor Party with endless fo media photo opportunities. This was the best opportunity in years to talk about growing our employment base, mining, agriculture, manufacturing, value-adding, creating breadwinner jobs. Opportunity not taken. 25 per cent of the delegates, one quarter, were union bosses. Yet there was no tangible job creation that may benefit union members. No wonder red unions are booming. What did come out of the summit? Additional vocational training places for jobs that don't exist. Preferential employment schemes for women and Aboriginals for jobs that don't exist. 195,000 new migrants every year for jobs that don't exist. How will our crumbling healthcare system provide for all these new arrivals? Victoria is treating patients in tents and Queensland in the back of ambulances. Where will the housing come from? 100,000 Australians are homeless and that rate is rising. Rental prices are up 18 per cent this year alone. Inflation is 6 per cent, on its way to 10 per cent. Life for everyday Australians is getting very hard very quickly. Labor will make all of these things worse with increased immigration, adding more pressure on health and housing while diluting the power of workers. That will reduce workers' wages and living conditions even further. Just who are Labor working for? We have one flag, we have one community, and one nation is now the Workers' Party. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. On Friday afternoon, the Assistant Treasurer, Stephen Jones, made a regulation which will exempt super funds from disclosing the payments they make to unions. Now, now I've lodged a Freedom of Information request to understand how this regulation was made and upon what basis it was made. Now, $35 million will be paid from super funds to unions by 2030, which is a huge amount of money. Now, this is how money is washed from the super funds into the Labor Party. Uh, donations are generally not made directly into the Labor Party. They're made through these unions. So 35 million bucks by 2030, a lot of money, run a lot of campaigns on that basis. We know that Treasury did not recommend these changes. So the FOI request should shed some light on why these regs were made, who gave advice on this issue uh, and why on earth these payments are going to be aggregated and hidden from members. Now, of course, the old regulations, which were made by the former government, um, hadn't even been given a chance to see the light of day. These disclosures were cancelled. 
in order to have this regulation uh, aggregate the, the numbers or the dollars that are being paid out of the super funds into the unions. Uh, so ultimately now, uh, the Senate will need to make a judgment about whether it will stand for transparency and integrity on the matter of compulsory super. I would have thought that in a compulsory system established by this place that people should be able to see where their money is going. Now, if it is being paid to a union or to any other organisation, people should be able to see. Uh, it's all well and good for Mr Jones to say that he has required funds to disclose political donations, but the real money here is washed through the unions, and I'm sure the FOI will shed great light on how, in fact, this policy was designed, uh, which is a great shame to this parliament. Senator Bragg. Senator Billick. Thank you so much, Mr Acting <laughs> Deputy President. Um, and I've just got a couple of words to say to Senator Bragg about that super theft. Now, ridding the world of nuclear weapons should be the goal of all countries that are committed to a lasting global peace. It's absolute madness that in this day and age we have enough nuclear warheads to wipe out a significant proportion of the world's human population. A world free of nuclear weapons is a goal to which Australia is deeply committed, and the global community has made significant progress towards this goal thanks to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT. Despite the urgency to the international security environment, it is disappointing that the 10th Review Conference on the NPT did not reach a consensus outcome. All state parties, with the exception of Russia, were ready to agree to a meaningful and balanced outcome across the treaty's three pillars of disarmament, non-proliferation and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Russia's refusal to join this agreement has been a deliberate obstruction of progress towards nuclear non-proliferation. By obstructing progress, Russia's actions threaten global peace and security. And while the outcome is disappointing, Australia remains committed to the NPT, which continues to deliver tangible security benefits to the entire world. We should not allow Russia's intransigence to deter us from continuing to pursue the complete abolition of nuclear weapons. Australia, of course, continues to condemn Russia for its unprovoked and completely unjustified, unjustified invasion of Ukraine and calls on them to withdraw their forces immediately from Ukraine's territory. And I'd like to just quickly thank all the other state parties for their willingness to make a constructive contribution and find a way forward for peace. I also thank the delegates for their efforts, and in particular our Assistant Minister for Trade, Senator Ayres, who Senator led the Australian Bullock, delegation. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson. Any day now, the Federal Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, will decide the fate of a beautiful patch of ancient rainforest in the Tarkine. Rainforest that's been declared World Heritage Values and rainforest that is threatened by foreign-owned mining company MMG, who wish to build a toxic tailing stand in the middle of this beautiful, ancient and unprotected rainforest. Uh, I was lucky enough to visit this rainforest with my wife last weekend. I wanted to do a quick shout out to the Bob Brown Foundation for doing tours for Tasmanians. In fact, any Australians who would like to go down and see this area that is threatened by foreign-owned mining company MMG. Uh, the only reason you can go down there and see this area is because 93 people protested and were arrested to stop this destruction. And then a federal court found that the previous environment minister, Susan Lay, had acted unlawfully by allowing the machines into this rainforest, by allowing the bulldozers and the excavators to go in there without not having properly assessed the environmental values of the area, in particular the fact that the area is a breeding habitat for rare and critically endangered masked owls. Well, that is now being considered, and I would strongly urge uh, Ms. Mrs. Ms. Plibersek, the Environment Minister, to reject MMG's proposal to build a toxic tailing stand in this beautiful, unprotected rainforest. In fact, to go a step further and actually put this up for World Heritage Listing, which should have happened 15 years ago. Um, this is one of the last tracts of temperate rainforest left in the world, and it's largely unprotected. It's still subject to threat from mining and from forestry, and it would deliver a huge bounty of jobs 
uh, and wealth for the region if we properly protected it. This is a really good opportunity for Labor to get some runs on the board and show Tasmanians they Thank care you, Senator about Mishwas, our wealth. Thank you, Senator Your time's expired. Senator Babette. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Now, I rise here today to speak of some flattering news. Now, it turns out that the Labor Party has decided to copy the United Australia policy of bringing Australian super back home. Now, this policy was just one of many that we took to the election, and, uh, it was, uh, and another one was lifting the ban on nuclear power. And I'm proud to say that uh, the Liberal Party, my good friends over here to my right, have taken that one and they've run with it. Now, I'm very flattered that the Labor Party wants to adopt our policy that it was designed as a win-win for both Australian super and the Australian people. Now, I would have seen Australian super funds incentivised to invest Australian super right here at home for nation-building projects that would benefit all Australians. At the moment, too much of our super is invested overseas, building the economies of Europe and America and others. Now, super funds have around $3.5 trillion could easily be used to grow our industries right here. And at the end of the day, we don't need to rely on foreign capital to build our country. But as always, the devil will be in the detail, and we need to make sure that these funds are steered towards nation building. Now, when I saw that the Labor Party had copied our policy, I smiled. The Treasurer was obviously paying close attention to our policies during the election campaign. Now, in the political realm, when one political party steals another political party's policy, it should be taken as a compliment. After all, politicians will come and go, but good ideas, they will last forever. Now, I do see the positive side because at the end of the day, this policy, will be, if it's done right, will benefit all Australians and it will help secure our economic prosperity and maintain our nation's independence. Now, it is a clear form of political plagiarism. Now, the UAP, obviously, we've got the best ideas for growing Australia. After all, imitation is a, is a sincere form of flattery, but plagiarism can be seen as theft. The difference between plagiarism and theft is acknowledgement. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Babit. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I actually have been listening carefully to the two-minute statements being given in this chamber, and I decided to change my contribution during the course of the discussion. And what prompted me to change my contribution was the contribution which Senator James McGrath made and the reaction which it elicited from a number of Green senators. And I should state at the outset that it was not the Green senators who are currently in the chamber, but some of their colleagues who are in the chamber. As, Sen as Senator James McGrath spoke about the fact that the MP for Ryan, Elizabeth Watson Brown MP, refuses, refuses to display the Australian flag in her electorate office, refuses to display the Australian flag in her electorate office. And this was met with some mirth, some mirth from the Green senators who are sitting this, in this chamber. I would say two things in relation to this point. Two points. If that is the view of the Australian Greens, then you go to the next election and you campaign on the basis of that view. You be honest with the people of Rhine and every other seat where you're seeking election. If that is your view, if that is your view, if that is the view of Elizabeth Watson Brown MP, then be truthful with the people of Rhine before election day, before election day, so they can make a decision, make a judgment on who represents their values the best. Be fair dinkum with the people of Rhine. Be honest with them. And the second point I'd make, as I was listening and watching the mirth Senator from Waters. the Green Senators, I was reminded of the famous words which one of my heroes, Senator Neville Bonner, the first Indigenous Senator to represent Queensland in this place, said, look to, look to unite us. Don't pursue symbolism, mere symbolism, which seeks to divide us. And that represents what the Greens are doing in the seat of Ryan. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Waters, it is your turn now. Thank you. One of the strongest, clearest messages coming from the Jobs and Skills Summit last week was the economic and social benefits of expanding paid parental leave to 26 weeks. The Grattan Institute, the Parenthood, Chief Executive Women, unions, the Business Council of Australia, everyone agreed that fairer paid parental leave will unlock women's workforce participation, it will encourage more equitable sharing of care between parents and give children the best start to life. Now, Australia has one of the weakest parental leave schemes in the developed world, especially for fathers. 
There was unanimous support from summit participants for that to change, and yet paid parental leave was nowhere to be seen in the summit outcomes. Women are sick of making the case for change, hearing words of support, but seeing no action. The Greens went to the election with a fully costed plan for a fairer paid parental leave scheme that provides 26 weeks paid at replacement wage, capped to 100,000 pro rata, including superannuation, removing the rules that disadvantage families where a woman is the higher earner, and creating effective incentives for both parents to share care right from the outset. Now, if the government is serious about increasing women's workforce participation, it needs to do more than just nod sagely while a panel of expert women say these things. It needs to act. The experience in other countries puts beyond doubt that more equitable parental leave, coupled with free childcare, improves women's workforce participation and helps shape the long-term sharing of care work. Use it or lose it provisions in Scandinavian countries saw a huge jump in the number of dads taking leave, and that fairer sharing of care has been sustained for more than a decade. In contrast, Australia's parental leave scheme tends to lock mums into the role of primary carer and the loss of work opportunities that comes with it. Fairer paid parental leave and free childcare are no-brainers that benefit everyone. And if this government had the guts to scrap the stage three tax cuts, we could easily afford them. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Antic. If you're a parent and a stranger approaches your child to tell them about safe sex, transgenderism, abortion and pornography, you'd probably call the police, or at least you'd intervene to protect your children. Yet, staggeringly, such people regularly visit our children's schools to give lectures on sexuality. These seminars are, in truth, another injection of adult content into politics, uh, into an already politicised school system, a school system which is tanking in the areas of maths and reading on a world scale. But the neo-Marxists in our school systems are determined to teach their radical gender theory, their extreme climate alarmism, and to destigmatise every single sexual behaviour, imposing their worldview onto our children. And they don't want you to know about it. I'm aware of at least one program uh, of this kind in the South Australian school system covertly doing the rounds at the moment. Education departments assume that these so-called experts know what's best for our children, while most parents simply want their kids to learn how to read and write. The nuclear family is under attack from the school curriculum and the ideologues who are in command of it. And few people know that sex education was invented by the Hungarian Marxist Georgi Lukács, who in the early 1990s, as Deputy Commissar for Education, sought to break down family bonds by introducing radical and compulsory sex education into schools. This agenda is still being sold to parents today as helping kids make responsible choices, but the point is simply to normalise and destigmatise adult concepts. Children deserve to be protected from a constant stream of adult concepts, and parents deserve the right to raise their children with their own values. Do you know what your child is, in, is learning at school? If you don't, I suggest you take a closer look at their curriculum and then take an even closer look at some of the programs being brought into their classrooms. I suspect you may not like what you find. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, last week's Jobs and Skills Summit produced 36 immediate actions and about the same number of issues for further action. This was a historic collaborative process, and it is just the beginning. The Albanese Labor government will build a bigger, better trained and more skilled workforce. In the lead up to the summit, I held a series of roundtables across South Australia, including three in the Upper Spencer Gulf with community service organisations, Indigenous RTOs, student unions, education and training providers, not-for-profits, community leaders and a wide range of migrant communities. After nine years of neglect by the former government, it's not surprising that a number of the issues that I heard across those ten roundtables were very similar. There were common themes. The vocational education and training sector which has long been the foundation of Australia's strong and vibrant community um, and a significant and essential part of our economy, has just been crippled. But what we saw last week at the Jobs and Skills Summit was an outcome, was some concrete actions that are going to make a fundamental difference. When I met with, skilled with people who were affected by the skilled migration issues, they talked about all of the things that they could offer, all of the things that they could support our community with, and the delays 
and the challenges and barriers that they were consumed by. And I'm pleased to say that the summit last week provided an outcome for them. Housing and community infrastructure was raised everywhere that I went. Securing a job is hard, it can be very hard, particularly if you cannot find a place to live. You're not going to move to the place where their jobs are. And the summit last week, the Jobs and Skills Summit, Thank you, provided Senator Brogan, an outcome. Your time has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you. Volunteers are the lifeblood of our communities. And while that statement might sound like a cliche, everyone in this chamber knows this to be true. Being part of a volunteer organisation brings an electric energy that nothing else can match. Having volunteered in a variety of organisations for over 40 years, I know there is nothing else like it. But today I wish to highlight the importance of volunteering to my home state of Tasmania and why it desperately needs our support. Tasmania thrives on its volunteer community and after recently visiting our major rural field day event, AgFest, the power of the volunteer has never been more apparent. While the strength of volunteerism was on show throughout AgFest, the sad truth is volunteer rates in Tasmania and across the country are in decline. Volunteering Tasmania's latest State of Volunteering report showed an 11 per cent decline in volunteer numbers since 2014. Volunteers contribute $4 billion to the Tasmanian economy annually, with the average volunteer contributing four and a half hours per week. Without volunteers, our iconic community-driven organisations suffer. The management team at Emu Valley Rhododendron Garden in Burnie, for example, which opened in 1981, recently announced there were not enough volunteers for the upcoming spring and summer tourist seasons and it may have to close or operate at reduced hours. We all lead busy lives with families, careers and other commitments, which doesn't leave much room for volunteering. The impact of low volunteer levels places pressure on community organisations. Thank you, Senator Askew. The time for this debate has now expired. We'll move to question time. Senator Hume. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Like my colleagues, I've been speaking to businesses across this Australia about their experience of Labor's cost of living crisis on them and on their operations. Now, one business owner told me that the cost of supplies was increasing 30 per cent week on week. Minister, what is this Labor government doing to alleviate this inflation on small businesses? And does she agree with her colleague, the Assistant Treasurer, that there will be hyperinflation? Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I welcome the opportunity uh, to talk about Labor's economic plan to address the cost of living yeah, crisis yeah. that we inherited yeah, yeah. from a government that had wasted a decade that had not dealt with the policy challenges, that they had their head in the sand and used the budget like it was uh, money made available for the National Party. That's, right. That's what we are fixing, and we accept that businesses are under a lot of pressure. They haven't had an energy policy for the last 10 years. That's right. 22 failed policies <laughs> under your government when you were in power. That's what small business is saying to us. Yes, there are challenges, but we need to deal with them, and Labor's economic plan does exactly that. And in terms of dealing with the cost of living crisis, we have made submissions to the Fair Work Commission to make sure that, that working people, those on the minimum wage, actually get a decent pay rise. We have extended some of the pandemic payments that your mob had ended or are going to end, and we have kept them going. We will debate in this week the uh, climate change bill to put in place the regulatory and legislative framework uh, Minister, to deal with the seat. impacts. Uh, uh, just a moment, Senator Hume. I'm running the Senate, thank you, and I will call senators when I'm good and ready. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. Point of, point of order. A minute into a two-minute answer, and the minister hasn't answered a question about the, the effects of inflation on small businesses, <coughs> and specifically about the potential for hyperinflation. Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. I believe Senator Gallagher is being relevant. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And, and in, in response to the second part, the uh, forecasts for inflation were detailed in the Treasurer's July update. Um, economic statement, but I am explaining to the Shadow Minister for Finance exactly what we are doing to put downward pressure 
on costs on businesses and households. I can go through it again. We've got childcare. We've got cheaper medicines coming in. We've got a bring forward of the training places to deal with the skills crisis that small business are also discussing with us after years of not dealing with workforce shortages and the skills training to make sure that young people and older workers actually have the skills that they need for the jobs of the future. They're just some of the things that we've done in three months as opposed to your nine years of inaction. Right. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Before I call Senator Hume, I remind those on my right that Senator Hume has the right to put her question in silence. I struggle to hear her question. Senator Hume, uh, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I remind the minister that, in fact, childcare, COVID payments and minimum wages are doing nothing to help small business inflation. Another small business owner told me that she had begun absorbing fixed costs because of, with the other cost of living pressures, she didn't think that customers would be able to afford any additional price increases. So, Minister, what do you have to tell this business that will assist them in making sure that they can stay open and that they can stay profitable? And does she agree with her colleague, the Assistant Treasurer, that there will be more strikes? Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. Minister. As the Prime Minister has said, this government is pro-business. We are pro-working with business to deal with the challenges that they are Order. dealing with right now after uh, a decade Minister, of a Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President. After dealing with a decade of wasted opportunity and inaction by those opposite that have the nerve to come in here now and start blaming us for the economic uh, challenges that we have inherited. These didn't happen overnight. They didn't happen on the 21st of May. They've been brewing for years. Skills, climate change, energy policy, dealing with the challenges in visa backlogs, in migration, all of the issues that we are responding Order. to now after your Order. government had its head in the sand because you were too busy fighting each other or throwing dodgy Senator cash McGrath. for the National Party. Thank you, Ministers. Um, Senator Hume, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I've also had a small business, in fact more than one, tell me that they're currently working through plans to lower hours, to lower hours for staff in expectation of an economic downturn. What does this minister have to tell these businesses who, say, who see no plan from this government? And does she agree? And does she agree with her colleague, the Assistant Treasurer, who said that under a Labor government there would be a very rocky economic period? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. Well, I can assure uh, the Shadow Finance Minister that we will be working closely with small business. They were at the table at the Jobs and Skills Summit. They were deeply involved in the discussions through their peak organisations. Uh, please resume your seat. Thank you, Minister. Um, President, we were working with small business and their industry representatives, and they were uh, business was very well represented at the Jobs Senator and Hughes. Skills Summit. So we will be dealing with the things that they want to see dealt with, like skills, like increasing the uh, migration numbers, like dealing with climate change, like putting in place an energy policy by supporting them in terms of uh, some of the challenges around cyber and digital. These are all the issues that we're looking with, and we want to ensure that people using their businesses have enough money in their pocket to go and spend in those businesses, and that's why we are supporting reasonable and responsible wage increases for working people. Thank you, Minister. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the outcomes of last week's Jobs and Skills Summit and how those outcomes will benefit Australians? Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I thank Senator Smith Senator uh, for the question and for her, um, all the work that she did in the lead up to the Jobs yeah. and Skills Summit. Yeah, right across our, um, the government, our caucus, more than 100 roundtables were held uh, in various locations. I did one with Senator Urquhart in, her, in, her, uh, in northern Tasmania to listen, very well represented, more than more than 70 people, businesses, NGOs, everyone coming together to work with us to talk about the challenges that they want to see. The summit brought people together 
uh, to agree key actions to build the stronger economy that we all want to see and help set a clear direction for future work. Putting full employment and productivity, remember that word productivity, you didn't see much of it, did you, when you were in, in government, at the centre of our economic strategy and recognising that equal participation and opportunities for women are critical to that. We agreed 36 immediate initiatives, including extra money for fee-free TAFE and fast-tracking of those fee-free places, more and better investment in social and affordable housing, an extra $4,000 income credit so aged pensioners can work more and earn more before it affects their pension, responsibly increasing the mig permanent migration target to ad address those crippling um, labour shortages that small business is telling us about, beginning the work to repair the broken bargaining system and strengthening flexible working arrangements. After a decade of division and delay, conflict and complacency, this is what can be achieved by a government that is inclusive, collaborative and consensus-seeking. By refusing to participate, not one of you, not one of you attended, Mr Little Proud did, all credit to him. It's clear that the opposition wants nothing but a decade of flat real wages, Thank falling you, productivity Gallagher. and falling Your living standards. Senator, Senator McGrath, Senator Mariel Smith, first supplementary. Can the minister outline the areas of policy that were discussed at the Jobs and Skills Summit and update the Senate on where there was broad agreement among those who were represented at the summit? Minister. I will. And I can tell you from being in that summit for two days how many people spoke to me about the Order. environment. Sorry. Order. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, President. I can't tell you how many people who attended the summit came up to me and said how refreshing it was yeah, yeah. that they had a government who was prepared to sit down all with them for two days and talk to them about all of the issues affecting them. It was a broad range of people right across the community, and they wanted a better skilled and better trained workforce, addressing skill shortages and strengthening the migration system, boosting job security and wages, promoting equal opportunities and reducing barriers to employment and maximising jobs and opportunities in our industry and our community. This is what the summit determined to be the priorities, as was making gender equality a core economic priority. There were significant agreements reached. It's a shame those opposite couldn't be bothered coming. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith, second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister explain what progress was made at the Jobs and Skills Summit on restoring national leadership on gender equality? Minister. Thank you. I can. And this was a very serious um, part of the summit. It was kicked off by an all-women panel on equal opportunity and pay in a room where women made up a majority of participants. At the 1983 Economic Summit, there was only one woman in the room, Labor Senator Susan Ryan. But we know that women's equality is good economic policy, something that was recognised unanimously at the Jobs and Skills Summit. We also talked about our $5 billion commitment to make childcare cheaper for more Australian parents and allow more women to work more hours if they wished. Um, we, we talked about we announced the chair of the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, uh, Sam Mostyn, to maintain momentum on the ideas raised at the summit and advise the government on the national gender equality strategy. And I said, and I committed to as Minister for the Public Service, to expect that the APS should take a leadership position on gender equality, including through reporting to WGIA, setting targets to ad address gender equality and gathering data you, on how Your to make flexible work. Senator Cash. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Why is the Albanese government entertaining the proposal of the Australian Council of Trade Unions to reintroduce industry-wide bargaining? Does the minister realise that industry-wide bargaining will lead to more strikes and significantly disrupt a number of sectors of our economy? Good Thank question. you, Senator Cash, Minister. Thank you, President. Well, isn't it disappointing, President, that the only group in Australian politics who hasn't got the memo that what the Australian people want is more cooperation is the Liberal Party? Even the National Party seemed to briefly get the memo when they had their leader turn up to the Jobs and Skills Summit. But of course, oh, yeah. the leader of the opposition didn't turn up. The shadow treasurer wanted to be invited and then didn't show up. The deputy Minister leader. Watt, please resume your seat. 
Uh, please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you. As I say, President, it's very disappointing that the, uh, the Liberal Party does not, has not received the memo because what the Australian people have been saying over and over again, both before and since the election, is what they want in industrial relations is more agreements and less conflict. But what do we continue to see offered up by the opposition who are still fighting the last war? They want to progress the nine years that we saw of more conflict, less agreements, lower wages and lower productivity. What a quadrilla that is. If you could go to the races and make a bet on a quadrilla and you were a member of the opposition, you would want more conflict, less agreement, lower wages and lower productivity. That is what you bequeathed the Australian people and that is what you continue to want to offer the Australian people. Now, in terms of uh, wage bargaining, the Albanese Labor government has made a very clear commitment that we will get wages moving in this country. and The way we are going to do that is by reaching more agreements. Business and unions agree that we need a new approach. That's why so many of them actually turned up to the summit, unlike anyone up until about that row last week, uh, uh, to actually Watt, have a discussion. Please resume your seat. Uh, those on my left, particularly, and some senators in particular, Senator Hughes and McGrath, the running commentary is absolutely disorderly, and I would have asked you to desist. Please continue, Minister. Thank you, President. So we will uh, legislate to ensure that workers and businesses have flexible options for reaching agreements, and that is all about bringing the current legislation up to date with a new government that wants to get wages moving. Now, Senator Cash referenced the ACTU. Of course, the ACTU aren't the only people to welcome this approach. I heard Alexi Boyd from Cosboa this morning on the radio. What we are hearing from our members is some of them are saying this is something they would like it like to look into. Thank you, it's Minister as simple White. as that. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you. A supplementary question. Will the minister guarantee that any changes the Albanese government makes to the Fair Work Act will not result in more strike action being taken? Thank you, Senator Cash, Minister. Thank you, President. Well, as I say, this change, which has been agreed upon by businesses and unions at the summit, is uh, about better pay for workers, particularly for women. It's about more productivity in the economy, not less. It's about more agreements rather than continuation of the nine years of conflict that we saw from the last uh, government Minister Watt, that did nothing. Your seat. Senator McGrath, I did ask you during the last series of questions to not do the running commentary. I would ask you to stop doing the running commentary, please. Minister. Thank you, President. So what will change as a result of these legislative changes from this, business, this government is that more businesses will have access to simple, flexible and fair agreements and more workers will get pay rises. So as I say, that's why Alexi Boyd from Cosboa was on the radio this morning saying that what she's hearing from her members is that some of them say it's something that's worth looking into. Uh, unfortunately, the party that presents itself as being the friend of small business is actually running against small business and not listening to uh, small business. Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Point of order on question of direct relevance. Senator Cash's supplementary question went very specifically to the rates of strike action that could occur under government reforms, simply seeking a guarantee from Senator Watt that there would not be an increase in the incidence of strike action. He hasn't mentioned strike action once in his response. With 12 seconds remaining, President, I invite him to give that guarantee. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I do believe the minister is being relevant, but I will listen over the next uh, 12 seconds. Minister. Thank you, President. Unfortunately, there remain in this uh, community and in this parliament some people who don't want workers to get pay rises, and there are some people who don't want businesses to have productivity, so that's why they keep using scare tactics about thank strikes. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Does the minister agree with the assistant treasurer that striking is an effective part of the bargaining process? Why is the government promoting workplace conflict instead of employees and employers working together. Thank you, uh, Senator Cash, Minister. Well, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Cash. The minister responsible for more conflict in industrial relations than any we have seen in recent history, the minister whose office leaked a police raid on a union office, that's how much she was into conflict, and now she wants to come in and lecture us about strikes and Order. about industrial conflict. Order. I mean, really, really. Even for you, that is utterly shameless. Um, uh, everyone knows. Minister, please resume your seat. 
Please continue. Thank you, uh, President. And thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Cash. I, I welcome every question you ask about industrial relations. Now, I noticed that there was one member of the opposition who did have the decency to admit that his uh, his government had been so failed, and that is the man who is now apparently known as Soccer Dad Matt Canavan, who on Twitter a couple of days ago said that when Australia became a nation in 1901, the average Australian had to work for 18 minutes to earn a loaf of bread. By 2019, that loaf cost just four minutes of work. Over the past three years, we have gone backwards. Thank you, Senator Canavan, for telling people that it now takes four minutes and 21 seconds Thank you, to Minister, earn your daily bread as a result of your expired. government. Senator Furuki. <clears throat> My question is to Minister Wong, representing the Prime Minister. Minister, the recent climate fueled floods in Pakistan are having horrific consequences. To date, one third of Pakistan is underwater, 33 million affected. The death toll is more than 1,000 people, 1 million homes have been wiped out, and half a million people are living in tents. This is the deadly face of the climate catastrophe. Early estimates show that the damage from the floods is more than $10 billion. The UN has called for $160 million in emergency aid. Australia has so far promised a measly $2 million in aid to Pakistan. Just $2 million. This is nowhere near our fair share. Minister, will the government take responsibility and provide more aid to Pakistan, commensurate with our wealth and contribution to the climate crisis, and equivalent to the scale of the disaster? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And uh, I thank the Senator for her question, and uh, I also acknowledge her, uh, her and her family's personal um, connection with Pakistan, um, along with many others in the diaspora for whom this has been uh, a very difficult time. Um, uh, the, the senator is right. Uh, this is a disaster on a truly massive scale. Uh, 33 million people affected, including through displacement and loss of livelihood. Uh, we've seen uh, lives lost, uh, including those of children. Uh, and on behalf of the Australian government, as I did last week, um, <clears throat> I extend uh, our sympathies and condolences to the families and communities in Pakistan that have lost loved ones and to the many who have been affected by the devastating floods. Um, we announced a contribution, as the senator has uh, indicated, uh, through the World Food Programme of $2 million to assist the Pakistani government and its people respond to immediate humanitarian needs. Uh, particularly uh, focusing on those who are disproportionately affected, including women, children and the vulnerable. Uh, in relation to the request, uh, I would make a few points. Uh, the first um, is you know, Australia uh, will consider further support in consultation with international partners um, following the UN launch of the UN flash appeal. Um, uh, it is the case that our initial response is on par with many other medium-sized donors. Uh, to be frank, um, uh, there are humanitarian demands uh, around the world, um, including in our new region. Uh, and um, just as we would you know, always like to be able to fund many of the good ideas that were discussed at the Job Summit, so too when it comes to humanitarian aid, I, I always have, and my ministers in the portfolio always have more requests. Thank you, which Minister. Are Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. The people of Pakistan, Minister, are paying the price for the insatiable appetite of wealthy colonial countries like Australia to keep digging up coal, gas and oil. This obsession is leading to these deadly consequences. Given the death and disaster this is inflicting on the people in Pakistan and the Global South, who did little to contribute to the climate crisis but are the most vulnerable, will the government now act urgently and commit to no new coal and gas. Minister. First, uh, I would, there was much in that question with which I, I, I don't necessarily agree, but I do agree with the proposition uh, that those who are most vulnerable in this world are most vulnerable to climate change. And so, uh, where you already have poverty, where you already have uh, poor levels of infrastructure, poor levels of economic resilience, uh, then uh, those communities and those nations are far more vulnerable to climate change and far less able to respond. 
Uh, I would make the point, uh, as I made when I had the privilege of being Australia's climate minister, that pointing the finger uh, at each other when it comes to uh, resolving uh, the uh, global action on climate change uh, was uh, less productive than finding agreement about how we start to reduce emissions. Uh, the senator is right that the vast majority of emissions already uh, in the atmosphere are as a result of developed countries. I would make the point going forward. If you, if you go, if Thank I you, make Minister. The point Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. Minister, we owe it to the people of Pakistan and all others who are on the front line, suffering the worst consequences of the climate crisis, to do everything we can to tackle it. We need fast action on methane to keep a 1.5 degrees centigrade future within reach. Will the government today commit to joining and signing on to the global pledge to cut methane emissions by 30 per cent by 2030? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Uh, I agree. Uh, the government agrees that we, we need urgent action, and it is, it is a pity that this country has spent nearly a decade fighting the climate wars, which have, been, have come at the cost both of jobs and opportunities here in Australia, but also have meant we have not been part of the solution when it comes to global action on climate. Uh, and in that context, I am disappointed to see some. Uh, commentary uh, from the Greens Party that you know the climate wars aren't over, and what I would say to you, what I would say to you is that I think Australians have made it clear they actually want a way forward, they want solutions, and whether it's those opposite or on occasion those at this end of the chamber, they seem to be more interested in the political benefits of conflict. Oh, sorry, Senator Fruit, you weren't in my line of sight. Yeah, no, that's all right. I just want to go to relevance. More than half the time has expired. I had a very specific question about whether the government would commit to joining the global pledge to cut methane emissions. Um, Senator Faruqi, the minister is entitled to take into account the preamble and the question, and I do believe that the minister, you did have a broad preamble. I do believe that the minister is being relevant, minister. Uh, thank you. There was quite a long preamble to which I, I think I am entitled to respond. I think um, we have made public our consideration of the, the methane issue that you have raised, uh, uh, but I would make the broader point uh, that what we can do is make sure that we get over the climate wars we've seen thank over, you, over Minister, the last 10 years. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Giacconi. Thank you very much, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Last week's Jobs and Skills Summit held right here in Parliament House brought together industry groups, business leaders, unions and advocacy groups to address workforce issues right across Australia. Can the minister please detail to the Senate how the outcomes from this summit will benefit the ag industry right now? Minister Watt. Thank you, Thanks, Senator Giacconi, for another great question about agriculture and industry I know he's very interested in. Uh, firstly, I just want to echo the words of the Prime Minister, who said in relation to the summit that it delivered outcomes that even he could not have hoped for. To see the leaders of groups divided for so long under the previous coalition government come together to discuss these major workforce and training issues was really something special, and that was certainly the mood of the room. And that applies to agriculture as much as to other industries. The National Farmers Federation and its members were in the same room as unions covering agricultural workers for the first time in many years, and I thank all of those participants for their collaboration and for putting the interests of industry, farmers and workers first rather than political games. And there were some great outcomes from the summit that will benefit the agriculture sector straight away. The government announced an additional $1 billion in joint funding with the states for fee-free TAFE in 2023, and I'll be working with industry, unions and rural Australia to ensure that agriculture gets its fair share. We also announced that the migration cap would be lifted from 165,000 to 195,000, including 34,000 places for the regions, an increase of 9,000 on that that the government, uh, previous government put in place. And again, this increase will help some of the gaps in agricultural workforce. The government also announced money for visa processing to speed that up and clear the backlog of nearly a million people who are waiting because of the previous government's inaction, and again, that will help in the agriculture workforce. And these measures, of course, come on top of the government's existing commitments, including to expand the Palm Scheme and strengthen worker protections. 
At the end of the summit last week, the NFF president, Fiona Simpson, said that they got sick of waiting for action under the previous government. The ag sector waited for a number of years for the ag visa. They waited for years for investment in training. They waited for years for any movement, and now we're Thank already you, delivering Your after 107 days. Thank you, Minister. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you, President. That's wonderful news. Thank you, Minister. Can the minister outline what measures from the summit will be implemented to alleviate these workforce issues in the agriculture industry over the next 12 months? Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Giacconi. In the lead-up to the summit, a historic meeting was held between agriculture and processing employers, unions and government. This was something the former government couldn't do and wouldn't do. Actually getting people in the same room to talk about shared challenges, something the previous government just not, would not bother even trying to do. And as a direct result, result of that meeting, we have established a tripartite agriculture workforce working group uh, to progress an agreed list of items needing further consideration. During the Jobs and Skills Summit, the NFF, Australian Pork Limited, Wool Producers Australia, JBS and the Australian Meat Industry Council joined the ACTU, the AWU, UWU and the Meat Workers Union at a signing ceremony to try and find agreement on these issues moving forward. This group will pursue uh, solutions to a better skill, attract, protect and retain workers across the ag sector. Having these different sectors, who were once so divided, come together was a fantastic step thank forward you, in Minister, dealing with these issues. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Tony, second supplementary. Oh, thank you very much, President. And what great spirit of cooperation there was during the job summit last week. And I want to thank the Minister. Can the Minister also advise the Senate how this new spirit of cooperation compares to the previous approach undertaken by the coalition government? Oh, sorry, Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Giacconi, for observing the spirit of cooperation. It sounds like some others could, could learn from that. One of the things that was mentioned during the press conference that we held, Order. a press conference that we held with the NFF, its members, and every union that covers the agriculture workforce, one of the things that was mentioned was how unlikely this tripartite working group would have been under the previous government. And it's no surprise when you have the leader of the National Party, who says he represents farmers, consistently hurling insults at the nation's peak farming body. Previously, he claimed that they don't represent farmers, they're only the peak body for farmers. He's called them ignorant, and just last week he called them cowards. No wonder the former government, with an attitude like that, couldn't deliver a single worker under their agriculture visa scheme. They couldn't get consensus within their own coalition, let alone within the wider sector. It's just more of the same from the Liberals and Nationals, dividing Australians instead of bringing them together. Uh, but I will give Mr Littleproud credit for turning up, because who wasn't there? The one person who wasn't there was the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Thank Dutton. Thank you, Minister Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Minister, Senator Gallagher for the Minister for Health. A peer-reviewed paper last week in the establishment scientific journal Vaccine examined Pfizer's COVID vaccine randomised phase three clinical trials data. It used the World Health Organisation's framework made for this purpose, the Brighton Collaboration on Adverse Events of Special Interest. Authors include virology and pharmacology experts from UCLA, Stanford, University of Baltimore and Queensland's Bond University. The paper concluded that Pfizer's vaccine was associated with a 36 per cent increase in serious adverse events. The most common were coagulation disorders and acute cardiac injury. In every 10,000 people injected, 18 will experience a life-threatening or altering medical complication. Serious adverse events from Pfizer's COVID vaccine are four times higher than any benefit in reduced hospitalisation. Minister, is Pfizer's vaccine safe and do you advise Australians to continue taking it? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I must say I haven't uh, read the paper that <laughs> Senator Roberts is citing from. Um, but in answer to his question, are the um, vaccines safe? Yes, they are. Uh, they have prevented the successful deployment of vaccinations across the world. Have prevented probably millions of deaths from COVID-19, particularly in those vulnerable populations, older people, people who have a disability or are immunocompromised. Uh, and we've done very well here in Australia. We've got some more to do in terms of fourth doses, where it's only still, I think, about 40 per cent of eligible people have received uh, their fourth dose. Uh, but the vaccine is safe. It's been an incredibly effective health measure to manage the pandemic, to deal 
to protect lives and to, um, to protect economic loss that would have otherwise occurred from uh, such a, a serious global pandemic. Um, and I think we, you know, we put, have put our trust in the health experts in Australia from the beginning of this pandemic. Their advice hasn't changed. ATAGI, who have considered all of the matters, the scientific panel that have looked at them, uh, the TGA, who has approved the vaccines, they have been through rigorous processes to ensure that they are safe. And where there have been adverse events, and there have been, unfortunately, including um, serious adverse events um, from the loss of life, uh, the advice has changed. Uh, and the vaccine program was changed to deal with that. And where there have been adverse events, they have all been reported publicly uh, on the TGA website so that people are able to see the data and see the changing health advice around the vaccines. But yes, they are safe and people should have their vaccine, including their fourth Thank dose. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. 63 million COVID injections means up to 113,000 Australians suffered serious adverse events. Since the vaccine's release, all-cause mortality after allowing for COVID deaths is at record highs. This paper proves COVID vaccines cause serious side effects, in 13 cases fatal. The TGA admits children are being given myocarditis and pericarditis. Minister, where's the Royal Commission that your own COVID committee called for? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, President. Well, we didn't call for a Royal Commission into the um, in vaccine safety. Um, so let's be clear on that. Um, as chair, uh, there was a recommendation about uh, looking at all aspects of the pandemic response, but it is different, and I don't want to be involved in any conspiracy about vaccines. Thanks very much. They are safe. The evidence has been provided. The data is available on the website. And I would say to Senator Roberts, uh, because I, I, I do have time for you, Senator Roberts, we have good discussions and have had through the pandemic, is if you are concerned by this paper you have read, I would urge you to refer it to the TGA or to the, to the AHPPC or to ATAGI and get their considered opinion on it to see whether there are, you know, to see and, and perhaps listen to the other side. Um, of those experts who have been working on vaccine and vaccine safety. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. The vaccines are causing coagulation disorders, and this will show in a reduction in live births. The Australian Bureau of Statistics receives live birth data six weeks post death, so we should be seeing live so, sorry, six weeks post birth. So we should be seeing live birth data to June 2022. Yet the ABS data stops at December 2020. Minister, why is this government holding back two and a half years of live birth data? What are you covering up? Minister. Of, um, well, we're not covering up anything uh, for a start, so just to answer your question directly. Secondly, on, you know, on issues of, um, of births, live births, maternal deaths or deaths of babies, usually those, that data is uh, reported and it's reported at state and territory uh, level. So I'm sure that that data uh, does exist if you are interested in it. Where there have been um, ad, uh, side effects from the vaccine, and there have been some, um, I'm sure many in this chamber got them, headaches, feeling a bit tired and, and escalating into more serious conditions, they have been appropriately managed and advised on by uh, all of those experts. So when there was some concerns about blood clotting and myocarditis in young men, I think in teenage boys particularly, those issues uh, were addressed and were managed, including by providing advice to anyone who is a vaccination provider uh, to keep an eye out for any conditions like that. And you'll see from the data that the TGA. Um, Thank you, Minister. Sorry, Your time I could has go on. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Northern Australia, Senator Watt. During the inquiry into the government's climate change bills, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility indicated there are a total of eight coal and gas-related opportunities within the project pipeline. Can the Minister guarantee the continuation of these projects? Thank you, Senator. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, as the former Shadow Minister for Northern Australia, I don't require a folder for this answer, uh, but, I, but I thank you for the questions, uh, Senator Macdonald. Um, I think it's well understood that the Labor Party's position in relation to any resource project—coal, uh, uh, gas or any other mineral 
uh, is that we assess it on its merits. Uh, our, our, we don't, do not uh, have the same position of the Greens, which is a blanket ban. We do not have the position of the opposition, uh, which is to support every single project without having a look at the environmental or economic benefits of it. We have a sensible approach. We have a sensible approach. So we, we, our position is very simple. If a, if a particular project stacks up economically, environmentally and socially, then it will go ahead. Uh, every project will go through uh, the proper assessment proposals. Every, every project has to stack up economically. Every project has to pass the environmental tests and get the environmental ap approvals. So uh, the projects that you're talking about are hypothetical in nature at this point in time. Uh, but uh, should those projects be applied for, then we'll consider them on their merits. Thank you, Minister. Second, first supplementary, Senator Macdonald. Can the minister outline how the proposed bill will affect the future investment decisions by NAIF, considering the government's commitment to increasing gas supply? Thank you, Senator. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Macdonald. Again, the position being put forward by this bill, this historic bill, uh, from this government is that what we will do for the first time is lock in an interim emissions target of 43 per cent by 2030. It's a real target. It doesn't rely on technology that has yet to be invented, uh, and that is, of course, a pathway to net zero by 2050. And uh, I might say to Senator Macdonald and other members of the opposition that these targets are targets that are already committed to by pretty much every resources company in the country. Uh, every resources in the country that you care to think about has committed to net zero by 2050. Um, they are all already making changes uh, to reduce their emissions. And frankly, what this government is doing is actually just trying to catch up with where industry is on the way to then leading. It's something that, unfortunately, the former government didn't do. We saw industry get well ahead of the former government's policy, and all that did was deprive regional Australians of jobs. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Thank you. That didn't answer my last question at all. Can the minister guarantee that no proposed or committed gas projects currently within NAVE's pipeline will be refused financing as a result of changes under the legislation? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I've seen no evidence whatsoever that this government intends to change NAFE's investment mandate or rules uh, in the way Senator Macdonald is talking about. Um, sorry? Uh, no. Senator McKenzie. Senator Mackenzie, that is disorderly. Minister, Thank you, President. The question As the minister representing the Northern Australia minister, I have seen no evidence to speak of. What, thank you, Senator Green, for reminding me. The only government that we have seen uh, interfere with the NAIF's investment decisions about investing in resources and energy projects is the former government, which killed off a wind farm outside uh, Cairns, the Caban project that would have delivered about 250 jobs to Cairns. Oh, sorry, Senator Macdonald. A point of order. I specifically asked about uh, oh, the just a changes moment, Senator under Senator Macdonald. Senator Green, I would ask you if that was you uh, to desist. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. <laughs> I specifically asked about uh, the, pipe, uh, the projects within the NAIF pipeline to be refused funding as a result of changes under this legislation. Thank you, Senator. Yes, thank you, Senator Macdonald, and I do believe the minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Again, what the climate uh, change bill is about is about bringing in an interim target to reduce our emissions. Uh, there is nothing in the bill that I'm aware of that would have the effect that Senator Macdonald is talking about, uh, and I would certainly hope that uh, she and her colleagues are not intending to continue the same scare tactics that we saw for 10 years that held back investment, drove up our emissions and cost jobs. Uh, thank you, Minister. Yeah. Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Minister, the Treasurer was quoted this morning in relation to the indexation of income support payments as saying, we know that it won't solve every problem for everybody, but it's important that we try and make sure that those payments keep up and that we acknowledge that times will still be tough for a lot of people. Minister, today's indexation of income support payments is less than $2 a day extra for someone on JobSeeker.
This pathetic increase will leave millions of Australians in really tough times, with payments that are not keeping up, that aren't within cooey of the poverty line, let alone giving people enough to live on. Minister, poverty is a political choice. Why won't your government choose to increase the rate of job seeker above the poverty line? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. I thank you, President, and I thank <coughs> Senator Rice for the question. It's, an, it's an, on an important topic and one which um, the government has been uh, looking at closely in terms of um, you know, when we've been working through our line-by-line -line audit of uh, those opposites' budget and how they used to allocate money to see how we can make sure that every dollar that is going um, is being spent is actually quality spending and going to supporting um, Australia and the Australian people. We've been clear though about the rate of job seeker. This did come up quite a number of times during the election campaign, and our commitment was uh, to look at payments um, through the budget process uh, and to um, you know, to look at, at basically how how much money is available and, and ease cost of living where we can, but we didn't make a commitment to in increase uh, job seeker over and above the indexation arrangements, which, because of the high inflation, um, it will be a very very significant adjustment to the parameters in the October budget, which. The budget will have to accommodate as well. I mean, part of the issue we're dealing with here is a trillion dollars of liberal debt, uh, deficits for as far as the eye can see. We do need to be fiscally responsible as well, uh, and that are, they are the challenges facing us as we put together our first budget. Um, we cannot just go and increase um, or fund all of the good ideas that we would like to fund because we've inherited an absolute mess from those opposite. Um, significant budgets, trillion dollars in debt, programs growing, terminating Senator measures McGrath. that when, are not, have no funding beyond the, first, the next two years. These are the challenges that we're trying to grapple with. But rest assured, we will do a better job and we will care about people uh, much more than Thank those you, people Minister, opposite The time did. has expired. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thanks, Minister. Minister, you talk about spending every dollar in a quality way of the trillion dollars of Liberal debt of being fiscally responsible. And I repeat, poverty is a political choice. Can you explain then why you are choosing to implement the stage three tax cuts, which will give $244 billion over the next 10 years to billionaires and the ultra wealthy and to everybody in this place, while people on JobSeeker are forced to live below the poverty line? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. So the priority for the government is actually doing what we can now in the immediate term to deal with um, the budget mess we've got and deal with the cost of living pressures Australians are facing. The, the, we have not changed our view on stage three tax cuts. They don't come in until July 2024. There is an immediate issue here right now that we are working through. And believe me, we are working hard every day to go through the budget to try and make room for good ideas that we would like to fund over and above. Uh, the commitments we made in the election campaign, but in terms of putting, uh, putting cost, immediate cost of re living relief, they will be things that we do within the October budget, like making medicines cheaper, like it, making the investments in cheaper childcare, and the quite significant um, parameter variations that we'll have uh, on indexing payments, which will make a difference for people who are living on those payments. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, I'll ask it another way. Can you explain why people below, living below the poverty line are going to receive a measly $1.84 a day, while Labor's stage three tax cuts will give Clive Palmer and everybody earning over $200,000 an extra $24.86 a day? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Well, my answer is the same as the previous question, which is that we are focused right now on the next two years and what we can do to deal with some of these cost of living pressures immediately. Those increase, the indexation increases to payments will flow um, through the adjustment made at the end of September. So they will provide some assistance to people 
uh, as we put in place other arrangements to deal with cost of living, such as our childcare policy and such as our cheaper medicines, that we will also do. In terms of um, stage three, we haven't changed our view on that, but that is not until 2024. These issues that people are dealing with right now are right now, and that's our focus as we put together the October budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. What is the Minister doing to help Australian pensioners deal with the lack of action and neglect of cost of living issues that is the legacy of the Morrison government? Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Walsh for her question. And congratulate her on the terrific job she's uh, continuing to do for the people of uh, Victoria. <coughs> Um, the Albanese Labor government has overseen the largest indexation increases to government payment in the history of more than 30 years of Australian government allowances. For Australian pensioners, they haven't seen a rise like this in over 12 years, over the entire length of the former cold-hearted Liberal National Coalition government that now sits opposite uh, because the Australian people simply had enough, enough of the lack of economic planning to lead us out of the pandemic, enough of the uh, lazy policy that has left our nations most disadvantaged, the most exposed to the tumultuous global economic uh, conditions. This government is committed to serving all Australians and ensuring that no matter what your circumstances, there is a strong social safety net to protect you when you need it most. This reflects the fundamental principles of this government to leave no one behind and uh, hold no one back. This indexation will be yet uh, another building block that we are putting in place to help ordinary Australians manage and challenging economic times that we face, ensuring that the government payments keep up with the cost of living. Madam President, uh, our government understands the challenges Australian households are facing with increasing cost of living pressures, especially those on low incomes. The measure to uh, increase uh, government payments by 4 per cent demonstrates yet again how we are committed to a welfare system that supports the most vul vulnerable Australians, encourages those who are able to work or study and remain you, sustainable Minister, for future generations. has expired. Uh, Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Minister, is the indexation measure the only boost that aged pensioners can expect from this government? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. And, and again, I thank the Senator for her uh, very important question. <coughs> indexation is not the only measure our government has announced in order to assist pensioners. As discussed in the chamber this morning, Following the uh, Albanese's, uh, job and, uh, Albanese government's Jobs and Skills Summit, we announced uh, an increase in the amount pensioners will be able to earn before losing any of their pension. From 1 December 2022, pensioners uh, <coughs> uh, on uh, the old age uh, pension will have their work bonuses income bank uh, credited with $4,000. This will take the maximum work bonus income bank from $7,800 to $11,800 until the 30th of June 2023. The $4,000 increase will be added to each age pensioner's work bonus income uh, bank uh, up, uh, up front. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Minister, what else is the government doing to address the cost of living pressures, pressures facing Australians? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Th again, thank the Senator for her uh, question um, and her commitment to uh, the most disadvantaged people in our community. <clears throat> the indexation measures announced will go some way to easing the cost of living burden facing Australia. And some of our society's most disadvantaged people are feeling that most keen keenly. These indexation me measures <clears throat> have been implemented to address the CPI rate uh, increase of 4 per cent. The indexation will continue to be applied on a six-monthly basis. The factors causing price increases are multifaceted, and uh, we must uh, work to address them across budget cycles. 
We are spending around $126 billion on income support payments through the uh, social security and social services portfolio, which encompass uh, family assistance and student assistance payments in 2022 and 2023. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin. President, uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. Is the Minister aware of reports today that the Space Industry Association of Australia is asserting that there has been no substantial engagement with the space industry by any ministerial office in Canberra, that the space policy is in a vacuum, that the critical national space infrastructure projects totalling $2.5 billion are stalled on departmental desks, and it appears to many that space has fallen through the cracks in Canberra. And can the minister reconcile his government's reported neglect of Australia's strategic Order. and economic importance, space industry, with the government's stated commitment to the industry thank sector? Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Uh, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, and uh, I thank uh, uh, the senator for his uh, his question. Um, um, we're certainly not uh, <coughs> letting space uh, fall between the uh, cracks, uh, and you're, you, you ought to know better than that, coming from South Australia, uh, Senator. Yeah, that's right. You know, you know all about <coughs> what the Malinowskis government yeah. is doing in South Australia, uh, and what the Albanese government oh, is doing uh, nationally on this issue. We're <coughs> we're revitalising. Uh, the space industry, which for 10 years under your uh, former government uh, was left to, uh, to wallow. Uh, now, I, uh, I, I, you, you ought to know, you ought to know, Senator, exactly what's going on. For instance, in Port Lincoln, Port Lincoln in South Australia is going to be the basis for. Um, further space ex exploration, further, further launches of rockets uh, into space. Now, I was, I, I, was recently, I was recently in the United States and I met with a company that's looking at Port Lincoln to build a new space station. And the idea, the idea of this space station, you'll like this. It's a centrifuge. It's a centrifuge. And, and, and this spins round and round and round and fires a rocket up into space. And instead of instead of costing, instead of costing, instead of costing, Minister Farrell, instead of, please resume your seat. Order. I'm waiting for the Senate to settle down before I call the minister, Minister Farrell. Thank you. Uh, uh, Madam President, and it fires a rocket up into space. And instead Senator of costing McGrath. about two million dollars uh, per rocket launch, uh, that costs about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So it's going to significantly reduce. Thank you, the Minister. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive answer. <laughs> and can I can I ask him, arising from that answer, explain? The Space Industry Association of Australia's revelation that no space industry representative was invited to the government's job and skills summit last week, despite the sector employing more than 10,000 workers and contributing billions to the national economy. Uh, thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Order. Order. Minister. Well, I can't quite work out the. Uh, <coughs> Senator's line of questioning here. Either, we, either this government is doing something about um, the space industry and therefore creating all those jobs, uh, or, it's, or it's not. But you can't have it both ways, uh, with due respect, uh, Senator. The reality is, the reality is, the reality is, I, as a young man, I can remember rockets being fired at Woomera uh, in South Australia. You, you let that entire industry go. You let that entire industry. Uh, <coughs> Minister, thank you. Uh, Senator Birmingham. I, I hate to do it, Madam President, but a, a point of order on direct relevance. As, as much as the trips down Senator Farrell's memory lane are most entertaining for the chamber, there was a question from Senator McLaughlin which 
did go particularly to why the government did not invite representatives of the space industry to the Jobs and Skills Summit. And I find it hard to understand how Senator Farrell's recollections of what was happening at Woomera when he was a young man have any bearing whatsoever you, on the invite list for the Jobs and Skills Summit. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, when there's quiet in the chamber, I will address your point of order. I will, ask, I will redirect uh, Senator Farrell to the question, which was specifically about the Jobs and Skills Summit. Thank you, Minister. Uh, with, with due respect, uh, President, I thought I'd answered that uh, directly in, uh, in my first sentence. That, that didn't make any sense for what Senator, uh, the Senator was, uh, was asking. Um, look, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that um, the Jobs and Skills uh, Summit that uh, we held last week and that uh, Senator Gallagher uh, had a very significant contribution uh, involved, involved a whole range— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator McLaughlin, second supplement. Western Australian. Order. Uh, Minister, as you be aware, the government is yet to respond to the inquiry of the other place into the developing Australia's space industry, and which reported in December. And can he please advise the chamber when we will receive a response to that report? Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Senator Farrell, Minister. Well, let me let me tell you, and I'll reiterate what I started my uh, comments uh, with these questions about the Malinowskis government. The Malinowskis government in South Australia, very fine man, very fine man, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Malinowskis and the Albanese government at the federal level will ensure that the space industry flourishes in this country. We're all about, we're all about um, bringing industry back to Australia. You let it go. <coughs> Do you remember about Holdens, what you did to Holdens in South Australia, what you did to Mitsubishi? Oh, that was a long time ago. But <coughs> uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Order. Senator McGrath. I'm sorry. Uh, when, when those on my left are quiet, I will ask Senator Birmingham for his point of order. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Pre Pre President, again, a point of order on direct relevance. We, we seem to be on the rather earthly matters of cars at present from Senator Farrell, rather than, of course, the actual question that relates to the space industry and the jobs from the space industry. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I do note Senator Farrell was just getting started, but um, I'm, sure, I'm sure he will get to the directness of that question. Uh, Minister. Uh, we're waiting, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, we intend to rebuild manufacturing in this country. You kicked, you kicked all of these co companies uh, out of our country. We're bringing them back, and space, space is going to be an absolutely vital part of that. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Can I ask honourable senators to make their way out of the chamber in, in an orderly fashion, please? Are there, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Hughes. Deputy President, I rise to take note of Senator Hume's questions to Minister Gallagher. Now, I know those opposite are still adjusting to what we know as government. They've spent so long in opposition, and we know they've spent the majority of time in opposition since Federation. But what they do need to start to understand is that they actually are in government now, and that government is actually about governing. It's about taking tough decisions 
in tough circumstances. Now, unlike those opposite, we actually will demonstrate some grace and will acknowledge that there are plenty of global influences that are creating cost of living pressures that many, many Australians are experiencing. But what that means, though, is that it is even more important that the government, which is again those opposite, be proactive in their response. We need to make sure that the government is making decisions that are going to have the best possible outcome for Australian families as they face the challenges that cost of living pressures are creating. Now, what our role over here is to hold them to account. Now, we, like to, we need to have a look at what's being proposed, and outrageously, we will actually make suggestions. We will propose things, having had a great depth of experience in government, of some of these solutions that would make an immediate difference. And one of those, what we talked about today, allowing pensioners, both on the disability support pension and the age pension, to increase the number of hours that they're able to work without having an impact on their pension. Now, we suggested this back in June 2022, so over 100 days ago. Uh, the idea apparently has now filtered through, not as an effective uh, way as we have proposed, but now through their job skills slash talk fest with the unions, they have come to some thought process that it might actually be worth considering. But this is where those in government now need to understand, and the Labor Party needs to understand that they actually need to put national interests first not their interests first, not just the unions' interests first. They need to put all Australians' interests first, and that includes small businesses, that includes families, that includes people that don't pay union fees, because the people that pay union fees are about 10 per cent of the workforce, not the 41 per cent of the workforce who are actually employed by small businesses who are represented by one person versus the 33 representing unions at the Skills Talk Fest held last week. Now, we know that we're not going to see any action taken by this government unless it gets sign off by the unions, that the tummy gets scratched by John Setker, and there they go and say, OK, the unions say we can do it. And I did note uh, with uh, much, much interest uh, as Senator O'Farrell's comparison between the South Australian government and the Albanese government, well, the South Australian government gave the donation of the CFMMEU uh, back after the ABCC claims became public, unlike the Albanese government. But we saw in question time again today the ministers that are responsible—we know there's only four of you because the Albanese government didn't put much weight on this chamber, so only appointed four ministers. Estimates are going to be crackingly long days and weeks for you. Uh, looking forward to them, looking forward to them. And Senator Polly, I hope we're there together. You know I like to give it a bit of interest for you. But they're just obfuscating when it comes to questions. They like to look back, the rearview mirror, it's where they're focused, because they don't have a solution. They don't have a plan. As they told us through the election campaign, they had a plan for a plan. We're just waiting to see what the plan is. They don't have a plan to address inflation, but hilariously today here they are claiming about the indexation of the pension. Well, the policy for a very long time is the pension's been indexed every six months in line with inflation. That's why it's going up so much, is because inflation is so high. In fact, the last time we had inflation this high was back in the days, and for those of us, I, unfortunately, I, I don't go back to Woomera, I don't go back as far as Senator O'Farrell, but I do go back when I was at school to the recession we had to have. That was the last time inflation was as high as it is today. The recession we had to have under Prime Minister Keating, well, I'm just looking forward to those lines coming again, because the Albanese government looks like it's insistent on emulating the failures of the Keating government. This talk, this skills fest wasn't in the way of hawk. It was a Rudd 2020 special that's going to produce a whole lot of nothing yet again. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Well, what a lot of codswallop that we have here from the opposition this afternoon. We have here, in taking note uh, of the minister's answer to the question of uh, what this government is doing in relation to inflation uh, on small business, 
we have seen from the government's own contribution to this debate an absolute reflection of the fact that they were missing in action on all of these issues while in government themselves. But as Senator Gallagher clearly outlined in the government's response, we are moving on past that wasted decade to absolutely get on with addressing this cost of living crisis. We had a wasted decade in relation to not having an energy policy for 10 years. That is 22 failed policies under the former government. That is what small business has told us. It has had real inflationary consequences because of their lack of capacity to invest with certainty in strategic direction. We are also dealing with the cost of living crisis by making submissions to the Fair Work Commission to ensure that those on the minimum wage actually get a decent pay rise. And as has been highlighted, this is something that is supported uh, by business broadly. We've seen support from COSBOA even for industrial instruments that make things simpler for them because that too will create a more stable and less complicated business environment. It will enable them to compete, to keep uh, employees uh, without needing to go into their own new rounds of bargaining. We've extended some of the pandemic payments that those opposite had ended, and we have kept them going. And this week, we will be debating, finally, our climate change bill to put in place uh, a scheme for our nation to give us some certainty around our energy and climate change future. All of these elements of uncertainty and chaos uh, propagated by the former government are absolutely seeded in the current inflation crisis. We are working to put downward pressure on our nation's uh, costs for businesses and households. We're doing this through cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, and we re uh, just announced this week in the lead up to the October budget very important announcements to support households keep up with their medication costs so that we're going from $40 a prescription down to I think it is about 32 We also have plans to deal with the skills crisis through fee-free TAFE places because we've had for years uh, a government that has absolutely failed to deal with critical workforce shortages, to deal with investment in skills and training, investment that is much needed to make sure young people, older workers and our businesses have the skills that they need for now and into the future. These are just a small handful of the things that we have done in just three months just three months, whereas those opposite ceded uh, the problems that our, our government now faces, and that is beleaguering households and small businesses right around the country. As the Prime Minister said, this government is pro-business, pro-working with business, pro-working with business to deal with the challenges that they are facing right now. We are dealing with a decade of wasted opportunity and inaction from those opposite. And they now come in here and start blaming us all Senator, for the years and Senator years Pratt, of inaction. Expired. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. And I too rise uh, to take note of the response to Senator Hume's question by Senator Gallagher. 
Well, the old expression that we all know is leopards don't change their spots. And there is nothing more certain that Labor in government never ever change their spots. They uh, talk down the economy. They're always hoping for things to go wrong and so disappointed when they don't. They make plans for having plans, and we've just heard again from the speakers opposite of all of their plans to have a plan to govern. They've got summits, they've got conferences, they've got reviews, they've got royal commissions. They have got everything they can do to prevent them from making a decision. Newsflash to those opposite. Government is difficult. Government is challenging. But in government, you have to make decisions. I'm absolutely at a loss to know what the opposition have done, what the now government did in opposition. You had many years to actually get um, across the economy, to get across COVID policy, to get across jobs policy. But it seems all you've done is talk to the trade unions in opposition and now finding many ways, instead of actually coming out and being honest, that the trade union movement is behind pretty much everything that you're now putting forward, your plans for a plan, be honest and actually just come out and say, this is what the trade union movement wants. In fact, why don't you put Sally McManus on the front bench? That would be more honest than the approach that you are now taking to deal with the cost of living uh, problems, industrial relations and many other things. Now, uh, when I say that leopards don't change their spots, I just want to read out something. And perhaps, colleagues, you might like to guess who said it and when in relation to the Labor Party. Our opponents, the Labor Party, have been destructive critics. They have politically welcomed every difficulty. They have prophesied and hoped for disasters. Depression, mass unemployment, financial collapse. These have been their gloomy political stock in trade. All their prophecies have failed. And instead of depression, we have, a record, we have a record prosperity under the Liberal government of the day. Instead of unemployment, we have a record level of employment at high wages. Instead of financial collapse, we have the highest national income on record, the largest exports and international reserves, splendid credit, buoyant loan markets and stabilised prices. Today, bitterly frustrated by the failure of Labor's past prophecies, they are struggling to raise false issues and new prejudices and to make glittering promises to distract attention from real and solid achievements. Colleagues, this was Sir Robert Menzies in 1954 talking about the Labor Party. And had I not just told you that, you would have thought it has actually been right here today in this chamber from those who now occupy the government benches. So, as I said, newsflash, government is hard. You have to make thousands and thousands of ministerial decisions every day based on the best evidence before you. You don't have a plan for a plan. You don't hold summits and wait three months for things that you could have done on day one and coming into government. Instead, you have reviewed, talked, held faux summits so you can get trade union ideas through under the guise of uh, you know, consulting uh, with very few West Australians, may I say. But let me tell you what government, good government actually looks like. Despite all of the rhetoric from those opposites now uh, you know, doing triple somersaults to try and reinvent the past, the coalition government responded quickly with the targeted cost of living package, which eased pressure on household budgets when they needed it most under our government. We provided lower taxes to around 10 million Australians received, received tax relief of uh, $1,500 when they now, today, lodging their tax returns. This includes the $420 cost of living tax offset for low and middle income earners. We delivered a $250 cost of living payment to nearly 6 million pensioners, welfare recipients, veterans and eligible concession card holders. We cut the fuel excise in half for six months, saving a family with two cars who filled up once a week at least $30 a week. We reduced the price of medicines and health costs for thousands and thousands of medicines. That is what good government looks like. So for those uh, opposites, at some point you are going to have to start making decisions, being honest about what you're doing and govern in this nation's best interest. Senator Polly. Yeah, well, I thought when we came back this week that uh, those opposite 
might have actually taken heed of what happened here uh, in this parliament last Thursday and Friday with the National uh, Jobs and Skills Summit. Now, it obviously hurts them greatly to see business, unions, NGOs and people of, uh, of community leaders coming together in the same room talking about the issues that matter to the Australian people. Now, of course, those opposite, they don't want to see things change because what they like is to see chaos and division within the community. They don't like to see the business community and small businesses talking and working with the union movement because, you know, that's not part of their script. Well, the issues have been known. We went to the election saying that we would have a job summit because it's not just this federal government's responsibility to come up with all the ideas and the solutions going forward. It needs to be one of a collected uh, acknowledgement of what the issues are and whether or not we've got the answers moving forward. But just um, one of the things that the previous government, those in opposition, part of their economic uh, plan was to stagnate wages. So they have said time and time again that was part of their plan. Well, the reality is stagnant wages does have an income impact on small businesses, which is what this question that was asked went to small businesses and the cost of living. Yes, there is high uh, um, inflation, and gee golly gosh, we've been in uh, government now for about 112 days, but you know we were supposed to forget uh, the last nine years of the Turnbull, um, Abbott and Morrison governments. There are uh, real issues with uh, standards of living in this country, but we have, to, we have to address that in a collective sense. We need to ensure that there are good, secure jobs. So to do that, we've already invested in relation to and outlined our plan for, aid, uh, for uh, childcare. We want more women back in the workforce. We want to make sure that there is uh, proper negotiation and uh, flexibility between the business community and unions in negotiating the ways forward. These are all sensible ideas, but what do we see from those opposite? Back to the old scare campaign, heavens above, if you have business and unions uh, working together, oh no, what we're going to have is strikes strikes. What a lot of nonsense. It's time to move into the 21st century. What we want to see is more sustainable investment. We want to create a sustainable economy that sees good, well-paid jobs. We want people to have the skills that's going to be needed for the future. Part of that is going to be we have to um, uh, change and open up migration so that we can bring the skills in, because even with the investment we're making in TAFE, what we're not going to be able to do is fill the jobs that are now there and need to be filled. We've got a, a new uh, problem, and it is a good problem to have. We've got more jobs than we have workers, so we're not going to be able to address that without bringing new skilled migrants into this country that will not only fill those positions but will add riches, richness to our um, culture and to our economy. But all we see from those opposite is criticism. It's like they can't just say, gee, this government is getting on with it. I mean, what we didn't see was we didn't see Mr uh, Dutton um, at the summit, but what we did see was Mr um, Littleproud, who was there, and I'd have to say making a contribution. You know, maybe he should resign from his party and join the Liberal Party so that they've got a, a leader. But I have to say, Mr 22 per cent, which is Mr Dutton, is better known as, of uh, this morning's newspaper, uh, he has a lot to learn because people in the electorates are sick and tired of the division. They want governments and oppositions and other parties to work together so that they come up with a stronger economy, more secure jobs. We have more women back in the workforce. We pay people in aged care a proper wage. Those who are looking after our youngest minds in early childhood education, we need more people investing in those jobs and we need to make sure that they are remunerated accordingly. Thank you, Senator Pauling. Senator Bragg. 
Deputy President, I must say that in rising to give note about the answers today that, uh, in my experience, it hasn't been a successful strategy for politicians to quote opinion polls. Uh, but uh, we wish you well with that, agenda, that approach. Um, the, uh, I mean, look, the, the point is that the, uh, the government so far, which won the election uh, with very few policies, uh, has gone in search of some policies, uh, and it has tried to do that by talking to a series of vested interests. And when I call this government a government for vested interests, uh, it is a serious point that I'm trying to make. One of the consequences of being a government for vested interests is that there are good ideas, good, could be some good ones, maybe some bad ones. There are good ideas that are not considered because the funnel is so small. And there have been, I think, some missed opportunities over the last seven days or so. I was surprised that there wasn't more consideration given to a small business award, a simple set of conditions that could cut across the complexity that many small businesses face in our economy. Um, I was surprised to hear the Labor Party talk about their desire to see higher wages but not consider the fact that compulsory superannuation increases eat 80 per cent of the projected wages growth in the budget. Uh, I was surprised that people didn't consider, well, maybe we could use uh, that superannuation system uh, to deliver wages growth now. Uh, I was surprised uh, that the super funds, of course, one of the strongest vested interests in this government, came to Canberra asking for another tax cut, asking for a scheme which would allow them to own all the houses, to become the landlords in Australia, where Australians would become serfs to the super funds uh, and be forced into renting for life. So those are the things that we could have had a discussion about, uh, but instead what we have seen is a series of policy initiatives designed to fill the coffers of the closest friends of the government. Now, of course, we've already seen, just in the last seven days, uh, the Attorney-General uh, announcing that he would abolish the regulation we put in place for class action lawyers, where people who are seeking redress through the court system uh, often find that the awards that they are provided by the courts are eaten up by blood-sucking class action lawyers. Uh, we also find uh, that the Assistant Treasurer, Mr Stephen Jones, on Friday afternoon makes a regulation to conceal $30 million in payments from super funds to unions uh, that are due by 2030. $30 million per annum. Uh, this is on top of the $130 or $40 million over the past 10 years. It's already been paid from the super funds into the union. So Jones, Mr Jones or Minister Jones uh, has delivered that. Uh, and then of course you see uh, Mr Jones's other uh, initiative, which is to review the best financial interest duty that the super funds face, uh, thanks to coalition reform. Now why would you want to review a best financial interest duty? Well only because you want to permit payments which are banned today. And then of course uh, the other matter, which is before the Senate later tonight, the matter of the abolition of the Building and Construction Commission, uh, which of course uh, has been a successful institution which has upheld the rule of law uh, on construction sites, which of course is a very large industry, almost 10 per cent of GDP. So again, you see payoff for the CFMEU. Um, so between the class action lawyers and the super funds and the unions, uh, you have seen the government try to, to deliver their agenda in their first 100 days. Now, we're only 100 days into this government, and eventually uh, the vested interests will run out of ideas that are in the top drawer. Uh, the big risk for the country is what's in the second drawer. Uh, it could be um, even crazier ideas. Now, again, my good friend, uh, Member for Whitlam, has already talked about 15 per cent super. Now, that would be a really good way to crash wages. Uh, but I'm sure that there are many, many other ideas 
uh, that will come from the vested interests and be facilitated by this government in the near future. Thank you. I'll, I have to put the question first, Senator Faruqi, and then I'll give you the call. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Hughes. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the government's response to my question regarding the floods in Pakistan. The scale of the floods in Pakistan is difficult to grasp. As Fahad Said, a climate impact scientist in Islamabad recently said, words like colossal, mammoth and gigantic don't do justice to the situation. 33 million people are affected. That's more than the population of Australia. Perhaps that gives you some idea of the enormity of this disaster. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Those who have seen the pictures coming out of Pakistan have seen the deadly face of this climate catastrophe. I speak to my Ammi and relatives back in Pakistan every night who are beside themselves at the death and destruction with one third of the country underwater and so many lives, livelihoods, homes and infrastructure lost. My heart, my thoughts and my duas are with those who are suffering. I've been meeting with the Pakistani-Australian community here who have come together so quickly to raise funds to support the relief and reconstruction efforts. The Pakistani community is known for its generosity and where, wherever they are, they are opening up their hearts and their wallets. I cannot say the same for the Australian government. The $2 million of aid they have committed to is in fact insulting. It is nowhere near our fair share. Australia needs to do more. The floods in Pakistan were caused by monsoon rains 10 times more severe than normal. Global warming is melting glaciers, which are worsening the floods. This is a climate-fueled disaster. The harsh reality is that disasters like this will happen again and again unless there is strong and urgent action to tackle the climate crisis. Pakistan is one of the most climate-vulnerable countries in the world, but has contributed little to the climate emergency. The people of Pakistan are paying with their lives and livelihoods for a crisis knowingly created and exacerbated by the global north. And despite multiple warnings from experts, the scientific consensus about the causes of the climate crisis, rich countries like Australia refuse to do what's necessary and stop digging up coal and gas. At the core of the crisis is the global north's rampant extractive capitalism and pursuit of incessant economic growth whatever the cost. The cost of this greed is being paid by countries and their people like Pakistan. The extreme greed is mirrored by an extreme stinginess when it comes to the consequences of that crisis. Rich countries promised finance to help poorer countries deal with, the climate, deal with climate change as a recognition of their responsibility for historic carbon emissions. But the promise of $100 billion of climate finance by 2020 has never been met. I call on the government to face the global injustice of this climate crisis and act to tackle it. And this means providing urgent aid to Pakistan, not just a mere $2 million, but a much bigger amount commensurate with Australia's historic and ongoing responsibility for the climate crisis and equivalent to the scale of the disaster. This is an issue of global justice. Aid funding and climate finance is about compensation and a debt owed for the terrible legacy of colonialism. It is not charity. It is about righting historic wrongs. And given Australia's dirty hands in producing climate changing emissions, we have a special responsibility to do everything we can for climate justice. And of course, the government must take strong, meaningful, meaningful action on climate. This means signing the Global Methane Pledge and ruling out new coal and gas projects. It is untenable to keep pouring fuel on the fire, to keep sac sacrificing the lives and livelihoods of those in poorer countries to maintain the profit margins of fossil fuel conglomerates, many of whom fill political donation buckets of both the big parties. This disaster is deeply painful and deeply personal for me. I was made in Pakistan. 
It's where I grew up, where my elders instilled in me the spirit to stand up, not just for myself, but to stand up for my community and to never stay silent in the face of injustice and unfairness. And there is no greater unfairness and no greater injustice than the climate crisis. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death of three former members of the House of Representatives. On the 27th of July 2022, of John Gaylor, a member for the Division of Leichhardt, Queensland, from 1983 to 1993. On the 19th of July 2022, of Stephen William Gibbons, a member for the Division of Bendigo, Victoria, from 1998 to 2013. And on June 17, 2022, of John Graham Mountford, a member for the Division of Banks, New South Wales, from 1980 to 1990. <laughs> Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Uh, Senator Chisholm. I give notice that on Wednesday 7 September 2022, I shall move that in accordance with section 5 of the Parliament Act 1974, the Senate approves the proposal by the National Capital Authority for capital works within the parliamentary zone relating to new construction and refurbishment works at West Block. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, I present a proposal relating to the works. Thank you. Um, I shall now. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Yeah, sorry. By Senator Askew, do it at placing of business. Which is uh, any no notices of motion for another day? No. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Brockman and Molan for the 5th to the 15th of September for personal reasons. Senator Fawcett for the 5th of September for personal reasons. And Senator Henderson for the 8th of September for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator McCarthy. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator McCarthy for today for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the eyes have it. Uh, there aren't. I'm advised there are no postponements or extensions of time, and I'm going to call Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Senate and I move that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on 30th August 2022 of Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, place on record its acknowledgement of his role in bringing the Cold War to an end and his vision for a more open and peaceful world and tenders its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. President, it is with sadness and respect that I move this condolence motion on the passing of the former president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. As a child of the harsh Russian 1930s under Stalin, Gorbachev was a man of simple background. His father and grandfathers were farmers in the early years of Soviet agrarian collectivism. 
His family life was so harsh and brutal, he later reflected, what difference was there between this life and serfdom? This early question reflected a lifelong courage to see clearly and to ask difficult questions. Nevertheless, he did not start his career as a disruptor. He was a party man and a loyal Soviet citizen. He was a brilliant student studying law at Moscow State University. While he was there, he met his wife, Raisa Titarenko, and they married in September 1953 and shared a close emotional and intellectual partnership which endured until her death in 1999. After graduation, he returned to his native Stavropol and his promise was quickly recognised and he rose through the ranks. In 1978, Gorbachev moved back to Moscow to take the position of Central Committee Secretary. Then, in 1985, he took leadership as General Secretary. His three immediate predecessors had all died in office within the preceding four years. The Soviet ruling class was ageing, and it had failed to confront the growing reality of economic mismanagement and an arms race of the United States that the Soviet Union could no longer afford. Gorbachev, by contrast, was a relatively young man in his 50s. And more importantly, he recognised that the Soviet Union was not serving its citizens and needed to change. Throughout his leadership, Mikhail Gorbachev was the, the defining figure in opening up Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Glasnost, Perestroika, Mikhail Gorbachev became synonymous with the processes of reform, openness, transparency and reconstruction he drove and inspired across Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And at a time that mutually assured destruction was accepted strategic doctrine, Mr. Gorbachev had the courage to reject this nightmare and work towards nuclear arms reduction, earning for himself deservedly the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. From Stalin onwards, the Soviet Union had been built on brutal, unforgiving power, on repression, on force, on lies, and on the denial of individual liberty, all sacrificed in pursuit of the ends of the state. Ultimately, it was a fragile and crumbling edifice which did not withstand the scrutiny and transparency brought by the Glasnost reforms. When the first people power revolution swept from East Germany out towards the rest of the Soviet bloc, the Soviet Union began to fall apart, crippled in part by its legacy of corrupt economic management and by the lies it had told its citizens. At that juncture, President Gorbachev made the critical decision, and one utterly unpredicted by any glance through Russian history, to let power go. There are those, including the current Russian president, who see this decision as a moment of weakness, but it was an act of profound courage, an act of profound strength. Today, as we witness the weakness and insecurity that underlies Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, we can see just how extraordinary President Gorbachev's choices were. Our challenge then and now is to strive for progress and peace. Our challenge is to reject the logic that seeks to force one nation's will over another. Instead, to resolve our differences and to grapple with complex global issues like climate change, strategic competition, post-COVID economic recovery, and all of the above and more, and to do so peacefully through dialogue, negotiation, compromise, hard work, and respect, through openness and accountability to our citizens for the world we are seeking to create in their name. In the end, that is the lesson we can take from the life of Mikhail Gorbachev. In the end, we always have a cho choice about how we approach the issues we face and what we do with the moments with which we are presented. On behalf of the Australian Government, I wish to place on record my respect for this extraordinary life and career. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, I rise in support of the motion moved by the Leader of the Government in the Senate and to associate coalition parties with the words and sentiments expressed by the Leader of the Government in the Senate. There can be no doubt that Mikhail Gorbachev was one of the towering figures of his era and one of the most significant world leaders of the 20th century. The importance of his role 
in bringing to an end the Cold War, which had cast a shadow over the world for half a century, cannot be understated. As one editorial opined, on assuming leadership, Mikhail Gorbachev assiduously turned his attention to one Herculean chore, dismantling the machinery of repression that his predecessors had so proudly and methodically erected. Mikhail Gorbachev was the first leader from the East able to work with leaders of the West after what had been decades of distrust and military threat. The fact that Mr Gorbachev could work to overcome this history of distrust through his relationship with then US President Ronald Reagan and with other world leaders reflected his commitment to his people and their own hopes for a more positive future. It was his meeting with then UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in London in 1984 which prompted the then British leader to declare of Mr Gorbachev that, I like Mr Gorbachev, we can do business together. That marked the beginning of the West's recognition of Mikhail Gorbachev as a new brand of Kremlin leader, a leader with whom the West did indeed do business, and meaningful business at that. In what many have described as a breathtaking series of reforms, Mr Gorbachev lifted the Iron Curtain that had drawn a line between the East and the West, freeing a continent from totalitarian rule. He secured agreement on disarmament treaties, notably nuclear disarmament with Cold War enemies. He freed political prisoners and allowed exiles to return home. He allowed his people, for the first time, to hear foreign news when he ordered an end to the jamming of foreign radio broadcast frequencies. He liberalised the arts and swept away decades of ideological restraint. And it was Mikhail Gorbachev who introduced free elections. Just consider how foreign that concept was to the people across the USSR at the time he did so. It were these very reforms that would ultimately give states in Eastern Europe the impetus in the years that followed to break free of Moscow. Mr Gorbachev will, to the world outside of the old USSR, be remembered as a reformer who brought greater openness to his country through policies the names of which are intrinsically linked to the man, a new era of openness through Glasnost and of economic restructuring through Perestroika. As Mr Gorbachev himself said in 1988 of his reforms, the winds of the Cold War are being replaced by the winds of hope. For indeed they were. For his work, especially in the reunification of Germany and the pursuit of nuclear disarmament, Mikhail Gorbachev was rightly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. His reforms became household terms and brought an awareness across the globe to the history of the states of the USSR and to the repression of generations. People across the former Soviet, former Soviet states seized the opportunity to reclaim their own nationhood, reflective of their own independent histories, languages and cultures. Thanks to Mikhail Gorbachev, they were able to do so without fear of military retribution. Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians leading the way to an independence that ultimately all 15 former Soviet states would seize. The relatively peaceful dismantling of the USSR and the relatively successful development of a number of the former Soviet states stand as a powerful legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev. However, in the end, not all of his reforms have been enduring. Many were more popular outside his own country than they were within. Despite that, Mr Gorbachev's commitment to his people and to those across former Soviet states was never diminished. Nor had his relationship with the world leaders and champions of democracy who were able to work with Mr Gorbachev towards peace in a part of the world to which the concept had become alien cast aside. The failure of a bid for Russian president in 1996 it did not dampen his commitment to causes he held dear. He continued his global work, including a focus 
on environmental causes. For anyone who was witness to the Gorbachev era, the strength of his relationship with his wife, Rosa, was abundantly clear, as was the extent of his grief at her death from leukaemia back in 1999. It has to be said, as we in the Australian Senate today pay tribute to a reformist leader, just how stark Mikhail Gorbachev's vision of the USSR contrasts to what we see today in Russia, both domestically and through its unlawful invasion of Ukraine. Mikhail Gorbachev died just days after Ukraine's 31st Independence Day, and sadly, also days after the six-month anniversary of Russia's attempted full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In the days following the death of Mr Gorbachev, it was reported that he was dismayed by the new area of Russian authoritarianism, of military aggression, and the overturning of media, religious and other freedoms that he had helped deliver for the Russian people. Having fought so hard to bring glasnost to the Russian people and those across the old USSR, it must have been particularly devastating to see Russia positioned now as being at least, if not even more, distrusted, isolated and seen as a disruptor on the world stage than it was before Mikhail Gorbachev's reign as its leader. While it is a sad reflection that these current events make Mr Gorbachev's work towards peace in Eastern Europe and across the globe seem even more elusive, we should not forget his achievements. The peaceful establishment of many nations, the reduction of many nuclear warheads, and a significant period of greater peace, stability and openness are legacies that Mikhail Gorbachev should be remembered for. And while not all hopes from 30 years ago have been realised, it is these challenges which remain that makes it more important than ever that we honour the life and contribution of the reformist Mikhail Gorbachev and that we all continue to strive for the peace that he worked for. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. The Australian Greens join in expressing our condolence for the death of former President Mikhail Gorbachev. Mr Gorbachev worked to cultivate constructive relationships with international counterparts to address the nuclear brinkmanship and reduce the political and military tensions at the heart of the Cold War. His approach stands in stark contrast to the warmongering we see from some current leaders, beating the drums of war with little regard for the human toll. In particular, Mr Gorbachev's work on nuclear weapons should be commended. At the Reykjavik summit, summit in 1986, he championed an agreement led by the US and the Soviet Union to dismantle their nuclear weapons and undertake sweeping reforms of nuclear arms control. If this had succeeded, the world would have had a great opportunity to create a world free of nuclear weapons. Instead, we are still facing nuclear armed states. The Reykjavik summit was a watershed moment and the first time that the US and the Soviet Union discussed international issues with diplomacy and a real desire for improvement. Reflection on Mr Gorbachev's legacy is a moment to reflect that nuclear disarmament is within reach as long as political leaders have the courage to make tough decisions. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. And I rise to associate the National Party um, with this condolence motion and the comments made to the chamber today. It's difficult for anyone born post the 1980s to comprehend what the world was like pre the collapse of the Soviet Union or to convey to those who did not live through the Cold War era just how awful it was. This was a world that lived for decades on the edge of a nuclear holocaust. A world threatened by an empire propped up by twin methodologies of terror and lies, by KBG agents and armies of informers whose task it was to crush all opposition to the official party line. It was deeply contradictory and a troubled political system. The Soviet Union was responsible for the hyperacceleration of an unhinged international arms race, and yet it could not provide even the basic provisions for its citizens on its supermarket shelves. Perhaps it was inevitable that such a system would eventually collapse. Yet history shows, however, that one man almost single-handedly precipitated that collapse, Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev came to power in 1985 and he was 53 years of age. This was decades younger than most of his comrades in the Politburo and a very stark contrast to his octogenarian predecessors. Gorbachev was the eighth and last leader of the Soviet Union 
successor to Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, Tunenko. So young was Gorbachev that in the 1980s he was given global rock star status. Gorbachev was the leader for six short years until 1991. As General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev embarked on a remarkable program of reform that was based on two extraordinary ideas, perestroika, the restructuring of the political and economic system, and glasnost, the end of censorship and the introduction of free speech. Gorbachev was an adherent to Marxist Leninism, but during his leadership moved the Soviet Union towards social democracy. His achievements included withdrawal from the war in Afghanistan, liberating the Soviet satellite states in East Central Europe that included the unification of Germany and reducing nuclear arms. As one obituary writer in the New York Times stated last week, few leaders in the 20th century, indeed any century, have had such a profound effect on their time. And in little more than six tumultuous years, Mr Gorbachev lifted the Iron Curtain, decisively altering the political climate of the world. At home, he promised and delivered greater openness as he set out to restructure his country's society and faltering economy. It was not his intention to liquidate the Soviet Empire, but within five years of coming to power, he presided over the dissolution of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. As history shows, the economic reforms Gorbachev set in place proved to be greatly flawed. Perestroika proved a catastrophe and became synonymous for chaos, corruption and dislocation that accompanied the country's turbulent transition to a market economy in the 1990s. Privatisation resulted in vast state assets being taken over by uh, Russian oligarchs, many of whom still control them today, while a devastating earthquake in Armenia, uh, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, combined with, ironically, a deep fall in the price of oil, impoverished the country and sunk Gorbachev's popularity. Gorbachev's time of triumph was short-lived. In 1990, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in recognition of his outstanding services as a reformer and who greatly contributed change for the better nature of the world development. In 1991, a referendum confirming the breakup of nations that made up the Soviet Empire was approved by more than three quarters of those who voted. But a few months later, a coup was launched against him. And during the standoff, Gorbachev was forced to step down and Boris Yeltsin took power. This um, outcome was first uh, alluded to uh, by our own Paul Kelly in The Australian in 1987, commenting uh, on Bob Hawke, the then Prime Minister's visit um, to Russia during this time, where he said, in short, Mr Gorbachev has greater obstacles. First, he faces political reactionaries, with a majority of the Politburo being appointees by his predecessors, and secondly, he faces the dead weight of the Soviet bureaucracy which only knows Soviet central planning. The great irony of the passing of Gorbachev last week, age 91, is that uh, he is despised by many Russians today. As several commentators have noted, it would be hard today to find a Russian who remembers him positively, much less the brave and heroic way he is perceived in the West. Many Russians, like Vladimir Putin, long for a lost empire and believe Gorbachev was the person who destroyed the might of the Soviet state. In fact, Putin has described Gorbachev era as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. To Russian liberals, on the other hand, Gorbachev was the leader who failed to set its successor in the right direction. When he visited Australia in 2006, Gorbachev said in an interview, when I was in office, I never regarded Australia as just a satellite of the US. Of course, the policies of the Australian government could give that impression, but we regarded Australia as an important country, as a wealthy country, as a country with which we wanted to have a better relationship, and that is still my opinion. While the Soviet Empire is no more, some of the more abominable aspects of that regime have re-emerged in recent years. Indeed, while entire empires can fall, dangerous and destructive ideologies have a habit of re-emerging. The invasion of the Ukraine is, in part, an attempt to reverse the loss of status felt in post-Cold War Russia by the disintegration of the Soviet Union that occurred under Gorbachev. And in the West, including in Australia, we're experiencing neo-Marxist novelties re-emerging in the form of challenges to personal and national freedoms, challenges to the free expression of ideas and opinions, threats to true academic freedom, freedom of religion, and to the right to practice your faith and bring your children up in that faith. We on this side of parliament, and I hope across parliament, especially in the nationals, adhere to certain 
invaluable values of freedom, respect, fairness, equality of opportunity and private property rights. Mikhail Gorbachev was the last of the great leaders of the last century, and as such we honour his contribution, known as the great facilitator to a more peaceful, secure world, as well as to individual freedom. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. Thank you, Senators. We are proceeding to formal business. We're just waiting for the Deputy President. I shall now proceed to the, to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Senator Wilson, I give you thank, the call. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the senator. Um, I move the motion. Is, is that motion to be agreed to? Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 13, proposing the introduction of, of, of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection. I call the senator. Thank you. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, 1999, and for related purposes. Is that to be agreed to? Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator. Thank you. I present the bill, otherwise known as the Climate Trigger Bill, and move that this bill may now proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. Senator. I move the bill and I move that this bill be now read a second time and seek leave to table my explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is, is leave granted? Leave is granted. I table the explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have my second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 33 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rennick proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 15 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I count for senators. Five. I noted I didn't count. <laughs> I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Rennick, I give you Thank the call. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, and I'm very pleased to rise to speak to this today. Because standing up for workers, there's nothing uh, motivates me more than standing up for the hard-working people of this country. And let me tell you that if we bring back uh, multi-pattern and bargaining in this country, it will be a job killer. And we do not want to see our hard-working battlers 
lose their jobs in this country. And just as importantly, we don't want to see our small businesses shut down. And believe you me, this is an attack on small business by the usual suspects, the big end of town, the big unions and the big corporations who want to drive true innovation and entrepreneurship out of this country. Because if there's one thing that the Labor Party love, it's command and control. And that is exactly what this uh, you know, issue is all about, is having unions dictate to small businesses what sort of rules that they can have in place. Now, I want to be very clear about this. That when it comes to union membership, I'm 100 per cent behind union membership. I'm making these comments directed at the union elites, the same union elites who sit there year after year and call for superannuation rises. I mean, we've already had uh, uh, members in the other place call for a rise in superannuation of 15 per cent in the second term if Labor were to be re-elected. I'd love to know exactly what low-income earners are meant to be actually taking home in their pay if 15 per cent of their money is going off into superannuation. But make no mistake that this will hurt industry, especially small business, at a time when they cannot afford it. And that will re result in job losses and it's going to result in potentially more strikes. Now we know that what we saw what happened in the early 2000s when there were basically patent and bargaining in this country, and the Productivity Commission has noted that the estimated cost of lost production from two industrial disputes across the automotive industry the year before was up to $630 million. $630 million. And we don't, do we really want to go into the history of the car manufacturing in this sector and how basically uh, inflexible labour laws were a part of the reason, not the only reason. I've, I've got my own little beef to grind with uh, withholding taxes uh, as well. No, 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 no. This all started. Thank you very much for the interjection, Senator Green. Uh, this all started way back in 1986 to 1988 under the Button Plan, where the Button Plan that was introduced by the Hawke Keating government actually destroyed manufacturing. And it was destroyed manufacturing in this country, most notably in Victoria. Now, that, that was great because what they did straight after that, what Labor did straight after that, they brought the Dawkins plan in. So they destroyed the manufacturing sector, right, and then they, they pumped money, they subsidised the university sector. So now we've got degrees on gender diversity and all this sort of stuff, when we should be putting more money back in the TAFE and getting people back in the real jobs. You know, one of the things that was completely overlooked in last week's job summit was the fact that effectively the first jobs you want to fill in this country are those jobs in your primary industries. Okay? Your farmers and your miners, that's where your true wealth comes from. Then you, once you've got those jobs filled up, then you work on your secondary industries. You go to your manufacturing industries. Yet in this country, the Labor Party and the Greens do everything they can to destroy the primary and secondary industries. Well, let me tell you, it is the primary and secondary industries, those jobs, manufacturing, farming, mining, that create the wealth to then feed the people and help employ people in the services industry. Right? So if we want to actually rebuild this country, there needs to be much more focus on getting back into primary production, uh, mining and manufacturing. Okay? And, that, and, I, and I'm an unashamed protectionist. I, I put my flag to the mask in my maiden speech when I called out Deakin and Barton, the first two prime ministers in this country, who are protectionists. Because this, and, I'll, and I'll be honest here, this neoliberalism that, ironically enough, was introduced by the Hawke-Keating government okay, has basically lowered the barriers of the nation-state to where now okay, we've offshored just about all of our productive jobs in this country offshore. So it is incredibly important that if we're to rebuild jobs in this country that we maintain flexibility in the workplace. Now, I totally support minimum working conditions and, and fair conditions for the worker. I want to be very clear about that. I myself come from you know, a multi-generational blue-collar family. Right? But the reason why I'm on this side of the chamber is that I believe in the individual worth, dignity and worth of every individual and people having the flexibility to make their own decisions. And I can tell you what, the Labor Party that used to believe in that, we know they don't believe that anymore. They went and introduced compulsory superannuation. They never put that to the vote, did they? And we know why they didn't, because in 1997, when New Zealand put compulsory superannuation to the vote, they lost it 92 per cent to eight. 
Because do you think if Paul Keating in 1992 had said to everyone, oh, look, by 2020 we're going to take 10 per cent of your wages, give it to someone you've never met, and you may or may not get it back when you're 60, and there's no capital guarantee that you're going to get it back, do you think the people would have voted for it? Of course not. Of course not. And what if this superannuation, what has this superannuation ended up funding? I'll tell you what it's funded. It's funded the privatisation of our sovereign infrastructure. Right? So either Macquarie Bank owns it or the foreign offshore companies own it. Okay? And we're now paying through the nose for toll roads and services. Our energy grid is on the verge of collapse because we've basically had rent-seeking privateers okay, in the superannuation industry. In the super energy, we're always whinging they want more handouts, more handouts. Climate change is just this, this big virtue signalling distraction for the rent seekers in the private sector to be milking our, uh, basically uh, our essential services dry. Right? So, like I said, yet again, we have to maintain flexibility in the workplace. We have to let our small business flourish. And they are not going to be able to flourish if they've got unions breathing down their throat and out be over and beyond you know, fair working pay, minim minimum award conditions, forcing one set of rules from one industry onto another industry with another set of working conditions that are completely different to everyone else. To everyone else. I tell you what, this is not what we want in this country. This is not what we want in this country. We should be trying to get Australians back into jobs, in particular those Australians who exercise their right in a, in a free democratic country not to take up a jab, which has been proven to be ineffective—10 million cases by August 22. Don't think it works. Sorry, but that's the facts. Okay, we've got hundreds of thousands, or potentially hundreds of thousands, of workers out of work here in Australia. And what does this lot on the other side do? The Labor movement want to do? They want to increase immigration to push out Australian workers who chose their democratic right to choose what goes into their body. And I heard you know, um, a lady, a minister in the other place say uh, last week, oh, we're going to bring in nurses you know, because we've got a, a nursing shortage. Well, maybe we've actually got a nursing shortage because this side of the chamber continues to push out people like nurses and teachers, if they're not being vilified, out of work. So I suggest before we start talking about bringing in you know, rigid working conditions that are going to make it very difficult for small business, why you want to start a small business in this country with, with you know, the Labor movement, with the big unions and their bullying tactics and their coercion via mandates. Where were they with the mandates? They ran a mile. They ran a mile. They do not believe in free choice. They do not believe in free choice. They don't believe in quality assurance. It's all about our way or the highway. Will heaven help us if we have the Labor Party getting in charge, of the, in, in, in charge of industrial relations in this country. Even the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd knocked back patent and bargaining uh, in 2007. They didn't even go that far. But we know that the Prime Minister of the day, you know, he comes from the far, far, far left. Okay? If any further left, he'd fall off the edge of the planet. But that's how far left he is. And he's done a very good job of hiding his Marxist tendencies and everything like that. But don't you worry. He will be totally behind the whole, you, you will uh, be happy and own nothing. And he's going to do that through basically sending small business broke. Everything's going to come back and being state-owned. And while I believe sovereign infrastructure should be state-owned, I certainly don't believe that is the case in the private sector. Our small business are the true capitalists in this country, not the guys in big corporations now who are controlled by the union funds. Over 20 per cent of all of our major blue chips now controlled by industry funds. They all have one proxy advisor. Yet again, you know, they've centralised power into the hands of a few inner city urban elites who wouldn't know the difference between a Brigalona box tree or hematite and magnetite. No, 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 they wouldn't know where the wealth in this country comes from, but they're more than happy to set down a whole new bunch of rules in this country and laws in this country that are going to drive small business broke and are going to actually send hard-working Australians back home, in the gutter, without a job. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, here we go with the scaremongering from those opposite, and it's clear that they are deeply embarrassed about the record years of low wage growth under their former government 
and are suffering what I would call complete FOMO about refusing to turn up to the Jobs and Skills Summit. But this MPI gives me a chance to talk about how successful the Jobs and Skills Summit was and what were the outcomes that have, has been led to. Uh, given the Liberal Party's refusal to play a constructive role, they might have missed some of the positive outcomes that were agreed to at the summit. This includes a uh, massive investment in free fee TAFE, an income credit for pensioners who want to get into the workforce, a fix for visa backlog and fairer updates to the parental leave provisions. This government was also able to secure positive guiding principles for a new way forward on workplace relations, because at the Jobs and Skills Summit, this government got everybody around the table. Businesses, unions and government agreed to work productively together to revitalise a culture of creativity, productivity, good faith negotiations and genuine agreement in workplace laws. That is what those opposite are opposed to, working productively together to revitalise creativity, productivity and genuine agreement in Australia's workplace laws. Last week, the Jobs and Skills Summit showed us what good government can do. This side of the chamber demonstrated what is possible when we approach problems with curiosity rather than obstinance. We have highlighted that there is nothing to be feared by governing in a way that invites a range of perspectives, even disagreement at times, but to always do so with respect. We saw that despite the scare campaign from those opposite, there is nothing to be feared in breaking bread with people who don't talk, look or act like you do. At the, same, at the Jobs and Skills Summit, we demonstrated that Australians are hungry for cooperation in the name of national interest. Obviously, there is detail that we need to consult on, and we are committed to do that. But I know that the Albanese Labor government has the stamina to settle and deliver on the principles agreed to at the summit. And I'm excited to get to work on the reforms that I know will one day mean that people in this country will have higher wages. The challenge our Jobs and Skills Summit undertook was to address these very vast and significant issues. It is very clear that the former government is embarrassed about the low wage growth over nine long years in government and is now trying to mobilise a fear campaign about plans to get wages moving again. The truth is it was never harder to get a pay rise than under the previous government, and that has to change. In Australia, minimum standards are set by the Fair Work Commission, and if you want a wage increase above the legal minimum, you must bargain with your employer for it. In order to get a pay rise, workers in particular workplaces have to go through a complicated and lengthy process called enterprise bargaining. There are very long and technical steps that workers and their employers must go through to secure an enterprise bargaining agreement. And currently, workers are only able to bargain workplace to workplace. This system has brought in over 30 years ago, and both workers and employers are saying that it is no longer fit for purpose. And certainly, at the roundtables that I held in the lead up to the summit in Mariba, in Cairns, and in Townsville, that is exactly what I was hearing from employers and workers alike that something needed to be done to improve the complexity of this system. Enterprise bargaining was introduced at a time when workplaces had many more workers and giving them more power to bargain for good wages and conditions. Only one in every seven workers is currently covered by an EBA, meaning most workers aren't receiving regular wage rises. For those lucky, one in seven, the system still isn't delivering, and it didn't deliver under nine years of the Liberal National Party. Workplaces are much smaller than they were when enterprise bargaining was introduced, meaning workers have fewer resources and power to bargain on, even, on an even footing with their employers. Workers and businesses are calling for multi-employer bargaining. It's nothing to be afraid of. Those opposite will try to create a scare campaign around it. But the Australian Union Movement, the representative organisation for small businesses, COSBOA, have come together to put forward sensible reform that allows for collective bargaining to take the most appropriate form for industry that it is serving. 
Multi-employer bargaining allows workers who do the same job across multiple employers to bargain together for wage increases. Now, I'll give you an example of this because I know that there will be a lot of misinformation coming from the other side of this chamber. But for example, every child care centre in Australia has their own set of wages and conditions, and under a employer bargaining, multi-employer bargaining model, all early childhood educators could possibly come together beyond their own centre and bargain for an industry-wide increase. There is no denying that childcare workers are some of our lowest paid workers, and yet they do some of the most important work. It boggles the mind how those opposite could be opposed to an instrument that would lead to wage rises for some of our lowest paid, highly feminised workforces. More people means more power, which improves our chances of winning good wages and conditions for lower paid workers. It is also good for business because the current EBA process means employers have to fork out big sums of money to consultancies to navigate a complex system. This would make it easier for both workers and employers to negotiate and settle fair wage increases. The proposal which has come from the ACTU but also from business uh, um, opens up the prospect of wage growth and collective bargaining for thousands more workers. Surely, surely those opposite could not be opposed to more workers in our economy getting a wage increase. It is a critical step in tackling the wage crisis because when more workers and employers are able to bargain for wage increases, the earning capacity of working Australians continues to grow. Labor continues to maintain that a fair day's wage for a fair day's work is a core value of ours, and we will always stand up to it. And despite the scaremongering of those opposite, we will always stand here proudly representing unions and union members. There is no amount of intimidation that those opposite can level out that would make us step away from those values. Because let's be clear who those opposite are talking about when they're speaking about unions. Union members are frontline workers, and a majority of them are women. Nurses are union members. Teachers are union members. Aged care workers are union members. Cleaners, pilots, bus drivers, these are all union members. And it's highly likely that the very people that were hailed as heroes by those opposite during the pandemic hold a union ticket. Even our sporting heroes are union members. The Matildas are a fantastic football team and a national icon. They are union members and they took collective action. They went on strike so that they could get equal pay and they delivered a historic pay deal which is unique to this part of the world. Look, union members don't take legal protected industrial action lightly, and when they do, they do it because they've exhausted every other avenue available to them. On the rare occasion that union members take the long, complex and difficult step of collective action, it is because they have taken exhaustive legal steps to get there. But don't let the other side of this chamber fool you. It was collective action that won a 38-hour week. It won annual leave. It won health and safety standards that make sure that when we go home in the same condition we arrived in at work. Chances are, if your job has good wages and conditions, you have a union member to thank for that. It is finally time for those opposite to stop the conflict, build a consensus, Come together with us on this to solve the challenges that our country is facing. That is how we will get wages moving again in this country, because every Australian worker deserves a seat at the table and every Australian worker deserves fair wages and fair conditions. Thank you, Senator. Senator Orman Pang. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this motion as a proud unionist. Unions are essential to the protection and advancement of workers' rights in this country. They ensure that the economic, social and environmental interests of workers are protected. 
All Australian workers should have a fair pay for fair work, but the reality is that many workers are falling through the gaps of our industrial relations system because they have been hamstrung by successive governments who have denied them the right to collectively bargain across sectors. The assertion that industry-wide bargaining would result in large parts of the Australian economy being shut down is nothing but a scare tactic. The Coalition's attempt to make unions and the rights of workers their political punching bag should be strongly rejected. It is a sentiment that is inherently damaging to the rights of Australian workers. But this is to be expected from an opposition that is out of ideas and out of energy. All they know how to do is run scare campaigns and attack workers. The lack of creativity is truly breathtaking. But we shouldn't be surprised. This run-of-the-mill stuff from the Liberals and Nationals who have not had an approach to workplace relations in their history that doesn't involve deliberately making wages stagnate and trampling on working people. The Greens are in agreement with the ACTU on the need for the implementation of industry-wide bargaining, and we welcome the commitment by the government to its reintroduction. All the evidence shows that enterprise agreements negotiated by unions result in better pay and conditions for workers. We want to see more workers covered by these agreements and more workers being represented by their union. Union membership has been dropping for too many years. Today, only 14 per cent of employees are members of trade unions and less in the private sector. This drop in union membership is a direct result of deliberate policy by successive governments dismantling legislative support for unions, restrictions on organising and forcing workers to negotiate individually with their employers. Today we see a continued lack of political commitment to encouraging the increase of union membership. Even this morning the Prime Minister refused to commit to encouraging increased union membership. As head of the so-called Workers' Party, his lack of support for union participation is disappointing. Falling membership and decreased collective bargaining power only serves to negatively affect Australians' living standards. We need stronger unions today. Unions are their members. When the coalition and big business denigrate unions, they are in fact attacking working people. Today, more women than men are members of unions. Industry-wide bargaining is particularly important and relevant for employees in traditionally female-dominated industries. The face of modern unionism has changed and increasingly union members are frontline workers in aged care, early childhood education and teaching. In that sense, I am perhaps the archetypal union thug, and I have been a proud union thug for 30 years. By improving the bargaining power of workers, we are not going to see the Australian economy being shut down as a result of strike action, as Senator Rennick has asserted. It says a lot about the Liberal and National Party's lack of understanding about what matters to Australians that this is their primary focus. Increasingly, we are seeing industries such as early childhood education and aged care being eroded as workers leave these sectors due to inadequate wages. Improving worker pay in sectors such as early childhood education and aged care would go a long way towards improving the current gender-based economic inequity in, inequity in Australia and ensuring that the deficiencies in workers' wages do not force them into a cost-of-living crisis. In focusing on the potential for strikes as the predominant issue facing our economy, Senator Rennick has demonstrated once again how the Liberals side with corporations rather than working people. Australians need wage rises now to deal with the increasing cost of living. Access to industry-wide bargaining is an essential element to ensure Australians' wages continue increasing to meet the demands of inflation and prevent a cost-of-living crisis. This is why the adoption of industry-wide bargaining is so important. Instead of being scared of the potential for strikes, we should be scared of the impacts the cost-of-living crisis will have on Australians. Fearing strikes cannot be the perennial reason for a lack of support for union strength, increasing union membership and expanding workers' rights. Stronger unions are an essential part of ensuring all workers receive equ equitable wages and fair working conditions. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm going to take issue with what the previous speaker has just said, because Australia cannot afford a backward step 
to the past. Anybody who lived through the 1970s and the 1980s would remember that there wasn't a risk of an economy-wide shutdown. There was action taken in support of economy-wide shutdowns. And it would appear that this is something that is missed by so many on the other side. Without a doubt, the deal that has been done between the Albanese Labor government and the ACTU well and truly shows that under Mr Albanese as Prime Minister of Australia, the Australian Labor Party are beholden nothing more and nothing less to the union movement. But what is worse is that they're actually paying back their paymaster. Because when you look at the threat of damaging industrial action, because that's exactly what this is designed to do, the Albanese government is about to deliver that in full to Australians. Because anybody who understands the history of the Industrial Relations Act would understand that this type of behaviour was actually ruled out and made illegal by the former Keating government. And in fact, even former Labor prime ministers, in Prime Minister Rudd and Prime Minister Gillard, even they recognised the need to ensure that this type of behaviour did not return. Even former Labor prime ministers, Prime Minister Gillard and Prime Minister Rudd, and they were pressed by the ACTU at the time, they were pressed by the, the union movement, but they stood their ground. They stood their ground and they refused to capitulate. Why? Because they understood that the last thing that Australia needed under their former Labor governments was a return to the dark old days of economy-wide shutdowns. And again, what is conveniently missed by those opposite in this debate is that under Labor's Fair Work Act, so that's the Fair Work Act that was put together under the former Rudd and Gillard governments, multi-employer bargaining is actually allowed. Two employers can get together if they want, and they can actually bargain for an enterprise agreement. What they also forget to tell the Australian people is that under Labor's Fair Work Act, the act that they're now saying is just not working, well, they certainly didn't say that the last time they were in government, there is also a low-paid bargaining stream in the Fair Work Act. And again, what that does is permits multi-employer bargaining for low-paid workers. So despite everything that those opposite are saying, the Fair Work Act, Labor's Fair Work Act, as it currently stands, the act that they designed already allows multi-employer bargaining and already allows multi-employer bargaining for low-paid workers. And in fact, when you look at why, under the former Labor government, this was actually inserted, the stream was designed for sectors such as the aged care and community services, the very sectors that the ACTU constantly refers to in arguing for an industry bargaining system. So you do then need to ask yourself, well, hey, hold on. If Labor's Fair Work Act, the Fair Work Act that was put in place by the former Labor government, at this point in time currently allows for multi-employer bargaining, but also has the ability for employers to get together in terms of the low-paid bargaining stream, why is Labor making announcements with the ACTU that they would actually like to introduce multi-employer bargaining? Because we know, under the current streams, you can't take strike action. So the only change that Labor are putting forward under the guise of allowing this type of bargaining, because it is already allowed under the Fair Work Act, is to acquiesce to their paymasters, the Australian Union movement, and to allow industrial action, economy-wide shutdowns, under the Albanese government. So, for those who lived through the dark old days of the 70s and 80s, you will recall that during those periods of time, when the industrial action was actually unlawful, but that did not stop people, you had general strikes, you had airline strikes, you had public transport strikes, you had beer strikes, you had waterfront strikes, and you also had retail strikes. 
When Mr Albanese says that I would like to deliver full employment, real wage increases and productivity gains, and that is what the summit is going to deliver, Blind Freddie can actually tell you that full employment, real wage increases and productivity gains are not going to be realised if the Albanese government legislates the ACTU's demands for sector-wide bargaining. You'll also be able to have sympathy strikes. So you can actually have all sorts of workplaces that have no relationship whatsoever with those who are seeking to go out on strike. They will be able to go on strike. So in my home state of Perth, you could have workers in New South Wales taking industrial action and workers in Perth will be able to go on strike in support of them. You tell me, a business that is forced to close because its workers are on strike, how does that deliver full employment? How does that deliver real wage increases? How does that deliver productivity gains? Because ultimately, that is what Mr Albanese said the summit would deliver. And yet all we have seen so far is a talk fest, is a glorified networking event, and then some window dressing for decisions that by and large have already been made by the Albanese government to appease their union paymasters. And on that note, it is a fact that unions currently represent less than 10 per cent of the private sector workforce. And yet when you look at how many of them were invited to the summit, they had around 33 seats at the summit table. And yet small businesses who on any analysis represent the backbone of the Australian economy, they are well and truly the job makers of our economy. They represent 41 per cent of our workforce. Australians might be interested to know they had one seat, one seat at the table. So despite all of the rhetoric that we are hearing from Prime Minister Albanese, I'm pro-worker, I'm pro-employer, small businesses representing 41 per cent of our workforce had one seat at the summit. And unions who represent less than 10 per cent of the private sector workforce had over 25 per cent of the seats at the summit. In life, it's a very simple equation. A business that has to close employs no one. And that is what we are going to see if and when Labor go down the path of legislating the ACTU's demands of industry-wide bargaining. Imagine the impact that strikes will have on supply chains. Supply chains under the Albanese government will be absolutely crushed. What happens when you destroy a supply chain? It leads to instability in workplaces. When you have instability in workplaces, what do you end up with? Higher unemployment, less profitability within businesses and a negative impact all over the Australian economy. What are families and businesses looking for out of the Albanese government? They're actually looking for a plan to address the rising cost of living. And yet what they have been given by the Albanese government is a government that is showing they're actually not interested in addressing the rising costs of living because even after 100 days, we still have not seen anything concrete put forward that would do just that. But what we have seen is that they are more than happy to capitulate to and entertain the outrageous demands from the ACTU. And as I said, under this government, general strikes, airline strikes, public transport strikes, beer strikes, waterfront strikes and retail strikes. That is what they are going to deliver to the Australian people. That is not a plan to address the cost of living. Senator Chisholm. 
You have the call. Uh, thanks, Adam, Acting Deputy President. And I must say, I thought Senator Rennick's contribution was going to be the most unhinged part of this debate, but Senator Cash well and truly uh, took over from that. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU, who are in here, and uh, Robert from the ASU as well, um, who I, I gather are here to hear uh, Senator White's first speech, and a really good unionist, some, someone who will add uh, fantastic, will make a fantastic contribution to the Senate at the same time. Um, but there's plenty of things I'm happy about the election win. Um, obviously, being in government and having the opportunity to change the country is significant, but I'm also pleased that the opposition kept Senator Cash in that portfolio. It is a real reminder to workers whose side is on, who's on the workers' side in this chamber. And I think if you went to Australians and said, what was the last election about? What was really a significant thing? What did Albo really stand for in the election campaign? And that was he wanted to see workers get a pay rise. And he was attacked for that by the now opposition. He was attacked for that in the media. But if you look at our record in what we have done in government, that is absolutely what we are focused on. The first act of the, of the Albanese Labor cabinet was to support a wage rise for those on the minimum wage. We've also seen now a commitment when it comes to aged care workers uh, and support for them to get a wage rise as well uh, once that decision is made. So, there is absolutely no doubt for the Australian people, and it's only further emphasised by the unhinged attack we've seen from the opposition to the Jobs and Skills Summit, that they still just don't get it, that we are on the side of workers, we're proud to be on the side of workers, and we want to deliver for workers um, as part of an Albanese Labor government. And it also shows that they have learnt nothing from the election campaign. They took no lessons from the election campaign. The Jobs and Skills Summit was about bringing people together. It was about trying to seek common ground, because no one involved in labour relations in this country thinks that the current system is working. Uh, that was clear in the lead-up. It was clear at the summit itself, and that's why we want to work together. And it is, says so much about this government, uh, this opposition, that they've completely missed the mark on that. They failed to understand. Uh, what our motivation is uh, and why we are seeking to bring Australians together on this. And the Jobs and Skills Summit it didn't culminate uh, Thursday, Friday last week. There was ongoing work that will continue to happen, but also it was about the lead-up work that was done by the government, the roundtables that we had. I think it was almost 100 roundtables that we held in different geographic regions, uh, different industries, and that led to uh, the optimism that we saw on display on Thursday, Friday. And we're all part of getting out there and listening. So the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, and myself, uh, we're in Rockhampton on, and on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, we had roundtables, we involved uh, local workforce, we had councils, we had unions. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we heard from a broad cross section of the community. Uh, I was last week I was in Roma and did a community uh, lunch with about 30 or 40 people from Roma in Western Queensland. And they were excited and were openly talking about what the Jobs and Skills Summit would bring and the opportunity it would bring for regional and rural Australia as well. And then on Wednesday before the Jobs Summit, uh, I was at the Business Council of Australia dinner where the Prime Minister was the guest speaker. And those business leaders could not leave quick enough to get to Canberra because they wanted to be part of the conversation as well. So they took it in the right spirit about what this government is trying to achieve by working constructively with people. And what are the opposition so upset about? Why are they so unhinged? Why are we getting this ridiculous scare campaign of Senator Cass saying it's going to be back to the 1950s or 1960s? No one is advocating that. All we are wanting to see is that workers get a fair go, um, that they can bargain effectively to get a pay rise. But as part of that, and what we all want to see, is the, the economic system working for the advantage of workers, but also those people who want an increase in productivity at the same time. So it is completely reasonable for this government um, to go about consulting with people, um, finding the best way forward, trying to work constructively where that happens, uh, and ensuring that we can take the country forward as a result. Uh, that is why we elected. That is in how we intend on governing. And I think the Australian people are seeing a government that is committed to listening, that is committed to consulting and is committed to working with everyone in the best interests of Australia. And it shouldn't be revolutionary. 
That's actually how governments of all persuasions should act. But the fact is it is revolutionary because for 10 years we saw none of it. We saw 10 years of deliberate low wages because that was actually a deliberate design feature of the economy that the former finance minister said. Uh, so this government is committed to turning that around. Uh, we're committed to, where possible, uh, working with uh, all cross-sections of the economy to ensure that we can achieve these goals and achieve these gains. And the Jobs and Skills Summit was a key part of that. But it is absolutely illustrative that the response from those opposite, um, failing to see the direction that this government is taking, failure to see the support from the Australian people that we want to take uh, this direction of this country in, that they are missing the mark, they're reverting to their same old scare campaigns uh, that isn't going to work, but it isn't going to distract us from achieving the goals that we want to achieve. And if you look at the last decade, uh, real wages have gone backwards in this country. Uh, the opposition, uh, whilst in government, spent 10 years looking for every opportunity they had to attack workers. Uh, we saw from Senator, from Senator Cash when she was a minister um, the attack on unions and raids on union officers. They had anti-worker legislation that they tried to introduce in the cover of the pandemic as well. And now, instead of focusing on the positives of bringing Australians together at the Jobs and Skills Summit, they are trying to run a desperate scare campaign, and we've seen that in the contributions on this MPI. They haven't learnt that the Australian people want an opposition who are constructive, one that will work with the government to improve legislation, like we did in the previous parliament. The Australian business community understand that. The uh, social sector understand that. The unions understand that. But it's something that the opposition are still failing to heed. And the Albanese Labor government knows that we need to get wages moving again. That is why we are so focused on the Jobs and Skills Summit being a success, because we know how important this is to the Australian people and those people who have been doing it tough after 10 years of no wage growth. But despite the opposition scare campaigns, uh, this was a summit that brought together government, employers, unions and the broader community, including David Littleproud as the National Party leader. The summit came up with a solution to build a bigger and better trained and more productive workforce that's focused on boosting real wages, living standards and create more opportunities for Australians as well. The one thing that all sides agreed on was that we need a new approach and that the current industrial relations system isn't working. The Albanese Labor government has listened and is acting. We will legislate to create more flexible flexibility for workers and businesses to reach agreement and get wages moving. We are making changes to close loopholes in the Fair Work Act, loopholes that allow wages to go down. So, instead of looking for solutions, the opposition are running the same tired scare campaigns that they did in government. They aren't wanting to work together to improve the system working for businesses and workers so that we can increase productivity and include wages. They talked a lot about small business, but the fact is, is that the Small Business Council of Australia were represented. And what they said was, and what Alexi Boyd said was, what we're hearing from our members is some of them are saying that this is something they would like to look into. It's as simple as that. So we've seen some constructive comments from the small business community. And as the Prime Minister said this morning on ABC Radio, I see myself as pro-business and pro-worker. I see that there is common interest between business and unions, that Australia works best when we're all headed in the one direction, when there's that spirit of cooperation, and that is the spirit which I wish to foster. That's the spirit that I saw in evidence over the two days at the summit. So you can see the clear contrast there between a government that wants to make progress on these issues because we understand how important they are for the Australian people. We want to see unions being able to re represent their workers and be able to achieve success for their workers in terms of productivity, in terms of wages and in terms of job conditions. But we also understand that we need businesses to thrive at the same time. And that's what bringing people together at a summit will achieve. Uh, none of the nonsense that we've seen from those opposite is going to achieve anything. We are going to be focused on delivering for Australian workers, on delivering for the Australian community, and workers of Australia will know that an Albanese Labor government is absolutely on their side and we will always be on their side. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, 
Madam Acting Deputy President, this is a grave matter of public concern. As inflation and cost of living skyrockets, Australian workers were hoping for a pay rise to keep up. Instead, the Albanese government is using the Jobs and Skills Summit as cover for flooding the country with unsustainable immigration levels. Prime Minister Albanese's immigration flood will increase the number of workers looking for work, and that will keep Australian wages down. What a sick joke. The Labor Party increasing immigration to suppress wages as its way of fighting for the workers. Pretending to care about workers is a signature of the Albanese government's approach. Instead of pretense, we need comprehensive reform in this country. The Fair Work Act, which I'm showing you here, is a mammoth, complex, confusing patchwork of red tape that gives small business nightmares and leaves workers like casual workers in central Queensland and the Hunter without basic protections and entitlements. Senator Chisholm is correct. He said that everyone knows it's a problem. It certainly is a problem. Instead of this, we need simple, effective industrial relations reform that doesn't just benefit the IR club of union bosses, lawyers and multinational companies. Next, we turn to the Albanese government's key strategy, the government's apparent intention to adopt industry-wide bargaining. It'll sledgehammer Australian businesses, especially small business, and it'll sledgehammer workers. If the Albanese government proceeds with this repackaged pattern bargaining, untold damage will be done to our economy. This isn't speculation. This has been done before. It's all happened before. A 2002 Productivity Commission inquiry found that just two industrial disputes in the automotive industry the year before cost $630 million in lost production. In today's dollars, that's more than a billion. It's worth explaining what this damage could mean. Currently, if workers want to go on strike against a particular company, as is their right, like the Qantas baggage handler strike happening right now, criteria must be met for the strike to be lawful. That's Qantas baggage handlers striking for benefits from Qantas. In industry-wide bargaining, the Qantas strike would automatically allow Virgin staff to go on strike, even though their pay conditions and employer are completely different. Industry bargaining means entire industries can be shut down even if there's only one company treating employees poorly. Imagine one cafe having a strike and that automatically triggering strikes across the hospitality industry, even at cafes already paying their employees well and treating them fairly. Paralyzing entire industries because of disputes with one employer in that industry is reckless and in the long run will harm workers. It's done as a reward for union bosses donating tens of millions of dollars to Labor's election campaign. In return, the Prime Minister gives union bosses more power so they can continue to betray honest union members in deals with multinationals. The Labor Party continues to abandon Australian workers. One Nation will Thank continue you, to fight for workers and small businesses. Senator, your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I have great pleasure today in rising to contribute to this very important MPI. And note that it, uh, it didn't take too long, did it, Madam Acting Deputy President, for uh, this government to be able to come here and be up to their old tricks. Uh, less than 100 days, they're up to their old tricks and already they're demonstrating that uh, really who's in charge is just the, uh, the union mates, uh, those their paymasters. And on the back of uh, channelling the former Hawke government with a summit of words and no action, now the government has heeded the union's clarion call for industry-wide bargaining power. Never mind the inflation crisis, which is, of course, an issue that many Australians are facing, all Australians are facing, and high interest rates and the spiralling cost of living pressures on all Australians. No, this government is intent, post talk fest, uh, is ensuring that unions are happy running amok in the Australian workplace. Business and industries of all sizes are rightly concerned at this sudden development. Why? Because through industry wide bargaining, unions may seek to weaponise strike action once again through protected action. Now, this should alarm everyone. The risk of economy-wide shutdown is a regression back to the 1970s and 80s, which Australians in this generation and now for a couple of generations have frankly never experienced, and they wouldn't want to. But be in no doubt, industrial striking is an instrument of sector-wide bargaining. In the 1970s, when industry-wide strikes were common and the Australian in industry were protected by high tariff barriers, you don't 
have to go far to see what the damaging impacts of strike action had on the Australian economy. Now, data assembled by Dr Jim Stanford uh, indicates that in the 1970s the average number of industrial disputes each year were 2,300. Yet in the period of 2010 to 2018, there was an average of 198. You only have to remember the dire state in Britain. Uh, in the 1970s, when strike action was out of control and crippling the British economy. It culminated with the famous winter of discontent. Crisis. What crisis, yelled the British press, during the dying days of a British Labor government. And now, in 2022, it's back to the future again. In New South Wales, we're seeing the rail strikes, particularly in Sydney, while up in Brisbane, the CFMEU is flexing its muscle and picketing in the Brisbane CBD. It's also calling for industrial action at airports, which would pose significant threat to an already precarious industry because of, COVID, because of the COVID pandemic. And we know what the disruption has been in that industry. The last thing they need is to have that compounded by further industrial action. Nothing emboldens unions more than the ascent of office to office of a federal Labor government. And that's what we're seeing right now. In the past, the Labor Party rejected the coalition's modest changes, modest changes to the better off overall test. Interestingly, a September 4, uh, 2022 Australian Financial Review article quoted former Prime Minister Paul Keating as saying that the boot is overprescriptive, while former ACTU uh, Bill Kelty said it was crazy. I quote, crazy, he said. Now, this government should work uh, with the coalition to ensure that the Australian workplace remains harmonious. Our economy depends on this, colleagues. Our economy depends on this. This is the last thing that we would want to see. We cannot revert back to the bleak days of a bygone era. The last thing that this country needs during an environment of high inflation, high interest rates, interest rates increasing and an out of control cost of living is unions gridlocking the Australian economy. It is for these reasons that I support this motion here today. Who is in charge of the agenda of this government? Who is in charge of the progression of our economy? Well, it's seemingly to be, it seems to be the unions. The unions were in force at the summit last week. There were over 30 unions, 30 union officials, 33, 34 union officials. Yet there were only seven West Australians present at that meeting. So who's in charge? Who's in charge? Who's listening to the interests of the economy, listening to the interests of those that are creating the jobs, that have actually got the jobs to make available for Australians to be able to take up? And sadly, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing it's the unions that are in control. And this lot over here, that's their paymasters, and that's what's happening. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. We have Senator Shoebridge. Deputy President, what we're seeing here in the Senate today is yet another attempt by the coalition to attack workers at a time when their side of the economy, when capital, is extracting ever more money from the economic system and workers are seeing even less in their pockets. It's no wonder we've seen this motion come from the coalition. They, they didn't attend the job summit. They're bereft of positive ideas, so they come in here with a scare campaign that industry-wide bargaining is, is somehow going to cause sector-wide strikes and industrial chaos. Where in, in fact, what we know it will produce, what we know it will produce is fair wages, particularly for those feminised part of our workforce, those with least bargaining power who most need help at the moment dealing with the cost of living crisis. So it's no wonder the coalition come in here with their scare campaign. They're happy because profits are up, shareholders are doing well. Profits are up, CEO bonuses are bigger than ever. They're happy, tick. But while profits are up, wages are stagnant. And right now, we know that an ever smaller percentage of the national uh, pie is going to workers in the form of wages, and yet more and more is being delivered to profits and shareholders and CEOs and senior executives. And we have an obligation to rebalance this system. So it goes some way to delivering a fair go. 
and allowing unions to properly represent their workers with pay deals that deliver consistent pay rates across employers is not something to be afraid of. It's called fairness. It's called equity. And I know that's what scares the coalition, but for the most of the rest of the country, it's what they want the industrial relations system to deliver. Fairness and equity and a growth in real wages. Small businesses and others that pay their workers fairly aren't concerned about these moves to put workers on a fairer footing. Isolating workers in some workplaces, particularly those with less bargaining power, um, has been the history of the last 30 years. And what that means is that workers with less power, like those in feminised industries, the care industry, the services industries, miss out on the better wages and conditions that are negotiated in, in workplaces with greater union density and greater ability to put economic pressure on the system. If change doesn't happen, those workers who have been left behind for the last 30 years will be left behind for the next 30 years, and the gap between the haves and the have-nots in this society will rise and rise. Now, employers, some minority of employers, and, and their friends in the coalition are still pushing to have workers fragment, fragmented, unable to bargain together, because they recognise that workers come in together and fairly bargaining will see wages form a greater share of the economy. Workers looking at their paychecks over the last decade have seen precious little growth and, 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 and often reductions in the real wages that they're bringing home, all the more so as we see inflation rise with cost of living pressures. It makes the astronomical housing prices in Australia and the growing cost of living a real and ongoing threat, and this parliament has an obligation to respond to it. What we do know is that our economy is more dominated than ever by the services and the care industries. And this is something the ACTU has said clearly in making the case for industry-wide bargaining. And as that, the economy has changed, we still have an industrial relations system that's, that's, that's 30 years old, that has failed to take into account those fundamental changes, and particularly those workers in smaller workplaces, in the care sectors, often workplaces that are dominated by women. They need to have the ability to engage in collective bargaining, and it's best done on an industry-wide level. As, as the ACTU said, the president of the ACTU said, allowing workers to band together across, across workplaces to bargain is an essential way of getting wages moving again after a lost decade of flatlining wages and real wage cuts. It should be unacceptable to all of us that real wage cuts are projected year on year. Now, Madam Deputy President, we will not get meaningful movement on wages unless we can, act, unless we can move on industry-wide bargaining. It scares the coalition, but I've got to tell you, there are workers out there who have had 30 years of flatlining wages, who are desperately keen for this parliament to do more than carp and complain, but actually give them power, give them a fair wage, and finally see a fair share of the pie goes to those in the workplaces Schubert, who deliver. Time has expired. Uh, we now move to first speeches, and I call Senator White. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, just a moment. <laughs> so I think the, the president's going to call yes. me. Yes. Um, we jumped the gun slightly, but I uh, remind all senators that the usual courtesies be extended to you, Senator White, as you speak. Please um, commence your speech. Uh, thank you, President. I want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have called this place home for tens of thousands of years. I acknowledge the, their unbroken connection to this land and give my deep respect to community members and elders, past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. I'm immensely proud to be part of a government that is seeking to change the constitution to create a First Nations voice to parliament. Getting justice for people has dominated my working life. How that happened and why it happened goes to a series of experiences, decisions and opportunities, some within my control and some not, which have determined the life I have led to date. Like many people, there were things I could not change or affect, and sometimes there were sliding door moments when my values or history guided me down a particular road or took me to places I could never have imagined. For some people, their pathway in life is determined by the circumstances of their birth. Governments, however, have the power 
to open up new choices and opportunities that would otherwise remain out of reach. The power we have in this place to change lives is significant. For many, this power came into sharp focus during our COVID years, but the reality is this power is there all that, the time. Now, today we'll go by here where I won't reflect on the consequences of our actions for those we represent. I've had the responsibility for the well-being of others before as a union delegate, as a lawyer and as an elected union official, but the responsibilities we have here are definitely next level. As a union official, there's nothing as bad as finding out that 4,500 of your members have lost their jobs on the one day. 21 years ago next week, 16,000 Australians lost their jobs at ANSET and a further 60,000 lost theirs in companies that relied on ANSET. It remains one of the biggest corporate collapses in Australia's history. The social and economic harm it caused is beyond words. Suicides, marriage breakdowns, the loss of homes and security, the ANSET collapse broke many people. It was a brutal reminder that markets don't prioritise the well-being of workers. That's not their purpose and never has been. They are vehicles to create wealth, not ensure justice. It was a lesson in how the decisions by government not to intervene also changed us lives. I will never forget the cruelty inherent in the Howard government's response at that time. It was left to union members to take up the fight for these Australians, and that's what we did. We won back nearly all of the $760 million owing to the ANSET workers. It ticked it took 10 years, but we got there. The resilience, bravery, leadership and collective action of the ASU's ANSET members in the midst of adversity made this possible and remains an inspiration to this day. Whoops. <laughs> As I see it, one of our main jobs here in Parliament is to make all forms of justice less dependent on money, connections and class. When I say justice, I don't mean legal representation in a courtroom, but the broader notion of social and economic justice, which is the measure we should test the outcomes of our policies against, whether it be in education, health, workplace laws or intervention in markets. This is difficult to achieve at the best of times, but now trust in government, politics and politicians is is at a low point. One of the hardest jobs that the Albanese government has ahead of us is to show people what governing in the public interest looks like. The creation of a national anti-corruption commission will be an important part of what I see as a new compact with the Australian people. There, may, there is more to do beyond that, but it is a good start. I learned about workplace justice pretty early on. Like many students, I worked at McDonald's to pay my way through uni. It was there I first felt the power of union organising and collective action. Our franchise was being bought back by the parent company, which had a reputation for not offering shifts to casual adult workers. I was 20 years old. Someone, not me, organised a clandestine night meeting in their home in downtown Camberwell with a union organiser from what is now the United Workers' Union. We all joined the union that night, and I don't know how, but I became the delegate. <laughs> I didn't really understand what a delegate was, but soon realised that it meant collecting union dues in cash and sending them to the union, talking to my workmates and, of course, dealing with management. We had little to lose, so our union membership was no secret. In the end, we kept our jobs longer than we would have otherwise, but the expensive staff like me were eventually rostered off. It was an early lesson about insecure work and the perils of casualisation. I also learnt that you don't always win, and winning doesn't always look the way you thought it would. But being brave and standing up for your rights is always important. I felt the power of collectivism for the first time, and it has been my, my driving force ever since. The experience at McDonald's made me want to work for a union, but despite my significant experience in remitting union fees, I couldn't quite land a union job. It turned out to be easier to become an article clerk at one of Australia's premier labour law firms than to get a job at a union. <laughs> I had a dream run as an article clerk at Morris Blackburn & Co. My first day was instructing two top barristers on a manslaughter trial, and that was followed by many more interesting criminal trials. I was hooked. My strike rate for acquittals was far higher than in the legal system generally. Maybe I just represented a disproportionate number of innocent clients. <laughs> Or maybe the fact that my clients had the money to pay for top dollar legal representation had something to do with it. Whilst we are all equal before the law, justice comes at a cost and results are all too often related to the quality of the representation you can afford. Morris Blackman also brought me into contact with people during the, their hardest times in their lives. 
I'm forever grateful to the many dedicated lawyers who shared their knowledge and impressed on me the need to listen and understand what is going on for clients, both legally and personally. Learning how to give people straight advice about their prospects has held me in good stead ever since. Near the end of my time, near the end of my time at Blackburns, my focus was acting for people who had been sexually assaulted by members of the clergy. Countless people came forward and shared their stories with me. Some had never told their families and loved ones of their experiences. I was honoured to have had this trust. Now I'm in this place, I look forward to seeing the National Redress Scheme in operation, while also recognising that full redress is just not possible. Money can never give a kid their childhood back or undo their trauma. Working at Blackburn's allowed me to practise my newfound union organising skills. I recruited around 70 new members to the union in the then ununionised workplace. A couple of the foundation members, George Georgiou and Sabina Wakefield, are here today. I treasure the fun and friendship we have uh, shared both and since leaving Blackburn's. A shout out too to your partners, Julie Spring and uh, Lindsay Wakefield, who are also great friends. Unsurprisingly, my organising success brought me to the attention of Lindsay Tanner, <laughs> who was in the process of changing the course of the Federated Clerks Union, now known as the Australian Services Union. I joined the Tanner team and was elected to State Council. I became heavily involved as a rank and file member. I was someone who could be relied on to show up when needed. That was when my political education really began. My wrangler back then was David Layden, who became a very dear friend and who was one of the most committed unionists I know. After a decade of working in a law firm, I finally got that union job and joined the Victorian Clerical and Administrative Branch of the ASU. This move gave me the chance to work with three of the best union leaders I have known, Gay Yule, Martin Foley and Ingrid Stead. These are three people who I would always want beside, my, beside me in a fight. A gay has been a mentor to many women and taught me that if you are a successful woman, you have a duty to bring other women along with you, something I try to do as often as I can, because if I don't do it, who will? With the support of Gay, Martin, Chris Woods, John Gazzola and Anne McEwan, a year later I moved to the ASU National Office as Assistant National Secretary. My work with the ASU has given me an up-close and personal view of corporate Australia. I've met CEOs and chairs and heard them explain how they operate and, more importantly, how they see the people who work for them. I've campaigned alongside thousands of ASU members and delegates during those years. I've also seen how working work has been changing. These changes, casualisation, outsourcing, the growth of the gig economy and the constant political attacks that undermine pay, conditions and the ability to collective bargain remain. Industrial relations is not a fair fight. And any new laws must take this uneven, uneven power balance into account. Workers aren't just a line item on a balance sheet. They are partners in the success of a business and deserve to be treated as such. I was in the fight against work choices, just as I've been against many other ideological attacks on workers, their families and the nation over the years. We didn't always win, but we lived to fight another day. I want to recognise the Australian Council of Trade Unions and its affili affiliated unions. All strength to your arms, Sally and Michelle. The movement could not have two better leaders at this important time. I've already mentioned a number of people who worked with me, with me at the ASU and in my union career, but can I also thank Emmeline Gasky, Imogen Sterney, Abby Spencer, Scott Cowan, Joseph Scales, Julie Bignall, Irene Monroe, Joe Justo, Gillian Strong, Fazia Aiden and Jody Mills. We did some amazing work together and you always made me look good. <laughs> One of the wins I will always hold dear is the 2012 Equal Pay case for over 200,000 non-government social and community services workers across Australia. It took a relentless campaign from union members and officials who lobbied the then Labor government without mercy, standing strong behind the dignity of women's work. My current Senate leader, then as Finance Minister, was one of those who bore the brunt of that lobbying. Our disagreements were more about style and substance, and it's my hope that all has been forgiven. <laughs> 
We won pay rises between 27 and 43 per cent plus safety net increases delivering, delivered over eight years. It took over six years of continuous campaigning, a change in the equal pay laws and a long and detailed Fair Work Commission case to get that result. It shouldn't have taken that much time and that much work, but it did. But still, the reality is it wouldn't have happened at all without the support of federal and state Labor governments. The Equal Pay case changed the lives of predominantly women workers in the community sector forever. Some extremely underpaid people saw increases of $700 per week. That case narrowed the gender pay gap, but shamefully it's the only case that has ever been won federally. The commitment of this government to address the pay gap and the value of women's work is something I want to be a part of. Australian women deserve no less. Superannuation is yet another area where women get a raw deal. The gap between the retirement savings of women and men is greater than the gender pay gap. Australians' retirement savings have too long been an ideological play, thing of a government unconcerned about real outcomes for women and more about who is on the board of an industry super fund. Instead of focusing on making super work for women and others who need it in retirement, opponents of superannuation constantly try to undermine our system. Superannuation that provides dignity in retirement for people who have worked hard their whole lives should be above petty partisan politics. For many of us, our families set our values and shape our lives from the start. Mine was a small family from the beginning, but now it's only me, my dear brother Michael and Michael's wife, Julie. I want to acknowledge the support Michael and Julie have given me over some difficult times. Michael and I often discuss politics and world affairs and occasionally motorsport. As a voter in a marginal seat, you're Opinion and views not only influence my thoughts, your vote also has on occasion determined governments, including in this last election. Thank you for being my very own marginal seat focus group. <laughs> Neither of my parents, John and Frieda, went to university. It wasn't even a consideration for my smart parents, who worked incredibly hard all their lives. They believed strongly in public education. Michael and I were the first in our family to go to university. Both my parents left school and started work at the age of 16. My mother in clerical work and my father as a delivery boy for the company Gassetna. He worked there his whole life and eventually became managing director. One of my first memories of, is of my mother on the parents' committee of my kindergarten. Over their lives, my parents got involved in the golf club, the aerial motorbike club, rotary probers, even the callig calligraphy society, being office bearers, writing newsletters and talking to people. That was our home life getting involved. Knowingly and unconsciously, I've followed that example. At Melbourne Uni, I was a member of the Law Student Society, the Commerce Student Society, the Symphony Orchestra, the Uni Review, the Netball Club, and pretty, uh, probably many more things. It's amazing I had time to study. <laughs> Since being elected to the Senate, I've had congratulatory mes messages from people from those days, which is surely a testament to getting involved. My involvement with boards and committees has continued throughout my life, right up until my election to the Senate. I have loved learning about community and public institutions uh, and their work along the way. Needless to say, I've spent many, many, many hours on Labor Party committees. <laughs> Those stories I will save for my memoirs. <laughs> my maternal grandfather, grandmother, aunt and mother came to Australia in the 1930s to give their family a better future. My grandfather was a skilled glassblower. Despite this economic contribution, the family were interned during World War II. My paternal grandparents lived and worked in Marrickville. Life for them was often difficult. Neither set of grandparents owned their own homes. They hoped that their hard work would give their children a chance to own their, their own homes, and it did. Sadly, housing affordability is far worse now than it was then. Working hard doesn't guarantee you'll ever be able to afford a house, another critical policy area to work on in this place. I am forever grateful that my parents introduced us to the arts. From a very young age, I went to live theatre, to galleries and to ex ex exhibitions like the Archibald Prize. I had the chance to learn the viola at school, which was a smart choice as it turns out. There was always a place for a second-rate player like me in orchestras. <laughs> Violinists are a dime a dozen and have a much harder time getting a gig. <laughs> It's really, it didn't really hit home that the exposure to the arts I had as a child didn't happen for everyone until I was on the board of the Australian Centre for the Moving in Image. Like many public 
arts organisations. ACME runs programs for schools. One program provides fully subsidised travel for children from Melbourne's west to come to the museum. Many of the kids had never been to the city before, let alone to a museum. The delight, wonder and surprise of discovering a new world of possibilities at institutions like ACME is an experience no child should miss out on. That is the power of the arts and the creative process. The arts lets us delve into other worlds and see ourselves and our society reflected back, for better or for worse. They allow us to imagine new possibilities and better ways of doing things. People like to talk about the economic value of the arts, but their true value goes beyond, far beyond dollars and cents. Artists and creative professionals are talented, clever and possess the power to impact lives through their skill. I stand in awe of the things that they do. I am proud that in Victoria we have led, had, we have led the nation in recognising the power of our creative industries. I am very glad that after nearly a decade we have an arts minister in Tony Burke who takes these things seriously. Getting cultural policy right changes how we come to know ourselves, how we come to know others and, the, how, the world, and how the world comes to know Australia. Before I conclude, I want to pay a tribute to my predecessor, Senator Kim Carr, a titan of the left in Victoria, whose contribution both as a minister and as a senator has been widely recognised. It is fair to say many are looking forward to his forthcoming book, not all with trepidation. <laughs> I also pay tribute to Senator Kimberley Kitching, who was taken from us all far too early. It's worth reflecting briefly on the fact that I've had a long career before joining this parliament. I like to say that you are never too old to learn new things and that there are opportunities in everything. You never know when the, where that road you choose might lead. Occasionally it leads you to the Senate. <laughs> I thank Lisa Darman and, and the mighty ASU, Alan Griffin, Matt Hilakari, Matt Norrie, Joe Brisky and the United Workers Union, Susie Byers and Tim Ayres for their support for my latest career step. Margaret Beattie and Greg Peacock, your enthusiasm for this new adventure was also very important to me. To Gavin Jennings, thanks for your support and wise counsel over many years. Thanks to the many people who have come from Melbourne to watch my speech, in particular the members of my book club. Our discussions, no doubt, will continue to be a mixture of politics and literature. I would like to thank our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, for many years of friendship and support. It's an honour to be part of the team. Can I also acknowledge my new staff team, Mark, Ben, Hector and Jess, for all their hard work in establishing the office. It's my hope that together we will achieve a lot and have a bit of fun on the way. And finally, thank you, Marita and Rachel, for the pre-speech star treatment. <laughs> I'm not here to make uh, my name or build my career. I'm immensely proud of the battles I have fought, the things I have achieved and the comrades I have made. That is not to say I don't have anything to prove. One, one promise I can make uh, make is that no one here will die wondering what I think. <laughs> People will also know where I stand and already know that I'm not afraid of saying what's on my mind. I'm not about to change the habits of a lifetime. Just as I have in other arenas, I will fearlessly and some may say relentlessly pursue action that will make our national com community and the state of Victoria a better place for all of us. Australian democracy is more fragile than we realise. It's suffered damage in recent years, and I think everyone in this parliament has an important role in restoring the public's trust in the political process. We must remain able to consider turning points in our th thinking. Uh, we might not agree with each other or those who are advocating to us, but not listening is always a mistake. In Lobbying Train, I always told our ASU members to remember the politicians they meet are no better than they are and that they know far more about their own issues than the politicians they are meeting do. I still believe this and will not forget that advice. I'm pretty sure, though, that there are a few people here in the gallery who wouldn't let me forget if I tried anyway. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that governments change lives, that strong progressive Labor governments change them for the better. But sometimes governments need a helping hand to stay on track. As I often say, sometimes we need someone else to show, our, show us our best selves. I think. Uh, in thinking about how to conclude this speech, I thought of my mother and her love of jigsaw puzzles that covered our dining room table at home, sometimes for weeks on end. In many ways, my career has been like a series of jigsaw puzzles, each more complex than the last, but building on the skills learned before to reveal a new picture each time. This may or may not prove to be the hardest puzzle I attempt in my career, 
but the level of complexity and the picture of a fairer and more just nation that I hope to reveal is a challenge that I'm very much looking forward to tackling head on, always alongside my colleagues, comrades and the community. I thank the Senate. Before I invite uh, Senator Cadell to make his first speech, I would ask senators and guests to um, either sit and listen quietly or uh, leave the chamber. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Cadell to make his first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. I call Senator Cadell. Thank you, Madam President. In just over two months, on a Sunday afternoon at about this time, a driver will exit Forest Elbow on Mount Panorama for the last time. They will hit 300 kilometres an hour going down Conrod Strait 
before going through the chase and taking Murray's Corner. Seconds after that, they will take the chequered flag of the Bathurst 1000. As they sit alone in the car crossing the line, soaking up their victory and achievement, this will be one of the greatest moments of their life. Their name will go on the Peter Brock Trophy. They will stand upon the top step of the podium and celebrate their victory. But as they stand there, they know that it is a team of people behind the scenes. The mechanics, the engineers, the apprentices, the trainers, the sponsors, the people that helped them out years ago in the junior classes, and many more that they share the prize with. The same stands for me today. Even though it is my great privilege to have my name upon this desk and my office, to be known as Senator Cadell from the New South Wales Nationals, it is the love support, help and so much more from the people in the gallery today and people watching from at home that have got me here. Most of all, most importantly today, know that you have given me your trust and I will not let you down. Today, in my first speech in the place, I would like to do two things. I would like to talk about how I arrived behind this desk and what I plan to do behind it. Because we are limited in time, I am sorry to the dozens of people I will not name today. But know this, if you are here, you are valued. If you are invited, you are respected. And if you weren't, I probably messed up. <laughs> when I look around this place, I see military veterans, community activists, leaders, corporate achievers, union representatives and so many more high-performing people. I've heard powerful speeches with first-hand experience of pain and misfortune delivered with such passion, and I find myself feeling somewhat of a pretender, like a charlatan, undeserving of really being here. Because mine is a story with as many failures as successes, as many disappointments as celebrations, and in the word of the hunter, where I am from, I am a bit of a plotter. <laughs> but then I look at the people up there. I think of those friends who can't be here, and I know that I must have done some good because they have stuck with me through all of that and lifted and propelled me to this day. So again, straight off the bat, thank you all. To mum and dad, you ruined any chance of having me de delivering a powerful speech about overcoming disadvantage and adversity by giving my sister Jane and I a wonderful, safe, middle-class upbringing where I felt loved and supported my whole life. <laughs> sure, it may have come with the love of a punt, a fondness for motorsport and firearms, a sense of humour that can best be described as strange, <laughs> an addiction to state of origin football, the Bathurst 1000s, and far too many trips into floodwaters on the farm in unsafe vessels that had an uncanny ability to attract snakes. <laughs> but you helped me in every way you could, in every way you can, at every time I asked. It is because of you that I am the very best version of a bogan I can be. <laughs> and my sister Jane turned out okay as well. <laughs> also here are my chips off the old bogan. Lachlan and Mitchell, and I am proud of you, the men you are becoming. I do need to apologise to them for passing on the same sense of humour that I was cursed with, but I know you are super proud of your dad, and I want to make sure that in my time here, I do some things that means your lives are safer, longer and happier. We've had a saying amongst the Cadell boys. It doesn't matter how you go as long as you try your best, and I will be doing that for you in this place. To their mother, Simone, thank you for the gift of our wonderful boys. Thank you for the 20 years of your life you shared with me, and I know you will continue to do amazing things with yours. Madam President and colleagues, this is the risky bit. I'm sorry for this, but my Star Wars fan kids feel I must do this. Lachlan and Mitchell. I am the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> I 
to my, my wife Bethan. Just when I thought my life was destined to wind down to an average footnote over the last few chapters, no longer worthy of love or success, just merely happy to still be here, you came along and ruined that. <laughs> I once again finding, my, finding myself living my best life as Roscoe, loving you in our little beach shack with our kids and our kitty cats thousands of miles from your home in Wales. Thank you for your love. Thank you for keeping me in line with your never-ending source of motivational tips, normally delivered with a slap or a loving Kermit face. My favourite still was upon pre-selection was, and I quote, I told this little don't become an asshole. <laughs> Many even sitting around you today would say that's only about 40 years too late. <laughs> to Anwen and Leo sitting at home, I'm lucky to have you both in my life. I know life gets confusing at times with our bigger family, but know that just means you have more people who love and care for you. Other family here today, Madam President, includes my godfather, Uncle Stu, Auntie Effie, my cousin Alyssa, and online Melissa and Fiona, and also some others. At high school, my life was going to be so simple. Join the Royal Australian Air Force as a fighter pilot, let them tell me what to do for 40 years, and then retire. A semi-dicky ticker and circumstances put an end to that after surviving the most brutal recruitment day I've ever seen at the old Sydney office that saw about 200 of us whittled down to half a dozen at the end of the day. I had done all I could to achieve this with no other thoughts. I joined the Air Training Corps, the cadets, with 16 flight at Blacksmiths and become a cadet under officer. This was one of the most enjoyable periods of my life. From this day right up to day with Hatchie, now Wing Commander Hatch, about to become Group Captain Hatch. We still catch up with Humphrey, Big Dog, Arkin, Pete, Bromie to have a brew and tell some lies. At school, I selected a lot of subjects I wasn't actually good at or I liked to qualify, but again, it wasn't to be. So I was essentially lost. I worked at a bank, played video games semi-professionally. I learned to fly. I chose a uni degree to sign up to based on an American sitcom. Found that unlike school and TAFE, unis have bars <laughs> and proceeded to waste the next two years doing first year commerce. <laughs> but again, I met some great people. Pete Galloway, Shane Fitzgerald, who are here today, along with my cousin Alyssa, who we ended up marrying, along with Pommy, Wizzo, Teddy Bear, Phil, Donna, Jorgen and Reg. We even had a crack at politics with the people like us shouldn't be in power party. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but during this time, I found politics. And somehow I had an understanding of the campaign and the way it works. I enjoyed it and I wasn't bad at it. I be became a member of, dare I say it, the Young Liberals, Bel Air branch. <laughs> Named after a pub, not a TV show. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We worked with Marty Musgrave, Simon Westaway and Shane again, Ian Benson, Jenny Palmer and a great bunch of members. We had a great time working on policy with the highlight being the performance incentive scheme for students. As good as the policy was, we very much preferred getting that acronym through the Liberal Party State Council. Think about it. During this time, I also had the great privilege of being employed by Mr Greg Hansen dead country vice president of the Liberal Party, also here today. His learnings and knowledge still come in handy. The number one lesson he, uh, in, he told me in a political argument is if you don't have a big stick, make one. It hasn't always worked out the way I planned it, but maybe sometimes I just make the sticks too big. We shared so many campaigns, Greg, but ultimately fell short in the one that mattered the most. I'm always sorry that didn't work out, you would have done great things in the Red Leather in New South Wales. Thank you for being here. It was also during this time I met so many people in this parliament and the New South Wales parliament, like Senator Maurice Payne, Jason Falinski, Alex Hawke, Gladys Brodjiklian, John Brogdon, and more importantly, the Honourable Ben Franklin, MLC. With Ben, we worked together on my Regain the Movement campaign for state president, 
along with Tony Chappell and, again, Martin Musgrave. Then in 1999, it was over. I was burnt out and over it. But history always catches up with you. And it was in those times with Ben, ended up bringing me to the Nats. My parents' property at Cliffley, uh, Cliffley was in the city of Cessnock, and one day, almost 10 years after my last political involvement, Ben reached out over Facebook looking for someone to work on the 2011 campaign. He wanted more mongrel in his campaigns, and he didn't know a bigger mongrel than me. In the Nats, I found a home for my views of fighting for more for non-capital city Australia. I also found a place filled with friends. With the Nats head office team over the years with Ben, Greg Desmond, Nathan Quigley, Tom O'Bear, Tony Sarks, Cathy Chalmers, Dominic Hopkinson, Will Coates, Izzy Gillespie, and then later Brad Vermeer, Sam Pern, Olivia Kerr, Stephen Mudd, and as is tradition for New South Wales Nationals, I have intentionally left out Douglas Martin. I also had the pleasure to serve under three chairs, the Honourable Niall Blair, Mr Bede Burke and Mr Andrew Fraser, and hand over the director's role to Joe Lundy. All very passionate Nats, all very different, but again, dedicating to serving the regions. When it came to the pre-selection, so many in the gallery today came, or some of who ironically don't get on with each other, came behind me and help me out. When I was down, my triple angels of Senator Nash, the Honourable Bronnie Taylor and Jocelyn Jansen came to the fore. When I needed some extra advice, I had Ben and the Tamworth crew of Bede Burke, Barnaby Joyce, uh, Russell Webb, Liz and Ian Coxhead, my family away from home. When I needed practice, I had Sam Faraway, Nat Openshaw, Jeff McCormack and Jock Souter. And despite all the dramas surrounding me at the moment, I do need to thank John Barillaro. I enjoyed working together on the 2019 campaign, and I must thank him for his support in my career. And just like my real family, these people have always been there for me when I need it. The New South Wales Nats are a family that can fight now and drink later, bag you today and lift you tomorrow, and we occasionally muck up because we wear our hearts on our sleeve and sometimes lead with our chins. But when you care so much about what you do, that can sometimes happen. That passion is exemplified in my office, with a group of people who have limited experience with government. We are all largely finding our way together. But with a hunger of living almost exclusively in safe Labor seats, at least wanting a shot to put forward a different case. Andy, Nick and Ash, who have done the hard yards as young Nats have had their chance in the majors. Josh and Les have brought some government experience to the team and are nailing some policy work for us. And then there is ads. Adrian Stewart Roach, my office manager. Have we not had a journey? We've worked together, travelled together, raced together, celebrated together and lost together. We joked about becoming a senator to get into a Vegas nightclub in 2014, and now we are here. Sorry you had to leave Porsche to come on board, Bob, but I wouldn't have done this without you, so let's make good things happen. And so here I am, standing somewhere I thought I would never be, surrounded by people I admire and watched by people who put me here. And what will I do with that chance? I want to fight the imbalance of power between the cities and the regions between the haves and the have-nots, between the loud and the silent. How is it fair in this place the executive controls so much and those elected so little? When my party, the Nats, advocates for decentralisation of government and departments, why not start here? Why not allocate serious budget for each elected member to ad, uh, administer to federal expenses for constituents and not-for-profits? rather than have to go cap in hand to a minister to let them judge if someone is worthy of dental or Medicare, or extra NDIS, or a club needs a new hall? Why not let a member be judged on their personal priorities as well as their parties? How is it fair that previous governments have taken away powers of farmers to collectively bargain with massive corporations for a fair price for produce, leaving them working 24-7 for a minimum wage? 
How is it fair that the regions be forced to pay for the price of the never-ending consumption of the city's hunger for energy and resources, with land restrictions and job, uh, job losses to offset it? Where I am from, we have given up any hope of government doing anything for us. We now just hope they don't do anything to us. How is that a good thing? How is it fair that we allow a formula called the cost-benefit ratio, generated by people in big, shiny city buildings, to dictate what we spend taxpayers' money on when it always favours the many over the few? CBRs measure benefit and not need. They prioritise thousands saving 10 minutes to and from work over dozens having safe, sealed roads to ensure they come home to their families. As Nats, we are used to the cries of rorts and favouritism when grants vary from the accountant's choices. I am actually proud of that. I love that. I am excited that people from all sides stand up and say they want projects that have community merit more than projects with grant writers that have talent. If we, as elected officials, always do what we are told, why are we here? Are we the window dressing for the executive and the bureaucracy, or do we really want to make a difference and contribute? During the pandemic, people decided what was important, and they voted with their feet. When showing up at an office wasn't a thing, they moved to the regions. They moved to the coast. They moved to the places that fed their soul and enriched their life. They did this in spite of poorer roads, lesser hospitals and fewer services. So let's stop feeding the infrastructure of the cities, driving up house prices with tens of billion dollars worth of attractions. Let's put that money into the regions so that people can have the best of both worlds, a life and a community. We've seen a demonstration of this city think in my last role at the Port of Newcastle. Somewhere in 2013 or 2014, in the bowels of the New South Wales Department of Finance, someone had the idea of restricting competition for Port Botany for another 50 to 100 million in privatisation income. What a great deal for the taxpayer. What they even fail to give any thought to is the farmers in northwest New South Wales who has to pay an extra $20 a tonne to ship their grain, or the Upper Hunter winemaker who pays an extra $1.50 a bottle to export their wine or the aluminium shelter five kilometres from the port that has to send their product 165 kilometres by road to export it. Every single year, a decision based on a CBR costs the community more than the extra money it raised for the state in total. But not a single person in government or opposition has the courage to admit the mistake and get it fixed. Why? Because the bureaucracy is the ultimate too-big-to-fail corporation, and that is a disgrace. The people of the Hunter need a plan B. We are willing to make it happen ourselves. And we had Craig, Tanya and Briggsy fighting the hard fight with me. But again, the decision makers have decided we don't deserve that right. Madam President, I respect this country, this parliament and this chamber very much. But I am here to be a right royal pain in the posterior to the status quo. All the people that I've mentioned here today got me here. All the people in the gallery today who have trusted me deserve no less, and they will get no less. As I have all my life, sometimes I will fail. Sometimes I will succeed, but I will always try. I love my Australia warts and all. We are on an old land, but a young nation. And we can be better, but we also have unimaginable potential. Thank you to the people in this chamber and the other place for making me feel as though I belong here, even though, as I have said, I have sometimes had my own doubts. I believe that within you and your officers lay the answers to so many of the problems we face as a nation if we can find a way as elected officials to have a bigger voice. I look forward to working with my family, my party, my supporters and all of you so that together we can have a crack at finding that voice. Thank you.
ask that senators please, uh, if you're not staying here for the next uh, order of business, then if you could remove yourself from the chamber, please. Okay. Uh, I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator Steelejohn. Hello. Um, hi, thanks, uh, Madam. <laughs> thanks, Chair. Um, could I take <laughs> could I take note of um, of uh, document number um, uh, the uh, Australia's COVID uh, vaccine rollout Department of Health and Aged Care document number uh, 00148 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Uh, which document number? Just one for you. Sorry, number four. Document, document number four. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Is anybody else seeking the call for consideration of documents? If not, we will proceed to uh, committee memberships. The president has received letters requesting change in the membership of committees. Minister. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. We'll now proceed to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? I table a document relating to an order for the production of documents concerning animal welfare. Are there any other ministerial? Senator, Senator Fruki. Minister of Agriculture's letter about OPD number 1304, which was a Senate order to release animal welfare incidents reports in export registered abattoirs. I requested these documents after a distressing story was published in The Age detailing horrific animal cruelty at abattoirs. Many really disturbing incidents of animal cruelty were described. It was reported that vets employed by the Federal Agriculture Department and stationed at export abattoirs spoke privately of feeling pressure from meat processors when raising animal welfare concerns. My request to table these reports was agreed to by the Senate on the 9th of February this year. But on 17 February, when the documents were due, Senator Bridget McKenzie told us that they were unable to comply and intended to respond at the earliest possible opportunity. On 29th March, these excuses were echoed again by the Morrison government. Well, surprise, surprise, that opportunity never came. Days became weeks, weeks became months, until, very conveniently for the coalition, the election arrived. It was frankly disgraceful to have run down the clock before an election to avoid producing documents that the Senate had ordered them to produce. And I'm thankful that the Morrison government is no longer, but we still live with the consequences of their inaction. We are still waiting for those documents. And I do appreciate that the new Minister for Agriculture, Senator Ward, has now responded to my request for the OPD and welcome his assurance that he will table the documents within this parliamentary sitting fortnight with optimism. Because if the new government is serious about trans transparency, they now have an opportunity to act like it. Every day that goes by without answers is another day that animals continue to suffer. Thank you, Senator Fruki. Are there any other ministerial statements or motions to take note? To take note as well. Uh, coming from Western Australia, I fully appreciate and understand the significance, Madam uh, Deputy President, of the uh, of the, the sheep industry, of the live uh, export industry. Uh, we know that it's a very significant, uh, very significant um, part of. Uh, Am I still going? Yes. Sorry, am I right? Yep. Uh, the, the live sheep export industry is an important contributor, of course, to the agricult uh, Australian agriculture. It's a vital source of revenue and jobs to our rural and regional economies, particularly for my home state 
uh, of Western Australia. Livestock export industry in general contributes $1.7 billion to Australia's uh, national economy every year. The live sheep export trade alone is worth around $250 million, with about 85 per cent of that income generated in Western Australia alone. And since 2018, the industry and its regulatory framework has undergone significant change. This commitment by industry demonstrates the industry's strong desire to ensure a sustainable industry for future generations. The industry has not sought to ignore the responsibilities that it has to animal welfare. Rather, changes have delivered an improved animal welfare performance. Uh, so rather than seek to improve and refine the regulatory, frame welfare, uh, regulatory welfare of the trade, there are many here in this place that would rather see a ban to see a ban on live sheep export trade altogether. Now, banning live sheep exports is, a reaction, is reactionary and would only result in substantial job losses throughout the industry. It would decimate an industry that's like mining and, and other industries that have underwritten, underwritten the success of the Australian narrative since Federation. Those who seek to ban live sheep export do not care about the generations of families who have contributed to this country with their hard work and their sacrifice. And continuing to strengthen the oversight is a prudent path forward and will ensure successful and sustainable future for this industry. Since 1985, there has been at least 10 government and parliamentary reviews that have examined the live export system and its associated animal welfare issues. These reviews have led to significant regulatory reform of animal welfare standards to which exporters must abide by and has increased the level of oversight of the export process. We have seen evidence that a sensible, a sensible approach does indeed work. Every six months, the Minister for Agriculture must table in Parliament a report from the department that includes livestock mortalities of every sea voyage. Now, we all saw on television a few years ago and on social media uh, those, those appalling images, appalling images uh, of, of uh, cruelty or, or situations where animals were, were not treated humanely. Now, notwithstanding the fact that some of what we saw was actually confected by activists who were intent on portraying that industry and portraying uh, those voyages uh, in a certain way and in a very negative way, what we've seen is the industry take enormous steps, significant steps, to improve the conditions, improvements chiefly led by the producers and the transporters the, themselves. And so, since 2016, the sheep mortality rate has decreased from 14,000 or 0.8 per cent, 0.8 per cent, uh, to uh, just over 1,300, 0.21 per cent. So a significant reduction in 2021, a significant reduction to 0.21% in 2021. Now, in view of the more than 660,000 sheep that were transported last year, this diminishing mortality rate only serves to highlight the industry's attitude towards better animal welfare. We know that producers in particular they value the, the dignity of every single one of those animals, every single one of that, those livestock that they have in their care. And there is a commitment that we've seen by this industry to ensure that these animals are treated humanely, uh, of course, uh, in, the, in that journey. There's restrictions in the time of year that these uh, ships can travel. Uh, measure, measures have been put in place. We're having uh, veterinary uh, officials on board to ensure that the Safeguards are in place to ensure that those animals are uh, treated as humanely as possible. The COVID pandemic has served uh, for us uh, to underscore how food security has become a major issue for many of our livestock uh, export destinations. Uh, they, 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 they simply cannot produce the food in many countries to support their populations and the, need the security of supply. So, of course, Australian and, as I've said, Western Australia in particular—and I know Senator Searle knows this very well 
having worked in the uh, transport industry, knows significantly uh, how Western Australia plays a critical role in ensuring that these markets are able to be met with good products, good produce, uh, and indeed uh, the, 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 the supply of, uh, of, these, of this supply to countries that, that need it. Now, if, if, if Australia, and indeed Western Australia, is not supplying, uh, then of course those supplies are going to come from other countries that may not have the level of integrity that we've seen our industry here in Australia uh, take up. They simply are not able to. These countries will not be able to uh, meet the needs internally, or they'll, they'll seek it elsewhere. And we can't be assured of the integrity and, of course, of the safety that we want to ensure uh, right here in our own country. Only live export can meet the protein needs of countries where refrigeration is not always available. And phasing out uh, of live sheep trade will have uh, wider trade implications for the exchange of products and services between Australia and the Middle East. The impact here is much greater and is beyond just the, the trade of sheep. It can impact many other sections of our trade relationships with many countries, particularly in the Middle East. Now, above all, it will have real impacts on families. Real impact on families and jobs and people that derive their livelihood from these farms and from these products and from these, these services. And it's not something that we would want to see, particularly in my home state, where we will see uh, that in my home state, those that will sacrifice on the altar of ideology, ideology uh, that, that are just determined to see this trade wiped out. And we're not going to see that happen. And we will not see that happen. We can't allow that to happen because it would be a devastation to the producers, to the families that rely on them, and to everyone that's involved in this industry that have done absolutely everything that they can to support uh, this industry and do everything that they can to see the improvements that have remarkably been put in place. To see that reduction of mortality down to 0.21 per cent is a remarkable achievement that everyone in that industry <laughs> must be really proud of. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, thank you very much. Senator McKenzie. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to um, speak to the benefits of our nation's world-class animal welfare standards. Time after time we hear the Greens Party come in either to this place or Senate estimates and denigrate our primary producers, denigrate our trading systems, our exporters, that they somehow should be ashamed of their hard work, our livestock transport operators, that they should be somehow ashamed of having the best animal welfare uh, standards in the world, and because they only speak to people in capital cities. Because if you live out in rural and regional Australia, if you live out in rural and regional WA, you know how hard these men and women work to make sure their livestock is safe, to make sure their livestock is well treated. You know in exporters uh, themselves and know how many changes have been made uh, as a result of all sides of politics taking the treatment of animals seriously. We export, over, uh, we export live animals to over 130 countries around the world. We do this. It underpins local regional economies, particularly the live sheep trade in WA. Um, absolutely employs thousands of people and contributes significantly to regional economies. And I was quite buoyed by the Premier uh, McGowan's commentary when the Labor Party, the now Agriculture Minister Murray Watt, uh, was all cock a hoot that he's going to shut down the live trade. And thankfully, the Premier in that state said, no, you're not, bozo. Murray wouldn't, Murray wouldn't know. I know, Senator Stirl, it's great to have you in the chamber. Uh, but, you know, that is amateur hour at best. Murray Watt standing up and proudly um, announcing that the city centric Labor Party, supported by the Greens Party, was seeking to shut down this vital industry to these regional economies. Because as the former um, contributor let the chamber know 
It, this is actually about fulfilling a cultural need in certain countries. It's about recognising that certain countries don't enjoy the level of development that we do. They don't have refrigerated truck networks. They don't have the types of things that we take for granted. And this is meeting a need. And if we can actually export um, safely, humanely, then that's absolutely what we should be doing. But once again, we have the Greens in here seeking to make farmers ashamed of what they do, that they're involved in a world-class livestock industry. Australia provides a variety of livestock class and breeds, and I think when you look at it's not just cattle, buffalo, sheep and goats um, for feeder, slaughter, breeding and dairy purposes. They are the gamut of livestock that we actually export in this country. It's not just sheep. Um, you often hear the argument, well, why don't we just set up all these abattoirs and slaughter them here and uh, we can s sell these 130 countries and millions of customers chilled beef, chilled goat, chilled buffalo. They don't have refrigerators. Their cultural practices are a little different to ours. They prefer to slaughter their own animals uh, according to their own local customs. And Australia provides the ability to give them that option in their home country humanely. Because it, if, if it isn't a live animal from Australia with our world-class animal welfare protections in place, it is from somewhere else. It is from somewhere else. And I can tell you, if you, if you want to be proud of our country, it's actually our um, animal welfare policies that you should be proud of. Um, in terms of slaughter methods used overseas, We've got almost 600 approved abattoirs in more, in more than markets that have been approved to slaughter Australian livestock uh, under the SCAS system. The exact numbers are held by the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources, uh, as they obviously regulate the trade. In the case of Indonesia, our most important market, pre-slaughter stunning of cattle has grown enormously from under 10 per cent five years ago to around 95 per cent today. And that's just showing each and every Day, each and every year, we are getting better and better at ensuring that world-class um, systems are in place, not just on ship, but once Australian livestock reaches um, the offshore market, that we can make sure that they are slaughtered in a humane way. In terms of the OPD um, before us today, I note um, that the Albanese government says it's committed to integrity and transparency and that the current agriculture minister takes the orders made by the Senate seriously and seeks to provide the requested information at its earliest opportunity. Due to the broad scope of the order, 1,304 initial searches have returned a high volume of documents. So we all look forward um, to the minister actually being as transparent and accountable um, as we seek him to be. The Senate is actually quite a very um, important mechanism in our democracy to ensure transparency of the executive government. But in terms of um, Mr McGowan, and as David Littleproud, um, the shadow agriculture minister, said, if we shut this trade down, we're simply exporting animal welfare standards to the other countries that don't have our standard, such as Ethiopia, such as Sudan. And we've got a responsibility and opportunity to get this right. Um, in terms of some of those opposite say, well, this is a diminishing market. Um, we can have all these local jobs and chip off the chilled, ship off the chilled um, product, not recognising that the markets actually don't want chilled product. We can already do that. The other argument is, well, it's a diminishing market. As these overseas um, places get more affluent, uh, more developed, uh, they won't seek uh, this type of product. Well, it's actually just not true, and I hate to put facts on the table when emotion seems to be the only game in town. Uh, $97 million last year, $113 million this year, uh, right now, and $130 million plus in the coming year. So this is actually a growing market, a growing market for our primary producers a growing market for our livestock transporters and the regional service industries that support them uh, right across the country, not just in regional WA. So I would
call on the Australian Greens and the Australian Labor Party, but particularly the Australian Greens, to support Australian farmers, because this is a global market. We export 80 per cent of what we grow, and we need to be proud of how we grow product in this country, proud of not just growing our vegetable crops, our horticulture, our grains, but obviously very proud of how we um, raise uh, cattle, sheep, goats and all of our livestock products. And instead of continually talking these people down like they need to go to bed ashamed of what they do every night, um, that young people in the cities are crying because Australian livestock are somehow being um, treated in unhumanely, inhumanely by Australian farmers or as a result of uh, Australian farmers running their business is a lie. Is a lie. It's perpetuated by those who seek to actually shut down our livestock industry to make sure we don't produce meat in this country. And the sad fact or the reality of them ever, if they ever reach the fruition of that outcome, is that some other country that doesn't treat their livestock as humanely as we do will just fill the gap. That's the reality. Um, so I support the industry. I look forward to the minister actually providing the documents in the efforts of transparency and accountability. And uh, I look forward to um, hearing from the Greens on how they want to shut our fabulous industry down. Uh, we won't stop standing up for it. Senator Shoebridge. I seek the House's leave because I missed the call. I'm sorry oh, to. Sorry, Senator Shoebridge. I missed a step in the process. If you just resume your seat for a moment. And the question before the chair is. I'm sorry, Clark, I missed that. Thank you. That the Senate take the question is that the Senate take note of the ministerial statement tabled by Senator Watt. Uh, those of that opinion say aye, those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Thanks, Acting. Deputy President, um, I seek leave to take note of document 10 in item 17, which is the Defence and Veterans Suicide Royal Commission interim report, okay. and also seek leave to continue my, my remarks. Yeah. Uh, is, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Shoebridge. I, I just seek leave to continue my remarks. Oh, okay. Yep. Right. Done. Thank you. Uh, the President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence, Climate Change Bill 2022 and Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022. I call the Minister. Thank you very much. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is... Uh, that the bills proceed that be read a first time. Um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Climate Change Bill 2022 and Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022. Minister. Thank you. I table revised explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is, is it the question or the lady? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that the debate be now adjourned. Those of th that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The minister. Thank you. I move that the resumption of the debate be made in order be in order of the day for a later hour. Uh, the question is as moved by the minister. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. 
President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the social, uh, social services and other legislation amendment lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the minister. Thank you very much. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. The minister. Uh, thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Um, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that the debate be now adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill of 2022, that the House concurs in the resolution of the Senate relating to the establishment of a Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia and of changes in the membership of Joint Committees. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to three laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate number two, reference standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Reference to Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee related to the Iron Boomerang project. Senator Roberts. I move the motion. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I seek to speak to it. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, Project Iron Boomerang is an exciting and visionary project that can make our country's north and make our whole country. Project Iron Boomerang's main elements are a 3,300-kilometre transcontinental railroad with heavy-duty axle capacity connecting existing rail networks in the iron ore region of the Pilbara to the existing rail networks in central Queensland. On the way, linking with the existing Darwin to Adelaide rail line to improve freight movement nationally. The essence of this project is that iron ore will be transported from west to east and those carriages then backloaded with coal to transport coal to Western Australia, hence the boomerang name. Steel blast furnaces in steel parks at both ends in the east in the Bowen Basin of, of Queensland, in the west in the Pilbara of Western Australia will in turn turn the iron ore and coal into steel slabs for export from Port Hedland in Western Australia and from Abbott Point and the Port of Gladstone in Queensland. Fibre optic, water, power and potentially gas lines can be laid along the rail alignment for additional commercial benefit. Project Iron Boomerang will strengthen Australia's balance of payments, lift our gross domestic product and with that lift our whole economy, restoring our national security, restoring opportunity. We have allowed too many industries to be closed and sent overseas. Too many jobs have been exported. It's time to turn that around. Project Iron Boomerang is not unique. The 1,440 kilometres Tarkula to Darwin Railway was completed only recently in five years at a cost of $1.2 billion across similar terrain, so we know we can do it. The total Adelaide to Darwin line is 2,975 kilometres. We can do this. Iron Boomerang is feasible and well within our grasp. At the very least, the project will create a freight and passenger line that will open up the top end and improve services to remote regions. The alignment will be used to lay a fibre optic cable and a power line. These services would ordinarily accompany a railway having this line's economic and security implications. Remote communities, often disadvantaged Aboriginal communities, 
will benefit enormously from access to high speed, reliable internet, reliable power, transport and permanent jobs. Imagine the transformation of inland northern Australia. There's a strong case for adding a water pipeline along the alignment to add potable water to the services that, I'm, that Project Iron Boomerang will offer remote communities. Lake Argyle in Western Australia is part of the Ord River, Ord River Irrigation Scheme. At 5,600 gigalitres, it is mainland Australia's largest dam. The Ord River Irrigation Network extends close to the start of Project Iron Boomerang. A connection could be made to bring potable water which is town, stock and station water, to remote communities. For too many years, successive governments have offered remote communities nothing except platitudes and paternalism while housing and services get worse and worse. Project Iron Boomerang offers a chance to change that future, to bring prosperity to Aboriginal communities, Australian communities, Northern Australian communities. The private sector, anxious to access cost-effective, reliable transcontinental and intercontinental freight and internet services, will meet much of the cost. Telcos are now showing a lot of interest in the fibre optic cable. The steel parks at either end are a large part of why Australia should move this project forward. In 2020, the world's largest steel manufacturer, China, produced 1, 000, 1 billion tonne, 1 billion tonnes of steel—1,066 million, to be precise. By contrast, Australia's two largest manufacturers, Liberty and Bluescope, produced just 12.7 million tonnes between them—1 per cent of China's production. Despite accounting for—and and by the way, the Chinese get their iron ore and their coal raw materials from Australia. Despite accounting for less than 1 per cent of world production, the Australian steel industry employs 100,000 Australians and adds $29 billion to our gross domestic product. Australia should be a leading manufacturer of steel. We hold the world's third largest reserves of metallurgical black coal and the largest reserves of iron ore, high quality iron ore. Yet we mostly export the stuff $145 billion of iron ore and $100 billion of coal, creating jobs overseas instead of here in Australia. Underlying world steel demand is expected to remain at 2 per cent growth over the medium term, with the new developing region of India, Bangladesh and Pakistan taking up the slack from maturing Chinese, American and European markets. If exports of coal for power are cut in the name of climate change, which one nation strongly opposes, substituting the use of coal for power with the use of coal for domestic steel will provide continuity of employment for the coal industry. And even Adam Bant has at last woken up to the fact that we need coal for making steel, so it's okay to burn coal now. Something that should keep the unions and coal miners happy. Steel is critical to the new economy, being an essential component of wind turbines and electric vehicles, amongst many other uses. Another economic benefit is fly ash, which is a byproduct of steel manufacture when the power source is coal. Fly ash can replace 20 to 30 per cent of the cement in concrete. Project Iron Boomerang will result in the construction of new concrete plants to utilise the steel, steel parks' byproducts. This will, provide more on, more, this will provide more employment and, of course, produce more concrete to secure the foundations of all those wind turbines that the Greens want to build and the damn walls that one nation wants to build. There are significant economic and environmental efficiencies from replacing the export of coal and iron ore with the export of steel slabs. Much higher value. Australia currently exports 950 million tonnes of iron ore, including 350 million tonnes of dirt, and 177 million tonnes of metallurgical coal for steel and 213 million tonnes of thermal coal for power generation, freeing the world's poor who haven't got electricity in some cases. This is shipped trucked and railed around the world. Then those transports return home empty. Project Iron Boomerang will eliminate that overhead from the price of steel and eliminate all the wasted energy in that supply chain. And that gives Australia an enormous competitive advantage in the steel sector. Australian steel slabs will be sent overseas as backloaded cargo for container ships, currently leaving Australia empty. More advantage to all, all importers and exporters from our country. It's likely and this is one of many claims for the committee to test, 
that these new steel parks, parks will be able to produce quality Australian steel 15 per cent cheaper than Chinese steel. 15 per cent cheaper than the Chinese and far higher quality. It's safe to say the project, with the support industries that will grow around the steel parks, will produce an economic benefit in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Hundreds of billions. The world steel market is worth $1.3 trillion. There's no reason Australia can't dominate that market, and with this project it will. Around 40,000 new breadwinner jobs will be created directly and indirectly, double that, or possibly much more. Project Iron Boomerang was granted project of state significance in Queensland in 2006. Yet this appears to have lapsed, partly through the need to coordinate three states on the project. And this is where the federal government is much better suited to advance the project. One Nation are proposing a committee referral with a view to recommending for or against the listing of Project Iron Boomerang as an Infrastructure Australia high priority project. The next step will then be a full business case, and that has a price tag of $240 million. Government must fund this before private equity will have the confidence to put billions of their own money into it. And we have nobody but ourselves to blame for the difficulty this project has had getting capital to complete a detailed business case. It's no surprise private industry are in effect saying to the government, we don't trust you. Once the federal government provides surety, it's likely that private equity will fund the major project elements. The railroad itself is costed at $20 billion, the steel parks around $40 billion, and supporting infrastructure another $10 billion. Increased government revenue of $25 billion annually, $25 billion annually, is likely for each $100 billion of additional domestic economic activity. One Nation does have a concern that the funding model will result in a high degree of foreign ownership, and this is something the committee can discuss. While we recognise that steel, company, steel customers may want to secure steel supply through joint ventures, One Nation wants Australian control through ownership. The work done so far in a business case proves the need to get serious about Project Iron Boomerang. I ask you for your support for this motion. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Stirl. Uh, Deputy President, thank you. I just want to uh, put a couple of minutes to support and thank Senator Roberts for bringing this to my attention. And I hadn't heard of Project uh, Iron Boomerang, but I sat down and got a briefing from Senator Roberts. And I remember it comes back to uh, when I was a kid growing up, and I remember in the great state of New South Wales, we used to do all this sort of stuff. We actually used to make our own steel. We used to have proud steel cities where there were communities, there was bonds, there was families before this fly in, fly out nonsense took over, before the farm was sold, if I can use that terminology as a farm. And it breaks my heart to think, with I'm watching my grandchildren grow up how disgusted they should be with politicians before us who thought this was a good idea to, to contract out work we used to do, and we did it well, especially when I pick up and I hear our conversations like what I've picked up in Senate inquiries on the, on the inland rail, where there's concerns of cheaper uh, 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 steel coming from China, nowhere near the Australian standard. And regardless of who's in politics or, or who's in government, I always still have a fear who are the ones who are supposed to be out there monitoring this stuff? Are they doing their job properly? And that's not a blue versus red conversation or a blue versus red blue, uh, uh, argument. I nearly said blue versus blue, but you know what I mean. So I want to support, and I know the, Australian, the, the Labor Party and, and Prime Minister Albanese and the Albanese government support you, Senator Roberts, for bringing this to us. I think it's a magnificent thing. And I also think this is what we should be doing. This is the big ticket items that, when I first came into the Senate, Lo and behold, I thought we would be discussing this stuff on a daily basis. <laughs> How tricked I got. But anyway, at least let's get back to it. The big stuff about building a better nation, as I said in my first speech, and leaving it better than what we found it. But I want to share a quick comment with the Senate. And I was in China and I met with Madame Fu Ying. And some may think who's Madame Fu Ying. Well, Madame Fu Ying is very highly regarded in the CCP. She was a, a China's um, uh, ambassador to Australia during the Howard regime. 
And I was joined by Senator, former Senators Gallagher and Dastiari, where Madam Fu Ying made it very clear to us how wonderful it is. Thank you, Australia, for sending us your coal. Thank you, Australia, for sending us your iron ore, because we turn it into steel and we make a, a heck of a lot more money selling it back to you, and we appreciate that. I want to support this, and we will support this, Senator Roberts. And I urge and I understand the opposition hopefully will get in behind us too, because this is the stuff we need to do. And once the beauty of speaking after Senator Roberts, you've heard the whole guts and the crux of the matter. I can't pick an argument in there. There's, there's not a downside that I'd see. And the beauty of it is that I know when it comes to my committee, the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, a committee that's been predicated for all the years I've been here to put aside all the political bulldust and actually dig deep, go wide, go varied, listen to everyone who's got a thought and actually try and deliver in the best interests of our nation. Senator Roberts, I'll tip my hat to you. I look forward to joining you on the uh, tour. And let's try and put these two great industries together, iron ore in my state of WA, coal in your state of Queensland. This makes too much sense. I'm starting to get a headache because it's sounding too easy. I might wake up in a minute and think I was only dreaming. Fully support you, Senator Roberts. The Albanese government will be backing you in on this one. Uh, thank you, Senator Stirl. The, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Roberts uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate, order of the day number one, relating to a motion for disallowance, a code for the tendering and performance of building work amendment instrument 2022 resumption of debate. Senator Scar. I thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I'm pleased to rise to speak on this disallowance motion in relation to the Code for the Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment Instrument 2022. And in doing so, I note that this, of course, is the first step, the first step in the Labor Party, the Labor government's project to abolish the ABCC, the Australian Building and Construction Commission, which is, as at today, as at today, is the only handbrake on the lawless activity of the construction division of the CFMEU. The only handbrake on the lawless activity of the CFMEU. I've made the point in relation to this discussion previously that when Minister Burke first uh, announced the abolition of this or substantial amendment gutting of the powers of the ABCC under the Code for the Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment Instrument 2022. In his media announcement, in his media announcement he did not, even dare, did not even dare to mention the CFMEU. He couldn't even bring himself to mention the CFMEU in relation to his announcement of the of the substantial amendment, the gutting of the Code for the Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment Instrument 2022. And so it is, so it is, Madam Acting Deputy President, when you actually look at the regulation itself, the delegated legislation itself, and you actually look at the proposed amendments, and then you go through and you look at the explanatory statement issued by the authority, issued by the authority, the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, again. The minister cannot bring himself to even refer to the CFMEU. Cannot even bring himself to refer to the CFMEU construction division, which is the whole reason why we have this apparatus called the Australian Building and Construction Commission, because of the lawless activity that is occurring on our work sites, construction sites all over Australia. And when you go through the explanatory statement, the guide to all the provisions, there is no mention of the CFMEU at all. Not a single mention of the CFMEU, not a single mention of the millions of dollars of fines which have been levied on the CFMEU or their disgraceful conduct on construction sites all over Australia. And as I've said previously in this House, and I will say all the way up to the next federal election, the fact of the matter is that the Labor Party is institutionally incapable, institutionally incapable of dealing with the lawless nature of the activities of the CFMEU. And I saw this just recently in our home state of Queensland when—and I'll quote from an article appearing in the Courier-Mail 
on 24 August 2022 in relation to an incident which occurred after this Senate last met. The title of the article, Hundreds of CFMEU protesters storm transport and main roads building in Brisbane CBD. By the reporter Madura McCormack, and I'll quote, Public servants have been put at risk, a government building forced to lock down and events cancelled after hundreds of militant construction union members stormed a CBD building in a protest gone awry. I'm not sure it was a protest gone awry, because if one looks at the conduct of the construction division of the CFMEU, this is what they do. This is their modus operandi, exactly their modus operandi. And I again quote, the Department of Transport Main Roads confirmed that more than 200 CFMEU members held a protest at the government's Mary Street offices on Tuesday about 9am before forcibly entering the building. This included knocking down a security guard who was not seriously injured, well lucky for the security guard, and exposing staff members to upsetting and unacceptable behaviour. What about the workplace rights of the security guard who was just doing his job, just doing his job, manning his post? going about his day when he gets knocked down by protesters CFMEU. What about his workplace rights? What about his right to a safe workplace when he goes about his business discharging his duties faithfully? Transport Minister Mark Bailey, who was not in the building at the time, unlike the poor old security guard, confirmed some staff were trapped in a server room to get away from protesters. So this was hardly a peaceful protest if there were staff actually trapped, public servants, Queensland public servants, no doubt many of them members of the Together Union, and I have something else to say about that later, no doubt many of the members of the Together Union trapped in a room, isolated because of the violent thuggery of the CFMEU. Queensland police confirmed they were called to protest action around 9.30am on Tuesday, though their estimates put the crowd at around 100 to 150. The annual Queensland Transport and Roads Investment Program industry briefing was due to be held in the Mary Street building that morning, with TMR Director-General Neil Scales scheduled to speak. But a TMR spokesperson confirmed police presence did not stop CFMEU members from helping others forcibly enter the building, with the mob then entering the conference room set to be used for the event. So it didn't matter the police were there. It didn't matter that this protest was so violent that Queensland public servants, no doubt members of a trade union themselves, had to call the police. That didn't matter. The construction division—and I'm not talking about the mining division, I'm talking about the construction division of the CFMEU—is lawless, absolutely lawless. I continue. And this is where it gets really interesting. This is where it gets really interesting. And there are members, senators sitting in this room, whose ethics and morals I greatly admire. Greatly admire, who sit on the other side of the chamber, who sit on the other side of the chamber. And no doubt, no doubt, as with me, they would agree with the principle of civil disobedience, peaceful protest, that sometimes you must take measures to make your voice heard. But in this case, in this case, They've stormed into a conference where there were three members of the CFMEU who actually had been invited to the conference to participate in the conference. To actually participate in this conference. And yet what do they do? 100, 150, 200 violent members disturbed the conference. The consequence, the, con the conference had to be called off. And subsequent conferences had to be called off because of the lawless nature of the construction division of the CFMEU's activity. Mr Bailey, who I must say is my local state member, defended workers' ability to protest but said, you must do it respectfully and you must do it peacefully, and that's not what we saw yesterday. And, I, and you know, I'm afraid that you know, I can't defend that at all, and I wouldn't defend that. No, nor would I, Mr Bailey, MP. I wouldn't defend it either. And indeed, the Premier of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk, MP, described the incident as follows. The footage is incredibly disturbing, and I would have hated being a person there with that happening. They owe an apology to those workers. An apology to those workers who were subjected to that and who felt, 
who felt unsafe. Palaszczuk said she understood police were looking into the matter. And how does the CFMEU respond? Is there contrition on, part, on the part of the CFMEU con construction division? Do they say, well, maybe we got a bit out of hand? Maybe our motions got away with us? We genuinely apologise? We show remorse? You don't have to be. You don't have to be Nostradamus to predict how the CFMEU construction division actually responded to that call for an apology. Why do I say that? Because you only have to read the many, many high court cases, Supreme Court cases, federal court cases, where repeatedly judges of this country have repeatedly said the CFMEU fails to show remorse. The construction division of the CFMEU repeatedly will not show contrition, will not show remorse. And this is what they said. This is what the Assistant Secretary said. And I'm not going to name him, Madam Acting Deputy President, because I believe this is a sick culture in this union. It is a sick, sick culture. But this is what he says. The issue seems like a bit of a storm in a teacup. It's a storm in a teacup. What happened? A storm in a teacup. A bunch of fluoro shirts attended the meeting, and unfortunately some people panicked about that. Workers simply just wanted to go and listen about industry projects that were coming up. We attended the meeting, the meeting got cancelled, and we left." End quote. That's from a senior official of the CFMEU construction division. No contrition, no remorse, nothing about the security guard who they knocked over as they ran into a peaceful meeting, which they'd been attended to participate in. They'd been attended to participate in the meeting. Not, nothing about the public servants who, no doubt, are members of the Together Union in my home state of Queensland who were trapped in a server room, unable to escape. Not a word. No contrition, no remorse. What's the problem? Objective achieved. Business as usual for the CFMEU construction division. Mark Bailey called on Rab Bar to make a public apology. Is that the same Rab Bar who sits on the ALP national executive? Maybe some of those here could ask him to make a public apology. Bailey said, I backed it in our workers from day one as their minister. I take that responsibility seriously, and they were mistreated by his union members. Mistreated by his union members. That's what a Labor minister is saying about the CFMEU in my home state of Queensland. And is anyone surprised? Is anyone surprised? Where will this end? Where will this lawlessness end? And how does the abolition of the ABCC actually promote lawful, safe working places? I've previously spoken in this place about the fact that Together Union, who may well be the union that represented the security guard who was knocked down and no doubt was also the union representing some of the public servants who essentially were deprived of their liberty and trapped whilst this violent protest was going on. I've previously spoken about the Together Union in 2019 having to take protected industrial action on behalf of occupational workplace health and safety inspectors because it was not safe for the occupational workplace health and safety inspectors to go onto construction sites in Queensland. That is how bad the situation is. And yet when the minister is in the process of gutting the ABCC, taking away all of the ABCC's powers in the explanatory statement, in the regulation, in all the documents in relation to this matter, there is not a single mention of the CFMEU. Not a single mention of the CFMEU and its unlawful behaviour. Not a single mention. It's the union whose name we will not utter. And the Labor Party is proving itself to be institutionally incapable of dealing with the situation of the unlawful behaviour of the CFMEU. And our public servants deserve better. Our occupational workplace health and safety inspectors deserve better. Everyone working on our construction workplaces deserve better than they have to deal with this unlawful behaviour. There was another case, Madam Acting Deputy President, where the reasons were brought down after we last met or in our last week or, or thereabouts. And this was another case dealing with the Australian Building Construction Commission, the CFMEU, in relation to Pacific Highway upgrade case number four. Because we know in relation to every single major infrastructure project in this country, 
involving the CFMEU, there are cases like this again and again and again. And I quote from Judge Humphreys, Judge Humphreys and what he says. It is perhaps appropriate, and this is at paragraph 52, it is perhaps appropriate to deal with the CFMEU first. This is a union which has a long and troubled history of breaches of the relevant workplace legislation. It is a union that appears to have a preferred mode of business that accepts prosecution for breaches of the relevant legislation as an occupational hazard and presumably the imposition of pecuniary penalties in the same casual manner. The judge then refers to the Pattinson case in the High Court, which I previously referred to in this place, refers to the judgment again in a case I previously referred to of the CFMEU and the ABCC, the Broadway on Anne case, and goes on and says, paragraph 56, given the findings of the High Court in Pattinson, the court is satisfied that it's entitled to look at imposing a pecuniary penalty at the very high end of the available range of penalties, in order to again emphasise the need for specific deterrence. And so it goes on. The court is also taking account that no remorse or contrition has been evidenced by the CFMEU. No remorse or contrition. Just like there was no remorse or contrition about the supposed storm in a teacup when the security guard, just doing, a bit, doing his business, going about his day, was bowled over by members of the CFMEU. No remorse, no contrition. This is their modus operandi, their way of doing business. And so the penalties in this case, another $100,000 penalty on the CFMEU. Just cost of doing business, another $100,000. Who cares? When's going to be our next protest? When are we going to pick at our next construction work site? This Senate has an obligation to consider the lawless activity of the CFMEU. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Sheldon. It's regarding the same disallowance matter, but you know, there's nothing that sets Liberal and National parties more in fits of hysteria than the mere mention of the CFMMEU. And I'm not sure if anyone in the opposition has ever actually met a CFMMEU member or official. They seem to think that construction workers and unionists are three-headed, fire-breathing monsters. After a lifelong trade unionist myself, I'm going to let the opposition on a little secret about trade unions. Union leaders are elected by union members. Union members are everyday rank and file workers, members of the community fighting for better conditions for their family and fair rates for their workmates and their families. So when the coalition gets up and talks about union thugs, they're actually talking about construction workers and those people fighting for decent rates. The people who built this building, built their offices and built their homes. And I know some of those opposite don't like to mingle with a hoi polloi, but if they ever find your way out of the boardroom of Qantas Chairman's Lounge or you meet a construction worker, you might realise they aren't that scary. When this disallowance motion was first introduced in the last sitting week in July, I spared myself from sitting through some of the absolute nonsense that was being sprouted in this chamber. And instead, I went over to the parliamentary theatre and watched the premiere of the screening of a documentary titled Lethal Bias, The War to Criminalise Australians, Australia's Construction Workers. It was commissioned by the construction union and produced by the celebrated former ABC journalist Matt Peacock. Anyone contributing to the debate should watch it. It is sparked with, with, it's packed with something that is often lacking from the debate about the ABCC and the CFMMEU. Facts. For starters, the notion that the ABCC has anything to do with making work sites safe is utter nonsense. Construction is up there with road transport as one of the deadliest industries in Australia. There is an organisation that goes onto work sites to make sure things are safe, and that organisation is the CFMMEU. There is another organisation that exists only solely to harass and impede the union from doing that work. That organisation is the ABCC. Lethal bias tells the story of Christopher Casentino. Christopher was an 18-year-old apprentice who died at a Macquarie Park worksite in 2019, when 17 metres of scaffolding collapsed on him. The scaffolding was massively overloaded. 
the scaffolding was not tied together appropriately. It was obvious to anyone who knew anything about scaffolding that this was a disaster waiting to happen. Christopher was trapped under tons and tons of concrete and steel. He was stuck under there screaming for help for 20 minutes. While his workmates, many of them in the CFMMEU, frantically tried to pull him from the rubble. Those are the real heroes. The ABCC never once bothered to look into the safety on that site or in any other site for that matter. What is the ABC doing instead? While well, Christopher and others are dying on construction sites every week, they are spending millions of dollars running court cases about stickers and flags. They are losing cases in the High Court seeking to block a woman's bathroom from being installed on a work site. The ABCC's core business is to stop the CFMMEU from making white work sites safe. The ABCC's core business is to protect shonky property developers and contractors who want to cut corners and use loopholes to squeeze an extra buck. When you cut corners on safety, construction workers die. This is a system the ABC exists to protect. This is a system the opposition is trying to save. Not only does the ABCC run a protection racket for deadly work sites, they run a protection racket for wage theft and sham contracting as well. In six years, the ABCC has, received, has re recovered the grand sum of $15,000 for sham contracting. In six years, the ABCC has not prosecuted a single employer for sham contracting. In six years, the ABCC has recovered $4 million in wage theft. In that same period, the CFMMEU has recovered over $100 million for workers. Now, despite the best efforts of the ABC to stop them from doing about their work, so the ABCC has nothing to do with safety or pay or conditions. That's obvious. So why are they wasting time with this disallowance motion? Of course, this is really all about the right wing's ongoing scare campaign about unions. Does anyone remember the Coalition's Royal Commission to the Unions? When the Coalition hired a sexual predator named Dyson Hayden to run a show trial more befitting a third world dictatorship. For those opposite who may have forgotten the dog and pony show did not lead to a single conviction. In fact, all it led to was the creation of the ABCC to continue on the anti-union witch hunt. And the first ABC commissioner, uh, Nigel uh, Hag Haggis, was forced to resign for breaching to get, and get ready for it. What was he breaching? The Fair Work Act. How about that? The Liberals went two for two, Dyson and Nigel. And I'll congratulate the current ABCC commissioner for being the first to avoid committing a crime or breaching the Fair Work Act, at least as far as I'm aware of. Although he does lose points for collaborating with the Master Builders Association during their campaign to re-elect the Morrison government. I would love to see Mr McBurney's notes from the 14 separate meetings the ABCC had with the MBA during the campaign. And of course, speaking of the Master Builders Association, perhaps the greatest farce of all in the debate has been the notion that the ABCC has improved productivity in the construction industry. The last time we saw productivity growth in construction was after the previous Labor government abolished the earlier alliteration of the ABCC. And since it was reinstated, productivity has actually declined in the sector. So what do the Liberals and master builders rely on to support this absurd argument? A survey commissioned by the master builders, which, is, as it turns out, has just 49 hand-picked respondents. A survey that has been described by respected University of Sydney economist Dr Philip Toner as, I quote, empirically empty and useless. Empirically empty and useless. And I couldn't sum up the ABCC nor the disallowance motion better if I tried. Thank you, Senator <laughs> Sheldon. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise uh, to uh, 
uh, talk about this disallowance motion. Earlier today in this chamber, I noted that Labor, like leopards, do not change their spots, and uh, neither does the CFMMEU. In 2016, when I first spoke in this chamber on the Building and Construction Industry Improving Productivity Bill, I quoted my old boss in the Army, General David Morrison, who said what has now become a very well-known uh, statement. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept, except in this case the standard the Labor Party walk, walk past is the CFMMEU. Uh, and they have their hand out for the 30 pieces of silver every time they walk past every illegal act and every infraction uh, from the CFMMEU. And I like uh, what Senator Shelton just said. This is not. This is not about the workers. This is about the criminal actions of those trade union officials. It is about criminal action of the officials. If only it was just about worker safety. If only they were just focused on that, our country would be a far better place, and the cost of construction would be a hell of a lot less for all Australians. If that was actually the case. So what we saw in 2016 and what many of us who are now on this side of the chamber talked about is exactly what they are doing today. It is a complete disgrace that Labor, with the support of some crossbenchers, who, who have been talking about nothing but integrity over the course of this campaign, are actually now considering getting rid of one of the most important integrity commissions in this country or, even if uh, not getting rid of it completely, getting rid of it in, pretty much in name only. The Gillard government lost the confidence of the entire building and construction sector in 2012 when it caved into union pressure to dismantle the ABCC, and nothing has changed. Again, another Labor Prime Minister is promising to abolish the ABCC or reduce it down to almost nothing. Again, this is further proof that they will always, always do anything they can to appease their paymasters at the CFMMEU, who they are clearly completely beholden to. Abolishing the ABCC is absolutely a matter of integrity, because while it's not called an integrity commission, it is clearly an integrity body, a body to promote the integrity, safety and lawfulness in an industry that has faced long-standing problems with industrial action. should never, ever be a question in this chamber. And yet here we are, six years later, discussing the same matter again. The facts about the CFMMEU are shocking. And again, despite Senator Shelton in this chamber just saying, oh, it's actually all about the workers, don't look at what the union officials here are doing, don't look at their corruption, don't look at their criminal actions, for which they have been prosecuted and found guilty of. So let's have a look at some of the actions that those opposite, for their 30, 30 pieces of silver, are trying very hard not to have anybody in this place or in this nation focus on. First of all, un unlawful industrial action. More than 1,400 breaches resulting from 20 cases have led to $3.6 million in fines. Coercion breaches. Coercion. In this day and age, coercion in the workplace. More than 470 breaches resulting from more than 37 cases, leading to nearly $6 million in fines. Right of entry breaches. More than 300 breaches resulting from 40 cases, leading to $4.2 million in fines. Freedom of association breaches. More than 120 breaches resulting from 15 cases, leading to nearly a $1 million in fines. Unlawful picketing breaches. More than 20 breaches resulting from four cases, leading to one, uh, over $1 million in fines. And if that's not enough, unlawful industrial action, coercion, Right of entry breaches, freedom of association breaches, unlawful picketing breaches. There is also misrepresentation breaches, almost 30 breaches resulting from six cases and nearly $400,000 in fines. So let's all ask ourselves in this place, and I hope across our nation, why on earth is Labor so desperate, so desperate to abolish this integrity commission? What crimes and why are they seeking to cover up these crimes? 
Well, the CEO of the Master Builders Association Australia, Danita Warren, said that the Labor government's decision to dismantle the ABCC is an abandonment of two decades of bipartisan recognition that the construction centre sector requires industry-specific regulation and also oversight. So let's have a look at what some of these behaviours that those on the opposite side of this chamber, and I hope nobody on the crossbench will actually support this, but let's have a look at some of the other breaches and what they actually look like. So the CFMMEU has been penalised for more breaches of the Fair Work Act breaches of the Fair Work Act than any other union. A CFMMEU office, official jailed for assault once told a female inspector she was an FS and asked her if she'd bought her knee pads as you were going to be sucking off something, dogs all day. This is what those on the other side, this is the behaviour, this is the language that happens still today that those opposite are still excusing. The Courier Mail revealed that a CFMMEU official allegedly barked like a dog at a female health and safety consultant on the Gold Coast construction site and said, go on, off you go, you FDC, go get your police. He allegedly then called her something I won't even abbreviate here in this chamber. It was disgusting and disgraceful and has no place in any, any workplace in this nation today. Now, some of the sexist incidents recorded in the files of the union watchdog included a CFMMEU official threatening to gang rape a woman after she had inspected a site. He threatened to gang rape a female inspector on site. How can anybody on that side of the chamber possibly, possibly excuse and take money from the officials from this union? You should all be hanging your heads in shame. One of the union officials also spat at a female workplace inspector during one uh, visit, and again I will not say the language that was used. In another visit, this same female inspector was called an effing S and a dog something by union officials while she was in there lawfully doing her job on behalf of Australians. CFMMEU delegates were accused of harassing the daughter of a builder when they picketed a work site. The picketers were accused of harassing the daughter of the builder when she entered the site in her car by commenting on her breasts and her bottom and making, again I won't say the sounds that they made, but it was an utter disgrace. They allegedly called her daddy's girl and a blonde bimbo and said, here comes the freeloader living off your dad's. That car belongs us because your daddy has paid for it. Again, again, that is by the very officials that are supposed to be setting the standard and looking after workers in the workplace. A CFMMEU official made three phone calls late at, uh, late at night to a female inspector's mobile phone. The last call logged at 11.23. PM. An anonymous flyer was then circulated, referring to the woman as a dog who wanted to be a pole dancer. The flyer gave the name of the woman's husband, her home address and her phone number. I cannot possibly think of a worse intimidation, not just for, any, for a female inspector but for anyone ringing them late at night, threatening and intimidating letting them know they know where you live, they know who your husband is, they know who your children is. Again, that is the behaviour that those opposites are again supporting. To that same, that same inspector, a number of threatening calls were made. And again, I won't say what was said, but again, there was a threat, threat of gang rape. Me and my mates are going to come and F you. The CFME, if that's not enough, there are plenty, plenty more examples. The CFMMEU officials at a site in Sydney intimidated a police female officer, a police female officer, but again, a female officer, in the course of doing her job, again, as a police officer representing us all and keeping law and order. And the women, the policewoman described how the official made sure that I was feeling intimidated 
and I was feeling scared. The court has also previously ruled that a female operations manager was subjected to intimidation by the picketers' actions, which Justice Rares described as, and this is the justice who described it as, calculated to instil fear into persons who are within or wish to enter those premises. A former Fair Work Building Commissioner employee was subject to intimidation by John Setka. Hardly a surprise, I think, to anybody in this building, but someone who is still protected by those opposite. Mr Setka and Mr Reardon made a number of sexually derogatory marks, and the woman found three missed phone calls from Mr Reardon and one missed phone call from Mr Setka, who left a highly sexually explicit derogatory message on her telephone. We would not ever accept that, and we've made clear we do not accept that in this place. It is illegal in every other workplace, yet those opposite and that some on the crossbench want to still look the other way. And as David Morrison said, turning, turning the eye and putting the hand out and taking the 30 pieces of silver uh, from the union. COVID-19 has significantly impacted on the construction industry and caused a reduction of more of over 600,000 jobs. And as we now recover from the pandemic, the demand for the industry is rapidly growing. Without this integrity commission, output in the industry could fall by at least $35 billion as higher construction costs make fewer projects possible and capital is relocated to other activities. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, the impact on Australians and on the integrity of every member of this chamber who votes to support the CFMMEU and votes to abolish the ABCC or to at least get rid of most of its powers should hang their head in shame. And anybody who does support that, please never ever come into this chamber or out of this chamber and talk about integrity. If you get rid of one of the most important integrity commissions in our nation, that has been shown time and time and time again, including to now, to be so important. If you vote to abolish it or to nurture it, you have lost your right to ever, with any credibility, talk about integrity. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Barbara Pocock. Madam Acting De Deputy President, I rise to support the Code of Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment instrument. And I do this because, for a couple of decades, I lived with a partner, father of my children, who worked in a job that meant he became a member of the CFMEU and then a delegate and an official. He is a good man amongst many good men. He never tolerated violence, a brave person who worked in a tough industry. I remember nervously watching him go to work as a union official the day after a brick had come through the back window of our car overnight. The building industry is a tough industry. That does not mean we should tolerate violence or misogyny. But that does not mean that we should, not make it, that we should make it impossible for delegates and officials in that union and members to do their jobs and to go to work safely protected by their union. Too many South Australian kids and adults have died on our building sites in my state. We need courageous people who are willing to be members and officials of a union that stands up to keep the industry safe, and we need to enable them to do their jobs. This interim building code regulation is a first step to ensuring construction workers have the same rights as other workers and other unionists. Workers should be treated fairly, as should unionists. The interim code is necessary to prevent unnecessary restrictions that have been imposed on the construction industry. The previous coalition government's building code banned clauses that ensured some uh, were not paid the same pay despite doing the same job. It prevented full-time apprenticeship ratios from being exercised, apprenticeship ratios that keep young people, apprentices, in the building industry safe 
uh, in the right ratio to more experienced workers. It also prevented the, uh, prevented, uh, pr the protection against sham contracting and, we found that, uh, and um, meant that workers were not protected uh, with safe conditions on their work sites. The previous go coalition government's building code went so far as to ban the flying of union flags and logos on notice boards, stickers on workers' hats. There are plenty of workers in, un in uh, workplaces across Australia who have got stickers uh, that, sim that are symbolic of their uh, membership of a union. Workers will now be able to bargain in the same way as other workers under the Fair Work Act and the anti-worker elements of the building code a highly politicised um, act will finally be removed. Workers should be treated equally regardless of the industry that they work in. Requirements for health and safety for workers are still protected under legislation and the Federal Safety Commission will be retained. It's vital to continue in particular protection of health and safety for workers in this industry. The ABCC was a political and an ideological attack on workers and unions, and instead of protecting workers' safety, it gave the previous coalition more power to persecute the very people who were trying to look out for the safety and fair treatment of people at work, so many of them young people. Instead of acting to address the real issues in the workforce, like ending insecure work, or closing the gender pay gap and lifting the minimum wage, the previous government spent their energy trying to break a union. They tried to break its solidarity, and, many made very, and it made very specific attacks on building workers. The ABCC undermined important protections for workers in their bargaining agreements, like being entitled to the same pay for doing the same job. The Greens have a long-held policy that has been to abolish the ABCC and prioritise workers' safety and community safety. The government's job should be to protect the rights of unions and their workers and not to undermine them. For decades, successive governments have looked after large corporations in many cases and that workers have needed the protection of unions to stand up. So we welcome this first step towards getting rid of what has been a very ideological and political body without real practical effect that worked hard to demonise particular workers and their unions, and we look forward to the full ab abolition of the ABCC. It's time our parliament focused on outlawing secure, insecure work, increasing wages, protecting the health and safety of all workers, and making sure that all workers have fair access to the same entitlements and conditions. Denigrating the whole union and the difficult circumstances that so many workers and delegates and officials do their work under is a mistake and we should proceed to support this code. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'm glad Senator Sheldon came back into the chamber to hear me speak. Because you put out a challenge to those on this side who actually knew a worker. Well, let me tell you about my grandfather. He was an ambulance man on the docks who suffered under the Painters and Dockers Union. He was harassed the whole time when he was there to protect their lives, to save their lives when there was an accident. You want to know why I don't like unions? Because they are full of thugs like the Painters and Dockers. My other grandfather was a carpenter, worked on building sites, again harassed by the builders, um, the BLF. Builders Labourers Federation. It was driven off building sites. You want to talk about people who know what it's like to be um, harassed by a union? Two, my two grandfathers were. That's who. And look at both of those unions, now both deregistered. So I will not be lectured to you by those on that side about the thuggery of unions and what they will do and the lengths that they will go to to harass those who stand up against them or won't join them. I just won't hear it. Right now we are going through some of the highest cost of living as, it, as inflation goes through the roof. The current headline, annual inflation, is 6.1 per cent. This is the highest rate of inflation in almost 32 years. This is the highest rate of inflation since Labor's 
recession we had to have. I think we're in for another one. The price of fuel has risen by 32 per cent in just a year, with prices rising for the eighth consecutive quarter by 4.2 per cent in the June quarter. The Coalition's cuts to fuel excise are coming to an end on the 29th of September, meaning under this government fuel prices are going to rise even further. Non-discretionary goods and services rose 1.8 per cent in the quarter, to be 7.6 higher through the year. Australians are having to make cost-saving measures, which for many Australians is going to feel like going back to the deprivations that they felt under lockdown, particularly in my home state of Victoria, where the Labor state government locked people down for the longest time in the world. They're going to have to make sacrifices in the name of being able to pay their bills. Australians need help from government with cost of living pressures higher now more than ever. However, Labor seems to have decided that now they are in government, they no longer have to campaign and win votes, and easing cost of living pressures was just a slogan during the election campaign, and helping Australians is no longer their priority. In the first 100 days of this Labor government, where we saw nothing happen, all we've seen is junkets, photo ops, a bit of a talk fest here and there. No plan was made to help Australians with cost of living pressures that Labor promised to fix. And what are the Labor Party doing about it now? Nothing. Their priority seems to be, very clearly, to be helping their union paymasters by reducing the ABCC's powers to the bare legal minimum. Now, one must ask, Senator Sheldon, through you, Chair, why is stripping the ABCC of its powers such a priority for this Labor government? Why is dismantling the ABCC so important to the Labor Party that it was one of their first two announcements that they made? Why is it so, with all the pressures facing Australians every day, that they decide that this is more significant to them rather than looking after Australians? Well, it's pretty obvious. I'll tell you why. It's to keep their union donations rolling in. The CFMEU over the past 20 years have provided the Labor Party with more than $16 million in donations. This is the very union where officials have previously been caught allegedly cursing at, spitting at, threatening to gang rape and even kill women. And my good friend Senator Reynolds outlined more atrocities that this union has done. We heard of the leader of the CFMEU, John Secker, had been found guilty of domestic violence on multiple occasions, including incidents where he bashed his partner's head against the table repeatedly, and another where he pushed her down a staircase. Is he one of the hoi polloi you don't want me to talk to? Because I don't want to talk to him. I don't want him running any organisation. The Prime Minister is a fan of saying, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. General Morrison's quote, as we heard before, that the Prime Minister seems to have grabbed hold of. And yet, by abolishing the ABCC, what is the standard that the Prime Minister is saying he's going to accept? That same behaviour of John Secker, same behaviour as we heard outlined by Senator Reynolds? This sort of union thuggery is unacceptable, and the Prime Minister should not accept it. And let us not forget that in analysis undertaken by EY, it was outlined that by abolishing the ABCC, there would be ongoing, create, it would create ongoing challenges which are likely to be more economically disruptive in this currently uh, harsh business environment. Specifically, labour costs could increase by around 8.8 per cent and a potential decline in productivity, something we heard this government talk so much about in its talk fest last week, could decline by 9.3 per cent. Not only that, but the output in the construction industry could fall by around 
$35.4 billion by 2030, and overall economic activity could potentially decline by $47.5 billion by 2030. This would come at a potential cost to taxpayers in the order of $9.5 billion by 2029 and an estimated reduction in investment, investment of $45.6 billion by 2030. So we see the Labor Party are willing to back thugs and throw the construction industry into chaos, all so they can continue to take their donations. And this will affect all Australians outside the construction industry. The last time the Labor Party abolished the ABCC, the cost of building infrastructure, so important to our recovery, rose an, out, an astounding 30 per cent. That's 30 per cent increase in costs to build hospitals, schools, roads, railways and other critical infrastructure. And this is at a time when the Victorian government infrastructure projects, the costs are blowing out um, wildly, and those on that side are going to push the costs even higher. The Labor Party talk about transparency, but when it comes to transparency over, about unions, they won't have a bar of it. As the Australian Industry Group said, the decision to scrap parts of the code and disempower the Commission is a backward step for the fight against bullying and intimidation that would result in health and safety risks and slow the delivery of infrastructure projects such as roads, hospitals and schools. This means that Australian tax dollars will be squandered just so the Labor Party's paymasters will be kept happy. Former Borrell uh, CEO Mike Kane has said that competition will be reduced as unions pick their preferred contractors and shut out others. That's not this Australia. That's not how we work. That's not how to run an economy. The ABCC does critical work supporting subcontractors with over $1.6 million paid to them following ABCC intervention in the 2020-2021 period. This is money going back into the pockets of everyday Australians. It is becoming clearer and clearer by the day that this government is good at doing the talk but not walking the walk when it comes to integrity. The Prime Minister said he would be a Prime Minister for all Australians, but it is clear that in his short time in office he is concerned about one thing and one thing only, protecting the protection rackets that he calls unions. We just saw this last week at the Jobs and Skills Summit. Despite unions representing less than 10 per cent of the private sector workforce, they had 33 seats at the table. Whereas, uh, meanwhile, small business, the engine room of our economy, representing 41 per cent of our workforce, had only one seat. It is really despicable representation of where the Labor government's priorities do lie. And just today, we've seen the ABCC release a statement stating that it has started a federal circuit and family court action against the CFMEU, CEPU, and two officials following alleged right of entry breaches at the 264 apartment residential tower project at 443 Queen Street, Brisbane. The ABCC is alleging in a statement of claim filed in the court that the CFMEU official Michael uh, Matthew Vonhoff and CEPU official Wendell Maloney contravened Section 500 of the Fair Work Act 2009. The ABCC statement of claim further says Ms Maloney believed, uh, behaved in an abusive and intimidatory manner towards the senior site manage, manager when he responded to a query about what was going on, saying words to the effect, "If you." speak to anyone, it will be the last time you work in the EBA industry. Is this really what you want to put your name to, guys? Is this really how you see yourselves and the side that you want to support? It's, it's beyond me that you can do this. These are the people that the Albanese government is protecting by dismantling the ABCC. 
And if the Prime Minister can actually say the words, the standard you walk past, the stand, it, it is the standard that you accept, then he's got to hang his head in shame and explain why he backs those people over everyday Australians. However, the Labor Party are not just, walk, not just walking past this disruptive, reprehensible behaviour. They are providing an avenue for it to continue and turning their back, whistling a loud tune and telling Australians to look the other way. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Lambie. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy. No, oh, that's not right, is it? <laughs> Jeez, I'm a bit slow today. Acting, acting Madam Deputy President, sorry. It's no fan that I'm not a fan of the CFMEU. Certainly, uh, I'm talking about the very conduct of the top echelon of it. As a matter of fact, if I had a dollar for every hour I have spent on those five letters, the CFMEU, whilst I've been up here the last uh, eight years, I can tell you I would be retired sitting in the Bahamas drinking cocktails. I would be so rich. There are some really bad apples in that union and everybody in here, and Labor included, you know it. You absolutely know it. You should be ashamed of yourselves. When you've got the union barg barging, barging into work sites and bullying workers to sign on, we've got a problem. They are using standover tactics, they are standover men. The Labor Party knows it. They know it. We've been out of control a little bit and put a bit of a choker chain on them for the last, what, five years or six years, and it's, it's been a pleasant experience. But I'll tell you what, she's open slather after today. They'll be like an army marching on with a really bad leadership because that hasn't changed. Culture doesn't change unless you change the leadership. The CFMEU squeezes employers who don't play by their rules. They force businesses to shut down. They physically and verbally threaten workers on sites. The CFMEU officials were caught calling female construction workers bimbos, daddy's girls, and we've heard the worst of the worst. I won't go over them. They told workers at Woolies that the union will make their life hard. Federal court judges have told the union that the time for their rule breaking was well and truly past, but here we go again back around the same circle. But you know what? The union doesn't see it that way because they keep on doing what they're doing and it's only going to get worse. We're going back to the good old days. Here we go again. This is what we're dealing with in the construction industry at the moment. It's the last thing that we need. We need tradies and their bosses to work well together, to have safe work sites. We've got to be building the apartments and the houses we need to get Australians into affordable housing. You know what tradies deserve? They deserve to go to work without being called homophobic slurs. They deserve to go to work without being harassed. They deserve a, they deserve a safe workplace. What do you know? Apparently the CFMEU, the unions, are supposed to supply that, and they're part of the problem. We have to work to, we, we have to, work to do in the construction industry. We should not be comfortable with what's going on, and we should be doing better for tradies and the people they work for. I want to be very clear here. All that doesn't mean I think the ABCC is great. It doesn't mean I wouldn't vote to replace the ABCC with something else or wind it back where it needs to be wound back. Where it needs to be wound back are the ultimate words here. I do not like the leadership of the CFMEU. I do not like their conduct. And it leaves a lot left to be questioned right across society. But that doesn't mean I think the ABCC is a good body. The thing that bothers me so much about what's going on in here tonight is the way Labor have gone about this, and it is disgraceful. This is the whole transparency, new government, you ha Didn't take long, she's all off. She's all off the table. The government has purposely gone behind our backs to gut the regulator a regulator their union donors don't like. How about that? Here come those donations again. Listen to them. It feels like the cavalry is coming into the Senate. That's what those donations feel like. It's amazing what years of political cash can do, what it buys you, what influence it buys you, but it sure as hell does not buy you safety on a construction site. Not when the bullies are on the loose. 
They have found a way to kill the regulator without having to win majority support from the Senate. You should never have done that. It's not right, and you know that, and it is shameful. If you want to cut the legs out from the ABCC, you should have put that to us fairly. If there isn't a, if there's a problem with the ABC, we should have fought it out on the floor. But oh no, 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 you didn't want to do that. You should have been able to defend yourselves, be brave, stand up, show some spine. Tell us why you believe the ABCC should be here. And even then I say you're not full of speakers over there. You're not exactly up there guarding them with everything you've got. How about that? You wouldn't expect anything less from you people over there at the moment to sneak around and find ways to give the CFMEU what they want without even putting it to the Senate. That's where we're at already. We're only on to the first week of September and that's where we're at with the Labor Party. How about that? Or is it called the CFMEU Party? Oh, to do it without even giving, getting majority of support. That's just absolute filth. That's dirty political tactics. And the worst part is that you're doing it for yourselves, for your election campaigns and for your future donations. You're a piggy bank for the CFMEU, and that is what you are. I honestly thought Labor would have been better than this. And here we go. Here's the true red coming out in its full colours. You know what? I'm not just disappointed. I'm mad and I'm disappointed on both of those things. I'm surprised at you, Minister Burke. Blow me away. Blow me away. I'm surprised at you even more, Minister Dreyfus. You surprise me more than anyone that you've let the CFMEU walk all over the top of you. In opposition, here you were telling us how much you care about accountability and all that proper process, putting things through parliament the way they should be done. And now you're in government, you do the same, you do this. You do this. You might as well be on monkey bars because the backflips are starting already. Here we go, three months in and we're on full go in the playground. Go those monkey bars. You find a way to strip funding and power from a regulator you don't like, a regulator your, dono your donors do not like, and you do it without even putting, up, putting it to us here in the Senate. How is, that for good? How is that good for trust? How does that show the Australian people that you take them seriously? The Senate deserves better than this. The Australian people deserve better than this. I called it out when it was a coalition doing it, and I'll call you out too for the next two and a half years, and I won't stop. I've had a gut full of what those political donations are doing to this country, to this country and its people, because it buys people in parliament, it buys parties, and it buys influence, and obviously it buys regulations that you can get rid of. You know this disgraceful behaviour and you have no shame. It's absolutely disgraceful behaviour, and yet you show no shame for that. Jeez. I've got to ask you where your conscience is. Fair income. You know you're not doing this properly either, but still no shame. For some reason, whenever a major party gets into government, you want to rule the roost. You reckon you own the kingdom. You want to be the king. How about that? You want to own everything in here or let others own you, take it which way you want. You reckon parliament's just a hassle that you don't have to go through because apparently you can come up with all the answers on your own. Makes me wonder what the rest of us are doing up here with all the captain's calls that are made. What's the point in the rest of us being here if you want to call the shots? If you don't want to do what you're supposed to do in Parliament, which is debate this out. You know there are a lot of businesses out there who have just come through COVID, who are just getting back on their feet, and they're wondering when the CFU is going to come knocking on their door. That's right. They're ready. They're going to come knocking on their door. There are tradies, builders and contractors who will have to go back to standing up against the bully boys in the CFMEU all by themselves. But apparently the Labor Party has no shame for that. They're not worried about it. They have no conscience. Those people should have had a say in this. Their voices should have been heard. And you haven't allowed that to happen. They should have been able to make their case. You should have heard them out, because that would have been the dignified thing to do. Instead, Labor is steamrolling our tradies. You're steamrolling them on behalf of the CFMEU because that's what they paid you to do. No need for proper parliamentary process over the CFMEU. No need to do a vote because they buy them. Because apparently the CFMEU, they're nothing less than God's angels. Choir boys. How about that? With a flick of a pen, you've made huge changes to the construction industry and let them off the hook. They're on the loose. 
with no care whatsoever on the retributions going to come to others. And none of us in here can do anything about it. So much for turning a new leaf in politics. So much for a new government going to lead by example. Pull! Just blew out like that. Great day. So much for consulting with the crossbench, doing things up here differently. It's all over Red Rover. Labor isn't interested in hearing all sides on, on this. You don't, care what I you don't care what I think about getting rid of the ABCC or what others think about getting rid of the ABCC, because if you did, you would have given us a bill. We could have all had it out to get this right. You should have done that right thing. Yeah, you wouldn't have come. You wouldn't have come to us and asked what you could have come to us and asked what we think and given us a chance to have our say on behalf of our voters. But oh no, you didn't do that. And what really gets up my goat is I would have worked with you on it. I would have come back. To, I would have gone back to my voters and asked them what they think and come up with some solutions. Because there are changes that need to be made. Everybody knows the ABCC has overstepped at times. I have no doubt that the coalition wants it for political reasons and that some of it, that some of its powers go too far. I hear that fight out. I would have listened to all sides. We should have been sitting in here fighting it out in the Senate floor. That's how it should have been conducted. Instead, we're going along the political games playing them once again. I feel like I've stepped back in time. Labor's playing games and no one else is invited. What do you know? They're having a party all by themselves. How rude. The back and forth is unbearable and it brings so much instability. And every time we have a change in government, the rules change for political reasons for a different set of donors at the parliament door because that's how it works up here. And that's really unfortunate and it's really unfortunate for the country. And by the way, there's 24-hour news circle, news cycle and the rest of the country is catching up on what these political donations are buying. The bottom line is it makes me really sad to tell both of you in here that you're underselling yourselves and you're being brought off really cheap. And that is the sad truth of the matter. The coalition give the construction regular stupid powers and stupid laws to get a good headline and embarrass Labor. Now Labor sits in the government seats, they hit back and gut the whole thing as if it's all bad and there's nothing going wrong in the industry. Oh please. Oh please. Meanwhile, everyone in the industry bounces back and forth between two extremes. And the instability in the construction industry is bloody unbearable, I can tell you. We never get to the actual problems that hurt tradies and their bosses, and tradies and their bosses in the industry deserve better than this. Builders and small businesses deserve better than that. And that's why I'll be supporting this disallowance this evening. But what I tell you what I am looking forward to is watching the CFMEU, CFMEU run an absolute muck. And I imagine it's only going to be oh, just after Christmas there, because trust me, they're way too big for their boots. And now that you've taken that choker, tra choker chain off them, they're on the loose. You have completely lost control of the CFMEU just like that. And that's going to play havoc on our industries right across this country. This is a very proud moment for the Labor Party. Three months in and this is where we're at. Quite frankly, I look very forward in the coming months, in the coming months of standing up here and absolutely berating you for doing what you're doing because by then it's all going to be out in the papers. They are going to be completely out of control and we're going back before the ABCC was even put in place. I know we know there's things wrong with the ABCC, but to gut it the way you did, you were inviting problems, and they're big problems. You have no control. If you want to continue to allow yourselves to be bought off by the CFMEU because of their political donations, because you really won't back yourselves to win future elections, and that makes a very sad day for this country today. But to, let that instruct, but to let that construction industry on the lo off the loose, on the loose is one of the worst things I've seen so far this year, and it is only going to get worse. But once again, I look forward to coming in here very shortly and berating you on their behaviour, because I know exactly where it's heading. 
You cannot, if you do not, you cannot change the practice of things and the culture of things if you do not change the leadership. And if you think that leadership has been sitting silent, that's because it knew you were coming into power. And now it's allowed, you've allowed them to take complete advantage of you, and you should be ashamed of yourselves. But the menace, the menace is in there, and what they are going to do to this country in the next six to 12 months, by God forbid, I look forward to you standing up and explaining yourselves. We all do. Bring it on. Senator Hughes. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Thank you. you may identify as, I assumed a gender, my apologies, Acting Apology Deputy accepted. President. And, you know, look, it's been a little bit of jet lag here, I apologise. <laughs> but <laughs> Senator Lambie, you know, just an outstanding contribution and completely spot on. Completely spot on. And the thing that gets me, because the heads are down for those that are forced to be in the chamber on the other side, and again, you know, kudos to Senator Sheldon for being the only person brave enough to actually come in and try and defend this, because those opposite in the previous parliament were the bastions of treatment of women. Women needed to be protected. They needed to be looked after. They needed to be safe in their workplace. And I remember many a speech from the far left and those opposite about how women needed to be safe in the workplace. Well, never again should any of you, any of you have the gall to come in here in any shape or form and demand that women be safe in the workplace because you are opening the doors wide with a big welcome sign to the CFMMEU to come in and make women unsafe on the workplace, unsafe to be abused, to be pandered to, to in a way that is misogynistic and condescending, that women may never be able to achieve anything on a building site for being shut down by misogynistic bullies, and the fact that you come in here and you know you are the government. You actually owe responsibility to all Australians, not just your mates who pay for your votes. It is an absolute disgrace. And any woman who sits in the ALP or the Greens and deems this worthy to pursue, never again open your mouths about the safety of women in the workplace. For the hypocrisy may ensure that you burst into flames immediately. I mean, we can all put up with a lot in this place, but the blatant hypocrisy that you lot are going on with is just astounding. Because we hear from Senator Sheldon and those opposite that the breaches that have occurred are because of a sticker on a helmet, because a flag was flying. Well, I can tell you there's a few flags flying around here that I'm not too happy about. But I still turn up to work, and pretty much I make sure they're hanging up in the right way. For those virtue signalers that couldn't even get the, the, the flag flying in the right direction, hanging it the correctly, because they're so concerned about it, they don't even notice which way to, to put the flag. But you know, never let a good virtue signal, never let a symbol get in the way of actually improving anybody's lives. So I thought, you know, as has been done, and, and I'm sure I apologise to those in this place if I repeat any, but outrageously I may not, because there are so many breaches that the CFMMEU has conducted and been through the ABCC for. There is actually such a litany of breaches and abuses on work sites that I'm pretty sure every member in this place could speak for a good 20 minutes and just read them out and just keep going and keep going. Keep going, but it would probably take us through to the end of the year because those opposite who you know, campaigned on transparency have ensured we have as few a sitting weeks as possible to hold them to any form of account. And I would actually commend Senator Lambie for also making the point, where are you all? Who's here to defend them? As I said, Senator Sheldon, he's turned up. Where are the rest of them? You know, SECA might not be sending the cheques if you're not here to really stand up for him. We know you're all going to vote there. But your, your tummies might not be as tickled as heavily if you're not here 
not here to defend him and say how absolutely fantastic the CFMMEU is. So I just thought I would go through a few of these because, as we know, this is a union that's been penalised for more breaches than any other union. And in some ways, maybe it's a bit unfair that we do pick on the CFMMEU because there's plenty of others with breaches as well. But it's just that these are so breathtaking in the blatant behaviour, the misogynistic behaviour, the abuse of women. And for those who purport to be such great supporters of the LGBT community, there is a term that Judge Vasta felt so appalled by, he had to put it in a lecture on his judgment to explain what it meant. The prosecutor didn't know what it meant, and I'm going to tell you, I didn't know what it meant either when I first heard the term. And whilst those charged with this are appealing the verdict or the decision, they're not appealing that they said the term, they're appealing that it was homophobic in nature. Now, this is a term which I won't repeat in this place. I didn't know what it meant. And I read Judge Vasta's annexure and I felt physically ill. Well, maybe go and read the annexure. And if you think calling someone the term that was used, Senator Chisholm, the term that was used that is so vile, that is so vile, do I think that, and in fact, you know what, just for your benefit, because you, Senator Chisholm here seems to think attacking the judge is something that should be brought out. A homophobic slur, pumpkin eater. Do you know what it means? I didn't know what it means. But go and look it up. It is the most disgusting homophobic slur I have ever heard, ever heard. And those CFMEU members that are appealing the decision, and as you snicker over there, and a female Labor senator snickering over there, as this was said, they're not appealing that they said it. They're appealing that they didn't mean it in a homophobic way. What a disgrace. So don't ever come in and say you care about women's safety on workplaces. Don't ever come in, and I'm looking up the far left of the chamber who pretend to be all virtue single about LGBT. Don't you ever come in as you defend the ABC, as you defend the CFMMEU, tear down the ABCC, as the most homophobic slurs are allowed to be put around on work sites, not denied that they're said. The fines that are given are just the cost of doing business to these unions. That Australians are allowed to be treated this way on their workplace, whether they're a gay man, whether they are a woman. The fact that the, those opposite of that whole side of the chamber think that this is, a, this is a union that we just heard up here is filled with decent people doing wonderful things. Well, I'm pretty sure most gay men being referred to as a pumpkin eater probably wouldn't think that was a nice thing. And I'm pretty sure women, and I, 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 I identify as a woman, was born as a woman, maintained myself as a woman, I breastfed my children all of those things. And I can tell you, if someone referred to me as an effing slut, that I needed knee pads because I'm going to be sucking off these effing dogs all day, well, you know what? I'm pretty sure I wouldn't take it as a compliment. I wouldn't go, that's a pretty crack and workplace I want to head back to tomorrow. I think that'd be something that I might have a look at and think, well, you're not a particularly pleasant person. I don't think you're providing a safe workplace for me. I don't think you're defending my rights as a worker. I would suggest that calling someone those things and a woman those things might actually be considered a little derogatory. And as those officers were the bastions of the Jenkins Review that we needed to adopt everything because everyone needed to feel safe in their workplace. I mean, we know Senator Thorpe pulled out a cracker to me last December, which, you know, if I wanted an apology from Adam Bant, I apparently needed to go and get it myself and ask for one, because, you know, that's the class and consistency of that lot up there. But the abhorrence that was actually, well, to be fair to the ALP, not everyone, a couple of them, a couple of their decent members, did come and see me and say that was the most abhorrent thing that they had heard. And it was, to be fair, while she, in reference to my son with a disability, 
could have been misinterpreted in another way. It wasn't meant that way, as no one heard it that way at the time, at the nature of the debate. But that's equivalent in some ways as being referring to the effing S. Now, maybe I could enjoy it. Well, maybe I could, Lydia could get to the CFMMEU and they'd actually welcome her language. Now, again, I think we're all clear that if you turn up to work and bark at a woman like a dog, it's not really a sign of affection. It's not really saying to them, I value your work. I welcome you into this workplace. But yet, that wasn't enough for this CFMEU official. He then called her an effing dog C. Now, as most women will tell you, uh, when someone tells you they'll see you next Tuesday, you usually think they're asking you for coffee. But occasionally in the CFMEU, that's not what they mean. They think that you should go to the police, you effing dog. Now, again, those opposite, and of course the, hypo the hypocrites of the century up the far end, will again insist at any opportunity that they can grandstand, because they love saying Parliament House isn't a safe workplace. I can tell you I feel very safe in this workplace, and most people I speak to feel very safe in this workplace because we don't refer to each other as effing S's or effing C's. Well, maybe some do, but certainly not in this chamber, and certainly with not it being considered unparliamentary language. But I can also say that I've never, maybe I'm not paying attention, but no one's ever threatened to gang rape me. Now, rape's not about sex, it's about violence. It's not about thinking she's a bit of all right and a few of us are interested in you. This is an act of absolute misogynistic violence. Yet women on work sites are being subjected by CFMEU officials to threats of gang rape. But yet we will hear from those opposite that the ABCC is interested in stickers on helmets. No, they are not. No, they are not. They are interested in protecting people on workplaces and work sites from being abused to having the most derogatory and offensive language used, not even behind their back, at least in this place when people say stuff about you. It's usually you know, kind of in the background. You hear about it through the corridors occasionally. But this is to their faces on site. I mean, I guess maybe that's what you think because, you know, Hypocrisy is your special flavour, but you might actually welcome the CFMEU because not so much hypocrites is just blatantly revolting. They don't hide behind what they do. They, they, actually, they actually promote people that behave in this way because, as I said, they see these fines from the ABCC as just the cost of doing business. I mean, it is, as I said, we could just keep going through these. And, and, you know, Threatening phone calls, three of them, late at night to a female inspector. Three threatening phone calls. Is this the way the ALP and the Greens think anyone should behave? That women should go home from work? It's not enough that they're being abused on their work site, but they should go home from work to be subjected to a continuing form of intimidation and harassment. I genuinely ask the question. I look forward to hearing from those opposite as they go through these litany of findings from the ABCC, as they go through the decisions that have been made, the fact that women are—I mean, it, just, I mean, it almost seems silly to think that anyone could be offended for being called a bimbo or a daddy's girl on a site, because maybe they should be grateful they weren't called the effing C. I mean, it's almost like. The person who called them the bimbo and the daddy's girl didn't get the memo that we'd up the language. I mean, I feel like that was the kindergarten side of things, and those that had moved up the more senior echelons of the CFMEU used language in a terms that were completely derogatory to the point that they cannot even be used in this place. So I do look forward, and I, and I hope we see some of them tonight, if any of them are actually paying attention 
They could put on Channel 104. It'll tell them what's being debated. They won't even have to think for themselves. They can come in here and they can just say to us, we think it is completely appropriate to refer to women as effing C's at the workplace. We think not only is it appropriate to call them effing C's at the workplace, we think it's completely appropriate to continue that harassment and intimidation when they go home with late night phone calls. Because we don't think women should be safe in the workplace, but we're going to hypocritically stand here at every opportunity and bark on about safety in the workplace whilst they allow this to occur. Senator Shoebridge. Um, Acting Deputy President, I rise um, with my Greens colleagues to uh, speak against this disallowance motion. And I start at the outset by acknowledging the contribution of Senator Barbara Pocock, who clearly put the case for why this disallowance motion is just part of the coalition's ongoing attack on unions part of the coalition's bias against unions, and I commend her for her contribution. The, the creation of the ABCC and the code that they enforced, the aggressive code that they enforced, was a deeply political attack by the Liberal Party, who designed a body uh, to target unions and to target workers and to do everything they could to make it unlawful to be a union in this country and particularly in the construction industry. We've seen repeated million-dollar fines and police raids, uh, trumped-up criminal charges, uh, perhaps the harshest anti-union laws directed against the construction unions uh, that, that, exist in, um, um, that, that exist in any, any comparable country in the planet. And of course, this was all drafted by former PM Tony Abbott and the now disgraced former High Court Judge Dyson Hayden. And, and it was designed by those two to target the construction industry, construction union, and try to put the union out of business. And, and, and while millions and millions of dollars of public money has been lavished on this attack on the construction union, the industry is largely unregulated. And construction firms that kill their workers kill their workers, kill young apprentices, kill their workers, go off without even a single prosecution. And, and, and what do we hear from the coalition about the deaths of building workers? Not one word. Did we see anybody from the coalition go and see the film Lethal Bias? Did any of them, did any of them go to hear from the parents, hear from the mums, hear from the dads who were talking about their kids who went to work at a construction site unregulated because of your rules, without a union because of your rules, their kids who went to work and died on site and didn't come home and not a single word from this bunch of hypocrites yes. over here. Not a single Order. word from them. Not one word. Because they're still backing in Tony Abbott's war on unions. They don't care about the young apprentice who's killed in the scissor lift or the falling or the, or the, or the, or the collapsing scaffold that's been dodgily put together without, and, and where, where it's a crime for the union to go on and do a safety inspection under their rules. They don't care. They don't care. They want to criminalise the union, take the union out of business because they don't care. Well, we won't support that code. The lawless in this industry is not, is not from people putting stickers on helmets or posters in lunchrooms. The lawlessness in this industry comes from builders cutting corners, cutting safety corners, excluding the union, failing to live up to their work health safety um, obligations, and seeing workers go to work and not come home. That's the lawlessness from the unregulated industry that, I've got to say, at a state level, has been a combined project of Labor and coalition governments, deregulating the construction industry, making it one of the most dangerous industries in this country, making it full of Phoenix companies, tax dodgers, work health safety uh, breaches and crimes. That's the industry they love because it maximises profits, and they don't care about the apprentices that don't come home. 
They don't care about the worksite safeties. They want to have a war on stickers and a war on flags. They want to have a war on stickers and a war on flags, not a war on safety or protecting anybody, because that's their politics, right? That's their politics. They hate unions. They hate unions. They love profits, and they don't give a rat's about safety. That's the coalition summed up in one go, and that's what this motion is. Now, a watchdog with teeth is clearly needed, clearly needed in the construction industry to keep an eye on the employers and and to keep an eye on unions if they step out of line, but not to be running multi-million dollar cases because you don't like a bunch of posters in the lunchroom, or, or, or run multi-million dollar cases you, because you don't like stickers on someone's hats or a flag on a crane. What are you afraid of with a flag on a crane? And I, and I appreciate some of the work of Josh Bornstein. Josh Bornstein has fought some of these nonsense cases, and he wrote a piece in March of this year, um, in March of this year, setting out um, just some of the outrageous hypocrisy in this space. So, so while, 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 while union officials were being prosecuted, there was a pros and he points out this: a prosecution of union officials who visited a union delegate to catch up over a cup of tea. That was the prosecution. A union official catching up with a union delegate over a cup of tea, case commenced by the ABCC. Do you know what the federal court said about it? This is what the federal judge says. He says it's a case where the ABCC should be publicly exposed of having wasted public money without a proper basis for doing so. But you love that. It's not your money. It's just taxpayers' money. You, you don't read the judgment. You don't care. And, and, and then he says, who can forget the televised raids by federal police on the premises of the Australian Workers' Union in late 2017? And apparently because they didn't do their paperwork 10 years ago, 10 years ago, a highly publicised televised raid on the AW for 10-year-old paperwork, all paid for by this mob, all paid for by the taxpayers under this mob's um, government. And, 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 he, and, and Bornstein, also points, Bornstein also points out and I'll quote, in his zeal to prevent union officials from attending workplaces, Nigel Hodgkiss, the then head of the ABC, published misinformation encouraging employers to restrict unions from accessing workplaces. Such conduct was found to have contravened the Fair Work Act, and Hodgkiss was forced to resign in 2017. The ABC itself engaged in serious, unlawful activity. And what did we get from this lot? Not, not even embarrassment. They just put some new head kicker into the ABCC. They don't even care. In fact, they gave Hedgekiss a nice little retirement gift after, again, at public expense. And then um, Bornstein says this as well. Two years earlier, that's two years before Hedgekiss breached the Fair Work Act, the head of the ABCC breached the Fair Work Act to try and discourage union activities. He says this, two years earlier, two union officials had their lives turned upside down when they were charged with blackmail over a coffee meeting with company executives to discuss an industrial dispute. The charges fell apart three years later. Fell apart. Fell apart. But that's what they want to spend taxpayers' money on. And meanwhile, under their watch, when the corporate regulator, ASIC, when it, 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 it exposed what was going on in Crown Resorts, ASIC said, under the coalition's watch, and again I appreciate Bornstein's summary here, ASIC said that it would not prosecute the directors of Crown Resorts, notwithstanding findings by an independent inquiry that Crown had engaged in, and I quote, conduct that was variously illegal, dishonest, unethical and exploitative. And, in fact, over, and that occurred over many years. And according to the Finkelstead inquiry, the illegal conduct included money laundering, lying to the gaming regulator and tax cheating. And its board was found to have failed to ensure that the company met its legal obligations. But this lot, this lot love Crown. They love Crown. And they love the gross illegality uh, and illegal illegality Senator of Crown. Rich. They love it. Senator Cobb, I can report of order. Of order on relevance, uh, Deputy Chair. We are talking about uh, a disallowance on the ABCC. We're not talking about Crown um, and they're not, they're not talking about Crown. We're talking about the ABCC uh, and the disallowance motion in relation to the ABCC. We're not talking about uh, other you. matters in the economy.
Thank you, Senator Colbeck. You have reminded the Senator of the subject that we're discussing right now, disallowance, and I return back to Senator Shoebridge. Well, I, I understand the embarrassment about having the hypocrisy of your government pointed out, your former government pointed out. I understand that it's awkward having the gross double standards and hypocrisy being pointed out, where you're willing to prosecute unions for stickers but not a, a, an un, a, not a multinational gaming corporation that was found to engage in money laundering and criminal activity uh, under your own watch. I understand the, the, the hypocrisy is awkward to hear. I get it. I get it. And I get it's awkward. But let's be clear. The risk to worker safety is not flags. It's never been stickers. The risk to worker safety in the construction industry is the is the lawlessness and the deregulation and the attacks on unions and the attacks on safety. That's what means young apprentices go to work in the morning and don't come home. That's why construction workers uh, have one of the, uh, tragically, deaths on a, weekly, on a weekly basis on construction sites. It's not about stickers. It's not about flags. It's because of the war on safety and the war on unions and the deregulation and the property developer donations that this mob sucked down day after day, the property developer donations that roll like gold into the Liberal Party's coffers federally, creating the lawlessness that's creating the safety issues on the construction sites. Of course, we don't support this disallowance motion. Senator Rennick. Did stand okay, first. Thank, thank you, thank you Acting uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, well, 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 we couldn't expect anything better from an inner city uh, 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 barrister who basically pro uh, loudly proclaimed that he was a proud member of the BLF and, and, and worked with the BLF uh, in his former history. But can I say, this isn't about attacking the union membership. Well, I want to be very clear about this. This is actually about protecting the union membership from union officials who use violence and intimidation against workers. Okay? There's all this like somehow this side of the chamber doesn't care about working class Australians. This side of the chamber believes in working class Australians. And I can assure you it's the inner city elites, whether they're big companies or big unions, there's not much difference between the two of them these days, or big bureaucracies. So to come in here and accuse the Liberal Party of not standing up for working class Australians, okay, come to Queensland, Senator Shoebridge. I'll tell you who the working class Australians stand up for uh, up there. They stand up, look at the outer metropolitan seats. The working class back us because we back the working class. We back the working class because we have seen what 30 years of labour and their union mates have done to our economy in Queensland. They have run it into the ground. They have run it into the ground. Okay? And for you to come in here and talk about hypocrisy, Senator Hughes just gave one of the best speeches I've ever heard in this chamber, calling out the hypocrisy of those on the other side. They come in here and they feign like they care about women. They feign like they care about workers. They feign like they care about essential services. They don't care about any of it. All they care about are their rivers of gold. And why is that? Because the CFMMEU over the last 20 years has put more than $16 million into, into the Labor Party. And that's just one union. Okay, so for you to come in here and say that somehow we are living off other donations or anything like that is totally false. But not that you'd know. Senator Shoebridge, living in your little glass uh, ivory palace in Sydney, in your eastern suburbs, mate. Don't talk to me about the battlers, mate. Don't talk to me about the battlers. You know what Queensland Health, who blew billions of dollars, who blown billions of dollars on the Sunshine Coast Hospital, that money, that money got sucked out of maternity wards in the regions because of cost overruns, because of union bullying that's going in to inner city Brisbane. They're building casinos. They're building a tunnel that goes from one side of the city to the other. That's going to cost about $10 billion. It's already got a couple of billion dollars in overruns that's going from one side of the city to the other. Okay? So don't come in here and talk about—because you know what that does? That kills essential services. 
That's what kills central services. And all you care about is casting aspersions that somehow that the Australian Building and Construction Commission is, is a some spurious body. Well, here's a little fact for you. 98 of the 107 cases okay, have prosecuted the unions. Okay? That is not a spurious. Okay, have found the unions guilty. Right? That is not a spurious. This is not a spurious body, and it's, I'll tell you what, it's one of the few bureaucratic institutions or judicial institutions, well, bureaucratic and then the judiciary, that actually achieves something. That actually achieves something. This is an over 91 per cent success rate. Okay? And, and, and you come in here and you mock this. You trivialise it by somehow saying that this body is, is uh, going after the unions because they're waving flags or flying flags or there's stickers on their helmets. No, no, no. This is much, much more serious than that. This is about violence in the workplace. It is about cost overruns. It is about misogyny. It is about the fact that the money that's being wasted on, on effectively cost overruns because of the mates, you know, the tier one construction companies, because I can assure you that we're no friend of the big tier one construction companies. They're in bed with big unions. So this whole idea that you're going to keep painting us as the party for the big end of town. No, 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 no. The Greens party is the party of the big end of town. Look at where the green seats are. They're all in inner city, Brisbane and Melbourne, and the teals are all in the rich suburbs. This party, the unicorn party, the Greens party is the party for the elites who don't want to actually go and do the hard, hard yards, not like the workers who put their nose to the grindstone. I can tell you what, those seats, they're all, they're, they're all coming our way, especially in Queensland. We're starting to see it in Western Sydney. We see it in outer Melbourne, okay, because you guys are only interested in your rivers of gold and your command and control where you get to dictate the rules to everyone. A classic example was vaccine mandates. When you guys could have stood up for those workers who exercise their free and democratic right to choose what they, goes into their body, where were the unions then? They were nowhere. Or, or should I say, where were the union officials? I've just got to be distinguished there between the membership, who actually I do care about because they are the people, they are the workers, they're the people who put their nose to the grindstone. But the union officials and the Labor Party are not interested in the workers. What they're interested in doing is driving small business into the ground, getting into bed with their big foreign owned tier one building constructors, uh, contractors and the unions and making sure they rip out rivers of gold, whether it be via union fees, superannuation fees, managing over a trillion dollars in wealth on behalf of the workers, and they've then marched on into the corporate boardrooms via their industry super funds, running, running our, our companies into the ground. Into the ground. So I'm just going to run through here, okay, just, just exactly uh, the bad, you know, the misbehaviour that the CFMEU and many other unions get up to, okay, this, is the, this is the abuse and misuse of power by these union officials who aren't actually standing up for the workers, who aren't standing up for the workers, the guys that go, go to work every day, get out of bed, put their nose to the grindstone. No, 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 no. They're not interested in that. They're not interested in that. Okay, so let's go through this. They've paid $2 million in penalties just in the last financial year alone. Okay? The Australian Building Construction, uh, Building Construction Commission has, has, against the CFMEU has received a successful outcome in 80 of 88 cases. Uh, over $16 million in penalties have been awarded against the CFMEU and its representatives since the, uh, December 16. Another $22 million in penalties have been awarded against the CFMEU and its representatives in cases brought by the Australian Building and Construction Commission. These aren't trivial amounts of money. These aren't trivial amounts of money. They're not penalties or fines because you know, someone wore a sticker on their helmet or they, they flew a flag or anything like that. No, 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 no. This is all because of violent, uh, misogynist behaviour that is going on within, the union, uh, within unions and on the workplace that is actually intimidating people from working there and it's also increasing the cost of building essential services, and I'll tell you what, we need to start building in this country. Right? If we're going to get this country, keep this country on its feet, we need to get more, more infrastructure going in this country, but you cannot do it 
because of this cosy relationship between tier one foreign building constructors and the union movement, or, or should I say the, the, the union officials that are basically doing out the taxpayer because the taxpayer is forking out billions and billions of dollars more than they need to to build this essential infrastructure. And it's got to stop. It has got to stop. But let's just go through some of the actual um, terms and, and misbehaviour, egregious misbehaviour by union officials on their own members. And that's the thing about the Australian Building and Commission um, Construction Commission. It's actually a union that actually fights against union officials. I mean, if the unions were doing their jobs properly, and actually the union officials were doing their jobs properly, the actual me uh, members wouldn't be intimidated. They wouldn't be uh, uh, assaulted. They wouldn't be having these spurious names, as, as Senator uh, Hughes has pointed out previously. Just the behaviour is outrageous. And for the Labor Party to be sitting there, for Senator Chisholm to be sitting there smirking at this when it was all going on, somehow this is going to be the new intimidation practice and sit here and smirk on top of his uh, intimidation this afternoon of Senator Cash. I mean, this behaviour goes on right here in this chamber. We've seen it from Senator Chisholm. We're used to it from Senator Watt. It's not the sort of behaviour we should be tolerating. It is not on. A CFMEU official was jailed for, uh, jailed for assault, once told the female in inspector that she won't, I won't even repeat the words, asking if she had brought knee pads as she is going to be beep, beep, beep uh, dogs all day. I mean, this stuff, this stuff is outrageous, right? The Courier Mail revealed that a CFMMEU official allegedly barked like a dog at a female health and safety consultant on a Gold Coast construction site and said, go, go on, off you go, you beep, dog, beep, get your police. He allegedly called her a beep, dog, uh, beep, beep, twice more that day. I mean, how is it that the Labor Party want to abolish a commission that is standing up for women in the workplace? And what is it with the Greens Party? Why are you standing up there and, and basically removing a safeguard for women in the workplace? Seriously, what is the reason for this? And of course, the reason for this is, is that Labor are all talk and no action. They don't care about women. They don't care about the working class. They don't care about providing essential services. All they want to do is get their rivers of gold from the union movement, whether it be through union fees, whether it be through superannuation fees, whether it be through controlling, controlling all that money in their industry super funds. All they want is command and control, because that is the modus operandi of the two parties opposite us, the Labor Party and the Greens Party. All they want to do is tear down and destroy this country in order that a few inner city elites, and we can see that people are waking up to this. Working class Australians are waking up to just how dangerous and how uh, you know, they're seeing through what the Labor Party you know, it used to stand up for working class, not anymore, how dangerous this party and the Greens Party combined are going to be. And you've only got to look at who's running the show. We've got uh, the Prime Minister, he's from the inner city, inner city of Sydney. We've got you know, people from the Greens over here in the city. They're from the inner city as well. They've grown up. They've always had good uh, essential services, St Vincent's Hospital, things like that. But where, why will not they stand up for people in metropolitan Australia and regional Australia? Why won't they do that? Because that is where the wealth of this country comes from. It is the backbone of this country. It is the working class people. And Labor have turned their backs on them by trying to remove this body from standing up to the thuggery and the violence and the intimidation in the union movement, they are revealing their true colours that they do not care about the Australian worker. This country was built by the battler. It belongs to the battlers. And I can assure you we are going to do everything on this side of the chamber to make sure it's the battlers who are rewarded. Because Labor, if they had their way, they would concentrate power within the bureaucracy, within the unions and within big business and their inner city mates in the inner, uh, ivory towers of Sydney and Melbourne and basically let the rest of the country fade away. And they'd be happy with that. They'd be happy with that. Well, I can tell you what, we're not going to let that happen on this side of the chamber, I can tell you. I can tell you. 
and you watch because under I can tell you under Peter Dutton, the member for Dixon, he knows a thing or two about the working class. He's been standing up for the good people of Dixon for the last 20 years. You've been writing him off. You've been writing him off, but I can tell you what, he knows what it's like. He grew up, you know, from a farm. He's got a farm. He's got multi-generational family out there at Sanford. I'm from a multi-generational working class family. You know, my grandparents used to actually vote blue collar labour. But you know what? You guys lost the plot. You became Marxists and communists, and you forgot about the true capitalists in this country and the people that get out of bed every day, put their nose to the grindstone, and do the hard yards. But you're not interested in that. You're interested in protecting your bureaucrats and your unions and your big corporate end of town. None of these guys, these guys, these guys aren't your primary and secondary industries. They're not your farmers. They're not your miners. They're not your manufacturing industry. Who can remember the hawk? Keating years. You just destroyed the manufacturing industry under the button plan. Yet you, you subsidised the academic sector. You've now got an academic sector that is out of control, selling university degrees for all sorts of crazy studies. Okay, and then how do you solve the problem? You bring in more immigrants to fix the labour shortage. It's only caused because so many people, 50,000 people, work in paper shuffling within superannuation alone, and then about 150,000 work in universities. Most of these degrees aren't, you know, aren't worthwhile degrees. Sure, STEM degrees, medicine, get it, right? You go to university if you want an engineering degree, things like that. I get it. But you guys, the fact that you're trying to remove this uh, commission just goes to show that you don't care about the real people in this country. You're not interested in standing up against violence, intimidation, sexual assault, misogyny. Shame on you, Labor, and shame on you, the Greens. Senator. Back. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I might, Senator Watt, I might. Um, unlike most who have spoken, in fact, I think probably unlike anyone who's spoken in this chamber, I actually have worked in the construction industry. I started working in the foundations of buildings. Uh, I did my trade as an apprentice carpenter joiner. I worked on construction sites uh, and I saw the impact of good unions, and I saw the impact of bad unions. I have a good friend who was a boss who had a pick put through his windscreen as he drove onto a construction site with a militant union. And it's an outrage that those on the other side come into this place and run a protection racket for bad unions mm. and bad union leadership. This is, this is not about flags and stickers, and for those on the other side to try and hide behind a cliché that this is about flags and stickers and people who just don't like unions is a complete and utter cop-out. In fact, it's outrageous. We all sat in this place over the last three years while we have investigated and condemned poor behaviour in workplaces, in this workplace, particularly against women. And yet those on the other side, and particularly as we've seen in contributions from the Greens just now, effectively running a protection racket for those who abuse women, who threaten women, who threaten women with unspeakable things. I imagine what, some, what would be said about any of us on this side had we been associated with anybody like that the outrage that would have come from that side of the chamber. It would be relentless. It would be unending. And yet what's happening right now from Labor and apparently from the Greens is that we're running a protection racket. They are running a protection racket for those who threaten women in ways that so many of my colleagues have put on the record here tonight and I don't intend to do because it's outrageous, it's a disgrace. You don't rack up millions of dollars of fines for flags and stickers. The Supreme Court and the High Court don't award damages of that scale for somebody whose flags has flags and stickers. And it's an absolute outrage and a disgrace that anybody would come into this place and try, and to, try to use that as a smokescreen for what we all know is happening in the construction industry and for, and for what this side, the coalition, tried to do 
to rein it in. And it's an outrage that this process, and I agree with Senator Lambie, that this process is, is attempted to be used to try and undermine the efforts and the role of the ABCC that brings us to a situation where we have to go through this disallowance process. They don't have the courage on the other side to bring in legislation that will put in place their version of what they say might be an effective work, uh, watchdog. We know it's needed. I give Labor credit, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, for the action that they took when they were in government last time and dealt with the BLF. Bob Hawke actually dealt with this behaviour once before. This government doesn't have the courage to do that effectively or properly. They don't have the courage to do that. And I'd forgotten, Acting Deputy President, that Senator Shoebridge had worked with the BLF. He talked about his work on the Green Bands. And can I say I completely differentiate what occurred in Sydney with respect to the Green Bands for what I know that happened on construction sites around this country where concrete pores were disrupted, where companies were stood over so that they didn't supply materials to certain construction businesses um, that wouldn't do things the way the CFMMEU want them to do. It's an absolute outrage that we have to go through this process and not through a formal process of a, a, a genuine plan to actually fix the current structure, if that's what Labor actually want to do, and to snap and, and to hide behind the smokescreen of flags and stickers, when we've heard colleague after colleague, particularly Senator Reynolds, who got up and detailed the way that women were spoken to, the way that women was, were, were treated on building sites, Senator Hughes, who detailed for us. And it's an outrage that she ha actually had to do that. It's an absolute outrage that we're actually talking about that sort of behaviour on building sites. The excuse that it's a robust work environment. Well, it's been said that this is a robust work environment. But we don't tolerate that sort of language, that sort of behaviour to women in this workplace. On what planet? Does a woman in any other workplace in this country, a building site, deserve to be treated in that way? Someone going about their work, that's not a safe workplace. On what, on, it is not safe, it's not a safe workplace for somebody going onto a building site to be abused, to be threatened, to be spoken to in that manner. That's not a safe workplace. And so, any discussion from the other side that this is about workplace safety is a complete and utter crock as well. It's not. In fact, those that are perpetrating that are creating unsafe workplaces. They are creating unsafe workplaces. And those on the other side try and pass it off as flags and stickers. They hide behind, oh, it's a robust workplace. It's about workplace safety. In fact, Senator Shoebridge's suggestion that construction sites are unregulated, I find bizarre. distressing and, and, and Senator Scar bizarre. I mean, coming from someone who's just come from a state legislator who have regulatory oversight of building sites and workplace safety through their state-based regulations, obviously not too effective as a regulator, as a legislator in his previous life in the New South Wales Parliament. But it's an absolute outrage and it's a disgrace that we have to be considering this. Mr President, Acting Deputy President, I thought it might be worth considering the economic impacts of this, considering where we're looking to go over the next decade. And obviously in the last parliament, Due to the actions of the coalition, Queensland is in the very delightful position of being able to host the 2032 Olympic and Olympic Games. 
Now, according to the economic modelling of the impact of the, of the removal of the ABCC, the potential impact is an additional 9.1 per cent in the cost of building projects over the next decade. Now, I made a contribution in this place a few weeks ago, Mr. President, Acting Deputy President, in relation to the failure of this new government so far to put in place the disciplines that the coalition insisted on in their deal with the Queensland government to ensure that there would be some discipline around this, the expenditure, the billions of dollars in expenditure for the construction of the infrastructure required for the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2032. We have a Queensland government who, at this point in time, runs at the behest of the unions, is completely out of control. We're going to not put in place some sensible, some very, very sensible provisions about the decision-making and expenditure of Commonwealth taxpayers' funds on a 50-50 basis with the Queensland government for the construction of the infrastructure. Now we're going to take away the discipline of the ABCC. And can you imagine what it's going to be like if this government goes ahead with patent bargaining? I mean, unions, particularly the CFMMEU, out of control if they're not already, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Potentially adding billions in additional cost to the construction of the infrastructure for what will be a magnificent event for Australia in 2032, the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Now, there's about $12 billion worth of infrastructure to be built for those games, and at 9 per cent, we're talking about over a billion. That's just for the removal of the ABCC. Just imagine what patent bargaining might do to that as well, um, and no economic supervision through a joint administrative body that was proposed by the then uh, Commonwealth Government, because we were very concerned about how the Queensland Government would make decisions about that infrastructure. And when you have a Queensland minister saying that the GABA, for example, which is a billion dollar project, is really just a sketch at this point in time, what's there protecting the Australian taxpayers' dollars? So there's a lot of discussion about this from this government about being sound economic managers, and yet the decisions that they're making are going in exactly the opposite direction in relation to a significant event that we're looking to welcome in a decade's time, but also the costs that might be appropriated as a part of that process. Acting Deputy President, as I worked my way through the construction industry, as I said before, I saw good unions and I saw bad unions. And I have to say, when I was operating in the sector in a professional sense, in the administration in the construction industry, there were some in the union movement that you could have a great relationship with, you could work with, uh, and you could get good deals for your business and for your workforce. That's what we want to see. We want to see a cons uh, a constructive and positive relationship. But can I tell you, we all felt it when the bad things were happening, when big building companies did deals with big unions and the cost of that trickled down through the rest of the industry. We all saw that. We all felt that. And I already have had small businesses come to me and saying that they are already being threatened by the unions. They are already being threatened by the unions because, particularly the CFMMEU, because they know Labor gets this through, they're off the leash. And this is what's going to happen to you. This is what's we're, this is what we're going to do to your business. This is how we're going to make it harder for you to work, and this is what you're going to pay. These threats are already being made, Acting Deputy President. These threats are already being made in the construction industry because the CFMMEU leadership in particular, and I don't want to, I don't want to smear the frontline workers 
the workers on job sites with the same traits that are coming from the union leadership. Because I agree with those in the chamber who have made statements about wanting workers to go to work and come home safe. I've been there. I've been on construction sites. And I know what trauma it brings right through the workforce when something goes wrong. Through the workforce, through a business and all of those associated with it. That's not what any of us want to see. This is not about being anti-union. This is not about being anything other than wanting to see appropriate behaviour, good behaviour on work sites. This is wanting to make sure that those horrific examples that were put on the record by Senator Hughes and Senator Reynolds don't happen. We, shouldn't, we, don't, we don't accept them in our workplace. No other worker in any other workplace should accept them either because that's not a safe workplace. And the complete, the, com the complete suggestion that it's a robust industry and so you expect some of these things to happen is a complete cop-out. And so I won't accept the Labor Party and I won't accept the Greens running a protection racket for this abhorrent behaviour. I will stand up every day for people on the front line in the workforce, every day, because I've been there. I'm one of the few in this place who actually have. And I will be supporting this disallowance motion because it should be supported in the interests of good behaviour in the construction industry to make sure that anybody working in the sector can go to work safe, not be threatened and go home safe, and that the appropriately re appropriate regulatory frameworks are in place uh, throughout the sector. Thank you. Senator McGrath. Thank you. Acting Deputy President, and with the, the indulgence of the Chamber, before I get into the meat of this disallowance, I would just like to um, uh, pay homage uh, to Senator Cadell and, and his first speech uh, from earlier this evening. Uh, Ross uh, and I worked on the Country Liberal campaign up in Darwin uh, back in 2012, and I've known him since then, and I can just see that he's going to be such a strong fighter for, for regional and rural New South Wales, but, but across, across Australia, and his earthy sense of humour and his self-deprecation will be a welcome addition to this place. And I, I thank the Chamber for allowing me that, that, that small indulgence before I now get down into uh, what we're here for. Now, what's, what's interesting, Acting Deputy President, and, and for those who, who might be listening at home or uh, over the World Wide Web, is, is the name of, 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 of what we're dealing with here. We keep talk, talking about a disallowance, and it's a... Um, Code for the Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment Instrument 2022 Motion for Disallowance. So what, what the, the Labor Party are doing is they're trying to, to slowly strangle uh, a safe workplace in Australia. And, and what they're doing is before they can get legislation before the chamber, they've brought for, forward regulations that, that, that in the words of, of Tony Burke, uh, they said that the Australian Building and Construction Commission's powers will be pulled back to the bare legal minimum, uh, and so that's what this is about. This is about the Labor Party doing the bidding of, of their union paymasters. And, and what is interesting, if you're a student of history, and especially if you're from Queensland, like Senator, Senator Scar is, is that, that Queensland is, is the birthplace, birthplace of, of, of the Labor Party. And it you know, came for, from a shearer strike, and that the Labor Party came out of the union movement. The Labor Party was was established as the political wing of, of the union movement, and, and you know, Labor senators and MPs are very proud of that, and you know, you know, good on them. I'm sure their parents are proud. But but what has happened with with the modern Labor Party is that. It actually isn't the political wing of, 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 of the union movement. What has happened is that, that the union movement has become the campaign wing of the Labor Party, because the Labor Party in its soul has died. You know, the, 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 the light on the hill, the flame on the hill of, of, of Prime Minister Chief Lee has become a sort of a, a damp, 
a damp sponge. And, and what has happened with, with the union movement is they've effectively become subcontractors to, to the Labor Party, as, as you, know, you might see who set up in some of the government affairs agencies around town. And what the union movement do is that they say to the Labor Party, look, we'll campaign for your election, but we want something in return. Because remember the union movement, for, for those who are listening, fellow senators, the union movement now has only about 10 per cent of the workforce, and, and, and about 10 per cent of the workforce. So, only, so nine out of 10 Australians don't join, it, don't join a union. Now, I'm someone who, who proudly believes in freedom of association, that you, do have, you should have the right to, to join a, uh, an industrial association, the right to join a union, but also the right not to join an industrial association or, or, or union. But what the, the Labor Party do through their subcontractors in, in the union movement, uh, who, who run these um, public uh, campaigning bodies, is that they're trying to protect the institutional power of unions, because unions have failed in their, their fundamental reason for existence, and that is to be mass membership organisations that defend the rights of the working class. And they don't do that anymore. Uh, they defend the rights of, of union officials. So for those who are listening, this debate is not about union members. This debate is not about the right to join a union or not join a union. This debate is about the, the exercise of, of power by union officials, in particular the exercise of, of power by union officials who over the decades have proven themselves incapable of understanding good governance, but proven themselves capable of understanding the power of thuggery, of understanding the power of corruption and understanding the power of pure, pure malice. And, and that is sad because that reflects upon the entire union movement. It reflects poorly upon, and this is quite sad, on those union members who trust those, those union officials to do what is in their best interests. And that does not happen with the CFMEU, because this effectively is a criminal organisation. It is an organisation who exists not to protect the rights of their members. This organisation exists purely to protect the power, the feudal power that exists within the structure of the CFMEU. And what we've heard, we've heard uh, tonight have been some very powerful examples. I, I do want to commend Senator Reynolds and, and in particular, Senator Hughes's uh, very strong and very, and very um, touching approaches of, of how safety in the workplace is disregarded by, by the Labor Party in the union movement when politics are involved. So we hear in this place loudly and clearly that we must have safe workplaces across Australia. And indeed in this building we've had reviews and committees and, and as Senator Hughes uh, very eloquently said, she's never felt uh, 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 unsafe in this place. But she, she did go through some, some examples of what women <coughs> and what some gay Australians have had to deal with in the workplace because of officials of the CFMEMU. And what is interesting is that the speakers opposite, none of them, none of them have commented or uh, expanded upon why they think that the, the conduct of these union officials is right or defensible, because they know it's not. But, but remember that in the UK we do have, and I am looking forward to the announcement of, of the new British Prime Minister um, in, in 45 minutes' time. In the UK we do have there is the House of Lords, so um, an appointed chamber with 92 hereditary peers. But in Australia we've got the Senate, which is for the Labor Party the House of Retired Bar Union Barons. And they, they come here after serving a term or two as the Assistant General Secretary of some acronym, and they come in here as part of a deal. And, and they sit on those benches over there, and quite frankly, 
Um, they don't add much to this place except when they depart and then when someone else comes in to, to, to warm that particular seat. And this is what is sad, that you would think that these union officials who sit opposite us would defend the right for all Australians to have a safe, a safe workplace. But no, they don't do that. Because remember that the unions are subcontractors to the Labor Party. And the, and the unions, and we experienced this during, during the May election when you know, my, 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 my sad slightly lost, oh, sorry, slightly, sadly lost. But what was interesting was the dying Labor Party infrastructure across Australia and how it was sal saved and salvaged by the union movement. And I experienced this on various pre-polls around the place, that you would have these, these you know, charming, and I use that sarcastically, uh, men, and they're always men, uh, who would come along from the particular union headquarters and you know, they have their tattoos and they um, have a, you know, their, their sort of general menacing approach to life where they would, you know, snarl at trees and, and chase cars. And what they loved to do was intimidate people. And they would stand over the little old ladies and the little old men of the LNP. And that's why I love my party. It's because the little old ladies and the little old men would stand their ground and as these union thugs would stand over them and intimidate them and call them all sorts of terrible names. And so that's when we get to, to the breaches of, of a safe workplace that the CFMEU have been found to undertake. And I know it's true. I don't need a court of law to tell me that, because I see that on polling day. I see that on what should be a celebration of our boisterous democracy, when often there are frank exchanges of views between the left and the right and the far left over there and the Greens. But what the union thugs do is they always take it to the next level and threaten violence against, against the, the LNP volunteers. And they are volunteers, where these aren't union members. They're union officials and they're union thugs. So, you know, the CFMEU has been penalised for more breaches of the Fair Work Act than any other union. Now, I am going to read out some of the, 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 the findings of what's happened in these, these workplaces, because I want those opposite to defend the actions of these union officials. I want them to get up and say, it was right for a CFMU official who once was jailed for assault to who told a female inspector she was an effing, well, it's an S word that rhymes with glut, asking her if she brought knee pads. And to quote, because you are going to be sucking off these, oh goodness me, effing dogs all day. Now, I want those union officials over there to come into this place and defend the actions and say, yes, that was what should happen in a workplace. Because this is why we need an honest cop out there. That's why we need the Australian Building and Construction Commission, because they go in and they stop this behaviour. Now, the Courier Mail revealed a CFMEU official allegedly barked like a dog at a female, a female health and safety consultant on a Gold Coast construction site and said, and I remember this was to do when they were, um, the Commonwealth Games were being instructed, and this, this, this um, you know, charming guy who you'd you know, love to take home and meet your parents sort of thing, you'd just imagine him sitting around the, you know, the, the dining table, and this guy said, go on, off you go, you um, effing dog, goodness, uh, C. Go get your police. And then he went on to call her, call her, okay? So we love the left over here, who are always up about the rights of women, the rights of minorities, but not when it comes to those women and those minorities who might have a different view to them as to the role of thuggish union officials. Oh no, they don't have their rights. They don't have any rights, not in, in a workplace that is going to be governed by officials of the CFMEU. So welcome to the modern Labor Party.
The party that, as Senator Reddick said, is not the party of the working class. It is the party who defend the right of spivs and thugs to threaten women and members of minority communities in Australia. Now, the, the CFMU delegates have also been accused of harassing the daughter of a builder when they pick it at a work site. So this is just charming, isn't it? This is our building industry, which is so important for Australia's economy, which is so important to make sure that, that people have jobs, that people have skills, that people have homes, and we have roads, and that we have everything that we can build to make Australia a better place. So we're not talking about some you know, two-bit business, as much as I love two-bit businesses, because I'm a big fan of small businesses. This is a multi-billion dollar industry that is held to ransom by the thugs of the CFMEU and what the Labor Party are doing because of their failure to, to act as a mature political party, because of their failure to grow and mature as a political party over the decades, that the Labor Party needs to subcontract out their campaigning to the unions. And you know, people talk about the need for a, a corruption commission uh, federally. The Labor Party is going to bring that in. And I sort of wonder sometimes whether the Labor Party doing a policies for votes deal with the union movement, whether that would fall within the remit of an anti-corruption commission. Because if a Labor Party is saying to the union movement, campaign for us and we will, do the we will deliver the following policies, or is it a case the union movement saying to the Labor Party, we'll campaign for you if you deliver the following for us? And in terms of some of the definitions of this anti-corruption commission, I wonder, I wonder whether I'll be knocking on that door at 9am when this anti-corruption commission opens and I'll be lodging complaints there about the conduct and the behaviour of this, this terrible, terrible octopus that is the modern Labor Party and the, and the failing union movement. The question is that I'm oh, sorry, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. You have been just a bit too efficient there. I think there's a couple more speakers who wish mm. to rise after I me. Didn't have any more on my list. In contemplating my contribution uh, to this debate, I carefully listened to the contributions of other senators. Okay. Uh, I listened to the contributions of my to... coalition colleagues, and in particular those who shared the harrowing stories and shocking examples of the misbehaviour of CFMEU officials targeted towards women, minorities, workers and public servants. I also listened to the contributions of the Greens, who to their credit have so far in this debate provided more senators to speak in defence of the government's uh, actions in this area than the government has in their own uh, defence. And of course the contribution from the sole Labor speaker so far, Senator Sheldon. I wonder whether Senator Sheldon. Oh, well, thank you, Senator Watt, for that interjection. I look forward to further contributions from your colleagues. I wonder whether, in caucus this morning, whether Senator Sheldon drew the short straw and is their designated speaker for the day to come in and defend the indefensible, or whether uh, he is the only one who has the courage to show up and defend the conduct of the CFMMEU. Because I sincerely try to put myself in the shoes of those opposite, many of whom ran, no doubt very sincerely committed to the advancement of women and minorities and defence of the rule of the law, and yet who will come into this place when this motion is put for a vote and dutifully do as they are told and defend conduct which surely even they know deep down is not right, is not okay is not something that we should want to see in Australia. And I puzzle to myself what is the possible reason why good people would come in and defend such reprehensible con conduct. And I'm sorry after reflecting and listening to the contributions of all senators, there really only is one possible contribution. And it is, as other senators have alluded to, ultimately all about money. The CFMEU is one of the Labor Party's most important financial benefactors. 
In the last 20 years alone, they have donated $16.3 million of their members' dues to the Labor Party. That's $16 million that's allowed the Labor Party to run and finance their campaigns and ultimately to prevail at the last federal election and occupy the government benches. And maybe they can tell themselves in the quiet of their room, in the dark of the night, when they're reflecting on their contribution to public life, that it might have been a bit uncomfortable to defend this reprehensible conduct, but it was worth it, because that $16 million allowed us to win the election and to be in government. I wish I could say that this was an isolated case. I wish I could say it was the only instance of the Labor Party making moral compromises for donations, but it's not. Because in just the first 100 days of this new government, they haven't done much. They haven't outlined a plan to address the cost of living crisis facing Australians. But one thing they've done very well, one thing they've done remarkably efficiently and productively is to deliver for the constituencies who delivered for them, and particularly for their financial backers. Because this is in fact a pattern of behaviour. And we've seen it in the regulations issued recently to try to protect super funds from the measures of disclosure and transparency that the former government uh, imposed upon them, and particularly the good work of Senator Hume, who was a responsible minister in the previous parliament. All that we asked, which I don't think is an unreasonable thing, is that when they are donating their super members' money to causes, uh, political and otherwise, that they disclose that to their members, that they be transparent about that to their members. And yet, in its first 100 days, this government has issued a regulation to try and obscure that information and hide it from those super fund members. The Assistant Treasurer, Mr Jones, has even laughably said that this is a red tape reduction measure, that this is about reducing the cost of compliance and the regulatory burden on super funds. Now, he was very embarrassed when Michael Rodden at the Financial Review pointed out that other areas of the law, in particular reporting obligations to APRA, already requires super funds to, or, to provide this information. The only thing this regulation did was to make it public. But why would the Labor Party be so passionate about delivering for super funds by helping them to cover it up? Well, my colleague, Senator Bragg, who I know is going to make a contribution shortly, um, has very deftly exposed over the last few months why that would be the case. Because in just one financial year alone, the most recent uh, financial year for which we have data, 2020 to 2021, super funds paid $12.9 million to the union movement. And we know those funds don't just go from super funds to the union movement and stay there. They help subsidise the political campaigning activity of the union movement and ultimately the political donations that the union movement makes to the Labor Party. So this is yet another example of the Labor Party trading donations for regulatory favours when they get to government. And unfortunately, it is uh, only one of many, because at 4.30 on Friday afternoon, it's always a bit of a giveaway when ministers issue a media release at that time, the Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus, and again our favourite Assistant Treasurer, Mr Jones, issued a media release. Uh, the footy finals were on, people were heading away for the weekend, but just in time before journalists clocked off, they shared the news that they are also overturning regulations governing litigation funders and class actions. Now, brief recap of the history of this issue. It has become very clear in recent years that the conduct of class action law firms and litigation funders is underregulated, and that the victims of that lack of regulation has been successful class action participants who banded together, finally had their day in court, won their case. And when it came time for the proceeds of that successful action to be handed out among those class action participants, they got cents on the dollar. And they got cents on the dollar because the overwhelming lion's share of those proceeds instead went to class action law firms and the litigation funders who financed their activities. Now, these are litigation funders who are typically located in tax haven jurisdictions like the Virgin or Jersey Islands or the Cayman Islands. These are litigation funders who are treating our justice system like it is a casino and generating returns on investment for their initial outlays of the many hundreds of percent. And in fact, it emerged during an inquiry which I chaired in the previous parliament that these funds are so oversubscribed that every time they advertise 
for injection of new funds from overseas investors, uh, they cannot meet the demand. And why wouldn't you, with such guaranteed lucrative returns through the Australian justice system? So, quite reasonably, the former Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, issued a regulation which required some very basic and very minimal compliance on the part of these litigation funders and class action law firms. One of the things it required of them was that they apply for and obtain an AFSL, an Australian Financial Services Licence. One of the key criteria of, of obtaining and holding an AFSL is it must conduct yourself honestly, efficiently and fairly. It remains an open question which one of those three criteria honesty, efficiency or fairness that litigation funders and class action law firms are unwilling or unable to comply with and which one of those things this government, the Albanese government, thinks it is an unreasonable thing to require them of. Because this regulation, issued by Mr Dreyfus and Mr Jones, would have the effect of removing that requirement from class action law firms and their partners in the litigation funding industry. So why would it be that Late on a Friday afternoon, within its first few months in office, one of the priorities of the Albanese government is to issue a regulation to remove a basic compliance and oversight of an unregulated industry. Well, to explain the answer to that question, I turn to Janet Albertson and an article in the Australian newspaper published on the 16th of May 2020, in which she writes, in the 2009-10 year, financial year, Morris Blackburn donated $163,300 to Labor, then its highest donation on record to the party. The previous year, it sent only $12,951 Labor's way, and the year before that, it was just $12,616. For the next 10 years, Morris Blackburn donated more than $1 million to Labor, compared with $257,767 over the previous decade. In the last financial year, with the state election in Victoria in November 2018 and the federal election in the following May, Morris Blackburn donated $354,805 to Labor, the firm's largest donation on record. It gave a further $200,000 to the ACTU, which campaigned for Labor. So that is just one class action law firm and just one snapshot of the millions of dollars which flowed from this industry to the Labor Party. And it is the third example I cite today of major Labor Party donors getting regulatory favours from this government. And they are regulatory favours which help these organisations evade scrutiny, transparency, disclosure and oversight. Now, this is a political party, the Labor Party, which campaigned for office on being the most transparent government ever, on being an ethical government that was going to bring in a corruption commission. And yet, in its first 100 days in office, it has engaged in behaviour which I think is arguably corrupt. And I share Senator McGrath's uh, ad advocacy that um, perhaps this is something that a future corruption commission should examine when it is established. Because it is very hard to think of any other reason why the Labor Party would go to such lengths to expose itself to some political risk and some political damage in order to protect its friends, except for the very significant financial donations that they receive. And Senator Lambie made a good point in her contribution, a number of good points, but one in particular I want to highlight. She noted that the Albanese government wasn't proceeding on this issue by way of legislation, at least not for now. They're doing so by regulation. It's not a coincidence that in case of letting their friends in the super funds off the hook, they're also proceeding by regulation. And in letting their, fund, their friends in the litigation funding movement and the class action law firms off the hook, they are also proceeding by way of regulation. Now, of course, regulation has an appropriate uh, role in a Westminster system. Not everything needs to be specified in legislation, but it's generally regarded as a tool for less contentious areas of public policy, the, the rats and mice of public policy, the filling out the gaps of the legislative framework. But these are not rats and mice. These are not trivial things. These are three big substantive things. And yet this government does not have the courage of its convictions in bringing forward legislation to deal with any of these three issues, in testing the numbers in this chamber to see whether it could obtain 39 votes for these things, and exposing itself to a full and proper debate, a debate that would involve referrals to Senate committees, public hearings and inquiries, and examination of this issue. They want to do it quick, they want to do it dirty, and they want to do it with the minimal scrutiny, because they know, ultimately, if exposed to the public, it would not reflect very well on them. Now, this is a new government. It is understandably riding high 
The poles are strong. It's in a honeymoon period. But that does not last, let me tell you. No government enjoys that level of public support forever. And when the worm inevitably turns, as it will, in a few years' time, decisions like this will not stand the test of time. Decisions like this will look like a stain on the early record of this government. And I really urge those opposite to consider. I know it's hard. I know you remember the Labor Party. I know your, your caucus discipline and solidarity. But consider, is this what you got yourself in public life to do? Did you run for office to provide regulatory favours to your political donors? Because if the Liberal and National parties did these things in government, you would be the first people to charge into this chamber and accuse us of corrupt conduct and corrupt behaviour. And if you think it's bad if your political opponents do it, then you should reflect on whether it's OK for you to do it as well. You should reflect on whether that is really the purpose for which you came to the federal parliament to represent your fellow Australians. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make a contribution on this disallowance motion. And uh, in coming after Senator Patterson's very good remarks, uh, it is appropriate that I start off on this theme of vested interests. And the reality is that there will always be vested interests. Uh, and that will be the case in any organisation. And of course, the former Prime Minister Paul Keating, who was uh, mentored by Jack Lang, who was a former Premier of New South Wales, had a, I believe Mr Lang uh, coined this expression about in the great race of life, always back self-interest, because at least you know it's trying. Now, it is, um, I believe, a very true statement um, that uh, conflicts are perhaps unavoidable, but uh, it is the job of ministers to work to their oaths, to take their oaths seriously and to only pursue public policy initiatives which are genuinely in the public interest. And it is true that the Labor Party won the election with a very threadbare agenda. Uh, they had some policies, some bad ones, they had some good ones, to be fair, uh, but they had very few policies. And so what they have now had to do in these first hundred or so days is pull together, or fashion together, or thrash together a bit of an agenda for the next little while. Now, um, they have been able to pick up the speed dial uh, of their uh, closest associates and say, now, what have you got in the top drawer? What, what, are, the, what are the issues we can, we can work on that are going to make us look as if we're doing something? Because we need to do something now we're in this job. It's like the cat that, or the dog that caught the car. And, of course, uh, Senator Patterson has uh, eloquently walked through a pretty good list of the, uh, the vested interests which are ruling the roost here. And uh, look, there's no problem with having a, a summit and uh, discussing policy issues. It's, in some ways, it's quite refreshing. But um, I'm not sure that the invitation list really reflects the modern economy uh, that we have. And so this particular issue of the ABCC is a pattern of behaviour, is part of a pattern of behaviour that we have seen uh, already across uh, class action law firms and, of course, superannuation. Now, um, the point about restraining vested interests and protecting against a concentration of power is very important in, in a democracy. It's very important that governments are not captured by vested interests. And you know, my own political party or my own side of politics has had a, a very mixed history with these issues over the long run. Uh, the predecessor party of the Liberal Party, the UAP, which I note has now been reborn in some sort of a new capacity here in uh, Canberra, of course uh, had been effectively destroyed uh, because the vested interests which had been involved in the party's governance uh, and had paid the party's bills uh, then sought to set the policies of that party. Now, that party then, of course, was run into the ground and Menzies uh, 
set the party up in a way where policies were not going to be set by the people that paid the bills because they had clear conflicts of interest in doing so. And unfortunately, the Labor Party is now where the UAP was, or the original UAP was, uh, some almost 80 years ago, where the paymasters are setting the policies. And that is, a, that is a risk for the nation, but it's also a risk for the Labor Party. Now, on the issue of this particular measure, clearly uh, the case has been made by my colleagues very um, effectively, I'd have to say, uh, that of course, uh, when you're looking at an, a size of the economy of this magnitude of almost 10 per cent, and you're talking about a labour market uh, component of 1.15 million, uh, and you're looking at uh, unbundling an institution which has already proven its value by reducing uh, labour costs, by increasing productivity, uh, by effectively dealing with the cases that were brought to its front door. Uh, you have to ask yourself, why would you want to do this? Now, of course, we know the answers, and I won't uh, bore the chamber with those answers again. They've been uh, well and truly set out. But it is, as I say, a pattern of behaviour. Uh, the ABCC has to go because the CFMEU say it's uh, not good for our operation. Now, the regulation we put in place to ensure that all the superannuation funds would have to disclose the contributions they make to unions, and that has to go because, uh, again, uh, the unions don't want to have that. Certainly the super funds uh, don't want to tell their members uh, where they're sending their money to. And, and equally, again, uh, the class action lawyers they don't, want, uh, they don't want to lose money because the way that it's established now, uh, they can run the cases and it's very important that we have class actions. It's a very important way for people to be able to access justice. But the idea that these class action law firms would now not be subject to regulation when they are running a managed investment scheme on behalf of often thousands of people is ridiculous. I, I mean, the proposals that were before this parliament were simply that you can run a class action, but you can't take all the money if you're the law firm. You've got to maintain a reasonable balance. Uh, and you know, The bulk of the money that is won in a class action should go to the people for which you're working. Now, that is a reasonable proposition, but apparently no good uh, because, of course, the class ac action lawyers and donors don't like it. But I, I do want to talk about this issue of where some of these things come together, because I think that uh, there is no question that the CFMEU does have considerable power over the Labor Party. Now, we have talked about the donations they make directly to the Labor Party, uh, and um, we have also canvassed in these contributions this evening and also earlier in the day the statements that Mr Stephen Jones has made, the Assistant Treasurer, that he made on Friday night when he made a regulation uh, that uh, removes the requirement for super funds to disclose their payments that they make to unions. All they have to do now is aggregate these payments. Now, Mr Jones, in his media statement, said that he was going to maintain the requirement for the super funds to disclose their political donations. Now, that's very cute. Because, of course, anyone who has looked at this matter knows that the money is washed through the unions. It is not paid directly to the Labor Party itself. And so, uh, by doing that, uh, effectively, and allowing the aggregation of the money from the funds into the unions to be maintained, uh, it is leaving a, or giving a green light uh, for the money to be supercharged. Now, um, I do want to talk about the, uh, the amount of money here that's been paid over the past few years. So, in relation to the CFMEU, uh, which is the, it is the number one recipient of all the uh, unions out of the superannuation system. So, as I say, uh, in, over the last five years, so in 2016-17, the CFMEU received $750,000 from the super funds. 
In 2017-18, the CFMEU received 1.4 million. In 2018-19, the CFMEU received 3.5 million dollars in the super funds. In 2019-20, the CFMEU received 4.7 million dollars. And in 2020-2021, the CFMEU received 6.1 million dollars. So uh, we've gone from $750,000 in 16-17 to $6.1 million in 2020-2021. Now, those are not Andrew Bragg's figures. Those are the figures that have been disclosed on the Australian Electoral Commission website. Um, so that is a very good example of where the people's retirement savings, which is ostensibly managed for their benefit, uh, is increasingly being filed into the coffers of the CFMEU. Now, that is a massive increase over the course of five years, and you've got to ask yourself, well, um, how can that be justified? Now, of course, under the regulations we made in the former parliament, now, all of those individual payments would have been disclosed to members. I mean, the, the members of these funds, by the way, are not going to trawl through the Australian Electoral Commission's website. They're not going to pull together and sticky tape together pieces of paper uh, that are filed by all the various unions in their annual returns, which shows their income, their income that is paid in by other sources. I mean, uh, most people have got better things to do than to go through and do that. So the whole point of the member disclosures was to set it out in detail so people could see it if they wanted to. Now, with the aggregation model that Mr Jones has, has made, and he's made the regulation on Friday, uh, we will now uh, not be able to see the individual payments made into the unions. And of course, the Senate can, can decide. I mean, the minister is free to make his regulation. Uh, that's his right under the Act. He's been given those powers. Now the Senate will have to decide whether it will stand up for integrity and transparency, and it will, it will make a judgment about whether it thinks that the people should be able to see the contributions that are being made by their super funds to other organisations and whether or not uh, that is something that they want to finance. And the same goes for this disallowance. The question is, will, this, will the Senate be prepared to hold the line on an institution which has proven that it has been able to successfully consider cases, uh, that it has been an effective cop on the beat, um, and that its abolition would result in a loss of productivity in our economy, a hit to GDP and a loss of 4,000 jobs. So these are very clear questions that the Senate can consider in relation to, to, to this disallowance on the CFMEU, or sorry, on the, um, the um, ABCC. But also, again, uh, I'm sure that there will be an opportunity in the near term for this chamber to consider the matter on the super non-disclosure and the, lo the loss of transparency. But of course, this is all just a theme of a government that is seeking to work for vested interests. And, and one would have hoped that, that the issues that really matter to the Australian people would have been the subject of this government's early initiatives. But sadly, the government is working through the top drawer of the issues of the vested interests. And these are the issues that are coming up now. Now, uh, given that there's a pretty threadbare policy agenda, uh, goodness knows what we'll be seeing in 12 months from now. Um, it may, may be more radical. I mean, I have to say this is a pretty brazen agenda to try and run all these things through, assuming that no one will care, the media won't be interested, it's too technical, it's too hard to understand. Uh, but my sense is that um, a lot of these things will be stopped uh, because they are not in the public interest and people will not want to go back to their electors and say, uh, yes, we allowed the ABCC to go because we didn't think it was important. Uh, yes, we thought it wasn't important that you should know where your super funds are going. Uh, yes, we thought it was a good idea to get rid of the class action regulation because we think that the class action lawyers should have more money than you when you win a case. Um, I mean, these are, these are not the arguments that people will, will want to run in the retail uh, uh, environment. I mean, these may, may be impressive arguments uh, to people uh, who need to pay off debts to various vested interests. But at the end of the day, 
Um, this chamber surely, uh, given it has great power vested in it, um, should be always looking uh, to maintain the highest possible standards, uh, and we should not be. I mean, frankly, we would be doing the Labor government a favour by stopping uh, this particular repeal, and we would be doing the government a great favour uh, by not allowing them to proceed with their uh, anti-transparency measures in super and all the other things that they're wanting to do. Because in the long run, as Senator Patterson, I think, pointed out as well. Um, these are not things that will reflect well on the government in the long term. In the long term, uh, they will have to justify why they did this, and the reality is that these are not the policy initiatives that are the most important things to the economy or the Australian people. These are the list of issues that are important to a few vested interests that have a disproportionate amount of power over the government and over the governing political party. So um, I'll be voting uh, on this disallowance to ensure that the ABCC can be maintained uh, for the good governance of the construction industry. Senator Ayres. Acting Deputy President, well, 